Lost Victories. By. Field Marshal Eric von Manstein. Dedication. In memory of our fallen son and hero Eric Manstein and all comrades who fell for Germany. Forward by Captain B. H. Liddell Hart. The general verdict among the German generals I interrogated in 1945 was that Field Marshal von Manstein had proved the ablest commander in their army, and the man they had most desired to become its commander in chief. It is very clear that he had a superb sense of operational possibilities and an equal mastery in the conduct of operations, together with a greater grasp of the potentialities of mechanized forces than any of the other commanders who had not been trained in the tank arm. In sum, he had military genius. In the earlier stages of the war he exerted a great influence behind the scenes as a staff officer. Later he became an outstanding commander and played a key part from 1941 to 1944 in the titanic struggle on the Russian front. His detailed account of the campaigns, pungent comments, and very significant revelations combine to make his book one of the most important and illuminating contributions to the history of World War II. An extraordinary aspect of Erich von Manstein's career is that he is best known outside Germany at any rate, in connection with operations that took place when he was a relatively junior general, and in which he took no part. For his fame primarily arose from his influence on the design or, rather, on the recasting, of the plan for the German offensive of 1940 which broke through the Western Front, and led to the fall of France, with all its far-reaching results. The new plan, for making the decisive thrust through the hilly and wooded Ardennes the line of least expectation has come to be called the Manstein Plan. That is tribute to what he did in evolving it and striving to win acceptance for it in place of the old plan, for a more direct attack through Belgium, which would in all probability have resulted in a repulse. At that time Manstein was chief of staff to Rundstedt's army group, and when his arguments for changing the plan became irritating to his superiors he was honorably pushed out of the way by promotion to command a reserve corps, of infantry, just before the new plan was adopted under Hitler's pressure after hearing Manstein's arguments. The book provides much fresh information on the course of this operational controversy and the evolution of the plan that led to victory. In the crucial opening stage of the offensive, which cut off the Allies' left wing and trapped it on the Channel coast, Manstein's com merely had a follow-on part. But in the second and final stage it played a bigger role. Under his dynamic leadership, his infantry pushed on so fast on foot that they raced the armoured corps in the drive southward across the Somme and the Seine to the Loire. After the collapse of France, Hitler hoped that Britain would make peace, but when disappointed he began, belatedly and half-heartedly, to make preparations for a cross-channel invasion. Manstein was entrusted with the task of leading the initial landing with his corps, which was moved to the Boulogne-Calais area for the purpose. His book has some striking comments on the problem, on the strategic alternatives, and on Hitler's turn away to deal with Russia. For the invasion of Russia in 1941 Manstein was given his heart's desire the command of an armored corps, the 56th. With it he made one of the quickest and deepest thrusts of the opening stage, from East Prussia to the Dvina, nearly 200 miles, within four days. Promoted to command the 11th Army in the south, he forced an entry into the Crimean Peninsula by breaking through the fortified Perekopismus, and in the summer of 1942 further proved his mastery of siege warfare technique by capturing the famous fortress of Shivastopol, the key center of the Crimea being Russia's main naval base on the Black Sea. He was then sent north again to command the intended attack on Leningrad, but called away by an emergency summons to conduct the efforts to relieve Paulus's Sixth Army, trapped that winter at Stalingrad, after the failure of the main German offensive of 1942. The effort failed because Hitler, forbidding any withdrawal, refused to agree to Manstein's insistence that Paulus should be told to break out westward and meet the relieving forces. The long chapter on the tragedy of Stalingrad is full of striking revelations, and the more illuminating because of the penetrating analysis of Hitler as supreme commander in the preceding chapter. Following Paulus's surrender, a widespread collapse developed on the German southern front under pressure of advancing Russian armies 
but Manstein saved the situation by a brilliant flank counterstroke which recaptured Kharkov and rolled back the Russians in confusion. That counterstroke was the most brilliant operational performance of Manstein's career, and one of the most masterly in the whole course of military history. His detailed account of the operation is likely to be studied, for its instructional value, so long as military studies continued up then in the Germans' last great offensive of the war in the East, Operation Citadel, launched in July 1943 against the Kursk salient, Manstein's Southern Army Group formed the right pincer. It achieved a considerable measure of success, but the effect was nullified by the failure of the left pincer, provided by the Central Army Group. Moreover, at this crucial moment the Anglo-American landing in Sicily led Hitler to direct several divisions to the Italian theater. Having checked the German offensive, the Russians now launched their own on a larger scale along a wider front, and with growing strength. From that time onwards, the Germans were thrown on the defensive, strategically, and with the turn of the tide, Manstein was henceforth called on to meet, repeatedly, what has always been judged the hardest task of generalship that of conducting a fighting withdrawal in face of much superior forces. He showed great skill, against heavy odds in checking successive Russian thrusts and imposing delays on the westward advance of the Russian armies. His concept of the strategic defensive gave strong emphasis to offensive action in fulfilling it, and he constantly looked for opportunities of delivering a riposte, while often ably exploiting those which arose. But when he urged that a longer step back should be made a strategic withdrawal in order to develop the full recoil spring effect of a counteroffensive against an overstretched enemy advance, Hitler would not heed his arguments. Hitler's unwillingness to sanction any withdrawal forfeited each successive chance of stabilizing the front, and repeatedly clashed with Manstein's sense of strategy. Unlike many of his fellows, Manstein maintained the old Prussian tradition of speaking frankly, and expressed his criticism forcibly both to Hitler in private and at conferences, in a way that staggered others who were present. That Hitler bore it so long is remarkable evidence of the profound respect he had for Manstein's ability, and a contrast with his attitude to most of his generals, and to the general staff as a body. But the cumulative effect became in the end more than Hitler could stand and all the more because the course of events continued to confirm Manstein's warnings. So in March 1944 Hitler reached the limit of his endurance, and put Manstein on the shelf, although with far more politeness than he normally showed in making changes of command. That ended the active career of the Allies' most formidable military opponent, a man who combined modern ideas of mobility with a classical sense of maneuver, a mastery of technical detail and great driving power. January 1958 Author's Preface This book is the personal narrative of a soldier in which I have deliberately refrained from discussing political problems or matters with no direct bearing on events in the military field. In the same connection it is perhaps worth recalling a statement of Captain B. H. Liddelhartz the German generals of this war were the best finished product of their profession, anywhere. They could have been better if their outlook had been wider and their understanding deeper but if they had become philosophers they would have ceased to be soldiers. I have made every effort not to view things in a retrospective light, but to present my experiences, ideas and decisions as they appeared to me at the time. In other words, I write not as a historical investigator, but as one who played an active part in what I have to relate. But even though I have tried to give an objective account of all that happened, of the people involved and of the decisions they took, my opinion, as that of a participant, is bound to be subjective. I still hope, nevertheless, that the account I give will be of some use to historians, for even they cannot get the truth from files and documents alone. The essential thing to know is how the main personalities thought and reacted to events, and the answer to this will seldom be found certainly not in a complete form in files or war diaries. In describing how the plan for Germany's 1940 offensive in the West came about, I have departed from Colonel General V. Seek's precept that general staff officers should be nameless. I feel I am at liberty to do this now that through no action of my own, 
the subject has so long been open to general discussion. It was actually my former Commander-in-Chief, Field Marshal V. Rundstedt, and our Chief of Operations, General Blumentritt, who told Liddelhart the story of the plan. At that time I had not had the pleasure of meeting him. In this account of military problems and events I have occasionally included items of a personal nature in the belief that there must be a place for the human element even in war. The reason for the absence of such personal reminiscences from the later chapters of the book is that worry and the burden of my responsibilities overshadowed everything else during that period. My activities in World War II have led me to deal with events largely from the viewpoint of leadership at a higher level. I hope, nonetheless, to have made it consistently clear that the decisive factor throughout was the self-sacrifice, valor and devotion to duty of the German fighting soldier, combined with the ability of commanders at all levels and their readiness to assume responsibility. These were the qualities which won us our victories. These alone enabled us to face the overwhelming superiority of our opponents. By this book, I should at the same time like to express gratitude to my commander in chief in the initial phase of the war, Field Marshal V. Rundstedt, for the trust he always placed in me, to the commanders and soldiers of all ranks who served under my command, and to the men who served at my various headquarters, in particular my chiefs of staff and general staff officers who constantly supported and advised me. Finally I must also thank those who have assisted me in preparing these memoirs, my former Chief of Staff, General Buss, and our Staff Officers V. Blumroder, Isman and Annas, Herr Gerard Gunther, who encouraged me to commit my memoirs to paper, Herr Fred Hildenbrandt, who gave me valuable assistance in composing them, and Herr Dipple.ing. Matern who showed great understanding in his work on the sketch maps. Von Manstein translators note I in order to shorten these memoirs to a size suitable for publication in Britain and the USA, it has been necessary to excise a number of passages from the original version. As most of them were devoted to personal reminiscences, often in lighter vein, their exclusion was thought unlikely to detract from the book's value in a strictly historical sense. A number of detailed appendices, however, have also been omitted, leaving only those which were considered to be of more than specialist interest. It may be mentioned here that Chapter 14, Operation Citadel, is a new translation of material originally contributed by the author to the United States Marine Corps Gazette, instead of being taken from the equivalent chapter in the German edition of the book, which is considerably longer. We should like to take the opportunity to thank the Marine Corps Gazette for allowing us to use this material. The formation symbols employed in the sketch maps of this edition are those now current in the NATO countries. They were adopted for the sake of greater clarity and uniformity. Finally, I should like to add a personal note of thanks to Captain B. H. Liddlehart for his kind assistance in checking the technical details of this translation and for his many helpful comments. Part 1. The Campaign in Poland 1. Before the stormy watched political developments after the Austrian Anschluss from a point far from the center of military affairs. At the beginning of February 1938, after I had risen to the second most senior post on the German army staff that of Oberquarty Mr. I, the deputy to the chief of staff, my career as a general staff officer had abruptly ended. When Colonel General Baron V. Fritsch was eliminated as commander-in-chief of the army through a diabolical party intrigue, a number of his closest collaborators, myself included, had been removed from the army high command, OKH, along with him. Since then, as commander of 18 division, I had naturally ceased to be informed of matters falling within the high command's jurisdiction. Indeed. Since the beginning of April 1938 I had been able to devote myself entirely to my job as a divisional commander. It was a particularly satisfying task even more satisfying in those years than at any other time but it also called for every ounce of one's energy, since the expansion of the army was still far from complete. The continual formation of new units entailed a constant reorganization of those already in existence while the speed of rearmament, and especially the attendant growth of both the officer and non-commissioned officer corps, 
meant that the most exacting demands were made on commanders at all levels if we were to fulfill our aim of creating intrinsically stable and highly trained troops who would guarantee the security of the Reich. To succeed in this work was more gratifying still, especially in my own case, now that, after several years in Berlin, I once again had the pleasure of being in direct touch with combat units. It is with immense gratitude, therefore, that I remember that last year and a half of peace, and, in particular, the Silesians of whom 18 Division was largely composed. Silesia had produced good soldiers from time immemorial, so the military education and training of the new units was a rewarding task. It is true that the brief interlude of the floral war, the occupation of the Sudetenland, had found me in the post of Chief of Staff of the Army commanded by Colonel General Ritter V. Lieb. As such, I had learnt of the conflict that had broken out between the Chief of Staff of the Army, General Beck, and Hitler over the Czech question, and which, to my intense regret, had ended with the resignation of the chief of staff I so revered. This resignation, however, snapped the thread which had kept me in touch with O.K.H. And so it was not until summer 1939 that I learned of Operation Order White, the first offensive deployment against Poland to be prepared on Hitler's orders. No such thing had existed before the spring of 1939. On the contrary, all military preparations on our eastern frontier had been based on defense. In the above operation order, I was earmarked as Chief of Staff of Southern Army Group, the commander in chief of which was to be Colonel General V. Rundstedt, then already living in retirement. It was planned that this army group should deploy in Silesia, eastern Moravia, and partly in Slovakia in accordance with the detailed arrangements which we were now to work out. As the army group headquarters did not exist in peacetime and would be set up only in the event of general mobilization, a small working party was formed to deal with the new operation order. It assembled on 12 August 1939 in the Silesian training area of Nahama. It was to work under the direction of Colonel Blumentritt a general staff officer who was destined to become the army group's chief of operations, yeah, on mobilization. This was an unusual stroke of luck as far as I was concerned, for my relationship with that exceptionally able man was one of the closest confidence. The bond had been forged while we were both serving at the headquarters of V. Lieb's army during the Sudeten crisis and I considered it extremely valuable to have a colleague on whom I could rely in times like these. As often as not, the things that attract us to another person are quite trivial, and what always delighted me about Blumentritt was his fanatical attachment to the telephone. The speed at which he worked was in any case incredibly high, but whenever he had a receiver in his hand he could deal with whole avalanches of queries always with the same imperturbable good humor. In mid-August the future commander of Southern Army Group, Colonel General V. Rundstedt, arrived at Nahama. Every one of us knew him. As an exponent of grand tactics he was brilliant, a talented soldier who grasped the essentials of any problem in an instant. Indeed, he would concern himself with nothing else, being supremely indifferent to minor detail, he was a gentleman of the old school, a type, I fear, which is now dying out, but which once added a delightful variant to life. The general had a charm about him to which even Hitler succumbed. The latter seemed to have taken a genuine liking to him, and, surprisingly enough, there was even a glimmer of this left after he had twice dismissed him. What probably attracted Hitler was the indefinable impression the general gave of a man from a past which he did not understand and to the atmosphere of which he never had access. As a matter of interest, when our working party assembled at Nehammer, my own 18 division was also in the training area for the annual regimental and divisional exercises. That everyone among us, disquieted by the number of emergencies through which the fatherland had passed since 1933, wondered where all this would lead, I need hardly say. Our thoughts and private conversations at this time were centered on the signs of the gathering storm on the horizon round us. We realized that Hitler was fanatically resolved to dispose of the very last of the territorial problems Germany had inherited through the Treaty of Versailles. 
we knew that he had begun negotiations with Poland as far back as autumn 1938 to clear up the whole Polish-German frontier question, though what progress, if any, these negotiations had made we were not told. At the same time we were aware of the British guarantee to Poland. And I can safely say that not one of us in the army was so arrogant, thoughtless or short-sighted as not to recognize the deadly seriousness of the warning that guarantee implied. This factor alone though it was not the only one convinced our party in Nahamad that there would in the end be no war. Even if the deployment plan on which we were now engaged went into operation, that still need not, in our opinion, mean war. We had watched Germany's precarious course along the razor's edge to date with close attention and were increasingly amazed at Hitler's incredible luck in attaining hitherto without recourse to arms all his overt and covert political aims. The man seemed to have an almost infallible instinct. Success had followed success in a never-ending progression if one may initially refer to the glittering train of events that ultimately led to our downfall as successes. All those things had been achieved without war. Why, we asked ourselves, should it be different this time? Look at Czechoslovakia. Though Hitler had drawn up a menacing array of troops against her in 1938, there had still been no war. Yet the old adage about taking the picture to the well once too often still echoed in our ears, for the position was now a much trickier one and the game Hitler seemed intent on playing had a more dangerous look about it. There was the British guarantee to contend with this time. But then we recalled Hitler's assertion that he would never be so mad as to unleash a war on two fronts, as the German leaders of 1914 had done. That at least implied that he was a man of reason, even if he had no human feelings left. Raising that coarse voice of his, he had explicitly assured his military advisers that he was not idiot enough to bungle his way into a world war for the sake of Danzig or the Polish corridor. The general staff and the Polish question Poland was bound to be a source of great bitterness to us after she had used the dictated peace of Versailles to annex German territories to which neither historical justice nor the right of self determination gave her any claim. For us soldiers she had been a constant cause of distress in the years of Germany's weakness. Every time we looked at the map we were reminded of our precarious situation. That irrational demarcation of the frontier. That mutilation of our fatherland. That corridor whose severance of East Prussia from the Reich gave us every reason to fear for that lovely province. For all that, however, the army had never dreamt of fighting an aggressive war against Poland to end this state of affairs by force. Apart from anything else, such forbearance had a perfectly simple military reason, any attack on Poland would have plunged the Reich into a war on two or more fronts, and with this it could never have cooped. In the period of weakness imposed on us at Versailles we had always had the Korkima Day coalitions a nightmare that disturbed us all them or whenever we thought of the aspirations for German territory still harbored with such ill-concealed longing by wide circles of the Polish people. Yet although we had no wish to fight an aggressive war, we could hardly hope, even taking the most unprejudiced view of the Polish mentality to sit down peacefully at the same table as the Poles to revise those senseless frontiers. Neither did it seem beyond the bounds of possibility that Poland might herself take the initiative one day and set out to solve the frontier question by force. We had gained some experience in this respect since 1918, and in Germany's years of weakness it had been just as well to be prepared for such a thing. Once Marshal Pilsudski's voice was silent and certain nationalist circles had gained a decisive influence in Poland, an incursion into East Prussia or Upper Silesia was just as feasible as the Polish raid on Vilna before it. For that contingency, though, our military deliberations had found a political answer. If Poland were proved to be the aggressor and we succeeded in warding off the attack, the Rye might well have an opportunity to get the unhappy frontier question revised on the political rebound. At all events, there was no exaggerated wishful thinking on the subject on the part of any army leaders. Although General V. Rabenow, in the book Seeked, Osmeinem Leben, quotes the Colonel General as saying that Poland's existence is intolerable and incompatible with Germany's essential needs, 
she must disappear through her own internal weakness and through Russia. With help from ourselves, this was in fact an attitude already overtaken by developments in the political and military fields. We had a pretty fair idea of the growing military power of the Soviet Union, and France, the land under whose spell one so easily fell, still faced us with the same hostility as ever. She would always seek allies in Germany's rear. But if the Polish state were to disappear, the mighty Soviet Union could become a far more dangerous ally of France than a buffer state like Poland was at present. Any elimination of the buffer formed by Poland, and Lithuania, between Germany and the Soviet Union could lead only too easily to differences between the two big powers. While it might be a matter of mutual interest to carry out frontier revisions vis a vis Poland, the complete removal of that state would hardly be to Germany's advantage in view of the entirely changed situation that now prevailed. So, whether we liked her or not, it was preferable to keep Poland between us and the Soviet Union. Aggrieved though we were as soldiers by the senseless and explosive frontier demarcation in the East, Poland was still less dangerous as a neighbor than the Soviet Union, like all other Germans, of course, we hoped a revision of the frontier would come about sometime and return the predominantly German populated areas to the Reich in accordance with the natural right of their inhabitants. At the same time it was most undesirable from the military point of view that the size of our Polish population should increase. As for the German demand for a union of East Prussia with the Reich, it could well have been harmonized with Poland's desire for a seaport of her own. This, and none other, was the trend of thought on the Polish problem favored by the majority of German soldiers in the days of the Reichs let us say from the end of the 1920s onwards whenever the question of armed conflict cropped up. Then the wheel of fate turned once again. Adolf Hitler appeared on the stage. Everything changed, including the basis of our relationship with Poland. The Reich included a non-aggression pact and treaty of friendship with our eastern neighbor. We were freed from the nightmare of a possible Polish attack. At the same time relations between Germany and the Soviet Union cooled off, our new ruler having only too clearly voiced his hatred of the Bolshevik system in public speeches. Poland was bound to feel less constrained politically in consequence of this new situation, but that was no longer a danger as far as we were concerned. German rearmament and Hitler's series of successes in the field of foreign policy made it improbable that she would use her new freedom of action against the Reich. And when she proved only too ready to take her hand in the partitioning of Czechoslovakia it seemed not unlikely that we could talk business about the frontier question. Until spring 1939, then. The high command of the German army never had any plan for offensive deployment against Poland on its files. Before that our military measures in the east had been purely defensive in character. War or bluff? Was it to be the real thing this time in autumn 1939? Did Hitler really want war, or would he, as with Czechoslovakia in 1938, bring the very limit of pressure to bear militarily and otherwise to settle the Danzig and Corridor questions. War or bluff? That was the question exercising the mind of everyone without any real insight into political developments, primarily into Hitler's own intentions. And who, for that matter, was vouchsafed any insight whatever into those intentions? At all events, it was entirely conceivable that the military measures taken in August 1939 despite Operation Order White, were directed towards increasing political pressure on Poland. Since the summer, on orders from Hitler, work had been proceeding at feverish speed on an Ostwall, an eastern equivalent of the Siegfried Line. Whole divisions, the 18th among them, were moved to the Polish frontier in constant rotation to work on this fortification for several weeks at a stretch. What was the point of all this effort if Hitler were going to attack Poland? Even if, contrary to all his assurances, he were contemplating a war on two fronts, the Ostwall would still have been quite out of place, since the only proper action for Germany in such circumstances would be to attack and overwhelm Poland first while remaining on the defensive in the West. 
The reverse solution offensive action in the West and defensive measures in the East was quite out of the question with the present ratio of forces, especially as neither plans nor preparations for an offensive in the West had been made. So if the construction of an Ostwall were to have any rhyme or reason in the present situation, it could surely only be to exert pressure on Poland by placing large troop concentrations on her frontier. Even the deployment of infantry divisions on the east bank of the Oder in the last ten days of August and the movement of the armoured and motorised divisions into assembly areas initially west of the river need not really have been preparations for an attack, they could just as well have been a form of political pressure. Be that as it may, the peacetime training programme went on just as usual for the time being. On 13th and 14th August I had my last divisional exercise at Nehama, winding up with a march past at which Colonel General V. Rundstedt took the salute. On 15th August there was a big artillery shoot in cooperation with the Luftwaffe. It was marked by a tragic accident. An entire dive bomber squadron, obviously wrongly informed about cloud altitude, failed to pull out of a dive in time and tore straight into a wood. There was one more regimental scheme the next day, and then the divisional units went back to their normal garrisons though they were to leave for the Silesian frontier again only a few days later. On 19 August v. Rundstedt and I received instructions to attend a conference at the Ober Salzburg on the 21st. On 10 August we drove from Liegnitz to my brother-in-law's estate near Linz and spent the night there, reaching Berchtesgaden the following morning. All the army group and army commanders and their chiefs of staff were reporting to Hitler, as well as the appropriate Navy and Luftwaffe leaders. The conference, or rather Hitler's address, as he was not going to let the occasion turn into an open discussion after his experience at a conference with the chiefs of staff the previous year, before the Czech crisis took place in the big reception chamber of the Berghof that looked out towards Salzburg. Shortly before Hitler appeared, Goring came in. He was an extraordinary sight. Up till now am I had assumed that we were here for a serious purpose, but Goring appeared to have taken it for a masked ball. He was dressed in a soft collared white shirt, worn under a green jerkin adorned with big buttons of yellow leather. In addition he wore grey shorts and long grey silk stockings that displayed his impressive calves to considerable effect. This dainty hosiery was offset by a pair of massive laced boots. To cap it all, his paunch was girded by a sword belt of red leather richly inlaid with gold, at which dangled an ornamental dagger in an ample sheath of the same material. I could not resist whispering to my neighbour, General V. Samoth, I suppose the fat boy is here as a strong arm man? Hitler's speech on this occasion was the subject of various prosecution documents at the Nuremberg trial. One of these asserted that he had indulged in the vilest of language and that Goring, delighted at the prospect of war, had jumped on the table and yelled Sig Heil. All this is quite untrue. It is equally untrue that Hitler said anything about his only fear being a last minute offer of mediation from some pig dog or other. While the tone of his speech was certainly that of a man whose mind was firmly made up, he was far too good a psychologist to think he could impress a gathering of this kind with tirades or bad language. The substance of the speech has been correctly reported in Griner's book Die Oberst Wehmacht Fu Rung 1939 -43. This report is based on a verbal summary given to the author by Colonel Warlemont for inclusion in his war diary and on shorthand notes taken by Admiral Canaries. A certain amount of information on the speech may also be gathered from Colonel General Holder's diary although here too, as in the case of the statements made by Wallemont and Canaries, I feel a number of things may have been included which were actually heard from Hitler on other occasions. The impression left on those of us generals who did not belong to the top circle of military leaders was approximately this Hitler was absolutely determined to bring the German Polish question to a head this time even at the price of war. If, however, the Poles were to give in to German pressure, now approaching its climax in the deployment albeit still camouflaged of the German armies, a peaceful solution still did not seem excluded, and Hitler was convinced that when it came to the point the Western powers would once again not resort to arms. He was at special pains to develop the latter thesis.
his main arguments being, the backwardness of British and French armaments, particularly with regard to air strength and anti-aircraft defence, the virtual inability of the Western powers to render Poland any effective help except by an assault on the Siegfried liner step which neither power was likely to risk in view of the great sacrifice of blood it would entail, the international situation, particularly the tension in the Mediterranean, which considerably reduced Britain's freedom of movement, the internal situation in France, and last but not least the personalities of the responsible statesmen. Neither Chamberlain nor Daladier, Hitler contended, would take upon themselves the decision to go to war. Logical and conclusive though his appreciation of the Western powers position appeared to be in many respects, I still do not think Hitler's audience was entirely convinced by his exposition. The British guarantee was certainly the only real obstacle to his designs, but it was nevertheless a pretty weighty one. What Hitler had to say about an eventual war with Poland could not, in my opinion, be interpreted as a policy of annihilation, which was the sense given to it by the Nuremberg prosecution. When Hitler called for the swift and ruthless destruction of the Polish army, this was, in military parlance, merely the aim that must be the basis of any big offensive operation. At all events, nothing he had said could give us any hint of how he was to treat the Poles later on. The biggest surprise, and also the deepest impression, was caused quite naturally, by the announcement of the impending pact with the Soviet Union. On our way to Berchtesgaden we had already read newspaper reports of the conclusion of an economic agreement, and that in itself was quite a sensation. Now we were told that Foreign Minister V. Ribbentrop, who was present at the conference and took leave of Hitler in our presence, was flying to Moscow to sign a non-aggression pact with Stalin. By this move, Hitler declared, he was depriving the Western powers of their trump card, for even a blockade of Germany would be ineffectual from now on. Hitler hinted that in order to facilitate the pact he had already made considerable concessions to the Soviet Union in the Baltic and in respect of Poland's eastern frontiers, but his remarks gave no reason for inferring that there would be a complete partition of Poland. Indeed, he is now known to have still been considering leaving a Polish rump state in existence even after the campaign had started. As a result of Hitler's address, neither V. Rundstedt nor I, and presumably none of the other generals either, concluded that war was now inevitable. Two factors in particular persuaded us that as at Munich there would be an eleventh hour settlement. The first was that the pact with the Soviet Union now rendered Poland's position hopeless from the start. If Britain, virtually deprived of the weapon of blockade, were compelled to take the bloody course of attacking in the West in order to aid Poland, it seemed likely enough that, under pressure from the French, she would advise Warsaw to give in. Similarly it must henceforth be clear to Poland that the British guarantee was now practically inoperative. If it came to a war with Germany, moreover, she must expect the Russians to take action in her rear with a view to accomplishing their old demands on her eastern territory. What else could Warsaw do in this situation but give way? A further consideration was the conference we had just attended. What was its purpose? Hitherto, on the military side, the intention to attack Poland had been camouflaged in every possible way. The presence of divisions in the eastern areas had been explained by the construction of an eastern rampart, and to conceal the purpose of the troop movements to East Prussia, an enormous Dannenberg celebration had been arranged. Preparations for big motorized troop maneuvers had been going on until the very last moment. There had been no official mobilization. Though these measures could not possibly escape the notice of the Poles and were obviously intended as political pressure, they had still been enveloped in the greatest secrecy and accompanied by every form of deception. Yet now, at the very height of the crisis, Hitler had summoned every one of his senior commanders to the Obas Salzburg an action that could not possibly be concealed. To us this seemed to be the climax of a policy of deliberate bluff. In other words, was Hitler not after all working for a settlement, despite his bellicose utterances? Was not this very conference meant to apply the final squeeze? Such were the thoughts of Colonel General V. Rundstedt and myself as we left Berchtesgaden. While he travelled on ahead to Anais headquarters, 
I stopped on in Liegnitz for a further day with my family. This alone was a measure of my inner disbelief in the likelihood of an imminent outbreak of war. At noon on 24 August, Colonel General V. Rundstedt assumed command of the Army Group. On 25 August, at 3.25 in the afternoon, we received the following cipher message from the High Command of the Army Operation Plan White, D Day equals 26.8. HR equals 0430. So the decision to go to war, the decision we had not wanted to believe possible, had apparently been taken. I was at dinner with Colonel General V. Rundstedt in our quarters at the Monastery of the Holy Cross in Nace when the following order from the High Command came through by telephone Do not repeat, not commence hostilities. Halt all troop movements. Mobilization to continue. Deployment for plans white and west to proceed as scheduled. Every soldier can judge what an eleventh hour counter order of this kind implied. Within the space of a few hours, three armies moving straight for the frontier across a zone extending from Lower Silesia to the eastern part of Slovakia had to be brought to a halt, not forgetting that all headquarters staffs up to at least divisional level were also on the march and that there was still a security ban on wireless traffic. Despite all the difficulties, we managed to notify everybody in good time a first-rate piece of work by the operations and signals staffs. Nevertheless, one motorized regiment in eastern Slovakia could only be stopped after an officer in a Fisela Storch aircraft had landed at the head of the column in the darkness. We were not told Hitler's reasons for what seemed to be an eleventh-hour reversal of his decision to fight. All we heard was that the negotiations were continuing. It will be appreciated that we as soldiers were considerably shaken by leadership of this kind. The decision to go to war is, after all, the gravest that a head of state ever has to take. How could any man reach such a decision and then cancel it again in the space of a few hours, least of all when that cancellation placed him, in the military sense, at a severe disadvantage? As I pointed out above when describing the Ober Salzburg conference, everything in the military sphere was aimed at taking the enemy by surprise. There was no public announcement of the mobilization, the first call up being scheduled for 26 August the day of the invasion that had this very moment been stopped. This meant that we were to march into Poland with nothing more than our sum total of armored and motorized formations plus a limited number of infantry divisions that were already in the frontier areas or in the process of being made immediately operational. There could be no question now of catching the enemy unawares. For even though the movement of troops into their final concentration areas behind the frontier was being carried out by night, it could certainly not elude the enemy's attention particularly as the motorized units in assembly areas west of the Oda had to form up in daylight in order to cross the river. Consequently, if there really were to be war, the other alternative must now come into effect invasion with all our mobilized forces. The element of surprise was lost in any case. As the original decision to start hostilities could not be regarded as an act of ill considered frivolity on Hitler's part, we could only deduce that the whole thing was simply a continuation of diplomatic tactics to bring ever increasing pressure to bear on the Poles. So when, at 1700 hours on 31st August, we received a fresh order at equals 1.9, H equals 0445 comma Colonel General V. Rundstedt and I were skeptical, particularly as no mention was made of the negotiations having failed. Within our own army group, at any rate, we were all set this time, in view of what had occurred on 25th August, to cope with another last minute stoppage of the operation. The general and I stayed up till midnight in anticipation of the countermand we thought might still come through. Only when midnight had passed and the last possibility of halting the operation had gone could there be no further doubt left. From now on the weapons would speak. Two, the strategic position following factors were decisive in determining the strategic position in the Polish campaign first. The superiority of the German forces provided that the German leadership were prepared to accept a considerable risk in the West in order to commit the bulk of its strength against Poland. Secondly, the geographical situation, which enabled the Germans to take the Polish army in a pincer movement from East Prussia on one flank and Silesia and Slovakia on the other. Thirdly, 
the latent threat present in Poland's rear from the outset in the form of the Soviet Union. German order of battle and plan of operations. German planners accepted the above mentioned risk in the West to the full. O.K.H. Launched its attack against Poland with 42 divisions of regular troops, including one newly formed armored division, 10 Panzer and one new infantry division formed from fortress troops in the Oderwater Basin, the 50th. They consisted of 24 infantry divisions, 3 mountain divisions, 6 armoured divisions, 4 light divisions, 4 motorised infantry divisions and 1 cavalry brigade. Then came 16 new divisions not formed until after the general mobilisation and destined for use between the second and fourth waves. These could not initially be regarded as first-rate troops. Also assigned for the Polish campaign were the SS Divisional Standarty Adolf Hitler and one or two reinforced SS regiments. For the West this left only 11 regular divisions, some fortress troops amounting to about a division in strength, later to be formed into 72 infantry division, and 35 newly constituted divisions of second to fourth line troops. No armored or motorized troops were available. There was thus a total of 46 divisions, of which only three quarters were conditionally fit to go into action. 22 Infantry Division, which had been trained and equipped as an airborne division, was retained at the disposal of OKH in the interior of the Reich. The bulk of our air forces were likewise committed against Poland in the form of two air fleets, a third weaker one being kept in the west. The risks which the German leadership ran by distributing its forces in this way were undoubtedly very great indeed. Because of the unexpected brevity of the Polish campaign, a development due in part to the loser's own mistakes, and, above all, as a result of the complete inaction of Poland's western allies at the time of her defeat. These risks have hardly ever been properly appreciated. It should be realized that at that particular juncture the German command had to reckon with a French army some 90 divisions strong. In autumn 1939, according to V. Tipplskirch, France actually raised 108 divisions in the space of three weeks. These consisted of 57 infantry, 5 cavalry, 1 armored, and 45 reservist or territorial divisions supported by strong army troops of tanks and artillery. One the last category had the advantage of being made up of fully trained reservists, whereas the new German formations consisted to a great extent of raw recruits or reservists from the First World War. There can be no doubt, then, that the French army far outnumbered Germany's forces in the West from the very first day. The British contribution of land forces, on the other hand, was quite insignificant. It amounted to a mere four divisions, and even these did not arrive until the first half of October. The basis of the German plan of operations against Poland was to make maximum use of the way the frontier ran in order to envelop the enemy from the start. Thus the German armies deployed in two widely divided flank groups which left the central sector, the Oder Water Basin, almost wide open. Northern Army Group Commander Colonel General V. Bock, Chief of Staff General V. Sarmouth, comprised two armies embracing a total of five infantry and one armoured corps. Under command of these were nine regular infantry divisions, including the newly formed 50 Infantry Division, which consisted of fortress troops and was not up to strength, eight infantry divisions established on mobilisation, two armoured divisions, plus the newly formed Tank Task Force Kemp, two motorized infantry divisions and one cavalry brigade in all 21 divisions. Supplementing these in East Prussia were the fortress troops of Königsberg and Lotz, in Pomerania. The Nets Brigade dot of this army group, 3rd Army, General V. Kutschler, deployed in East Prussia and 4th Army, Colonel General V. Kludge. In East Pomerania. The task of the army group was to thrust through the Polish corridor, to throw the mass of its forces on the east of the Vistula towards the southeast or south, and then, after forcing the Nera line, to take any Polish defense of the Vistula from the rear. Southern Army Group, Commander Colonel General V. Rundstedt, Chief of Staff General V. Manstein, was considerably stronger. 
It consisted of three armies, 14th, Colonel General List, 10th, Colonel General V. Reichenau, and 8th, Colonel General Blaskowitz. In all, the army group had eight infantry and four armored corps, totaling 15 regular infantry divisions, three mountain divisions, eight newly drafted divisions and the bulk of the mechanized formations four armored, four light and two motorized infantry divisions. This made a total of 36 divisions. The army group deployed 14th Army in the Upper Silesian Industrial Region, Eastern Moravia and Western Slovakia, 10th Army in Upper Silesia around and to the south of Krasburg, and 8th Army in Central Silesia eastward of Els. Its task was to defeat the enemy in the large bend of the Vistula and in Galicia, to dash for Warsaw with strong motorized forces taking the Vistula crossings as fast as possible on a broad front, and then, in conjunction with Northern Army Group, to destroy the remainder of the Polish Army. Polish order of battle and plan of operations peacetime Poland had 30 infantry divisions, 11 cavalry brigades, 1 mountain brigade and 2 motorized, armored, brigades. In addition to these there were a few frontier corps regiments, a large number of home defense, ON battalions and naval troops stationed in the Gdynia area. In other words, her aggregate strength was pretty considerable. Her weapons, however, dated mainly from World War I, and her air force of some 1,000 aircraft, was also not up to modern standards. Germany had expected Poland to double the number of her divisions in the event of war, though it seemed doubtful whether the requisite arms were available. According to V. Tipel Kirch in his history of the Second World War, Poland drafted only enough regiments for ten reserve divisions prior to the outbreak of hostilities, and even then she apparently had no time to embody all of them in their scheduled divisions. Nevertheless, German intelligence did identify a number of reserve divisions in the course of the campaign. The Polish High Command disposed its forces as follows deployed along the East Prussian frontier, in front of the Bobner of Vistula line were, I, a combat group of two divisions and two cavalry brigades between Siwaki and Tomza, and two, the Modlin army of four divisions and two cavalry brigades on both sides of Mlawa. In the corridor was the Pomors army of five divisions and one cavalry brigade. Facing the German frontier from the water to the Slovakian frontier were three armies, I, the Poznan army, with a strength of four divisions and two cavalry brigades, in the western part of Poznan province, two, the Lodz army, four divisions and two cavalry brigades, around Wilon, and three, the Krakow army, six divisions, one cavalry and one motorized brigade, between Czstoku and Nowy Targ. Behind the two last named armies was the Prussia army, six divisions and one cavalry brigade, in the area Thomas Zokils. Finally, the deep flank along the Carpathian frontier was to be covered by a Carpathian army, composed mainly of reserve units and ON battalions in Echeland formation. A reserve group, General Piska's army, consisting of three divisions and one motorized brigade, remained on the Vistula in the area Modlin Warsaw Lublin. In the course of the campaign, moreover, an independent Bolzi group was formed east of the Bug presumably for protection against Russia. In the event, the Polish deployment was still in progress when the German invasion started, and for this reason it was probably never properly completed in the form described above. Some reflections on the Polish deployment It is difficult to decide the strategic aim of the Polish deployment, unless it was based on a wish to cover everything and surrender nothing voluntarily. It was a policy that usually leads to the defeat of the weaker party. Hitler was to have a similar experience only a few years later, without ever learning his lesson from it. Now, the difficulty of Poland's strategic position was really quite obvious, consisting as it did in the inferiority of the Polish forces and the fact that the line of the frontier enabled Germany to attack from two, later even from three sides at once. So when the Polish High Command still could not resist trying to hold on to everything, this only went to show how difficult it is to reconcile psychological and political inhibitions with hard military fact. Apart from Marshal Pilsudski and one or two sober-minded politicians, 
probably no one in Poland ever quite realized in what a dangerous situation the country had landed itself by enforcing its unjustified territorial demands on the neighboring states of Russia and Germany. Yet this same Poland numbered only 35 million inhabitants, of whom a mere 22 million were of Polish nationality, the rest belonging to the German, Ukrainian, white Russian and Jewish minorities, all of which had been oppressed to one degree or another. Besides, in their reliance on their French allies, people in Poland had undoubtedly spent far too long in the years of Germany's, and the Soviet Union's, military weakness dreaming of a chance for aggression against the Reich. Some had dreamt of raids on isolated East Prussia or thanks to the propaganda of the Polish Insurgents League on German Upper Silesia, others had even considered a march on Berlin, either by the shortest route through Poznari and Frankfurt or by first conquering Upper Silesia and then advancing on the capital west of the Oder. Admittedly such dreams had been frustrated by Germany's fortification of East Prussia and the Oder water basin and later by her armament. But it is unlikely that Poland's politicians and soldiers, banking on a simultaneous French offensive in the West, ever put such aggressive ideas right out of their minds. Defensive though the above dispositions may well have been in the first instance, it is reasonable to infer that they were meant to leave the door open for offensive action at a later date as soon as the first French assistance had made itself felt. For the rest, the Polish general staff did not possess its own tradition of generalship shaped by long experience. On the one hand the Polish temperament was more disposed towards attack than defence. It is fair to assume that the mind of the Polish soldier was still coloured, at least subconsciously, by romantic notions from bygone days. I am reminded here of a portrait I once saw of Marshal Wright Smigley painted against a background of charging Polish cavalry squadrons. On the other hand the newly founded Polish army was French taught. This, in view of the fact that French military thought since 1918 had been based on experience of static warfare, could hardly have imbued the Poles with a sense of operational speed and mobility. It is conceivable, then that except for a desire not to abandon anything to the enemy, the Polish deployment plan had no clear-cut operational objective whatever and amounted merely to a compromise between the aggressive ambitions of yesteryear and the necessity of preparing for defence against a superior opponent. At the same time the Poles made the mistake of assuming that the Germans would carry out an offensive on the French pattern and that this would soon degenerate into positional warfare. Of some interest in this connection is a confidential report which we received just before the outbreak of war on the subject of Poland's allegedly offensive intentions. It emanated from a source hitherto regarded as completely reliable in the immediate circle of either the Polish president or Marshal Rides Smigli, and contended that the Polish deployment would be offensive in character and include the concentration of strong forces in the province of Poznan. Most remarkable of all was the allegation that this plan of campaign had actually been proposed, if not demanded, by the British. In the circumstances we found the whole thing rather improbable. Yet it was to emerge later that the Poles actually did assemble relatively strong forces in Poznan province, notwithstanding the fact that from their own point of view this was the least likely direction from which to expect a German attack. The Poznan army was to meet its fate in the battle on the river Bzorodot in point of fact there had been no lack of sensible suggestions on the Polish side. As Colonel Hermann Schneider reported in the Militarwissenschaftliche Rundschke in 1942, General Wagand had suggested putting the defence behind the line of the rivers Niemann, Bor, Brneru, Vistulu and San. Operationally this was the only proper recommendation to make since it eliminated the possibility of encirclement by the Germans and would also, by virtue of the river obstacles, have considerably strengthened the defence vis-à-vis the German tank formations. What was more, this line was only about 375 miles long, in contrast to the 1,125 mile arc described by the Polish frontier from Siwaki to the Carpathian passes. Acceptance of this suggestion would of course, 
have necessitated abandoning the whole of Western Poland, which embraced the country's most precious industrial and agricultural areas, and it is hardly likely that any Polish government would have survived such a step. What also had to be borne in mind was the fact that a withdrawal as extensive as this at the very start of hostilities was hardly likely to increase French aggressiveness in the West, and it was an open question whether surrendering the whole of Western Poland to the Germans would not encourage the Russians, for their part, to take immediate steps to secure their share of the spoils in the East. Consequently, Colonel Schneider tells us, another solution was put forward by General Kutzba. Director of the Polish Military Academy, in a memorandum he submitted to Marshal Reid Smigli at the beginning of 1938. He insisted that there could be no question of giving up Poland's vital strategic zone, which embraced both the industrial regions of Lodz and Upper Silesia and the valuable agricultural areas of Poznan, Kutno, and Kiels. Accordingly, he proposed a deployment plan which, while dropping any attempt to hold the corridor or Poznan province, substantially resembled the one ultimately implemented in 1939. To buttress the Polish defences, a far-reaching system of fortifications was to be built south of the East Prussian frontier, in a wide arc from Grudziards to Poznan, and along the Silesian frontier from Ostrowo, through Czstokowa to Sieszyn. At the same time, General Kutzba pointed out, Attention should be paid to preparing sally ports for later attacks against both East and West Prussia and Silesia. That to build such far-flung fortifications inadequate strength would have exceeded Polish potentialities was only too clear. Nevertheless, General Kutzba had recognized Poland's military inferiority vis-à-vis -vis the Reich. His appraisal of French support was equally clear-sighted, since he took it for granted that, even if France rendered the maximum military assistance, Poland would be thrown on her own resources for the first six or eight weeks. He therefore envisaged a strategic defense along the western periphery of the above-mentioned vital zone, in the interior of which reserves were to assemble for the decisive operations later on. As I have said, the deployment carried out by the Polish army in 1939 was very similar to that recommended by the general. The latter however, had envisaged making the main effort in the area Torunbigos-Czgniezno, whereas in 1939 there tended to be two focal points, one in the area around East Prussia and the other opposite Silesia. The Polish deployment of 1939, aimed as it was at covering everything, including the forward province of Poznan, was bound to bring defeat, in view of the Germans' superiority and their ability to outflank. How, then? should Poland have operated to avoid such a defeat? The first question to settle was whether the vital strategic zone referred to by General Kutzba was to be lost by itself or, as a result of a German envelopment from East Prussia, Silesia and Slovakia, together with the Polish army. It was the same sort of question as I kept asking Hitler in the years 1943 for every time he called on me to hold the Dunitz Basin, the Dnieper and other areas of Russia. To my mind, the answer to Poland's problem was perfectly clear. As far as her high command was concerned, everything must hinge on the Polish army's ability to hold out at all costs until an offensive by the Western powers compelled the Germans to withdraw the mass of their forces from the Polish theater. Even though the loss of the industrial areas would appear on the face of it to render Poland incapable of fighting a war of any length, the army's continued existence as a combat force would still have held out the prospect of winning them back. Whatever happened, the Polish army must not allow itself to be encircled to the west or on both sides of the Vistula. The whole crux of Poland's problem was to play for time. Obviously no decisive defense could be contemplated anywhere forward of the Borbnera Vistula line, although it might be possible on the southern flank to move this front up as far as the Dunajek with a view to holding on to the central Polish industrial area between the Vistula and the Sand. The most important thing of all would have been to eliminate any possibility of encirclement by the Germans from East Prussia and Western Slovakia. A means of doing so in the north was offered by the line of the Borbneru and the Vistula down as far as the fortress of Modlin or Wysograd. This, at any rate, formed a strong natural obstacle, 
and additional support was afforded by the former Russian fortifications, obsolete though they were. A further point was that if any German armor at all appeared from East Prussia, it was unlikely to be in great strength. The problem in the south was to obviate an outflanking maneuver deep in Poland's rear by defending the Carpathian passes. Both tasks could undoubtedly have been fulfilled with limited forces. To deploy the Polish forces forward of the Borbnero line was just as big a blunder as pushing strong forces out into the corridor and the bulge of Poznan province. Once the necessary guarantees had been created against such deep outflanking in the north and south, it would have been possible to fight a delaying action in the west of Poland, always bearing in mind that the main German thrust was to be expected from Silesia. One reason for this was that the rail and road network in that part of the world allowed a quicker concentration of powerful forces than could be effected in Pomerania or, for that matter, in East Prussia, the other was that a drive on Warsaw via Poznan, being purely frontal, would have been operationally the least effective, and was therefore improbable. The Polish assembly of forces should not have taken place in the vicinity of the frontier, as happened in 1939 but far enough back for the defenders to identify the main direction of the German thrusts. This would have meant managing with a bare minimum of forces in the corridor and the Poznan area in order to oppose the main thrust from Silesia in the greatest possible strength and, above all, to keep an adequate strategic reserve in hand. Had Poland concentrated on improving the former German fortifications on the Vistula between Torun and Grudziards, instead of so long indulging in dreams of aggression she could at least have delayed the link-up of the German forces advancing from Pomerania and East Prussia, similarly, by properly fortifying Poznan, she could have curtailed the Germans' freedom of movement in that province. One further point is that the idea of utilizing the inner defense line to deal counterblows in the north or south of western Poland, according to the way the situation developed, would hardly have worked out in practice. There was insufficient space available for operations of this sort, and the Polish railway network would not have stood the strain. Besides, the possibility had to be borne in mind that big troop movements would very soon have been hampered by the Germans' air forces and tank formations. Consequently there was nothing for it but to plan the really decisive defense as far back as the Borbnero Vistulasan, or Dunajek, line, and merely to fight for time anywhere forward of this always remembering that one had to place the main effort opposite Silesia from the very start and simultaneously ensure due protection on the northern and southern flanks. No one can argue that any of these measures would have saved Poland from ultimate defeat was proved to be the case she were abandoned to her fate by the West. Nevertheless, they would have saved the Poles being so easily overrun in their frontier areas as a result of which the Polish High Command was unable either to fight a set battle in the Vistula Bend or to withdraw its forces behind the great line of rivers and take up a prepared defense. From the very first day Poland could only fight for time. All she could do was to hold out against German attacks ultimately behind the river line until an allied offensive in the west compelled the Germans to pull back. It should therefore have been incumbent on the Polish military leaders to tell their government quite bluntly that they could not go to war against the Reich without a binding guarantee from the Western powers that the moment hostilities broke out they would launch an offensive in the West with all the resources at their disposal. No government could have disregarded such a warning in view of the decisive influence wielded at the time by the Polish commander-in-chief, Marshal Rydz Smigli. The government ought to have come to terms on the Danzig and Corridor question while there was still time, if only to postpone a war with Germany. In 1940, our troops in France captured a letter, dated 10th of September 1939, from General Gamelin to the Polish military attaché in Paris. It was obviously a reply to an inquiry from the Poles as to when they could expect any effective military assistance. The comments made by Gamelin for onward transmission to Marshal Wright Smigley were as follows more than half our regular divisions in the northeast are in action. Since we crossed the frontier the Germans have been resisting energetically, despite which we have made some headway. However, we are tied down in a static war with an enemy well prepared for defense, 
and I have not yet all the necessary artillery. Dot, 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 dot. There has been aerial warfare from the outset in conjunction with the operations on the ground, and we are conscious of having a considerable part of the Luftwaffe opposite us. Dot. I have thus fulfilled in advance my promise to start the offensive with my main forces a fortnight after the first day of the French mobilization. It was impossible for me to do more. It follows from this that Poland did in fact have a guarantee from the French in her possession. The only question is whether the Polish High Command should have been satisfied with one which did not commit the French to start the offensive till a whole fortnight had elapsed. In any case, events have since shown that the above promise was meant to imply anything but swift and effective aid to Poland. Poland's defeat was the inevitable outcome of the Warsaw government's illusions about the action its allies would take, as well as of its overestimation of the Polish army's ability to offer lengthy resistance. 3. The operations of Southern Army Group when our troops crossed the Polish frontier at daybreak on 1 September 1939. We of the Army Group staff were naturally at our posts in the Monastery of the Holy Cross at Nace. This was a training establishment for Catholic missionaries situated outside the town and offered an ideal wartime setting for a senior headquarters staff by virtue of its size and seclusion and the unembellished state of its classrooms and cells. To a certain extent the Spartan existence of its normal inmates, from whom we had taken over part of the building, reflected itself in our own standard of living, for though our camp commandant came from the famous Lone Brow in Munich, he showed little inclination to pamper us. As a matter of course we drew ordinary rations like any other troops, and the midday stews we got from the field kitchen certainly gave us no cause for complaint. On the other hand, I really cannot believe that the evening menu need have been limited day after day to army bread and hard preserved sausage which our older gentleman had considerable difficulty in masticating. Fortunately the monks helped out with occasional lettuces or vegetables from their kitchen garden. On a number of evenings the army group commander and his senior staff were joined by the abbot, who retailed fascinating accounts of the self-sacrificing work of the missionaries in distant parts of the globe. This was a welcome distraction, however brief from the burning problems which the immediate future presented. September 1st put an end to these talks, however. Henceforth the battle claimed every moment of our time. The fact that we were in our offices so early that morning was due less to any practical necessity than to the feeling that we had to be in readiness from the very moment our troops made contact with the enemy. For it was certain that many hours would pass before we heard any vital news from the armies under our command. These were the hours familiar to anyone who has worked on a higher formation staff, the phase in which events have already begun to take their course and one can only await developments. The soldier at the front knows the tremendous tension that mounts before an attack, as the platoon commander's watch ticks steadily on to the moment of release when the assault can go in. From then on, however, the frontline fighter is completely taken up with the battle around him and quite oblivious of anything else. The difference with the formation staff and the higher one goes the more this applies is that the moment of attack marks the beginning of a period of waiting that is charged with suspense and anxiety. Subordinate formations quite rightly dislike getting inquiries about the progress of a battle, which they are liable to interpret as a sign of nervousness. Consequently it is better just to sit and wait. A point worth noting in this respect is that the saying about bad news traveling fast seldom applies in the military sphere. Whenever things are going well, news usually finds its way back quickly enough. If, on the other hand, the attack gets stuck, a blanket of silence descends on the front, either because communications have been cut or because those concerned prefer to hang on till they have something more encouraging to report. And so the tension breaks only when the first reports come in, whether these be good or bad. Pending their arrival we, too, could only sit and wait. Would the troops on whom we had expended so much labor and effort, but whose training had been carried out far too quickly, come up to expectation? In particular, would the big armored formations, the organization and use of which constituted something completely new, justify the hopes of their creator, General Guderian, and ourselves? Would the German headquarters staffs, in particular our own army group, 
be able to master the opening situation and go on to win a complete victory that would destroy the enemy while he was still west of the Vistula and remove any danger of a war on two fronts? Such were the questions running through our minds in those hours of tension and uncertainty. The opening situation it was envisaged in OKH's plan for a large scale outflanking operation against the Polish army from East Prussia and Silesia, that Northern Army Group, having once established a link between East Prussia and Pomerania by expelling the Polish forces from the corridor, would be able to get straight behind the Vistula in order to attack the main enemy forces in the large bend of the river from the rear. The task that must devolve on Southern Army Group, on the other hand, was to try to engage the enemy as far forward as the Vistula and to frustrate any attempt he might make to withdraw behind the line of the Vistula and San. This meant that 10th Army's tank formations, with its infantry divisions following as closely as possible behind, must make a concerted effort to overrun the enemy troop assemblies that would probably be taking place near the frontier, and that the tanks should if possible reach the Vistula crossings from Dimblin to Warsaw ahead of the enemy. It also presupposed that 14th Army, which was to advance through Galicia, would reach and cross the San with the greatest possible speed. In the event of the enemy's intending to place his decisive resistance as far back as the San and Vistula, this army could immediately unhinge the river defences from the south and join up deep in the enemy's rear with the eastern wing of Northern Army Group as it approached from the north. 14th Army was bound to be assisted here by the fact that its right wing, by extending so far eastward into Slovakia, constituted an immediate threat to the deep flank of the enemy forces concentrating in the Krakow area, and thereby made it impossible to effect any protracted defense of Galicia. Such was the course of action on which Southern Army Group based its operations in Poland. It strove throughout to engage and destroy the main body of the enemy forward of the Vistula, but at the same time remained ready to anticipate any attempt he might make to avoid accepting the decisive battle until he was behind the San Vistula line. Instead of giving a day to day account of the operations, useful though a detailed survey of this lightning campaign would undoubtedly be, I would rather confine myself to a broad outline of its essential phases. These, partly in chronological sequence and partly simultaneous, were as follows the heavy frontier battles fought by 14th Army in Galicia and the latter's subsequent pursuit of the beaten enemy to land over the sand. 10th Army's breakthrough to the Vistula and the Battle of the Radom Pocket. The Battle of the Bzura, which was conducted direct from HQ Southern Army Group and led to the destruction of the strongest enemy grouping by 8th and 10th Armies. The attack on Warsaw and the final battles which resulted from the frequent changes in the agreements entered into by Germany's political leaders with the Soviets, who were by now marching into eastern Poland. The latter crossed the Polish frontier on 17th of September 1939. 14th Army's assault march through Galicia. The first object of 14th Army was to encircle the strong enemy forces believed to be in the area of Krakow. This encirclement was already inherent in the army's extensive deployment from Silesia through the region of Moravska Ostrava, Marish Ostrow, to the Carpathians. While 8 Corps, General Bush, 8 and 28 infantry and 5 panzer divisions, was to break through the strong Polish frontier fortifications in eastern Upper Silesia and then advance on Krakow along the north of the Vistula, 17 Corps, General Kenitz, 7 and 44 infantry divisions, moved on Krakow to the south of the Vistula from Moravia. The task of directly outflanking the enemy forces thought to be around Krakow fell to two further Army Corps colon 22 Panzer Corps, General V. Klest, two Panzer and four light divisions, which was to drive on Krakow from the south out of the Orava Valley in the western Carpathians, an 18, Mountain, Corps. General Bear, two and three mountain divisions, which was to break out of the Porprad Valley east of the High Tatra with the aim of advancing through Naui Sachs, near Sands, on Bochnia, west of Tano, and taking the enemy at Krakow in the rear. Still further east, the Slovakian forces later released by OKH had to attack through the Dukla Pass, so well known from World War I days, one mountain division, a seasoned Bavarian formation 
and two reserve divisions were allocated to this enveloping wing later on. Though 14th Army's initial battles, in particular those fought by its Silesian Cal for the Polish frontier fortifications, proved hard going. The issue in these frontier regions was virtually decided already from the operational point of view by the outflanking movement from the Carpathians. Admittedly the proposed encirclement of the enemy grouping around Krakow did not come off in the literal sense, as the enemy recognized the danger threatening him and duly evacuated western Galicia. But the bulk of his forces were still smashed in these first battles and the chase that followed, in the course of which 22 Panzer Corps succeeded in overhauling its quarry. They took the army's right wing, the Mountain Corps and 17 Corps as far as Lau and the fortress of Przemysl, both of which were captured. The left wing, consisting of the Panzer Corps, 8 Corps and 7 Corps allocated to the army by the army group, was able to cross the Seine above its junction with the Vistula, and though our opponents fought back bravely in the subsequent battles, which were in part extremely heavy, further enemy forces some of them coming from Warsaw or Northern Army Group's front were wiped out. In due course we joined hands with the left wing of Northern Army Group. By 15th September, Lau and Przemysl having fallen, the pursuit was virtually over, even if the destruction of the remaining Polish units in this area and east of the San was to call for further fighting. The breakthrough of 10th Army and the Battle of the Radom Pocket, while the object of 14th Army's operations apart from annihilating the forces deployed in western Galicia was to pursue and catch a retreating enemy and thereby prevent him at all costs from making a fresh stand behind the Vistula, the task of the two armies attacking from Silesia was to make him accept a decisive battle forward of the river. The crucial role of thrusting through to the Vistula devolved on the stronger 10th Army, with its powerful complement of armor, while the weaker 8th Army was to cover the northern flank of the operation against the enemy forces believed to be in the Kalis Zlods area and Poznan province. 10th Army attacked from Upper Silesia the left wing from around Krasberg with 4's corps up. Reading from right to left, these were 15 motorized corps, General Hoth, 2 and 3 light divisions, 4 corps, General V. Schwidler, 4 and 46 infantry divisions. 16 Panzer Corps, General Hopner, 1 and 4 Panzer Divisions, 14 and 31 Infantry Divisions, and 11 Corps, General Lieb, 18 and 19 Divisions. 14 Motorized Corps, General V. Wyattersheim, 13 and 29 Motorized and 1 Light Divisions, followed up. Following behind the Army as an Army Group Reserve were 7 Corps, General V. Scobert. 27 and 68 infantry divisions, and 62 infantry division. 8th Army, composed of 13 corps, General V. Weichs, 10 and 17 infantry divisions and the motorized Lubstandarty, and 10 corps, General Alex, 24 and 30 divisions, had to advance in deeply echelon formation in the direction of Lodz. This army, too, was followed by two divisions. 213 and 221, of the army group reserve. Immediately after the German armies had crossed the frontier at dawn on 1st of September 1939, violent fighting started, in the course of which the enemy was thrown back. For the next few days our big problem was whether he would still seek to join the decisive battle forward of the Vistula or whether his object in the present fighting was to gain time in which to get his forces back behind the river. Initially, at all events, there were signs of strong enemy groupings forming in the mountainous country of Lizagora around Kiels, at Radom and around Del Odz. What decided the battles of these first few weeks, however, were probably two factors which had appeared for the very first time in this campaign. One was the tearing open of the enemy's front by tank formations which penetrated deep into his rear areas and with which, incidentally, our infantry divisions were hard pressed to keep up. The other was the almost complete elimination of the enemy's air force and the crippling of his staff communications and transport network by the effective attacks of our Luftwaffe. 
For these reasons no centralized control of operations was ever really achieved by the Poles. By reason of the situation on the enemy side, Army Group HQ found it necessary to set 10th Army two objectives. One group on the right, 14 motorized corps and 4 corps, followed through by 7 corps, which was not moved over to 14th Army until later on, had to attack and defeat the enemy grouping still assembling around Radom. Another group on the left, consisting of 16 Panzer Corps, 14 Motorized Corps and 11 Corps, was to cut off the enemy's line of retreat from the Lord's area to Warsaw while 8th Army attacked from the west. In pursuit of these orders, 10th Army succeeded in engaging the Radom grouping in the wooded mountains of Lizagora while the mobile 15 Motorized Corps moved in between it and the Vistula crossings of Opatau and Imblin and the 14 Motorized Corps, operating from the Army's left-hand group in the north, also barred the way to Warsaw. By 9th September the first pocket of the war had closed round an enemy army. Though the fighting in the Kiels Radom region went on till 12th September as a result of the enemy's efforts to burst out of the ring in closing him, his fate was already sealed. By the end of the battle 60,000 prisoners and 130 guns were in our hands and the enemy had forfeited seven divisions. Even if he had succeeded in getting back across the Vistula, this would not have helped him, for on the day the Battle of Radom ended 14th Army already had its one mountain division at the gates of Lau, and the army's left wing, through having crossed the Lower San, was in a position to unhinge any enemy defense of the Vistula. Meanwhile, 16 Panzer Corps, which belonged to the left hand group of 10th Army, had fought its way to the Vistula crossing of Gorakal where Aya, south of Warsaw, and one armored division had penetrated into the southwest suburbs. These forces were actually too weak to capture a city fortified as Warsaw was, and the armored division had to be pulled out again. The fact remained, however, that the enemy's western approach to the capital was now blocked. While fighting was still going on in the Radom area, even if signs of victory there were already apparent, our attention was drawn to the northern wing of the army group as a result of an enemy initiative. During the first nine days of the campaign, everything had run so smoothly and so completely according to plan that one was tempted to believe that little could happen now to interrupt or cause any real change in the scheduled course of operations. Nonetheless I still had a vague feeling that something was brewing on the northern flank of the army group. We knew, after all, that the enemy had assembled strong forces in Poznan province which had not yet come to light. For this reason, on 8th and 9th September I had repeatedly pointed out to the chief of staff of 8th army that he must pay special heed to reconnaissance on his northern flank. Discussions between ourselves and OKH regarding the location of these Poznan forces had produced a teleprinter message from OKH on 9th September to the effect that the enemy was moving them off to the east with all the transport he could muster, and that a threat to 8th Army's deep flank need no longer be feared. Nevertheless we reckoned that there must be some 10 enemy divisions south of the Vistula between Lodz and Warsaw. It will be recalled that the army group had intended to use 10th army to block the route back to Warsaw of an enemy grouping of 5 or 6 divisions thought to be around Lodz, while 8th army had also been directed to attack this force from the west. 8th Army's original task the provision of deeply echelon protection to the entire army group operation on its northern flank naturally still held good. It would appear, nevertheless, that HQ. 8th Army paid rather more attention to the aforementioned task than to developments in the north, for early on 10th September it reported a surprise attack from that quarter against its 30 division, launched by considerably stronger enemy forces. The situation threatened to become critical, as attempts by the army to restore it by counter-attacks failed one after the other. However, the army still reckoned on halting the enemy who was undoubtedly present in strength and presumably composed in the main of forces drawn back from Poznan province and for this purpose wheeled both its core round to form a defensive front facing north. All the same it asked to be quickly reinforced by one Panzer Corps in order to prevent any southward enemy breakthrough to Lodz, which had been occupied without resistance on 9th September. Army Group HQ, however, 
was by no means disposed to see the situation of 8th Army restored by a reinforcement of its front. Even if a local crisis, and possibly a serious one at that, were to arise here, it would have not the least bearing on the operations as a whole. On the contrary, it actually offered us the chance of winning a big victory, since strong enemy forces had now been committed to a battle west of the Vistula, and this, if the right actions were taken on our own side, would end in their destruction. Instead of acceding to 8th Army's request for the additional support of a Panzer Corps, therefore, Army Group HQ started making preparations for the enemy's encirclement. The two divisions following 8th Army as an Army Group Reserve were anyway still approaching from the west, and these could be presented against the western flank of the enemy now attacking 8th Army from the north. For the same purpose a light division was ordered over from the battle now drawing to a closer round radium. What the army group desired above all was to compel the enemy to fight a battle with reversed front. To this end it directed 10th army to turn round 16 panzer corps, now at the southern perimeter of Warsaw, and 11 corps, which was following the latter, in order to intervene in 8th army's battle from the east. The latter's own task was to hold off the enemy as long as he kept up his assault, but once this perceptibly slackened off, to go over to the attack. As a result of impressions gathered by Colonel General V. Rundstedt and myself on visits to HQ 8th Army at this time, during one of which Hitler was also present, Army Group decided to assume direct control of the operation. The attack by the two corps of 10th Army intervening from the south and southeast was to be directed by Colonel General V. Reichenau himself, while HQ 8th Army was left in charge of the fighting of its two cal facing north and the envelopment of the enemy from the west. Finally, at the request of our army group, 3 Corps, which had crossed the Vistula from the north in the enemy's rear as part of Northern Army Group, was brought in to close the ring. When it became apparent in the course of the battle that large elements of the enemy were striving to escape along the Vistula to the fortress of Modlin, Army Group even pulled up 15 motorized corps from the Radom region to block this last escape route. After heavy fighting in which the enemy had tried to break out first to the south, then to the southeast and ultimately to the east, his resistance finally collapsed on 18th September. By 20th September 10th Army had reported the capture of 80,000 prisoners and booty amounting to 320 guns, 130 aircraft and 40 tanks. 8th Army reported 90,000 prisoners and as yet uncalculated amounts of captured equipment. 9 enemy infantry divisions, 3 cavalry brigades and elements of 10 further divisions had been involved in this defeat in point of fact many more formations than we had supposed. The Battle of the Bzera was the biggest self-contained action of the Polish campaign and constituted its climax, even if not its decisive engagement. The latter, operationally speaking, lay in the far-flung envelopment of the entire Polish forces by Northern Army Group in the North and 14th Army in the South. Whether this one large-scale counter-move arose from a hope on the part of the Polish command that it could still change its fortune in the Vistula Bend, or whether it was merely directed towards clearing the way to Warsaw for the enemy forces south of the Vistula, it could have no further influence on the fate of the Polish army. Even if the Battle of the Bzera did not measure up in actual results to the big battles of encirclement fought in Russia later on, it was still the largest of its kind to date. It was not one which could be planned from the outset through penetration of the enemy front by powerful tank formations, but arose from counter moves made on the German side when the enemy's own actions unexpectedly gave us our big opportunity. The capture of Warsaw after the Battle of the Bzera and a series of actions in the wooded country south of Modlin against enemy elements trying to escape from the fortress towards Warsaw, our army group was given the task of taking the capital. Even now certain of its formations were being moved off to the west, where the French and British, much to our surprise, had looked idly on as their Polish ally was being annihilated. We had already reported to OKH that the preparations for the assault on Warsaw could not be complete before 25th September, our main motive being a wish to avail ourselves of the whole of the army artillery, 
including that of 14th Army. However, after the Soviet intervention on 17 September and the establishment of the Vistula as a demarcation line, Hitler was in a great hurry to take the city, and ordered that it must be in our hands by the last day of the month. While it is not abnormal, I suppose, for politicians to expect the generals to win a victory, it was undoubtedly a new departure for them to go as far as fixing the actual date. Apart from this, Army Group was disposed to conduct the attack in a manner which would keep casualties down to a bare minimum. The only reason why the city had to be attacked at all was that the enemy had taken steps to defend it with an entire army and that the Polish commander in chief had announced that it would be held to the last. The army group was well aware that in the circumstances nothing could be expected of a surprise attack on the city. On no account, however, did it wish to become involved in a battle inside Warsaw, whatever reasons might be given for doing so. This would inevitably have caused extraordinarily high losses both to the attacking troops and the civil population. Eighth Army, which had been charged with the capture of the city, was accordingly ordered to confine its attack to investing the fortress area with a tight, unbroken ring of troops roughly coinciding with the line of the circular railway. The city would then be compelled to surrender by a combination of artillery bombardments and air raids or, if these did not produce results, by a food and water shortage. I might mention here that Army Group HQ had successfully opposed an earlier wish of Hitler's to have the city bombed by the Luftwaffe, our argument then being that no air raid at that particular juncture would have had a direct bearing on, or in any way benefited, military operations. In the present instance, however, these same reasons served to justify bombardment. On 25 September, fire was opened on the outer forts and strong points, as well as on important supply centers. At the same time, the localized attacks to reach the predetermined siege line began. On 26 September, we dropped leaflets warning that the city was about to be shelled and calling on its occupants to surrender. As the Polish troops continued to offer a stubborn resistance, the actual bombardment was begun on the evening of the same day. At noon on 27 September, Colonel General V. Rundstedt and I learned during a visit to my old 18 Division, which had just taken two forts, that the enemy had offered to capitulate. The shelling was immediately stopped. The capitulation was signed next day by the Polish Army Commander and Colonel General Blaskowitz, commander of the German 8th Army. It provided for immediate succor to the civil population and enemy wounded and in every way upheld the military honor of an enemy defeated after a gallant struggle. It was agreed that the officers should retain their swords and that the non-commissioned officers and men should go into captivity for only as long as it took to dispose of the necessary formalities. According to the Polish plenipotentiary, 120,000 officers and men capitulated in Warsaw. When signing the instrument of capitulation, the Polish general said, A wheel always turns. He was to prove right in the end, though hardly as far as the subsequent fate of his fatherland was concerned in the sense his words had been meant to convey. The final battles east of the San and Vistula Old Dorf, the bulk of the enemy forces committed forward of the Vistula had been eliminated in the Battle of the Bzura and the Fall of Warsaw, numerous other engagements, some of them quite heavy were still being fought in 14th Army's area in eastern Galicia and on the far side of the Lower San against individual groups of the enemy who had so far escaped destruction. In the meantime 10th Army had also got a corps across the Vistula at Diemblin to advance on Lublin. In the midst of this fighting we suddenly received orders from the Supreme Command to hand over Lao which had just capitulated to the troops of 14th Army. To the Soviets and to retire along the whole army group front behind the demarcation line arranged by Ribbentrop in Moscow. This ran from the Uzok Pass to Prism Iceland then along the San and Vistula to the north of Warsaw. Thus the battles fought on the far side of those two rivers had been wasted effort as far as the units of Southern Army Group were concerned, and had only benefited the Soviets. To get back across the sand we had to disengage from an enemy grouping whose strength we still estimated at two or three divisions and one or two cavalry brigades. 
these forces now showed tremendous courage though at the same time a complete misunderstanding of the overall situation in going over to the attack themselves in an attempt to prevent our 7 and 8 corps from reaching the river. Here again heavy fighting ensued purely in consequence of the political haggling still going on between the German and Soviet governments. The extent of this was best shown by the fact that on 1st October a further alteration was made to the demarcation line. This time our orders were to reoccupy Lublin province. Fourteen motorized corps therefore crossed the Vistula again and received the capitulation of the last enemy grouping still in action as it withdrew towards the river before the advancing Soviets. The Polish campaign was over. In the course of it Southern Army Group had taken 523,236 prisoners and captured 1,401 field pieces, 7,600 machine guns, 274 aircraft, 96 fighting vehicles and an incalculable quantity of other equipment. The enemy's losses in blood were undoubtedly very high indeed for he had fought with great gallantry and had shown a grim determination to hold out in even the most hopeless situations. Our own army group's losses were as follows, officers, 505 dead, 759 wounded, 42 missing. NCOS and other ranks, 6049 dead, 19719 wounded. 4022 missing. On 5th October, Hitler held a victory parade in Warsaw of all the divisions stationed in and around the city, taking the salute at a march past on the big avenue leading from the Belvedere to the castle. Unfortunately, the occasion ended on a discordant note which only too clearly revealed his attitude towards the leaders of the army. It had been arranged that before flying back to Germany, Hitler should meet the commanders and commanding officers of the troops that had taken part in the parade, and for this purpose, a table had been laid in a hangar where they were to be served with plates of soup from a field kitchen. When he came into the hangar and caught sight of the white cloths and autumn flowers on the table, however, Hitler turned on his heel and joined the troops at a field kitchen outside. Having swallowed a few spoonfuls of soup and chatted to the men round him, he made straight for his waiting aircraft. It was a patent attempt to demonstrate his attachment to the popular masses. Yet I very much doubt whether he really won the approval of those gallant grenadiers of ours by such behavior. They would, I am sure, have fully appreciated the gesture if, after the victories they had won, the head of state had honored the troops as a whole by a visit to their commanders. His treatment of the latter was a snub which, happening when it did, inevitably set one thinking. Before long the Polish campaign was being described as the Blitzkrieg the Lightning War. Indeed, as far as its speed of execution and the outcome were concerned, it did constitute something almost unique until the German offensive in the West produced a similar development on an even bigger scale. In order to assess it fairly, however, one must bear in mind what was said in a previous chapter about Poland's prospects in this war. In point of fact, the Germans were bound to win this campaign by virtue of their superiority and their infinitely more favorable starting conditions provided that two stipulations were fulfilled. One was that the German command accepted a very high degree of risk in the West in order to have the necessary superiority in the East. The other was that the Western powers did not in any way exploit this risk to render timely aid to the Poles. There cannot be any doubt that things might have turned out very differently had the Western powers taken the offensive in the West at the earliest possible moment. This would, of course, have presupposed the existence of a Polish command with a rather greater sense of reality a command which, instead of scattering all its resources from the outset in an effort to cling on to what could not be held, would have concentrated its forces at the crucial points and fought systematically for the time needed to confront the Germans with the dilemma of a real war on two fronts. The bravery with which the Polish troops fought right up to the end would have been an adequate guarantee of their ability to hold on until the Allies reached the Rhine and forced the German command seriously to consider calling off the campaign in Poland. And so in this case too as Count Schlieffen had once put it the weaker party made their own contribution to the victory of their adversaries. 
On the other hand, it must also be recognized that the speed and completeness of our success in Poland were ultimately due apart from our operational advantage at the start and the numerical superiority we had achieved by accepting a big risk in the West to the better leadership and higher quality of the German fighting troops. A vital factor in the speed of our success was the unorthodox use of big, self-sufficient tank formations supported by a far superior air force. But what had been really decisive, next to the steadfast courage and devotion of the German soldier, was the spirit pervading the German staffs and fighting troops. While the material achievement of rearmament had certainly been largely due to Hitler's own efforts, material superiority alone would by no means have guaranteed so swift and conclusive a victory. The most important thing of all was that our little rights, once rather looked down upon by many people, had revived Germany's great tradition of training and leadership after carrying it through the aftermath of the 1918 defeat. The new German Wehrmacht, as the child of that Reichs, had found and was probably alone in doing so, how to prevent warfare from degenerating into a static war or, as General Fuller expressed it in connection with the final stage of World War I into A.N. Mungary. In the German Wehrmacht it had been found possible with the help of the new means of warfare, to reacquire the true art of leadership in mobile operations. Individual leadership was fostered on a scale unrivaled in any other army, right down to the most junior NCO or infantryman, and in this lay the secret of our success. The new Wehrmacht had passed its first test with flying colors. So far, even the army staff had been able to act without interference from outside. So far, the military commanders had retained full authority of command. So far, the troops had had a purely military battle to fight, and for that reason it had still been possible to fight chivalrously. On 15th October Colonel Husinger of the OKH Operations Branch came to see us with the welcome news that our headquarters was also to be moved to the Western Front at the end of the month. Our place was to be taken by HQ. 8th Army under Colonel General Blaskowitz. Shortly afterwards I myself was instructed to present myself at OKH in Zossen on 21st October for the purpose of receiving our operation orders for the West. I left Lodz on the 18th to pay a brief visit to my family and brother-in-law, who was lying severely wounded in a Breslau hospital. Then there was a new task to be faced. Part 2 the campaign in the West introductory note Eno is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer. Richard III happy to have escaped the thankless task of having to act as the occupying power in Poland, our headquarters arrived on the Western Front on 24th of October 1939 to take command of the newly formed army group had the armies under command, 12th and 16th, had their forward divisions in position along the frontiers of southern Belgium and Luxembourg and their rear units strung out as far back as the right bank of the Rhine. It had been decided that Army Group HQ would be located in Koblenz. We duly moved into the Hotel Riesenfürst and Hof beside the Rhine a place which in my early days at the cadet school in the nearby market town of Ingers I had regarded as the very peak of elegance and culinary refinement. But now wartime restrictions had left their mark even on this famous establishment. Our offices were situated in a once charming old building near the Duchesek which until the outbreak of war had accommodated the Cobbins division. The lovely Rococo rooms of yesteryear were now bare and gloomy. Not far from this building, in a small square lined with ancient trees, stood an obelisk of considerable interest. It bore a bombastic inscription having been erected by the French Commandant of Cobbins in 1812 to mark the crossing of the Rhine by Napoleon's Grand Army on its march to Russia. Below the original inscription another had been engraved. Its approximate purport was, noted and approved, and it bore the signature of the Russian general who had become Commandant of Cobbins in 1814. What a pity Hitler never saw this. At my suggestion our command staff had received the valuable addition of a second, older general staff officer for the operations branch. He was the then Lieutenant Colonel V. Treskow, who put an end to his life in July 1944 as one of the main forces behind the conspiracy against Hitler. 
Treskow had already worked under me in peacetime in the first department of the general staff of the army. Too he was a most talented officer and an ardent patriot. With his quick brain, his many accomplishments and his cosmopolitan and gentlemanly ways, he had a special charm of his own, and his elegant, aristocratic appearance was fully complemented by his beautiful and equally intelligent wife, a daughter of the former war minister and chief of the general staff, V. Falkenhayn. In those days there could hardly have been a more charming couple in Berlin army circles than the Treskows. Treskow and I were linked by an intimate bond of sympathy that was closely akin to friendship and dated from the time we had worked together in the operations branch. Here in Cobblins, too, he was to render me valuable assistance in our struggle for the adoption of our own army group's plan for the offensive in the West. When I later became commanding general of a panzer corps and then an army commander, I asked in each case to have Treskow as my chief of staff. However, my request was turned down on the rather original grounds that I did not need so clever a man. When he was finally offered to me in the spring of 1943 to be chief of my army group staff, I could not give him precedence over my chief of operations, General Buss who was of the same age and had proved his mettle in the many battles we had fought together. My only reason for mentioning this is that a gentleman close to Treskow has given currency to a story that I refused to have the latter because he was not a reliable national socialist. Anyone who knows me will be aware that I did not select my staff on that basis. If those months in Cobblins were to become the winter of our discontent. This arose from the strange suspense of the 1939-40 Shadow War or Drôle de Guerre, as the French called it. It would have been easier to bear had we been able to pin our attentions from the outset on systematically preparing the troops under our command for an offensive in the coming spring. Unfortunately Hitler was known to want an offensive late that same autumn and when this proved impossible, at least during the winter. Every time his weather boffins, the Luftwaffe meteorologists, predicted a period of fine weather, he issued the code word which was the signal for the troops to start moving into their final assembly areas. On each occasion the meteorologists had to climb down again, either because heavy downpours of rain had made a hopeless mess of the ground or because a sharp frost and falls of snow had raised doubts as to the advisability of using tanks and aircraft. The result was a process of vacillation between warning orders and countermands a most frustrating state of affairs for troops and commanders alike. During this period Hitler's mistrust of military reports which did not suit his own wishes revealed itself most strikingly. After Army Group HQ had once again stated that continuous rainfall made it temporarily impossible to form up for the offensive, he sent his military assistant, Schmunt, to us with orders to examine the state of the ground himself. Treskow was the ideal man to deal with this. He spent an entire day dragging his erstwhile regimental comrade along well-nigh impassable roads, across sodden plowland and marshy meadows and up and down slippery hillsides so that by the time they got back to our headquarters in the evening, Schmunt was in a state of complete exhaustion. From that day on Hitler dispensed with such wholly improper methods of verifying our weather reports. The person who had most to suffer as a result of this absurd chopping and changing and the consequent wastage of effort was, of course, our army group commander, Colonel General V. Rundstedt, with whom patience had never been a strong point. Very soon our headquarters was swamped with the flood of paper which regularly descends on fighting units and formation headquarters during the quieter phases of war. Thanks to a very proper unwritten law in the German army that the general commanding a formation be kept free of all minor detail, however, V. Rundstedt was hardly affected and was able to take a long walk every morning on the promenade. Since I, too, had to take some sort of exercise. I often used to meet him. Even in that freezing winter, when the Rhine was already covered with ice, Rundstedt still wore only a thin raincoat. When I protested that he would catch his death of cold, he merely retorted that he had never possessed a greatcoat in his life and was certainly not going to buy one at his age. And neither did he, 
for even after all these years the old gentleman still bore the imprint of his Spartan training in the cadet corps. Another habit of V. Rundstedt's served to remind me of my own days as a cadet. On returning to his desk to await the verbal reports which he daily received from myself and other members of the staff, he would fill in the time by reading a detective thriller. Like many other prominent people, he found a welcome distraction in such literature, but since he was rather shy about this taste of his, he regularly read the novel in an open drawer which could be quickly closed whenever anyone came in to see him. It was the very same thing we had done as cadets whenever an instructor came into our quarters during a private study period. However, our discontent that winter was due in only small measure to Hitler's vacillations and their prejudicial effect on the troops, who were in time liable to doubt the good sense of orders which were repeatedly being cancelled to say nothing of the fact that the interformation training schedules, which had a particular relevance in the case of the newly formed divisions, were seriously upset. The real cause of our discontent or, to put it more exactly, our uneasiness was twofold. In the first place it arose from a development which I can only describe as the eclipse of OKH. I personally found this development particularly distressing, having fought right up to the winter of 1937-8, as obiquati Mr. I of the general staff and assistant to Fritsch and Beck, to ensure that in the event of war OKH would be given its proper position within the framework of overall war policy. Secondly, Army Group HQ sought in vain throughout the winter to get OKH to accept an operations plan which in our own opinion, at all events seemed to offer the only guarantee of a decisive victory in the West. This was not adopted as the basis of the offensive until Hitler had finally intervened and only then after OKH, undoubtedly as the result of our badgering had removed me from my post as chief of staff of the army group. These two facts the demotion of OKH and the struggle over the operations plan largely form the background to the western campaign to which this part of the book is devoted. Its later course is already known in such detail that there is no need for me to go through it all again. All I intend to tell of it is what I saw as a corps commander. Nonetheless, the winter of our discontent was still followed by a glorious summer exclamation mark for, the eclipse of O.K.H. The elimination of OKH, or the general staff of the army, as the authority responsible for war policy on land is generally assumed to have been effective from the time when Hitler dismissed Field Marshal V. Braukic and took over the leadership of the army in addition to that of the Wehrmacht as a whole. In actual fact, however, the general staff was eliminated for all practical purposes even if this was not yet formally the case in the weeks immediately following the Polish campaign. After my visit to Zossen on 21 October 1939 to receive Operation Order Yellow on behalf of Army Group A, as Southern Army Group was henceforth to be designated, I noted in my diary, musical accompaniment by Halder, Stulpnigel and Griffenberg extremely depressing. At that time General V. Stulpnigel, as obiquati Mr. I, was the right-hand man of Holder, the chief of the army staff, while Colonel Griffenberg headed the OKH operations branch. It was perfectly evident from the remarks of these three gentlemen that OKH had issued a war plan forced on it by Hitler. They, as well as the commander-in-chief himself, obviously took a thoroughly negative view of the idea of an offensive in the West and did not consider it the proper way to bring the war to a close. From what they had to say it could also be gathered that they did not think the German army would be in a position to enforce a decisive denouement in the West. This impression was corroborated both by the operations order, which will be analyzed in due course, and by the various visits to be paid to Army Group HQ by the Commander-in-Chief and his Chief of Staff. Now it was quite clear that opinions might differ particularly during the period of the late autumn and winter of 1939 as to the expediency and prospects of a German offensive in the West. What horrified me was my realization of the extent to which OKH's status had declined within the scope of the Supreme Command and this just after it had conducted one of the most brilliant campaigns in German history. Once before, admittedly, Hitler had disregarded the views of OKH that had been during the Sudeten crisis. 
but on that occasion something entirely different had been at stake not a matter of military leadership but one of political decision. Hitler's dispute with OKH primarily with Becker's chief of the general staff had arisen not over the handling of an army operation but over the question of whether action against Czechoslovakia would lead to intervention by the Western powers, and thereby to a war on two fronts which the German army could not have the capacity to fight. The appraisal of this problem, however, had ultimately been a matter for the political leadership in whose power it had lain to obviate by political measures any trend towards a war on two fronts. So although the command-in-chief had taken on a grave military responsibility by bowing to the primacy of politics on that occasion, he had still in no way renounced the prerogative of military leadership in his own exclusive sphere. At the time of the Polish crisis no such divergence of views between Hitler and OKH had reached our ears. Indeed. I am inclined to think that after Hitler's political assessment of the Western powers had proved correct in the case of Czechoslovakia, OKH hoped that the same would apply in autumn 1939. In any case I believe that throughout those final crucial days of August OKH assumed right up to the last just as we did at Southern Army Group that the whole business would again end in a political settlement similar to that reached at Munich. At all events. If one disregards the wishes he expressed regarding the deployment in East Prussia to which OKH agreed Hitler cannot be said to have interfered in the conduct of operations in Poland. Now, however, the position was quite different. It is true, of course, that the question of how the war should be continued after the defeat of Poland was a matter of overall war policy which ultimately had to be decided by Hitler as the head of state and commander in chief of the Wehrmacht. However, if the solution were to be a land offensive in the West, this must depend entirely on how, when and whether the army would be able to tackle the task. In these three respects the primacy of the army leadership was inalienable. Yet in all three Hitler confronted the high command of the army with a fait accompli when on 27 September without prior consultation of the commander-in-chief of the army he informed the commanders-in-chief of all three services of his decision to take the offensive in the West that same autumn and, in so doing, to violate the neutrality of Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg. The decision presently found expression in an OKW directive of 9th of October 1939. I was bound to infer from the remarks made by the three above named officers when I took over Operation Order Yellow that OKH had resigned itself to this capitus de minutio. It had issued a directive for an offensive of which it steadfastly disapproved and in whose success in the decisive sense, at least it had no confidence. In view of the relative strengths on the Western Front, one had to admit that such doubts were not unjustified. I could only deduce, therefore, that OKH had in this case renounced any claim to be the authority responsible for land warfare and had resigned itself to acting as a purely technical, executive organ. The very thing had now come to pass which Colonel General Beck and I had once sought to prevent by our recommendations for a rational distribution of responsibility at the summit in time of war. What we had called for was one single authority which would alone be responsible for advising the head of state on questions of military policy and have joint control of army operations and the overall conduct of the war. For at least as long as it took to decide the issue on the continent, either the commander-in-chief of the army was to have command of the Wehrmacht as a whole or a Reich chief of staff responsible for running the Wehrmacht should simultaneously make the decisions on army policy. What had to be avoided at all costs was that two different general staffs those of the Wehrmacht and the army should have a say in the running of the latter. This was precisely what now appeared to have happened. Hitler and his OKW not only decided what operations the army should conduct, but also when and how they should be conducted. OKH was left to work out the appropriate orders whether or not it agreed with what it was being called on to implement. The commander-in-chief of the army had been demoted from the status of military advisor to the head of state to that of a subordinate commander pledged to unquestioning obedience. Before very long this was to be made only too plain by the creation of an OKW theater of operations in Norway. The explanation of how OKH came to be brushed aside like this is to be found both on the personal plane and in the manner in which the question of continuing the war after Poland's defeat was handled. Hitler v. 
Braukic Halder The main reason for the trend discussed above lay in the personality of Hitler, in his insatiable thirst for power and his excessive self-esteem, which was engendered by his undeniable successes and encouraged by the lickspittling of his party bosses and certain members of his retinue. Vis-a-vis -vis his military opponents he was greatly aided by the fact of being not only the head of state but also, as commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, their military superior. Moreover, he had a genius for suddenly confronting his military collaborators with political and economic arguments which they could not immediately refute and of whose value, in any case, the statesman must perforce be considered the better judge. In the last analysis, however, it was Hitler's lust for power which caused him to usurp the role of the supreme war leader in addition to being the head of state and political chief. A conversation I had with him in 1943 proved most revealing in this respect. It was one of the many times I tried to induce Hitler to accept a rationalized form of command in other words, to resign the direction of military operations in favor of a fully responsible chief of the general staff. On the occasion in question Hitler hotly denied having any desire to play the warlord though he was undoubtedly attracted by the glory that went with it. On the contrary, he contended, the really decisive thing was that he should have the power and exclusive authority to impose his will. Power was all he believed in, and he regarded his will as the embodiment of that power. Apart from this it is not unreasonable to suppose that after the Polish campaign Hitler feared the achievements of the generals might impair his own prestige in the eyes of the people and that that was why he treated OKH so dictatorially from the outset regarding the conduct of the campaign in the West. Such was the man utterly unscrupulous, highly intelligent and possessed of an indomitable will with whom generals V. Braukic and Halder had to contend. Not only was he acknowledged by the people as their head of state, he also ranked as the most senior member of the general's own hierarchy. Indeed. It would have been an unequal battle even if Hitler's military opponents had been different men. The future Field Marshal V. Braukic was a very able officer. While not belonging to quite the same class as Baron V. Fritsch, Beck, V. Rundstedt, V. Bock and Ritter V. Lieb, he certainly ranked immediately after them and, as events have shown, also possessed all the requisite qualities of a commander-in-chief of the army. As far as V. Braukic's character is concerned, his standards of personal behavior were quite unassailable. Neither would I dispute his willpower, even though it tended in my own experience to be manifested in a somewhat negative inflexibility rather than in creative resolve. He preferred to have decisions suggested to him rather than to take and impose them on his own initiative. Indeed, he frequently evaded decision in the hope of being spared a struggle to which he did not feel equal. In many cases Braukic put up a sturdy fight for the interests of the army one example being his efforts to have Colonel General V. Fritsch publicly rehabilitated by Hitler, although he was well aware how unpopular this would make him with the latter. The order of the day he published on the death of Fritsch was a sign of his courage. At bottom, however, he was no fighter. He was never really the sort of man to get his way by sheer force of personality. Colonel General Beck, for one, complained most bitterly to me about the half-hearted way in which Braukic had represented OKH's point of view at the time of the Czech crisis and left him, Beck, completely in the lurch. When, on the other hand, people like Herr V. Hassel, the former ambassador in Rome, blame V. Braukic for wavering over the question of whether to resort to violence against Hitler, they forget the essential difference between plotting from behind a desk when one is no longer in a position of responsibility, as was the case with Herr V. Hassel, and committing oneself, as leader of the army, to a coup d'etat which can imply civil war in peacetime and lead to the victory of one's external enemies in time of war. Field Marshal V. Braukic a man of elegant appearance who bore all the hallmarks of the aristocrat, was never anything but dignified in his bearing. He was correct, courteous and even charming, although this charm did not always leave one with an impression of inner warmth. Just as he lacked the aggressiveness that commands an opponent's respect, or at least compels him to go warily, 
so did he fail to impress one as a forceful, productive personality. The general effect was one of coolness and reserve. He often appeared slightly inhibited, he was certainly rather sensitive. Qualities like these might well ensure the support of his immediate collaborators, who respected the gentleman in him, but they were not enough to assure him of the full confidence of the troops which a man like Baron V. Fritsch had enjoyed, nor could they impress a man of Hitler's type. Admittedly General V. Sieg had been far colder, even to the extent of being unapproachable. But in this case everyone had sensed the inner fire that inspired him and the iron will which made him a leader of men. Neither quality had fallen to the share of V. Braukic, nor had he been blessed with that soldierly boldness which apart from his great qualities as a commander had won V. Fritsch the hearts of his troops. As far as V. Braukic's relations with Hitler are concerned, I am convinced that he wore himself out mentally in his struggle with a man of such ruthless will. Disposition, origin and upbringing precluded him, in his encounters with Hitler, from resorting to the weapons which the latter, relying on his position as the head of state, had not the least hesitation in using. Braukic choked down his vexation and anger, particularly as he was no match for Hitler dialectically. And so it went on until a heart complaint finally compelled him to retire at a time most convenient to Hitler. It is only fair to add that from the very start Braukic found himself in a much more unfavorable position vis-a-vis -vis Hitler than his predecessor had done. To begin with, ever since Blomberg had relinquished his post as commander-in-chief of the Wehrmacht, Hitler had not only been head of state but also the supreme military authority. The final blow dealt to the army by War Minister V. Blomberg had been to suggest to Hitler that he should assume command of the Wehrmacht though, of course, it is open to debate whether Hitler would not have arrived at this solution anyway, with or without Blomberg's advice. Most of all, by the time V. Braukic took office Hitler had acquired a very different attitude towards the army, and in particular towards OKH from the one he had had in former years. There is no doubt that when he originally came to power he had shown the military leaders a certain deference and respected their professional abilities. It was an attitude he retained until the last in the case of a man like Field Marshal V. Rundstedt, despite having twice relieved him of his command during the war. There were two points in particular which led Hitler to change his view of the army in the last years of peace. The first was the realization that under Colonel General Baron V. Fritsch, as indeed under V. Braukic, the army stuck firmly to its traditional notions of simplicity and chivalry and its soldierly conception of honor. While Hitler could certainly not reproach the army with disloyalty towards the state, it was quite obviously not going to throw its military principles overboard in favor of the National Socialist ideology. It was equally clear, moreover, that this was the very thing about the army that made it all the more popular with wide circles of the people. Although Hitler had originally refused to listen to the calumnies against senior military figures served up to him from various party sources, the rabble-rousing campaign against the army, which was mainly the work of people like Goring, Himmler and Goebbels, ultimately bore fruit. Even War Minister V. Blomberg helped to arouse Hitler's mistrust, however unintentionally, by going out of his way to stress his task of marrying up the army with National Socialism. The result of this agitation became evident when Goring, ostensibly as the senior officer of the Wehrmacht, addressed a group of high-ranking military leaders in spring 1939. In the course of his speech he quite brazenly upbraided the army, as distinct from the other two services, for maintaining an outlook that was steeped in tradition and did not fit in with the National Socialist system. It was a speech which Colonel General V. Braukic, who was among those present, should on no account have tolerated. The second source of tension in Hitler's relationship with OKH consisted in what he later used to describe to quote the least insulting of his epithets as the everlasting hesitation of the generals. The implication here was twofold. One thing he meant was OKH's very proper attempts to check the inordinate pace of rearmament, the steady acceleration of which was detrimental to the quality of the troops. Secondly, 
Hitler maintained that all his successes in the field of foreign policy had been achieved against the opposition of the generals, who had in each case been too cautious to act. The answer to this is that Colonel General V. Fritsch that is OKH did not raise any objections to Hitler's plans regarding either the introduction of conscription or the occupation of the Rhineland. Neither did General Beck object, v. Braukic being absent from Berlin at the time, when Hitler decided to invade Austria. It was the war minister, v. Blomberg, who first opposed general conscription, doing so for reasons of foreign policy which he presently discarded. It was also Blomberg who at the time of the march into the Rhineland advised Hitler unbeknown to OKH to recall the German garrisons from the left bank of the river when the French ordered a partial mobilization. The fact that Hitler very nearly followed this advice, only being dissuaded from doing so by Foreign Minister V. Neuritz remark that this was not the time to lose one's nerve, may well have served as a constant reminder of his own fit of weakness to intensify Hitler's collective resentment against the generals in future. And when OKH repeatedly pointed out in the years of rearmament that the army was still far from being ready for war, they did no more than their duty in issuing these warnings. Officially Hitler always agreed with them. Yet they may well have increased his dislike of O.K.H. The first time Hitler's foreign policy encountered formal opposition was at the conference with the foreign minister and three service chiefs on 5 November 1937, at which Hitler revealed his intentions towards Czechoslovakia. The fact that he clashed with the foreign minister, V. Neurath, as well as the war minister, V. Blomberg, and the commander in chief of the army, Baron V. Fritsch, was certainly one of his reasons for getting rid of these admonishers at the earliest opportunity. It is widely believed today that the acceptance of Colonel General Baron V. Fritsch's dismissal by Germany's generals showed Hitler that he could treat OKH just as he liked from then on. Whether this was the conclusion he drew at the time I should not care to say. If he did, he was certainly mistaken about the general's motives. Far from being a sign of weakness, their attitude was due to ignorance of the true facts of the case, their inability as decent soldiers to believe the state leadership capable of such a base intrigue, and the practical impossibility in such circumstances of carrying out a coup d'apostrophe atat. Finally, there can be no doubt that the party personalities I mentioned above were forever harping on the theme of the everlasting objections of the generals in conversations with Hitler. It is quite certain, therefore, that V. Braukic found himself in an extremely difficult position from the start as far as Hitler was concerned. On assuming office, moreover, he was ill advised enough to make a number of concessions affecting personnel including the quite unjustified dismissal of a number of generals with excellent records and the appointment of General Key Eitel's brother as head of the Heerspersonlamt. 3. This was Braukic's first fatal step. The devastating blow to OKH's standing vis-à-vis -vis Hitler came at the time of the Sudeten crisis, when, thanks to the tractability of the Western powers, Hitler proved himself right in face of all the army's misgivings and objections. Von Braukic's action in sacrificing his chief of staff on this occasion naturally weakened his position even further in Hitler's eyes. The second OKH personality who had to deal direct with Hitler after Beck's dismissal, Colonel General Halder, was Field Marshal V. Braukic's equal as regards military qualifications. At all events, the two men worked together on terms of close confidence, and I am inclined to believe that when V. Braukic agreed with Halder's recommendations he did so from conviction. Like most of the officers who had begun their careers on the Bavarian general staff, Halder had a remarkable grasp of every aspect of staff duties and was a tireless worker into the bargain. A saying of Moltke's, genius is diligence, might well have been his motto. Yet this man hardly glowed with the sacred fire that is said to inspire really great soldiers. While it speaks for his high sense of responsibility that he prepared for the Russian campaign by having an operations plan drawn up by the Oberquartiermis for I, General Paulus, on the basis of studies made by the chiefs of staff of the army groups, 
the fact remains that the basic concept of a campaign plan should be born in the mind of the man who has to direct that campaign. In his outward bearing, Holder had not the elegance of V. Braukich. He was incorruptibly objective in his utterances, and I myself have known him put a criticism to Hitler with the utmost frankness. On the same occasion one also saw how fervently he stood up for the interests of the fighting troops and how much he felt for them when wrong decisions were imposed on him. Unfortunately, objectivity and moderation alone were not the qualities which could impress Hitler and any feeling of sympathy for the troops left him completely cold. What ultimately led to Halder's downfall, in my own opinion, was his divided allegiance. Even when he took over from Beck he was already a declared enemy of Hitler. According to Walter Gorlitz, in his book The German General Staff, Halder told V. Braukic on taking office that his only reason for accepting the post was to fight against Hitler. He is credited with numerous plans for Hitler's overthrow, though it is hard to say what real prospects of success these would have had in practice. On the other hand, Holder was Germany's and later Hitler's chief of staff, after the latter had taken over command of the army. Now, although it may be given to a politician to play the dual role of a responsible advisor and conspirator, soldiers are not usually fitted for this kind of thing. Above all, it is traditionally unthinkable in Germany that a chief of the general staff should not be on terms of confidence with his commander-in-chief. Even if, in the light of Hitler's actions, it is accepted as admissible for a chief of staff to plan the overthrow of the head of state and commander-in-chief in peacetime, the dual role of chief of staff and plotter in wartime inevitably created an insoluble dilemma. As chief of the general staff, it was Halder's duty to strive for the victory of the army he was jointly responsible for leading, in other words, to see that the military operations of his commander-in-chief were successful. In the second of his roles, however, he could not desire such a victory. There cannot be the least doubt that Halder, when confronted by this difficult choice, opted for his military duty and did everything in his power to serve the German army in its arduous struggle. At the same time his other role demanded that he should at all costs hold on to the position which, he hoped, would one day enable him to bring about Hitler's removal. To that end, however, he had to bow to the latter's military decisions, even if he did not agree with them. Certainly his chief reason for remaining was that he thought this his best hope of protecting the army from the consequences of Hitler's military blunders. But in doing so he had to pay the price of executing orders to which his military convictions prevented him from agreeing. The conflict was bound to wear him down inwardly and finally lead to his downfall. One thing is certain, it was in the interest of what was at stake, and not of his own person that Colonel General Halder stuck it out for so long as Chief of Staff. I have endeavored to give a pen portrait of the two personalities under whom, in autumn 1939, there culminated a process which can only be described as the eclipse of OKH. From what I have said it will be clear why neither of these officers, first rate though they undoubtedly were, could be a match for a man like Hitler. At the same time, the fact that OKH's relegation to a purely executive organ was actually accomplished just after it had scored such brilliant victories in Poland was also due to the way in which Hitler and OKH respectively approached the problem of how the war should henceforth be prosecuted. Up till and immediately after the outbreak of war, Germany had quite naturally prepared only for defense in the West. Who could have guessed that the Western powers would let Poland down so ignominiously after giving her a guarantee? Their feeble push into the forward zone of the Siegfried line along the Saar which was immediately followed by a withdrawal onto French territory could not be regarded as even the preparatory step for any large offensive later on. As long as such an offensive had been definitely expected, it had only been possible to wait and see whether we should succeed in halting it at the Siegfried line or in the event of its being launched towards the Ruhr through Luxembourg and Belgium in delivering a counter blow once the necessary forces had been released from Poland. Now, however, an entirely new situation had been created by the inaction of the Western powers. Even when allowance were made for French methods in the time the British took to act, 
the Western powers could not be expected to take the offensive in the immediate future, now that Poland was beaten and the whole of the German army available for the West. Poland's fate was sealed at the latest by 18 September, when the Battle of the Bzura was over and the Soviets had crossed her eastern frontier the previous day. This, then, should have been the deadline for an exchange of views between Hitler and the commander-in-chief of the army on what action to take in the West. Yet, judging by the books published to date, notably those of General V. Losburg, at that time the Sino operations officer at OKW, and Ministerial Ratgriner, the OKW war diarist, no such discussions took place. It may be assumed that the reactions of Hitler and the OKH leaders to the brilliant success in Poland and the unexpected inaction of the Western powers were entirely different. Hitler undoubtedly interpreted the failure of the Anglo French forces to take the offensive as a sign of weakness which would permit him to attack in the West himself. Furthermore, what had happened in Poland convinced him that henceforth there could be no task too big for the German army to tackle. O.K.H., as will be seen, did not share this view by any means. On the other hand, it was permissible to infer from the attitude of the Western powers that they had only entered the war to save their faces and that it must thus be possible to come to terms with them. Also, General Halder may have toyed with the idea of paving the way to such an understanding by removing Hitler, so that any German offensive in the West at that particular juncture would have been quite out of place. Whatever the answer, OKH could be certain that until then Hitler had never contemplated, even after the fall of Poland, the idea of an offensive in the West. I was given infallible proof of this in the winter of 1939-40. On one of the many occasions when Hitler issued the preparatory code word to put the final troop movements into the assembly areas in train, I was visited by the chief of staff of the air fleet supporting army group A, General Spell, who told me that his formations would be unable to take off from the waterlogged airfields. When I objected that the Luftwaffe had had months in which to construct solid runways, Spell assured me that Hitler had on an earlier occasion strictly forbidden any kind of work associated with a future offensive. In the same connection it may be noted that the ammunition production had not attained the level necessary for an eventual offensive in the West. Obviously OKH had misjudged Hitler's mentality in assuming that his viewpoint was immutable. Grinner tells us that during the second half of September, when the end was approaching in Poland, OKH had had a paper on the further conduct of the war in the West prepared by General Heinrich V. Stolpnagel. The conclusion he reached was that the German army would not be adequately equipped to break through the Maginot Line before 1942. He had not considered the possibility of going round through Belgium and Holland because the Rye government had only recently assured these countries that their neutrality would be respected. In the light of this paper and Hitler's attitude hitherto, OKH had evidently deduced that the policy in the West would continue to be defensive. At the end of the Polish campaign it accordingly ordered the army's defensive deployment in the West to be reinforced, manifestly without first obtaining Hitler's approval. In the completely new situation created by the total collapse of Poland such a policy was tantamount to resigning the initiative to Hitler regarding any future plans. It was certainly not the right way for the military leaders to safeguard their influence on the further course of the war, whatever form this might take. Apart from that, the conclusions reached by V. Stolpnigel could not be regarded as an answer to the problem of Germany's future war policy. If we were to wait till 1942 to penetrate the Maginot Line, the Western powers would in all likelihood have caught up with our lead in arms production. In addition, it would never have been possible to develop a decisive operation from a successful penetration of the Maginot Line. Against the minimum of 100 divisions available on the enemy side since 1939, this was no way to achieve decisive results. Even if the enemy committed powerful forces for the actual defense of the Maginot Line, he would still have been left with an adequate strategic reserve of between 40 and 60 divisions with which immediately to intercept even a wide breakthrough of the fortifications. Without any doubt the struggle would have petered out inconclusively into trench warfare. 
such could not be the aim of German strategy. One cannot assume, of course, that Colonel General V. Braukic and his chief of staff thought they would achieve anything with a purely defensive strategy in the long run. Nonetheless they did pin their hopes initially on the possibility that the Western powers would either still come to terms or take the offensive themselves in the end. Unfortunately they were not competent to take decisions in the former contingency, and their hope for an allied offensive was, as will be shown, unrealistic. The fact of the matter was that from a military point of view the spring of 1940 was not only the earliest but also the latest occasion on which Germany could have hoped to fight a successful offensive in the West. According to Grinner, Hitler was not informed of the Stolpnigel Memorandum, but must still have been aware that OKH was going to cling to a defensive policy in the West. Instead of the timely discussion on the future course of the war that should have taken place at the latest by mid September, he now confronted the commander-in-chief of the army with the fait accompli of his decision of 27 September and the OKW directive which followed on 9 October. Without any previous consultation with the commander-in-chief, he not only ordered offensive measures in the West but even decided on the timing and method to be adopted. All of these were matters which should on no account have been settled without the concurrence of the commander-in-chief. Hitler required the offensive to be launched at the earliest possible date in any event before the autumn was out. Originally, according to General V. Losburg, he fixed 15 October as the deadline. At the latest this would have meant disengaging the armor and aircraft in Poland at the end of the Battle of the Bzura. Furthermore, Hitler had laid down how the proposed offensive operation should be conducted namely by bypassing the Maginot Line by way of Belgium and Holland. The commander-in-chief of the army was to be left with merely the technical execution of an operation on which he had deliberately not been consulted and for which, in autumn 1939 at all events, he could certainly not guarantee any prospect of decisive success. For those who wonder how the commander-in-chief of the army could possibly accept such a capitus diminutio of his position by acceding to Hitler's intentions, Grinner has probably given the right answer in his book, Die Oberst Wehmacht Fu Rung. He suggests that V. Braukic, feeling that he was unlikely to achieve anything by immediate opposition, hoped that if he put up a show of goodwill at the beginning he would ultimately be able to talk Hitler out of his plan. Incidentally, the same view is advanced by General V. Losberg on the strength of his own knowledge of Hitler and the latter's attitude at the time. Braukic may also have been counting on the weather to make it impossible to carry out a late autumn or winter offensive when the day came. If the decision could thus be delayed until the following spring, ways and means might be found of ending the war by a political compromise. If these really were the thoughts of the commander in chief and his chief of staff, they certainly proved right as far as the weather went. But the notion that Hitler could be talked out of such a fundamental decision, even by General V. Right you now, to whom OKH duly entrusted the task of doing this, was to my mind quite futile. The only hope would have been if OKH had been able to offer a better solution of its own which would impress Hitler. As for there being any possibility of ending the war at that time by peaceful negotiation, none emerged. The peace offer made by Hitler to the Western powers after the Polish campaign met with a flat rejection. Besides, Hitler would most probably not have accepted any reasonable settlement of the Polish question that would have made it possible to reach an understanding with the West. In any case, such a settlement was hardly conceivable now that Soviet Russia had swallowed the eastern half of Poland. Another very doubtful point is how Germany could have achieved an honorable peace without Hitler at that time. How was he to be overthrown? If General Halder had any fresh plan to take military action against Berlin in October 1939, all I can say is that he would have found even less support among the troops than in autumn 1938. To begin with, then, Colonel General V. Braukic fell in with Hitler's intentions, and OKH drafted Operation Order Yellow in accordance with the policy Hitler had laid down. By 27 October, however, the commander in chief, backed by his chief of staff, was trying to persuade Hitler on military grounds to postpone the offensive till a more favorable time of year, 
by which he presumably meant spring 1940. According to Grenor, the same recommendation had been made to Hitler a few days previously by General V. Reichenau, probably at V. Braukic's request. Though Hitler did not entirely reject the arguments put up to him, the date he had fixed as long ago as 22nd October for the start of the offensive 12th November continued to hold good. Dot on 5th November V. Braukic made a fresh attempt to bring Hitler round. This was the day assuming that the attack really did start on 12th November, on which the code word had to be issued for the troops to begin moving into the assembly areas. Though this conversation took place in private, Key Itel was not called in until later, author, details of it leaked out, and its upshot was what I believe to have been an irreparable breach between Hitler and the generals. According to what Grinner gathered from Key Itel, v. Braukic read Hitler a memorandum comprising all his reasons for objecting to an offensive that autumn. Besides citing such incontrovertible facts as the state of the weather and the unpreparedness of the new formations, he advanced one argument which lashed Hitler into a white fury. It was a criticism of the performance of the fighting troops in the Polish campaign. Braukic advanced the view that the infantry had not displayed the same aggressive spirit as in 1914 and that the discipline and staying power of combat units had not always been entirely up to standard as a result of the tempo of rearmament. Dotted v. Braukic been talking to an audience of senior commanders they would have seen his point. Admittedly he was not justified in his charge that the infantry had not shown the same aggressiveness as in 1914 at least as long as he expressed it in those generalized terms. This was due to a misunderstanding of the transformation through which the infantry attack had passed in the years between. The 1914 methods of attack were just not conceivable any longer. On the other hand, it could not be denied and this occurs with untried troops at the beginning of every war that individual units had occasionally shown signs of jitters, particularly when fighting in built-up areas. Furthermore, various higher formation headquarters had found it necessary to crack down on cases of indiscipline. These facts were not surprising if one considered that in the space of a very few years the Reichs of 100,000 men had been inflated to an army several millions strong, a large proportion of whom had only been with the colors since the general mobilization. But none of this in the light of the victories in Poland could be adequate reason for concluding that the army was unable to fight an offensive in the West. If only Colonel General V. Braukic had confined himself to emphasizing that the newly formed divisions were still precluded by their lack of training and inner stability from going into action and that the offensive could not be carried out with the experienced divisions alone, he would have been on just as safe ground as he was with his objections to the season of the year. A generalization of the kind mentioned above, however, was the very last argument he should have advanced in any conversation with Hitler who saw himself as the creator of that new way Mack whose fighting qualities were now being called into question. Indeed, Hitler was right to the extent that if it had not been for his political audacity in pushing ahead with rearmament and for the part played by National Socialism in reviving the military spirit even among those social strata where it had been ostracized during the Weimar Republic, this way Mack would never have attained the strength it possessed in 1939. What Hitler chose to overlook was that the achievements of the former Reichs were entirely on a par with his own. For had not the officers and non-commissioned officers who stemmed from the old Reichs devoted themselves so wholeheartedly to the preliminary planning and material preparations, Hitler would neither have come by the way Macht he now regarded as his creation nor could the victories in Poland have been won. By raising such objections in the presence of Hitler, a dictator whose self-esteem was already inflated, V. Braukic attained precisely the opposite of what he intended. Disregarding all V. Braukic's factual arguments, Hitler took umbrage at the criticism he had presumed to direct against his Hitler's own achievements and brusquely broke off the interview. He insisted on adhering to 12th November as the operative date. Fortunately, the weather god took a hand at this juncture and enforced a postponement, a process that was to repeat itself 15 times before the end of January. Therefore, 
even though OKH had ultimately proved its point vis-à-vis -vis Hitler regarding the possible date of the offensive, the upshot was a crisis of leadership whose consequences were to become appallingly obvious in the further course of the war. Its immediate effect was that Hitler and Braukich ceased to meet. The GSOI of the operations branch, the future General Husinger, told me on 18th of January 1940 that Braukic had not seen Hitler since 5th November a quite impossible situation with things as they were. A further consequence of the breach of 5th November was the talk given by Hitler to the commanders and chiefs of staff of all army groups, armies, and corps in the Reich Chancellery on 23rd November. I need not go into this fully, as it has already become known through other publications. Its essential points were Hitler's emphasis on his irrevocable decision to take the offensive in the West at the earliest possible date and the doubts which he even then expressed as to how long the Reich would remain free from an attack in the rear in the East. As far as his factual explanation of the fundamental need to take the offensive in the West went, his remarks were well considered and, I thought, convincing, except for the question of timing. Otherwise his speech constituted a massive attack not only on OKH, but on the generals of the army as a whole, whom he accused of constantly obstructing his boldness and enterprise. In this respect it was the most biased speech I ever heard Hitler make. The commander-in-chief of the army did the only possible thing and tendered his resignation. This Hitler refused to accept, though that was obviously no solution to the crisis. OKH was still in the unhappy position of having to prepare for an offensive of which it did not approve. The commander-in-chief was still repudiated as an advisor on overall war policy and relegated to the status of a purely executive general. Any inquiry into the reasons for such a development in the relationship between the head of state and the army leaders will show the decisive factor to have been Hitler's thirst for power and his ever-growing self-conceit both of which were augmented by the mischief-making of the Gorings and Himmlers. Yet it must also be stated that OKH made no small contribution towards its own elimination at Hitler's hands by the way it handled the problem of how the war should be prosecuted after the Polish campaign. By deciding to remain on the defensive in the West, OKH resigned the initiative to Hitler although it should unquestionably have been OKH's business in the first instance to recommend to the head of state what steps were to be taken after the army, effectively supported by the Luftwaffe, had defeated Poland so swiftly. swiftly.o.k.h. was undoubtedly right to take the view in autumn 1939 that the time of year and the immaturity of the new formations made an offensive inadvisable at that stage. But neither this simple statement of fact nor the arrangements made to reinforce the defensive dispositions in the West provided an adequate answer to the problem of how to bring the war to a satisfactory conclusion in the military sense. This question had to be answered by OKH if it were to assert its influence on overall strategy. The commander and chief of the army certainly had every right to recommend the course of political settlement with the Western powers. But what was to happen if no prospect of such a settlement emerged? With a man of Hitler's type it was particularly necessary even if an offensive in the West did not seem expedient at that moment that OKH should indicate there and then the military way to end the war. Consequently there were three questions to consider once the Polish campaign was over first, could the war be brought to a favorable conclusion by sticking to defensive tactics? or could this object be achieved only by a victorious German offensive in the West? Secondly, if such an offensive proved necessary, when could it be launched with any prospect of decisive success? Thirdly, how must it be conducted to ensure an effective victory on the continent? As far as the first question went, there were two possibilities. One was that the Reich would reach a settlement with the Western powers after the fall of Poland. OKH was bound to regard this skeptically from the outset, partly because of the British national character, which made it fairly improbable that Great Britain would come to terms, and partly because Hitler was unlikely, once Poland had been defeated, to be prepared for a reasonable settlement of the German-Polish frontier question in the sense of a compromise. After all, in order to reach agreement with the Western powers he had to re-establish Poland, and this he could not do after having made over her eastern part to the Soviets. 
that much was an accomplished fact which not even another German government attaining power after Hitler's overthrow could have removed. The other possibility of successfully ending the war by remaining on the defensive might occur if the Western powers should decide, after all, to take the offensive. This would offer the Germans the prospect of attaining a victorious decision in the West in the course of delivering a counterblow. The same idea emerges in the book Jess Prack MIT Holder, where Holder is quoted as speaking of an operation on the rebound. According to General Hughes India, however, OKH only began to consider the project much later that is sometime in December and not at the turn of September and October, the phase so vital for its own position. Undoubtedly there was something very attractive about fighting an operation on the rebound, for the idea of saddling the enemy with the burden of an offensive against the Siegfried Line or the odium of violating the neutrality of Luxembourg, Belgium, and perhaps even Holland was inevitably an extremely tempting one. But was this not really a case of wishful thinking, at least for the foreseeable future? Could it be supposed that the Western powers who had not dared to launch an offensive while the mass of the German forces were tied down in Poland, would attack now that the Wehrmacht faced them in full strength? I do not believe and neither did I at the time that any basis existed for a German rebound operation. This view has found clear corroboration in a war plan drafted at the time on the orders of the Allied Commander-in-Chief, General Gamelin. The main train of thought reflected in this document, which later fell into the hands of German troops, was as follows before spring 1941 the Allied forces would not have massed the material strength to take the offensive against Germany in the West. To attain a numerical superiority of ground forces, fresh allies would have to be won. The British were not prepared to participate in a large offensive before 1941 except in the event of a partial collapse of Germany. This remark, which obviously implies a hope of revolution, shows what we should have had to expect from a coup d'etat. The principal task of the Western powers in 1940 had to be to safeguard the integrity of French territory and, of course, to hasten to the assistance of Belgium and Holland if they were attacked. In addition, every effort would be made to create further theatres of attrition for Germany. Those named were the Nordic states and if Italy remained neutral, the Balkans. Naturally the attempts to bring in Belgium and Holland on the side of the Allies would continue. Finally, endeavours would be made to deprive the Reich of its vital imports, both by the already mentioned creation of new theatres of war and by tightening the blockade through pressure on the neutral powers. From this war plan it becomes palpably clear that the Western powers intended to wage a war of attrition in as many different theatres as possible until such time as they had attained the clear preponderance which would allow them though in no case before 1941 to launch an offensive in the West. Although OKH could not at the time in question know of this Allied war plan, it was only too likely that the Western powers would fight a long-term war in the sense indicated. In view of the bloody prospects an assault on the Siegfried line would entail, the hope that the French and British peoples would tire of the phony war was hardly a realistic basis for any OKH decisions. In no event could Germany wait until the enemy had built up his armaments and in the light of Roosevelt's attitude, allowance must be made here for American aid, to a point where he was stronger on land and in the air as well as at sea. Least of all could she afford to do so with the Soviet Union at her back. The latter, having by this time obtained all it could hope for from Hitler, had hardly any more vital interests in common with the Reich, and the stronger the Western powers grew the more precarious the position of Germany would become. As far as the military leaders were concerned, therefore, the situation after the Polish campaign was this, the answer to the first of the above three questions that is whether the war could be brought to a successful conclusion by remaining on the defensive in the West, must be in the negative, unless the political leadership could still manage to reach a compromise with the Western powers. The right of the commander-in-chief of the army to advise Hitler to resort to compromise is beyond all doubt, if only because of the military risk a prolongation of the war would entail. Such action would, of course, involve accepting a temporary delay on the Western Front. Irrespective of that, however, 
It was both the duty and the right of the army leaders to give Hitler military guidance. They had to tell him what military steps were to be taken if no political solution of the conflict could be reached. In other words, it was up to OKH to present Hitler with an alternative military plan if it proved impossible to achieve the political compromise with the Western powers for which even Hitler evidently hoped in the first instance. One must not assume that Hitler would continue as hitherto to reject an offensive in the West once Poland was beaten, nor must one wait until he took a military decision on his own account. No military recommendation on the prosecution of the war could consist in maintaining the defensive in the West unless it were thought that Britain could be brought to her knees by aerial and submarine warfare, an assumption for which no real foundation existed. On the military side, therefore, Assuming that a political understanding proved unattainable, the only recommendation one could make was that the war in the West be conducted offensively. When such a recommendation was submitted, moreover, it was essential that OKH should assure itself of the initiative in deciding on the timing and method. As far as timing went, OKH was in agreement with all the commanders on the Western Front that no decisive success could be gained from launching the offensive in the late autumn or winter. The principal reason for this was the season. In autumn and winter the Wehrmacht would be prevented by weather conditions from playing its two big trumps, Armour and Luftwaffe, to their fullest effect. In addition, the short period of daylight at this time of the year renders it virtually impossible to win even a tactical decision in the space of a single day, thereby cutting down the speed of operations. The other reason was the still inadequate standard of training of all the new formations set up on the outbreak of war. The only troops really fit to go into action in autumn 1939 were the active divisions. None of the others had had enough experience of handling weapons or of operating as integral parts of a larger formation, nor did they as yet possess the requisite degree of inner stability. Furthermore, the refitting of the armoured formations following the Polish campaign was still not complete. If it were intended to start an offensive in the West before the end of autumn 1939, the mechanised divisions in Poland should have been released at an earlier date but that was a point which had not occurred to Hitler. Over and above all this, serious deficiencies existed in the Luftwaffe. Thus it was clear that an offensive in the West could not be justified before spring 1940. That this afforded time to seek a political solution of the conflict was welcome from the point of view of the military, little as it counted with Hitler after the rejection of his peace offer at the beginning of October. Since the problem of method, namely the strategic preparation of an offensive in the West, is the subject of the next chapter, there is no point in going into it any further here. Only this may be said in advance. The offensive plan imposed by Hitler on 9 October was a half measure. Instead of being aimed at a complete decision on the continent, it was initially at any rate concerned only with an interim objective. This was the point that provided OKH with its opportunity to bring home to Hitler that his military advisers had something better to offer than a partial solution not worthy of the stake involved. Always providing, of course, that OKH itself believed that by launching an offensive it could achieve a complete decision on the continent. It is still not known what prompted the OKH leaders to remain so non committal on future policy in the West during those vital weeks after the Polish campaign that the military decision was actually placed in Hitler's hands. They may have been moved by a very proper desire to make him seek a political compromise. They may also have rightly shunned the repetition of the violation of Belgian neutrality and all that went with it. At the time, however, an outsider was left with the impression that the OKH leaders considered it doubtful, to say the least, whether any German offensive would be decisively successful. Be that as it may, OKH left the initiative to Hitler to make the military decision. By further bowing to Hitler's will and putting out the orders for an operation with which its leaders privately disagreed, it resigned for all practical purposes as the authority responsible for land warfare. When, shortly afterwards, the operational proposals put up by HQ Army Group gave OKH a chance to regain its lost position, it let the opportunity slip through its fingers. By the time the Western offensive, thanks to these same proposals, had achieved a degree of success exceeding even Hitler's original expectations, 
The latter regarded OKH as a body which he could bypass even in matters of grand tactics. Hitler had taken over the functions which Schlieffen believed could at best be performed in our age by a triumvirate of king, statesman, and warlord. Now he had also usurped the role of the warlord. But had the drop of Samuel's anointing oil which Schlieffen considered indispensable for at least one of the triumvirs really fallen on his head? Question mark 5. The operation plan controversy not until after the war did anything become generally known about the background of the plan which replaced OKH's original Operation Order Yellow of 19th and 29th of October 1939 as the basis of our offensive in the West the plan by which so swift and decisive a victory was scored over the Anglo-French armies and the forces of Belgium and Holland. The first to disclose how this new plan emerged was probably Little Heart IV who linked my name with it as a result of statements made to him by Field Marshal V. Rundstedt and General Blumentritt, our chief of operations during the period in question. Since I may be considered to have been the prime mover in this matter, it seems right that I should now make my own attempt, on the basis of the records at my disposal, to show how the plan came into being, especially as it has since acquired a certain significance. After all, the ideas behind the plan were mine, just as it was I who drafted all the memoranda to OKH by which we sought to have the operation planned on the only lines conducive, in our opinion, to decisive success in the West. Finally it was I who when already replaced as Chief of Staff of the Army Group had an opportunity to expound to Hitler in person the ideas that our headquarters had so long failed to get accepted by OKH only a few days after this. OKH put out a new operation order based on our recommendations. At the same time I would stress that my commander, Colonel General V. Rundstedt, and my collaborators Blumentritt and Treskow, agreed with my view throughout and that V. Rundstedt backed our recommendations to the full with his own signature. Without his sanction we could never have kept up our attempts to change OKH's mind by these repeated memoranda. The war historian or officer reading military history might well find it worth his while to study this intellectual tussle over an operation plan in its entirety. For the purpose of this book, however, I shall confine myself initially to outlining the OKH's plan and to explaining what I could not help regarding as their shortcomings of its or, more precisely, of Hitler's, strategic conception. Next, by way of contrast to the OKH plan, I propose to deal with the essential arguments on which the army group based its strategic considerations. Last of all, I shall briefly show how, after a long series of frustrations, the original operation plan was finally amended undoubtedly on Hitler's instructions to coincide with the views of our own headquarters. The OKH or Hitler's plan if asked to define, in the light of the operation orders issued by OKH, the basic strategy which that body, and Hitler, planned to adopt in the West. I would put it this way OKH proposed in accordance with Hitler's directive of 9th October to send a strong right wing of the German armies through Holland into northern Belgium to defeat the Anglo-French forces it expected to encounter there together with the Belgians and Dutch. In other words, the decision was primarily to be sought by a strong thrust on the right wing. This assault wing consisted of Army Detachment 10, an Army Detachment Army Abtei Lung being a small army of two or three Army Corps, and Army Group B, Colonel General V. Bock, and was to assemble in the area of the Lower Rhine and the Northern Eiffel. Army Group B had three armies under command. Altogether the Northern Wing embraced 30 infantry divisions and the bulk of the mobile formations, nine armoured and four infantry divisions. Since the total number of German divisions available on the Western Front was 102, these therefore constituted almost half our aggregate strength. While Army Detachment 10's task was the elimination of Holland, the three armies in the Army Group were to attack through northern Belgium, passing north and south of Liege. The strong tank forces were intended to play a decisive role here in an attempt to overrun the enemy. On 29 October, this first operation order was amended to leave Holland out of the picture in the initial stages. 
This may have been due to representations from O.K.H. Henceforth Army Group B was to attack round both sides of Liege with two armies up, 4th and 6th, and 2, 18th and 2nd, following through. Later, however, Holland was again included in the operation, her elimination being this time entrusted to 18th Army. The decisive thrust of Army Group B was to be covered on the southern flank by Army Group A, the latter, consisting of two armies, 12th and 16th, and a total of 22 divisions, none of them with any mechanized troops, was to advance through southern Belgium and Luxembourg, after assembling in the southern Eiffel and the Hansruck. 12th Army was to follow through on the left of Army Group B, establishing a system of Eckeland defense as it went in order to cover the further advance of Army Group B against enemy incursions. 16th Army was to wheel south after crossing Luxembourg in order to protect the deep flank of the whole operation by establishing a defensive position running closely along the north of the Maginot Line's westward projection between the Saar and the Meuse east of Sedan. Army Group C was left with two armies and 18 infantry divisions to hold the Siegfried Line from the Luxembourg frontier down to Switzerland. 17 infantry and two mobile divisions were available as army reserves. The aim of this operation was defined in paragraph 1 of the OKH Operation Order of 19 October under the heading General Intention, in pursuance of Hitler's OKW Directive of 9 October. It was to defeat the largest possible elements of the French and Allied armies and simultaneously to gain as much territory as possible in Holland, Belgium and northern France as a basis for successful air and sea operations against Britain and as a broad protective zone for the Ruhr. Paragraph 2 of the operation order indicated that the first object of the two army groups assault, which was to be coordinated under the commander-in-chief of the army, V. Braukic must be while eliminating the Dutch armed forces, to defeat as many elements of the Belgian army as possible in the vicinity of the frontier fortifications and, by rapidly concentrating powerful mechanized forces, to create a basis for the immediate prosecution of the attack with a strong right wing and the swift occupation of the Belgian coastline. In the aforementioned amendment to the operation order issued on 29 October, OKH somewhat extended the aim of Army Group B's operation by rewording the general intention. Henceforth this was to consist in engaging and destroying the largest possible elements of the French army in northern France and Belgium, thereby creating favorable conditions for the prosecution of the war against Britain and France by land and air. In the paragraph headed order of battle and tasks. OKH set the army group the aim of destroying the Allied forces north of the Somme and driving through to the Channel Coast. The covering role of Army Group A, which continued to be mainly defensive, was broadened to the extent that its right hand army, 12th, had now to be pushed over the Meuse opposite and south of Fiume and then to head through France's fortified frontier zone in the general direction of Long. The operational intention of both operation orders might best be expressed by saying that the Anglo French elements we expected to meet in Belgium were to be floored by a powerful, straight right, while our weaker, left fist covered up. The territorial objective was the Channel coastline. What would follow this first punch we were not told. Objection significantly enough, my first reaction to the plan laid down in these two operation orders was emotional rather than intellectual. The strategic intentions of OKH struck me as being essentially an imitation of the famous Schlieffen Plan of 1914. I found it humiliating, to say the least, that our generation could do nothing better than repeat an old recipe even when this was the product of a man like Schlieffen. What could possibly be achieved by turning up a war plan our opponents had already rehearsed with us once before and against whose repetition they were bound to have taken full precautions. For it was obvious to any military mind that the Germans would be even less keen, or able, to assault the Maginot Line of 1939 than they had the Verduntul Nancy Epinal fortifications of 1914. By this first rather emotional reaction of mine, however, I did OKH an injustice. One reason was that the plan had come from Hitler, another was that it was actually far from being a repetition of Schlieffen's.
The widespread view that this was so is correct in two respects only that is it was intended in 1939, as in 1914, to place the main weight of the German offensive on the northern wing, and both plans also involved marching through Belgium. Otherwise the plans of 1914 and 1939 were widely divergent. In the first place, the situations were entirely different. In 1914 it had still been possible, as Schlieffen did, to count on strategic surprise. Even if this did not include the march through Belgium, it certainly applied to the massing of Germany's forces on the extreme northern wing. In 1939 the corresponding intention on Hitler's part could not be concealed from the enemy. Furthermore, there was reason in 1914 for hoping, as Schlieffen did, that the French would do us the good turn of launching a premature offensive into Lorraine. In 1939 no such development could be expected. The enemy would immediately throw in strong forces to meet our drive through Belgium and Holland, and these, in contrast to 1914, would have to be tackled mainly head-on. Instead of taking the initiative prematurely in the center of the front, the French were likely to strike a powerful backhand blow at the southern flank of our main forces during their advance through Belgium. In other words, the Schlieffen plan just could not be repeated. Apart from this, I soon realized that neither OKH nor Hitler had any intention of copying the Schlieffen plan in the full magnitude of its conception. Schlieffen had drafted his plan with an eye to the utter and final defeat of the entire French army. His aim was to outflank the enemy straight off in the north with a wide right hook and then, having cleared the whole of northern France, to drive down to the west of Paris and push the entire enemy army back against a front extending from Metz through the Vosges to the Swiss frontier, compelling it in the end to capitulate. To achieve this he had accepted the risk of initial reverses in Alsace, at the same time hoping that the enemy, by unleashing an offensive in Lorraine, would do their own bit towards making the Germans' big outflanking operation a complete success. The 1939 operation plan, on the other hand, contained no clear cut intention of fighting the campaign to a victorious conclusion. Its object was, quite clearly, partial victory, defeat of the Allied forces in northern Belgium, and territorial gains, possession of the Channel Coast as a basis for future operations. It may be that when the then Colonel General V. Braukic and his Chief of Staff were drafting the 1939 Operation Order they were reminded of what Moult had written in his introduction to the General Staff's treatise on the War of 1870-71 colon no operation plan extends with any certainty beyond the first encounter with the main body of the enemy. It is only the layman who, as a campaign develops, thinks he sees the original plan being systematically fulfilled in every detail to its preconceived conclusion. If this thesis did inspire OKH's planning, it meant that the latter reserved the right to decide whether, and by what means, the offensive should be prosecuted once the first objective's partial victory on the right wing in northern Belgium and the occupation of the Channel Coast were attained. Judging by what I had heard when the operation order was handed to me in Zossen, However, I could only suppose that OKH regarded the chances of achieving decisive results in the French theatre of war as extremely slender, if not non-existent. This impression was later reinforced during the many visits paid to our headquarters by the Commander-in-Chief of the Army and his Chief of Staff, neither of whom ever gave any serious attention to our repeated insistence on the need to strive after total victory. Similarly I doubt if Hitler himself then believed in the possibility of completely eliminating France in the course of the projected operation. Indeed, his primary concern was probably the recollection that when our offensive miscarried in 1914 we had found ourselves lacking even the necessary basis for submarine warfare against Britain. That was why he now attached such importance to winning that basis in other words, to possession of the Channel Coast. Now it was perfectly clear that an operation aiming at the total defeat of France could no longer be executed at one stroke, as Schlieffen had planned to do. As has been explained above, the requisite conditions no longer obtained. Yet if it were proposed once the partial victory envisaged by OKH, 
had been one to proceed with a view to eliminating France entirely as an opponent. The present operation had at least to be related to this ultimate goal. In the first place, it had to bring about the total destruction of the enemy's northern wing, in order to establish decisive superiority for the second move, the aim of which would be to annihilate the remaining western forces in France. In the second place, it had simultaneously to create a favorable strategic situation from which to launch this subsequent thrust. To my mind, the operation as drafted offered no guarantee of fulfilling these two basic requirements. When the German assault formation, Army Group B, which had a total strength of 43 divisions, arrived in Belgium, it would run into 20 Belgian and if Holland were brought in a further 10 Dutch divisions. However inferior these troops might be to the Germans in the qualitative sense, their prospects of resistance were favored by strong fortifications, on both sides of Liege and along the Albert Canal, and natural obstacles, in Belgium the Albert Canal running down to the fortress of Antwerp, and the fortified line of the Meuse pivoted on Namur, in Holland the numerous waterways. Within a very few days, moreover, these forces would be joined by the Anglo-French armies, including all their tank and motorized divisions, already assembled on the Franco-Belgian frontier to meet a German invasion. Thus the German assault wing would have no opportunity, as in 1914, of achieving strategic surprise by a grand-scale outflanking movement. With the arrival of the Anglo-French forces it would have to fight an opponent as strong as itself, and attack him more or less frontally at that. The success of this first blow must thus be achieved by tactical means, since there was no provision for it in the strategic dispositions for the offensive. Were the enemy to show any skill in his leadership, he might conceivably succeed in evading an outright defeat in Belgium. Even if he did not manage to hold the fortified line Antwerp Liege Meuse, or Semois, he must still be expected to get back behind the lower Somme in reasonable order. Once there, he could draw on his powerful reserves to build up a new front. By this time the German offensive would be losing momentum, and Army Grouper would be unable, either by the disposition or the strength of its forces to prevent the enemy from forming a defense front from the end of the Maginot line east of Sedan to the lower Somme. In this way the German Annie would land in a situation similar to that of 1914 at the end of the autumn battles. Its only advantage would be possession of a broader coastal basis along the channel. Consequently we should neither have achieved the destruction of the enemy forces in Belgium which was essential if we were to have adequate superiority in the decisive phase nor should we have been in a favorable strategic situation for these final battles. The operation planned by OKH would bring partial victory, nothing more. As it turned out, the enemy was overrun wholesale in Belgium in 1940, thanks to the skillful handling of Army Group B with the result that the Belgian and Dutch armies were forced to capitulate. But however great our trust in German leadership and the striking power of our armor, these were not successes that could be counted upon in advance. Had the other side been better led, the story might have been a very different one. The utter debacle suffered by the enemy in northern Belgium was almost certainly due to the fact that, as a result of the changes later made to the operation plan, the tank units of Army Grouper were able to cut straight through his lines of communication and push him away from the Somme. Finally, there was one other thing that the OKH plan failed to consider, the scope for maneuver open to a bold and resolute enemy commander. One had no right to assume that such leadership would be lacking, particularly in view of the reputation General Gamelin enjoyed with us. He had certainly made an excellent impression on General Beck when the latter visited him before the war. A bold enemy commander was in a position to parry the German drive expected through Belgium and simultaneously to mount a large scale counter offensive against the southern flank of the German northern wing. Even when the forces earmarked for support of the Belgians and Dutch had been thrown into Belgium, 50 or 60 divisions for such a counter blow could certainly be found in the Maginot Line which could easily spare them. The further forward army group be advanced in the direction of the English Channel and Somme estuary, the better the enemy command could effect its thrust into the deep flank of the Germans' northern wing. Whether army group A, 
with its 22 divisions, would be strong enough to parry this was by no means certain. Whatever the answer, any developments on these lines would hardly be strategically conducive to a final solution in the Western Theatre. Army Group A's plan above objections, sketched out as they occurred to me when studying the OKH operation orders, formed the basis of the proposals we set forth in a series of memoranda aimed at bringing the army leaders round to our own point of view. Since these proposals were inevitably somewhat repetitive, I shall merely summarize them here, at the same time indicating where they contrasted with the operational intentions of OKH, the aim of the Western offensive, I submitted, must be to force an issue by land. To strive after the limited objectives set out in the OKH operation orders justified neither the political hazards, violation of three countries' neutrality, nor the military stakes involved. The offensive capacity of the German army was our trump card on the continent, and to fritter it away on half measures was inadmissible if only on account of the Soviet Union. The main weight of our attack must lie with Army Group A, not B. The proposed thrust by Army Group B would hit the waiting enemy more or less frontally, even if it achieved some initial success, it might well peter out on the Somme. The real chance lay with Army Group A, and consisted in launching a surprise attack through the Ardennes, where the enemy would certainly not be expecting any armor because of the terrain towards the lower Somme in order to cut off the enemy forces thrown into Belgium forward of that river. This was the only possible means of destroying the enemy's entire northern wing in Belgium preparatory to winning a final victory in France. Besides offering the main chance, Army Group who also harbored the main danger for the German offensive. If the enemy acted rightly, he would seek to elude an unfavorable contest in Belgium, possibly by withdrawing behind the Somme. Concurrently he would deploy all his available forces for a grand counter-offensive against our southern flank with the aim of surrounding the main body of the German army in Belgium or forward of the Lower Rhine. Disinclined though one might be to credit the French high command with such audacity, and certain though France's allies were to oppose so bold a solution, the possibility could still not be discounted. If our offensive through northern Belgium were to halt on the Lower Somme, the enemy would at least succeed in forming an unbroken defensive front with the reserves he had in hand. This front could start at the northwest end of the Maginot Line east of Sedan and, taking advantage of the Aine and the Somme, run right down to the channel. To prevent this it was vital to smash any enemy concentrations on our southern flank, either on both sides of the Meuse or between the Meuse and Oyes, before they could reach completion. The cohesion of the enemy front in this area must be destroyed from the outset with a view to turning the flank of the Maginot Line later on. Army Group A, with which the operation's main effort must lie, even if initially, for reasons of space, more divisions could be accommodated with Army Group B, must be given three armies instead of two. One army would drive through southern Belgium and across the Meuse as already envisaged but then it must thrust towards the lower Somme to take the enemy forces facing Army Group B in the rear. Another army must be committed in a southwesterly direction with the task of taking offensive action against and smashing any enemy forces concentrating west of the Meuse to counterattack against our southern flank. A third army must, as envisaged, cover the deep flank of the overall operation from north of the Maginot Line between Cirque and Meuse and east of Sedan. In pursuance of this transfer of the main weight of the operation from Army Group B to Army Group A we duly called for, I, one more army, which, even if it could not be phased in until our offensive was underway, must be available from the very start, and two, strong armored forces. These, very much condensed, are the main trends of thought constantly recurring in our army group's manifold memoranda to O.K.H. The struggle for army group A's plan naturally I did not immediately find myself presented with a cut and dried operation plan in that October of 1939. Hard work and endeavor must always confront the ordinary mortal before he attains his goal. No ready-made works of art can spring from his brain as did Palazathene from the head of Zeus. Nevertheless, 
The basic principles of the new plan were contained in the Army Group's very first proposals to OKH dated 31st of October 1939, on operational policy in the event of a German offensive. To be more precise, there were two documents involved. The first was a letter from the Army Group commander to the commander in chief dealing with the fundamental problem of carrying out a German offensive in the situation at that particular time. Von Rundstedt began by emphasizing that the offensive planned in accordance with the operation orders of 19th and 29th October could not have a decisive effect on the war. The strength of Germany's forces in relation to the enemies offered no basis for an all out victory, nor did the operation being entirely frontal in character, afford any prospect of turning the enemy's flank and taking him in the rear. The probable upshot would be a frontal battle on the Somme. At the same time V. Rundstedt pointed to the difficulties opposing the effective use of tanks and aircraft are race cards in autumn and winter. Nevertheless, an offensive must still be launched if its success would create the prerequisites for our fleet and air force to go into action against Britain. The experience of World War I had shown that it was not enough to possess only a part of the Channel coast, we must control the whole North French coastline as far as the Atlantic for this purpose. To expand the offensive capacity of the German army on a limited victory was, with the Soviet Union at our backs, indefensible. This offensive capacity was the decisive factor on the continent, and the friendship of the Soviet Union would be ensured only as long as we had an army capable of offensive action. For the time being our army's offensive capacity was invested solely in the regular divisions, and would remain so until the new formations had acquired the necessary degree of training and stability. A crucial offensive could not, however, be mounted with regular divisions alone. It might be that the Western powers could be made to take the offensive as the result of pressure by the Luftwaffe on Britain, though even if Britain were to demand such action, it was not at all certain whether French fighting morale would stand up to the bloodletting this must entail. From our point of view, it was desirable that the enemy should himself be saddled with the burden of attacking fortified positions and with the odium of violating Belgian and Dutch neutrality. At the same time one could not play a waiting game indefinitely and give Britain time to fill in the gaps in her armaments and aircraft production. From the military point of view the war against Britain could be won only at sea and in the air. It could only be lost on the mainland if the army's offensive capacity were wasted on indecisive battles. Von Rundstedt's letter thus amounted to a warning not to launch any German offensive prematurely that is in the autumn or winter months. In this respect Army Group and OKH saw eye to eye. They did not agree, however, on the method to be adopted, and the Army Group commander went on record against conducting the operations, for such was the implication of the OKH operation orders in a way which did not assure us of conclusive success. Army Group A's second communication to OKH dated 31st October and now put in the form of a staff letter, supplemented v. Rundstedt's appreciation by making definite recommendations on how we felt a German offensive should be conducted. This document, which already contained the essentials of the new plan, stressed the necessity of, a, shifting the main weight of the operation as a whole on to the southern wing, b, committing strong motorized forces in such a manner that they could thrust up from the south into the rear of the allied troops in northern Belgium, c, following up with an additional army responsible for warding off, by offensive action, any large-scale counter-attack against our southern flank. One could hardly have expected this letter to evoke any response by 3rd November, the date on which we were visited by the commander-in-chief of the army and his chief of staff, though it did enable me acting on instructions from Colonel General V. Rundstedt to state our case direct. Colonel General V. Braukitsch, however, turned down the request I made for additional forces. The extra army and strong tank units, with the remark that he only wished he could spare them. This made it clear enough that he still entirely refused to accept our point of view. Finally, however, he did promise us an armored division and two motorized regiments from the army reserve. Unfortunately our visitors also made it only too clear that they had strong reservations about the projected offensive in the west.
specifically with regard to the chances of winning a decisive victory. Understandably enough they asked our army and corps commanders to report on the present condition of their formations, but the way they received the complaints, of which there were naturally many about the state of the newly formed divisions left one with the impression that they personally set no very great store by the offensive. To compensate for this impression, Colonel General V. Rundstedt himself addressed the generals of the army group a few days later. By indicating the operational standpoint of his own staff, he showed them that there was actually every prospect of a victorious decision in the West, even if it were not expedient to take the offensive before the spring. On 6 November, when replying to an OKH request for a statement of our intentions in pursuance of the operation order, we put our recommendations up once again, but received no answer. All this time, Hitler's weather boffins, the Air Ministry meteorologists, were scampering merrily up and down their ladders. Every time they predicted even a brief spell of good weather, Hitler issued the code word for the final troop assemblies. But on each occasion the boffins had to retract and the attack was called off. On 12th November we were taken completely by surprise by the following teleprinter message The Führer has now directed that a third group of fast moving troops will be formed on the southern wing of 12th Army or in the sector allotted to 16th Army, and that this will be directed against Sudan and the area to the east of it, taking advantage of the unwooded terrain on either side of Allen, Tintini and Fleurenville. Composition, HQ-19 Corps, 2 and 10 Panzer Divisions, 1 Motorized Division, the Lbstandarte and the Grossdeutschland Regiment. The task of this group will be, a, to defeat mobile enemy forces thrown into southern Belgium and thereby to lighten the task of 12th and 16th armies, b, to gain a surprise hold on the west bank of the Meuse by Ors, southeast of Sedan thereby creating a favorable situation for the subsequent phases of the operation, specifically in the event of the armored units under command of 6th and 4th armies proving unsuccessful in their own sectors. The above was followed by an appropriate amplification of the OKH operation order. It was apparent from the wording of the message that this allocation of 19 corps to army group had been made on Hitler's orders. What had caused him to do this? Possibly he conceived the idea following a recent interview with the commander of 16th Army, General Bush. The latter was acquainted with my views and may have brought up our wish for armored forces for a swift drive through the Ardennes. It is also possible that Hitler reached the decision on his own. He had a keen eye for tactical openings and spent much time brooding over maps. He may have realized that the easiest place to cross the Meuse was at Sedan whereas the armor of 4th Army further up would find the going much harder. Very likely he had recognized the Meuse crossing at Sedan as a promising spot, in the sense that it offered an opening on the river for the southern wing of Army Group A, and wanted as he always did to go for every tempting objective at once. In practice, pleased though we were at acquiring the Panzer Corps, it still entailed dispersing our armor, and for that reason the commander of 19 Panzer Corps. General Guderian, was at first none too happy about his formation's new role, his contention having always been that tanks should be used to punch hard at one place at a time. Only when I had briefed him on our army group's operational motives for seeking to shift the main weight of the entire offensive to the southern wing and drawn his attention to the alluring target of the Somme estuary in the enemy's rear did Guderian show unbounded enthusiasm for our plan. Ultimately it was his Elan which inspired our tanks on their dash round the backs of the enemy to the Channel Coast. For me, of course, it was a great relief to know that my idea of pushing large numbers of tanks through such difficult country as the Ardennes was considered feasible by Guderian. To come back once more to the allocation of 19 Panzer Corps. There is no doubt that Hitler envisaged it only as a tactical measure which would at the same time facilitate Army Group B's own crossing of the Meuse. Nor did OKH's amplification to its operation order include any reference to setting new objectives. It had no notion whatever of seeking, 
or even paving the way for, a final decision by mounting an outflanking movement from Army Group A's sector in the direction of the Somme estuary. On 21 November, the Commander in Chief of the Army and his Chief of Staff paid us another visit in Cobblins. In addition to the Army Commanders of Army Group A, the Commander of Army Group B, Colonel General V. Bock, and his Army Commanders also attended. It was a noteworthy occasion for one reason in particular. Von Braukic had asked that the Army Group and Army Commanders should state their intentions, and what dispositions they had made, in pursuance of the OKH Operation Order. Yet when our own turn came round, he announced that he only wanted the Army Commanders to speak. It was evident from this that he wished to obviate any risk of Army Group A's ventilating its disagreement with the Operation Order. Consequently, we had no choice but to hand the heads of OKH a further memorandum we had prepared on our opinion of how the offensive should be conducted. This, like its predecessors of 31st October and 6th November and the four that followed on 30th November, 6th December, 18th December, and 12th January, set forth the principal considerations on which Army Group A's plan for the overall operation were based. Each of these memoranda propounded substantially the same concepts as have already been developed above, so I shall refrain from recapitulating them. In the meantime, it seems, Hitler had been giving some thought to the employment of 19 Panzer Corps in the sector of Army Group and to the problem of how to move up additional forces in support of it in case the thrust delivered by the armor still massed with Army Group B did not achieve the quick results expected of it. We are told by Grinner, who kept the OKW War Diary, that about mid-November Hitler asked OKH whether, and by what methods, Guderian's armor could be reinforced should the need rise. Grinner also reports that about 20th November Hitler sent OKH a directive instructing it to make provisions for a rapid switch of the offensive's main effort from Army Group B to Army Group U in the event of the latter's achieving quicker and more far-reaching results. Acting apparently on this directive, OKH at the end of November moved up 14 motorized corps from east of the Rhine to locations behind Army Group A's assembly area. The corps still remained part of the Army Reserve. Nonetheless, with OKH retaining the express right to decide, in accordance with the situation, whether it would eventually be allotted to Army Group A or B. It is not clear whether Hitler himself conceived the idea of shifting the main weight of the operation to Army Group A or whether he was even then aware of Army Group A's views. On 24 November, the day after he had addressed the heads of the three services at Berlin, Hitler received Colonel General V. Rundstedt and Generals Bush and Guderian. I gathered from Bush during the return journey to Cobblins that Hitler had shown great sympathy for the Army Group's viewpoint at the interview. If this is so, I think he must have been primarily concerned with the reinforcement of our Army Group summer as a means of opening up the line of the Meuse at Sudan in the interest of Army Group B. I consider it most unlikely that V. Rundstedt used this occasion to present Hitler with our own draft plan, particularly as V. Braukic's position was so precarious just then. As for Grinner's statement that Hitler had heard of our plan as early as the end of October from his military assistant, Schmunt, this at least seems doubtful as far as the timing is concerned. However, Schmunt did come to see us on instructions from Hitler to ascertain whether an offensive really was precluded as our reports claimed by bad weather and the state of the ground. On that occasion Colonel Blumentritt, our Chief of Operations, and Lieutenant Colonel V. Treskow told Schmunt in confidence that the Army Group had sent OKH a plan of attack which it considered to be no better than the latter's own. A few days later Blumentritt, with my consent, given only very reluctantly, though with V. Rundstedt's approval, sent Colonel Schmunt a copy of my last memorandum. Whether it was passed on to Hitler or even to Jodl I cannot say. At all events, when Hitler sent for me on 17th of February 1940 to hear my views on an offensive in the West, he gave not the least hint that he had seen any of our memoranda to O.K.H. It may be that Hitler's object at the end of November was to ensure that the main effort could be shifted from Army Group B to Army Group A when operations were already in progress. 
This still did not imply any deviation from the plan as it stood to date, nor did it mean that he had accepted our operational precepts. Despite the fact that 14 motorized corps had been moved up behind our assembly area, the operation order remained fully in force. Just as before, success was to be sought first and foremost by Army Group B's massed push through northern Belgium while Army Group A kept to its protective role. The only difference was that Hitler wanted to be in a position to switch the main effort of the offensive at a later stage if Army Group B's successes did not come up to expectation or if Army Group A achieved quicker results. This was made palpably clear by the reply I received from General Halder to a fresh memorandum I had submitted on 30th November. It was, incidentally, the first acknowledgement of our recommendations to date. The gist of our own remarks had been that a new point of attack that is through Army Group now seemed to be emerging after all, and that provided the Ardennes breakthrough were successful, this must entail extending the scope of the operation just as we had suggested. While conceding that our views largely coincided with those of OKH, Holder insisted that the latter's orders regarding 19 and 14 Corps did not establish a new focal point for the offensive, but merely provided for the possibility of creating one if the need were to arise. Owing to influences beyond our control, he added, the decision as to where the main effort will be made has changed from a problem of planning to one of command during the operation itself. Two things could be gathered from the above. The first was that Hitler intended that his right to make the crucial decision should also cover the actual execution of the offensive. The second was that he intended making the location of the main effort dependent on how the offensive developed and that, for the time being at any rate, he was either unacquainted with our own plan or disinclined to adopt it. The latter impression was confirmed by a reply given to me by Halder on the telephone on 15th December. On 6th December I had sent him another personal letter recapitulating all the aspects favoring our operation plan. This letter actually contained the new plan in its entirety. When Halder had still not replied by 15th December. I rang up General V. Stolpnigel, the Oberquarty Mr. I, and asked him how much longer OKH proposed to ignore our proposals. This produced the aforementioned telephone call from Halder. He assured me that the army leaders entirely agreed with us, but were under strict instructions to leave the main effort with Army Group B or, alternatively, to allow for a shift of this effort in the course of the offensive. One might have assumed from this that the heads of OKH had actually come round to our point of view and that they would have brought it to Hitler's notice in some form or other. However, I learnt at the same time from General Warlemont, Jodl's deputy, and from the chief operations officer of the Wehrmacht operations staff, the future General V. Losburg, that OKH had never submitted any recommendations to Hitler on the lines suggested by us. It was all rather perplexing as far as we were concerned. Whether or not OKH was sincere in agreeing with us, the idea of not placing the main effort with Army Group until after the offensive had started was in any case quite incompatible with the operations we at Army Group had in mind. Admittedly, it was Napoleon who coined the phrase on Sen Gage part out et on Voigt. For the French this has become almost axiomatic, particularly since their Lorraine initiative in 1914 proved such a fiasco. It is also an axiom which the Allied High Command could undoubtedly have adopted in 1940. Since they wished to saddle us with the burden of taking the offensive, they would have been absolutely right to sit back and wait. Their duty lay in evading a test of strength in Belgium in order to deal a counterstroke against the southern flank of our offensive with the most powerful forces they could muster. In our own case, however, there could be no question of waiting to see where and when we should play our trumps, for the operation plan of Army Grouper was based on surprise. The enemy could hardly be expecting a strong armoured force to drive through the Ardennes with a whole army in its train. But this drive would attain its objective, the lower Somme, only if any enemy forces thrown into southern Belgium were successfully overrun. We had to cross the Meuse at the same time as the remnants of these troops if we were subsequently to take the enemy forces facing Army Group B in northern Belgium in the rear. Similarly, 
any attempt to smash the deployment of strong enemy reserves on our southern flank between the Meuse and Oi Eyes, for example, before it could be completed, thereby creating a favorable jumping off position for the second act, the destruction of the remaining enemy forces, could succeed only if we had enough forces down that to retain the initiative. To wait and see which way the cat jumped before deciding where to place one's main effort was tantamount to abandoning the chance of annihilating the enemy forces in northern Belgium by an outflanking movement from the south. At the same time, it would mean allowing the enemy to deploy for that counter blow on our southern flank, which constituted his own chance of victory. It was a chance, albeit, of which the enemy high command never availed itself. As for the idea of waiting for adequate forces to be allocated to army group and making the decision to deliver the main thrust the dependent on whether we managed to achieve surprise with inadequate forces, all one can do is to quote Moltke's dictum that an error in the first stages of deployment can never be made good. In short, one could not wait to see how our offensive developed whether the massed drive of Army Group B would smash the enemy in Belgium or whether a lone 19 Panzer Corps would get through to Sedan. If Army Group A's plan were to be adopted, we must be given adequate armor and three armies from the outset, even if the third army could not be phased in until room for it had been found in the course of the advance. That was why, in my memorandum of 6 December, I had called for not two armies of 22 infantry divisions and only one panzer corps, but three armies of 40 divisions and two mobile corps. Incidentally, this was the actual number we secured after Hitler had intervened and our plan had been accepted. And so we had to go on with the struggle. Our prime concern from now on was to ensure that from the very first stage of the operation not only 19 Panzer Corps but also 14 motorized corps were utilized for the thrust through the Ardennes, across the Meuse at Sedan and on towards the Lower Somme. Furthermore, it was essential that the third army we had requested should be available from the outset to take offensive action against any enemy deployment on our southern flank west of the Meuse. If we could get these two demands accepted even if OKH still would not accept our views as a whole the offensive was bound to be guided into channels conducive to the conclusive victory for which we strove. Admittedly, even our own operation plan would not as Moltke put it extend with any certainty beyond the first encounter with the main body of the enemy least of all if a lack of adequate forces brought the attack to a standstill in its preliminary stages. But in that very same context Moltke pointed out that the military commander must look past this first encounter and keep his eye fixed on the ultimate goal. That goal, as we saw it, could be none other than total victory on the European mainland. Such must be the object of the German offensive throughout, even if two distinct phases were needed to achieve it. The Napoleonic precept quoted above which, in the last analysis, is exactly what Hitler's reservations regarding the location of the main effort boiled down to might provide an admirable solution in other situations. In our own case it meant aiming short of absolute victory. On 18th December, my letter to the Chief of Staff on 6th December not having produced the desired effect, I submitted to V. Rundstedt a draft operation order for the Western offensive based on our own conception of the operation. It was to serve him as a brief in interviews with the Commander in Chief of the Army and if the latter agreed with Hitler. The interview with V. Braukic took place on 22nd December, but there was no meeting with Hitler. OKH was also sent the above draft in writing, as I hoped that when expressed in this cut and dried form our views would have more chance of convincing the O. KW operations branch than the purely theoretical representations made hitherto. Only after the war did I find that the operations branch never received any of our memoranda from Halder. The weather in the second half of December put any thought of an offensive out of the question. In any case, it seemed advisable to allow an interval to elapse before we again started pressing for a change in the operation plan, since we had supplied quite enough food for thought for the time being. As a result I was able to go home for Christmas. On my return to Kobolns from Lignitz I looked in at OKH in Zossen to find out what impression our draft had made. I was again assured by General V. 
Stolpnagel that they were much in agreement with our views, but that OKH was bound by an order from Hitler to leave the decision open as to where the main effort should be made. As before, it was not clear whether the commander in chief had made any mention of our recommendations to Hitler. It seemed improbable that he had done so, since I learned from Lieutenant Colonel Husinger, then GSOI of the operations branch, that V. Braukic had not been near Hitler since 5th November. In the new year, Hitler's weather boffins livened up again. The clear, frosty weather promised a fine spell which would enable the Luftwaffe to go into action, though the cold accompanied by a thick blanket of snow in the Eiffel and Ardennes was by no means propitious to armor. At all events, Hitler again issued the code word which set the troops moving into their final assembly areas for the offensive. Undeterred by this, we sent OKH one more memorandum on 12th January. It bore the title Western Offensive and again set forth the views we had so often expressed on the need to aim at a decisive victory. Although there could be no question of changing the operation order at that particular juncture, we felt that once the actual operation had started our views would still have to be taken into consideration. In any case, the order to start the offensive had been countermanded so many times already that it was reasonable to hope for a repetition that would still leave us time to get the plan fundamentally changed. To achieve that, however, we had to remove the stumbling block which to date had prevented our own plan from being accepted. Where did this lie? According to what OKH had told us, it lay with Hitler. OKH had repeatedly emphasized that though largely in agreement with our views, it was under orders from Hitler not to fix the focal point of the attack until the operations were underway. But had OKH in fact ever apprised Hitler of our plan, which differed so radically from its own version? Would it not be possible to convince Hitler if only he could be shown a plan directed not merely at limited objectives but actually visualizing something which, as far as we could see, neither he nor the heads of OKH had seriously considered to date the possibility of conclusive victory in the West. To get this clarified once and for all, the memorandum was accompanied by a letter from Colonel General V. Rundstedt ending with the following sentence now that this army group has been informed that the Führer and Supreme Commander has retained overall control of the operations by reserving the right to decide where the main effort will be made, that is that OKH is not free to make its own operational decision, I request that this memorandum be submitted to the Führer in person. Signed, V. Rundstedt. This demand, which was made at my suggestion and to which the general had immediately been ready to append his signature, did, to a certain extent, contravene German military tradition, which prescribed that only the commander in chief of the army or his chief of staff were competent to make recommendations to the supreme commander. However, if OKH really agreed with our views, there was nothing to stop it taking up our operation plan and submitting it to Hitler on its own initiative. 5. This would have given it an opportunity of impressing him, and possibly of rehabilitating itself as the ultimate authority in all matters affecting land operations. No one would have been more pleased to see this happen than myself, as one who had striven so much with Colonel General V. Fritsch and General Beck to give OKH this standing during my period of office as obiquati Mr. I. If, on the other hand, OKH had already made an unsuccessful attempt to get proposals in line with our own accepted by Hitler, the submission of a plan initiated by Colonel General V. Rundstedt, of whom Hitler held so high an opinion would have considerably strengthened its position. Perhaps it would then still have been possible to dissuade Hitler from making the location of the main effort dependent on the course of operations. This also we had been led to believe by OKH was now the main obstacle to the realization of our policy. The answer we received to this memorandum was disappointing. It said we were mistaken in supposing that OKH sought only limited objectives, as others were to be fixed in due course. Provision had been made for assigning Army Group extra forces and an additional Army headquarters, but the actual timing must rest with the Commander in Chief of the Army. There was, we were told, no occasion to show Hitler our memorandum, 
with which the Commander-in-Chief was substantially in agreement. This assurance of the Commander-in-Chief's agreement could still not close our eyes to his unwillingness to advocate to Hitler the fundamental changes which we recommended in the Operation Plan. On the contrary, the Operation Order remained in force in its previous form. The outcome of the battle in Belgium was still to be sought by the frontal push of Army Group B where the main effort would continue to be concentrated for at least the first phase of the offensive. Army Group remained responsible for protecting this operation. Nothing was done about broadening its task to include a drive towards the lower Somme and round the back of the enemy forces being tackled frontally by Army Group B in northern Belgium. Any eventual shift in the main weight of the German offensive remained dependent on the progress of operations. Army Group A was not given the armor which, according to our own scheme of operations, must be under command from the outset if there were to be any hope of achieving surprise in southern Belgium and driving round behind the enemy in the direction of the Somme estuary. Neither was the army group to enjoy the security of having an additional army, necessary though this would be for any offensive action to cover our thrust against the anticipated enemy counterblow. In other words, we were sticking to that irreparable error in the first stages of deployment. Those responsible did not want to commit themselves to an operation which General Jodl described in February 1940 as a roundabout road on which the god of war might catch us. Quite unconsciously, the German and Allied high commands had agreed that it was safer to attack each other head on in northern Belgium than to become involved in a venturesome operation on the German side by accepting the plan of Army Group A on the Allied side by avoiding a conclusive battle in Belgium in order to deal a punishing blow to the southern flank of the German offensive. Meanwhile something had occurred which many people have since held to be the decisive factor responsible for the fundamental changes which were later made to the operation plan to bring it into line with the recommendations of Army Group A. The GSOI of 7 Airborne Division had made an accidental landing on Belgian territory, as a result of which at least part of First Air Fleet's operation order fell into Belgian hands. One had to assume that the Western powers would learn, through Belgium, of the operation plan existing to date. In point of fact this misfortune did not lead to any alteration of the operation plan, though it may well have increased the readiness of Hitler and OKH to entertain our army group's proposals later on. As it was, a Commander-in-Chief's conference in Bad Godesburg on 25 January of the Generals Commanding Army Groups U and B and their subordinate armies revealed no change in OKH's basic attitude. Though the meeting took place some considerable time after the mishap in question, the tasks of the Army Groups and Armies remained the same as before. Army Group B's role was now merely expanded to allow for its 18th Army to occupy the whole of Holland and not as had previously been intended only those parts of the country lying outside the so-called Fortress of Holland. As far as Army Group A was concerned, everything remained as before. Though we were able to get 2nd Army HQ brought into our area, it remained, like 14 motorized corps, at the disposal of OKH despite my having pointed out, on my commander's instructions, that sending 19 Panzer Corps through the Ardennes on its own would not bring us success at Sedan now that the enemy had assembled considerable forces, 2nd French Army, on the Meuse, v. Braukich still refused to place it under our command. This showed that the Supreme Command was just as determined as ever not to shift the main effort until it became clear what course the operations were taking. It also proved that the loss of the operation order to the Belgians had done nothing to change the minds of those at the top. Nevertheless, Army Group HQ followed up these representations to OKH on 25th January by a further memorandum five days later based on enemy intelligence we had received in the meantime. We pointed out that strong French forces, particularly mechanized units could henceforth be expected to be thrown into southern Belgium. In these circumstances there was no point in hoping that 19 Panzer Corps would alone be strong enough either to overcome this enemy grouping or to force a crossing of the river. Our view was corroborated by a sand table exercise in Cobbles on 7 February at which we ran through the advance of 19 Panzer Corps and the two armies of our army group. 
it was only too plain from this how problematical the use of 19 Panzer Corps in isolation was going to be. I had the impression that General Holder, who attended the exercise as an observer, was at last beginning to realize the validity of our standpoint. Meanwhile my own fate had taken a sudden turn. On 27 January I was notified that I had been appointed commanding general of 38 Corps, the headquarters of which was about to be set up back at home. I learned from Colonel General V. Rundstedt that he had already been informed of this in confidence by the Commander-in-Chief at the conference on 25th January. The reason given was that I could no longer be passed over in any new corps appointments, as General Reinhardt, who was my junior, was also being given a corps. Though there was little or nothing about the move to distinguish it from the normal process of promotion, it still seemed strange to switch the chief of staff of an army group just when a big offensive was impending. There were, after all, other ways of solving the rank problem which supplied the pretext for this change. It can hardly be doubted, therefore, that my replacement was due to a desire on the part of OKH to be rid of an importunate nuisance who had ventured to put up an operation plan at variance with its own dot at the close of the above mentioned sand table exercise, which I had helped to run, v. Rundstedt thanked me in front of everyone present for all I had done as his chief of staff. His choice of words on this occasion reflected all the kindness and chivalry of that great commander. It was a further source of satisfaction to me that the two army commanders of our army group, Generals Bush and List, as well as General Guderian, not only deplored my removal but were genuinely dismayed by it. On 9 February I left Cobbins for Lignitz. My trusty colleagues Colonel Blumentritt and Lieutenant Colonel V. Treskow, however, had no intention of throwing up the sponge and treating my departure as the end of the struggle for I operation plan. It was Treskow, I imagine, who induced his Frenchman, Hitler's military assistant, to fix an opportunity for me to talk to Hitler personally about the way we thought the offensive in the West should be conducted. Be that as it may, on 17 February I was summoned to Berlin to report to Hitler with the other newly appointed corps commanders. Our interview was followed by a luncheon at which Hitler, as usual, did most of the talking. He showed an amazing knowledge of technical innovations in the enemy states as well as at home, and the reports of a British destroyer's raid on the Almark inside Norwegian territorial waters prompted him to dwell at length on the inability of small states to maintain their neutrality. As we were taking our leave at the end of the meal, Hitler told me to come to his study where he invited me to outline my views on the handling of the Western offensive. I am not clear whether he had already been informed of our plan by Schmunt, and, if so, in what detail. In any case I found him surprisingly quick to grasp the points which our army group had been advocating for many months past, and he entirely agreed with what I had to say. Immediately after this conversation I filed the following minute for the information of HQ Army Grouper when reporting to the Führer as commanding general of 38 Corps on 17th of February 1940, the former chief of staff of Army Grouper had an opportunity to present the Army Group's viewpoint on the conduct of the operation in the West. The substance of his statements was as follows the aim of the offensive must be to achieve decisive results on land. The political and military stakes are too high for the limited objectives defined in the present operation order, that is defeat of the largest possible elements of the enemy in Belgium and occupation of parts of the Channel Coast. Final victory on land must be the goal. The operations must therefore be directed towards winning a final decision in France and destroying France's resistance. This, contrary to what is laid down in the operation order, requires that the main point of effort be placed unequivocally on the southern wing from the start, that is with Army Group A, it cannot remain with Army Group B, nor can it be left open. Under present arrangements the best one can do is to attack the Anglo-French forces frontally as they advance into Belgium and to throw them back to the Somme, whereupon the operation may conceivably come to a standstill. If the main effort is transferred to Army Group in the south, the task of which is to drive through southern Belgium and over the Meuse in the direction of the lower Somme, the strong enemy forces expected in northern Belgium must, if thrown back by Army Group B in frontal attack, 
be cut off and destroyed? This will be possible only if Army Group drives swiftly through to the Lower Somme. That must be the first phase of the campaign. The second will be the envelopment of the whole French army with a powerful right hook. To fulfill this task, Army Group must consist of three armies. Another army must therefore be inserted on its northern flank. The northernmost army of the Army Group, second, has the task of driving across the Meuse to the Lower Somme to intercept the enemy forces retreating before Army Group B to the south of it. Another army, twelfth, must advance over the Meuse on both sides of Sedan and then swing southwest in order to smash by attack any French attempt to deploy in strength for a counter attack west of the Meuse. On the Third Army, sixteenth, will devolve the initially defensive task of covering the southern flank of the operation between the Meuse and Moselle. It is essential that the Luftwaffe smash the French troop concentrations at an early date, because if the French do attempt anything, it will be to carry out a large-scale counter-attack west or on both sides of the Meuse, possibly extending as far as the Moselle. For to send 19 Panzer Corps out on its own to force the Meuse at Sedan is to do things by halves. If the enemy comes to meet us with strong motorized forces in southern Belgium, the corps will be too weak to crush them quickly and get straight across the line of the Meuse. Conversely, if the enemy confines himself to holding the Meuse with the strong forces he has there at present, the corps will not be able to cross the river alone. If motorized forces are to lead the advance, at least two corps must cross the Meuse simultaneously at Charleville and Sedan independent of the armor directed against the Meuse that give it by 4th Army. Thus 14 Corps must be put alongside Guderian's Corps from the outset, there can be no question of making its use with Army Groups who or be conditional on future developments. The Führer indicated his agreement with the ideas put forward. Shortly afterwards, the new and final operation order was issued. Unfortunately I no longer had access to this final operation order. I only know that its issue was ordered by Hitler on 20th February. In its essentials, it satisfied the demands for which I had fought so long. It provided for colon 1. 2 Panzer Corps. The 19th under General Guderian and the 14th under General V. Wyatersheim, to lead the advance across the line of the Meuse between Charleville and Sedan. They were united under the newly created command of a Panzer Group led by General V. List. 2. The final allocation of HQ 2nd Army, previously with Army Group B, to Army Group and the provision of the requisite forces. It would now be possible to insert this army immediately space became available between the Army Group boundaries after 16th Army had wheeled south. 3. The placing of 4th Army, previously with Army Group B, under command of Army Group A to give the latter the necessary maneuverability in its advance towards the lower Somme. Army Group had consistently called for at least the southernmost core of this army in order to extend the boundaries of its own advance. Grinner is mistaken in putting the time of this change in the order of battle as far back as November. It was only implemented in pursuance of the new operation order. By these new instructions OKH implied that it fully accepted the army group's point of view. The main weight of the operation as a whole was transferred to the southern wing to the fullest extent permitted by the breadth of the ground available to us north of the Maginot Line and the road network existing there. At the same time Army Group B remained strong enough, with three armies, to discharge its task in northern Belgium and Holland with the overwhelming success now known to us. Army Group A, on the other hand, was now able to surprise the enemy by thrusting through the Ardennes and across the Meuse to the Lower Somme. In this way it could prevent the enemy forces fighting in Belgium from withdrawing behind this river. It would likewise have been possible to deal effectively with any big counterblow against the southern flank of the German offensive. As far as the execution of the German assault operation in May 1940 is concerned, I would say this the attack of Army Group B, thanks to the superiority of the German troops, and especially the armored units, had a more decisive success than one might have expected in view of the strength of the Belgian fortifications and the fact that it was compelled to attack frontally. Despite this, 
The really decisive reason for the Allies' utter defeat in northern Belgium was still the surprise thrust through the Ardennes, across the Meuse to the Somme estuary and ultimately against the Channel harbours. Apart from the energetic leadership of Colonel General V. Rundstedt, this success is, I feel, primarily due to the tremendous verve with which General Guderian translated the army group's operational principles into action. The success in northern Belgium was not as complete as it might have been. The enemy succeeded, according to Churchill's figures, in evacuating 338,226 men, 26,176 of them French, from Dunkirk though they lost all their heavy weapons and equipment in the process. This successful evacuation must be attributed to the intervention of Hitler, who twice stopped the onward sweep of our armor once during its advance to the coast and again outside Dunkirk. Three different reasons have been given for the latter order, the true effect of which was to throw a golden bridge across the channel for the British army. The first reason is that Hitler wished to spare the German armor for the second act of the French campaign in which connection Key Eitel is said to have told him that the ground around Dunkirk was bad tank country. Another reason offered is that Goring assured Hitler that the Luftwaffe was quite capable of preventing the escape from Dunkirk unaided. In view of Goring's thirst for prestige and his proclivity to boastfulness, I think it extremely probable that he did make some statement to this effect. Both arguments were wrong from the military point of view. The third reason given is that Hitler, according to reports of a conversation between him and V. Rundstedt, deliberately allowed the British to escape because he believed it would facilitate an understanding with Britain. Whatever the answer may be, Dunkirk was one of Hitler's most decisive mistakes. It hampered him in attempting the invasion of Britain and subsequently enabled the British to fight in Africa and Italy. While Hitler accepted Army Group A's idea of cutting off the enemy in northern Belgium by driving through the Ardennes to the sea and allow this to be carried out as far as the gates of Dunkirk, he did not entirely adopt its other idea of simultaneously creating a point of departure for the second phase. The German command was thus content to cover the dash of Army Group A's mechanized elements to the sea against counter-attack on either side of the Meuse by dropping off the succeeding divisions like a long string of pearls to defend the threatened southern flank. Apparently it was thought too risky that any enemy attempt to counter-attack in strength should be thwarted by immediately striking south to the west of the Meuse and thereby tearing apart the enemy front between the Meuse and Oi eyes once and for all. As was to be seen later on in the Russian campaign, Hitler had a certain instinct for operational problems, but lacked the thorough training of a military commander which enables the latter to accept considerable risks in the course of an operation because he knows he can master them. In this case, therefore, Hitler preferred the safe solution of defensive action to the bolder method suggested by Army Group. It was his good fortune that the enemy commander did not mount any big counter-offensive, though in fact the latter could well have assembled some 50 divisions for this purpose on both sides of the Meuse possibly extending as far east as the Moselle even if it had meant temporarily abandoning everything in Holland and Belgium outside the fortified zones. And so, after the first act of the German offensive had been completed, both opponents again found themselves facing each other on a continuous front running along the Maginot line to Carignan and thence along the Aisne and Lower Somme. The Germans first task was to penetrate this front all over again. That the second phase of the German offensive so soon led to the total capitulation of the enemy is primarily due to his inability, after his losses in northern Belgium adequately to man the whole of his front from the Swiss frontier to the sea. Another reason was that the morale of the French army had already been badly dented not to mention the fact that the enemy possessed nothing matching the quality of the German armoured formations. Had the Allied commander-in-chief acted as HQ Army Group a thought he should, he would have decided on a large-scale offensive on both sides of the Meuse. According to the plan of Army Group A, however, this would have been smashed while still in the assembly stage. If Army Group B, after simultaneously encircling the enemy in northern Belgium, had then wheeled forward over the lower Somme to envelop the rest of the French forces after the pattern of the Schlieffen plan, 
we should have finished up fighting a battle in the rear of the Maginot line with the fronts reversed. Dot in view of the fact that, with the exception of the British escape from Dunkirk, we ultimately gained a brilliant victory in the French theatre of war, the above observations may appear superfluous. Perhaps their only importance is to show that even if the enemy had displayed greater energy and better judgment, the new plan would still have won the campaign even allowing for the critical moments that might have occurred in the first phase between the Meuse and Moselle. 6, Commanding General, 38 Army Corps, the bystander the part one subsequently played in the execution of the Western offensive was so insignificant that I could well afford to leave it out of these memoirs altogether. My primary reason for including it is to pay grateful tribute to the bravery and extraordinary achievements of the troops who served under me at the time. Another is that the operations of 38 Corps following the Germans' successful breakthrough on the Somme will serve to illustrate a pursuit that was kept upright across the Seine and down as far as the Loire and never gave the enemy a moment's peace until his final collapse. During the months in which others continued to work on the ideas for which I had fought, I initially had the modest task of watching my corps headquarters and the ancillary signals regiment assemble in Stettin. From time to time I received instructions to inspect new divisions in the process of being set up in Pomerania and Poznan. On 10th of May 1940 I learnt of the start of the German offensive in the west over the radio in Liegnitz, where I had gone for a short leave. It goes without saying that during the next few days all my wishes and most ardent hopes were with our troops as they drove through the Ardennes. Would they succeed in racing across Luxembourg and penetrating the Belgian defences on either side of Bastogne before strong French forces could close in? Would it be possible to maintain the momentum of the armour as it went over the Meuse at Sedan and created the basis for an encirclement of the enemy's northern wing? The reader will appreciate that I was not feeling exactly grateful to the body which had banished me into the German hinterland at the very moment when the plan for which I had struggled so long and so doggedly was coming to fruition in the west. On the evening of 10th May came the order to move HQ 38 Corps up to Brunswick. From there the next move took us to Dusseldorf, where we came under command of Army Group B for the next few days I had nothing else to do but swan around inspecting the powerful Belgian positions which had fallen in the first assault on the Meuse at Maastricht and along the Albert Canal, as well as the very up-to-date Fort of Ebenemal, which had been taken in a surprise raid and was still under fire from Belgian batteries further back. I also visited Army Group B and 6th Army to brief myself on the progress of the operations. I gathered that they still had no clear picture of what the enemy ultimately proposed to do. Neither, it seemed, had OKH, since it continued to cloak its future intentions in silence and confined itself to extending the boundary between the two army groups further to the northwest. On 16th May our headquarters came under command of Army Group A and the next day I reported to my erstwhile commander, Colonel General V. Rundstedt, in Barstone. I received a most cordial welcome from him, my successor, General V. Sodenston, and the rest of my old staff, and here at last I learned how well the operation through the Ardennes and over the Meuse had progressed. Our corps was to go over to 12th Army, which would carry on with the westward drive towards the Lower Somme, whereas the new 2nd Army was to be inserted between 12th and 16th Armies with a front facing southwest. Immediately on my arrival at HQ 12th Army I experienced a piece of interference by Hitler in the conduct of military operations. Acting on Hitler's instructions, OKH sent down an order to the effect that Panzer Group Klist must not go any further than the OIs for the time being and that 12th Army was to swing southwest and go over to the defensive. Second Army was now to be inserted between 4th and 12th Armies to take over the further advance west. The reason given was that the Führer wished at all costs to avoid any German setback, however temporary, which would boost the already abysmally low morale of the French populace. 
he feared that such a setback might actually occur if 12th Army continued its envisaged drive westwards towards the Lower Somme and got caught in the flank by a French counter-attack coming up west of the Meuse from the south. In other words, the propagandist interests of the politician were already beginning to impinge upon the job of supreme commander. On the one hand it was clear that in halting Panzer Group Clist on the Oi Eyes one risked losing the chance to destroy the very enemy forces in northern Belgium which the Panzer Group was supposed to take in the rear. At the same time the order that 12th Army was to go over to the defensive on the front facing southwest meant abandoning the initiative in the area between the Meuse and Oi Eyes. As it happened, there was no reason at the time for expecting any large-scale counter-attack in this sector. As Army Group saw it, the enemy would need at least another week to bring up the forces necessary for a counter-offensive, if, indeed, he had any such plan in mind. The whole point was, however, that one of the basic propositions repeatedly put to OKH by the army group during the winter had been that an offensive solution should be found for securing the southern flank of the thrust towards the lower Somme. It was now apparent that Hitler, though not bold enough to accept a temporary risk on the southern flank of the German offensive, was already claiming the right to exercise a personal and detailed control of army operations. The fact, however, that he was able at this juncture to plead the spectre of an even temporary German setback as grounds for intervening may perhaps have been due to OKH's failure, despite the advice given earlier by the army group to insert second army into the front as soon as the first German forces had crossed the Meuse. It could go either between 4th and 12th armies to carry on with the drive for the lower Somme or between 12th and 16th armies for the offensive advance to the southwest between the Meuse and Oi Eyes. The reason for the omission cannot have been the lack of space for further divisions in the front line, since the important thing was to have an army headquarters in the line in time for the divergence which must now ensue in the direction of the thrusts. Room for more divisions would be found in due course when their zone of operations broadened out. This example only serves to show once again that no operations plan will ever be implemented to the full extent envisaged by its originators, even when no cogent grounds exist for departing from it. Even if on this occasion Hitler's interference did not seriously prejudice operations, as was subsequently the case when Panzer Group Klist was halted outside Dunkirk. The defensive role he had allotted to 12th Army still enabled the enemy to build up a new front on the AI which had to be cracked all over again in the second phase of the French campaign at the cost of some very heavy fighting. The chance of finally putting an end by offensive action to any coherent French defence in this decisive stretch of front had been needlessly sacrificed. This very point together with the encirclement of the enemy's northern wing had been one of the cornerstones of our operational recommendations to OKH in consideration of the inevitable second phase of the German offensive. Meanwhile our headquarters had been moved as far forward as the picturesque little Luxembourg town of Klerf. At this stage we ceased to be onlookers and were put in charge of a number of the divisions following in the rear of Second Army. It was a somewhat uninspiring task to be given just when the decisive defeat of the enemy's northern wing was at hand. About this time news reached me that my brother-in-law, Egbert V. Loesch, had been posted missing near Brussels as commander of a dive bomber squadron. Egbert, my wife's youngest brother but one, had lived with us for several years in Dresden and Magdeburg when he was still at school. Always my wife's favorite brother, he had grown as dear to us as a son, and his young wife was now living with us in Lignitz. For weeks to come she, her mother and my wife were tormented by worry and uncertainty, as no information was forthcoming on the fate of Igbut's aircraft and crew. The only thing known with any reasonable certainty was that they had crashed as Igbut's squadron was going into the attack. Not until after the French campaign. Was I able to have a proper investigation made, and after a long search the wreckage of the aircraft was located in the vicinity of Brussels. Inquiries with the inhabitants of a nearby village revealed that the aircraft had received a direct hit from an AA shell just as it went into its dive. Two members of the crew had managed to bail out, but both had been shot dead by Belgian troops, one while he was still floating down and the other after he had safely landed. 
my brother-in-law and the other man had died in the aircraft. On 25th May my headquarters received orders to relieve HQ-14 Panzer Corps, which General V. Clist had left behind with nine Panzer and two motorized division to secure his rear on the Lower Somme, in the Abvillamian sector. We took over on 27th May. At this stage there was still no firm front on the Lower Somme. 14 Panzer Corps 2 Motorized Division, which was to be relieved by 57 Infantry Division, was holding a bridgehead around Abville on the left or southern bank of the river. 9 Panzer Division had the same task at Amiens. The intervening ground was merely being kept under surveillance. So far the enemy, too, had been unable to bring up sufficient forces to form a new front along the Lower Somme. Our Amiens bridgehead was apparently faced by a French colonial division and some British forces and the Abville bridgehead by a British division. Our job was to hold both bridgeheads. Initially nine Panzer division and the two motorized division due to be relieved at Abville were to remain north of the Somme's mobile reserves. Shortly afterwards, however, they were quite rightly pulled up to the Channel coast to be used in the battle. The dot General V. Wyatt Asheim, commanding general of 14 Panzer Corps, had told me at the handover that he did not anticipate any large-scale enemy activity. One hour after he left, reports came in that both bridgeheads were being violently attacked and that enemy armor had appeared in each place. However, both attacks were beaten off by the afternoon after several heavy French tanks had been knocked out at Amiens and 30 light and medium British ones at Abville. Of the latter, a gunner called Bring Forth accounted for nine single-handed. He was the first private soldier I put up for the Knights Cross. Even so, I regarded these attacks as clear proof that the enemy was either hoping to get a relief force over the Somme to his hard-pressed northern wing or intending to set up a new front on the lower Somme. This confronted us with the same problem as I mentioned earlier in connection with Hitler's order for 12th Army. Ought we in the same way to remain on the defensive on the Lower Somme, or should we try to retain the initiative? The defensive solution which 14 Panzer Corps had apparently been told to adopt would unquestionably allow the enemy to build up a strong new defense line along the Lower Somme. Indeed, it was problematical whether we should even be able to hold the Amiens and Abville bridgeheads once the enemy brought up fresh forces. The two mechanized divisions provisionally left in reserve north of the Somme were most unsuitable for any battle for the bridgeheads, since they could neither be plugged into these to strengthen their defenses nor could they be employed in a counter-attack role until the enemy had actually flattened the bridgeheads, wiped out the divisions inside them and come across the Somme. The conclusion I drew from the above, and several times submitted to General V. Kludge, the commander of 4th Army of which we now formed part was that we should use both mechanized divisions, or else both infantry divisions due to replace them, to carry out a surprise river crossing between the two bridgeheads and deliver flanking attacks against the enemy forces assaulting them. What I had in mind was to fight a mobile action to the south that is forward of the river until such time as the battle in northern Belgium was over and the German northern wing could wheel forward across the Somme. Our aim should be to keep this open for it and to prevent the enemy from forming a continuous front. There was no denying, of course, that as long as the Corps fought alone action south of the river these tactics might land it in a difficult situation. It was a risk one had to accept if, in the interest of strategic continuity, we were to avoid the far from easy task of attacking a Somme front which the enemy had had time to stabilize and consolidate. Unfortunately, however, the commander of 4th Army paid no heed to our repeated representations and would not release the 2nd line divisions which were, in fact, available for a river crossing. Whether this was a personal decision or due to instructions from OKH I do not know. As a result, we had no choice but to carry on with the defense in the bridgeheads, while the enemy was left in a position to establish a continuous front along the river in between them. The fact of the matter was that people have normally only heard of defending a river from behind it or of keeping it open by means of fixed bridgeheads. The possibility of contesting a river line by fighting a mobile action in front of it is not usually mentioned in the textbooks. For the next few days the enemy kept up his attacks on the two bridgeheads and for a time the position around Amiens looked troublesome. 
A tour of the units that convinced me that everything was in order, however. A particularly prominent part in these defensive actions was played by 116 Infantry Regiment, then led by my old comrade from the 3rd Regiment of Foot Guards, the future General Helm. At Abville, on the other hand, things took a critical turn on 29th May. Here, after a series of strenuous marches, 57 Infantry Division, which had so far no experience of action, had taken over from two motorized division. Shortly after its arrival an enemy attack supported by strong British armor broke into a number of German positions and caused heavy losses not only in killed and wounded, but also, as was later discovered, in prisoners. I myself had driven out to Abville just in time to meet a German battalion which, probably through having misunderstood its orders, had evacuated its positions and was now marching back through the town. I turned it straight round again, and in due course the division was master of the situation. As General V. Kludge had actually authorized us to pull out of both bridgeheads if need be, he duly rejected a fresh request from us for permission to cross the Somme on both sides of Abville and take the enemy attacking there in a pincer. It was evident that the men at the top wished to avoid running the least risk until the battle in northern Belgium were concluded and an orderly deployment could be carried out against the new front now being formed by the enemy. It went without saying that the enemy would also make use of this interval to bring up his own reserves and establish a new front from the end of the Maginot line in the Carignan area down to the mouth of the Somme. Once already, between the Oyes and Meuse. Hitler had voluntarily surrendered the initiative, thereby enabling the enemy to form his front on the Ain. Now all attempts to retain the initiative south of the Somme had been renounced as well. Assault march to the Loire while I had been fated to be little more than an onlooker for most of the first phase of the campaign in the West, at least the second was to bring me the experience of being able to play my full part as commander of a senior formation. Our attempts to persuade our superiors to allow us to cross the Somme before the enemy organized a cohesive defense behind it had proved fruitless. The first few days of June were now devoted to preparing for the planned attack which 4th Army was due to launch early on the 5th. The sector on both sides of Abville was taken over by two corps. General Count Brockdorf. Between this and 38 Corps, General Hoth's 15 Panzer Corps was sandwiched in a daily. The Amiens bridgehead, including 9 Panzer Division, was taken over by 14 Panzer Corps, General V. Wyatersheim, which simultaneously came under command of the adjacent army. 38 Corps was thus left with a sector barely 30 miles wide on each side of Piquigny. For the first assault it had two divisions up the 46th Sudeten Infantry Division, Major General V. Hayes, on the right and the 27th Swabian Division, Lieutenant General Bergman, on the left. The 6th Westphalian Division, Major General V. B. Gelben, was to be held in reserve to begin with, and only committed to complete the breakthrough once the leading divisions had got across the river. Of these three well-tried divisional commanders, General V. Hayes was executed after the attempt on Hitler's life on 20 July 1944, General Bergman was killed in the East, and General V. B. Gelben died during the war. Author. While the high ground on our own side undulated gently down towards the Somme and had no woods to provide any effective cover, the southern banks rose steeply and gave the enemy an ample view of our jumping off positions. However, the actual valley of the river, which was only a few hundred yards wide, concealed the two opposing front lines from each other by virtue of the numerous thickets at the water's edge. On the southern side still within the valley were several villages, notably Pili, Ailey and Piquigny, which the enemy appeared to have occupied in strength. Like most French villages, they had massive houses and walls that offered excellent strong points to any defender. Up on the high ground behind the steep southern bank, in the rear of the enemy's defense zone, there were more villages and a number of sizable woods affording the enemy useful centers of resistance and cover for his artillery. Our corps was now faced by two French divisions, an agro-colonial division and the 13, Alsatian, division. 
intelligence reports, indicated that the enemy's artillery was certainly no weaker than our own numerically, and possibly even stronger. In view of the type of ground and the ratio of forces involved, I felt our attack would best succeed if we utilized the element of surprise. Our own artillery was thus ordered to remain completely silent until the assault began. Only then was maximum fire to be put down on the southern bank and the villages down in the valley in order to eliminate all opposition to the actual river crossing. The infantry of both our divisions had been moved up into the riverside undergrowth the night before the attack, complete with rubber dinghies, pontoons, and gang boards. Their mission was to effect a surprise crossing at first light and bypass the villages. The river crossing at dawn on 5th June succeeded along the entire front taking the enemy completely unawares. Then, however, his resistance came to life again up on the escarpment and in the villages by the river. The enemy fought bravely the Negroes with their characteristic bloodthirstiness and contempt for human life, the Alsatians with the toughness one had to expect from this alemannic people, who had furnished Germany with so many good soldiers in World War I. It was really tragic to meet these German lads as foes in the present fighting. When I talked to the prisoners, many of them told me not without pride that their fathers had served in the German army, the guards or the Imperial Navy. It all put me in mind of the numerous Alsatian recruits I had trained myself in the Third Foot Guards, most of them, like my range estimator of those days, Lance Corporal de Cheng being excellent soldiers. I had watched the start of the attack from my corps command post in a copse fairly near to the front. As soon as we were satisfied that the crossing had been generally successful, I went forward in my car. Now the struggle for possession of the commanding heights in the riverside villages started. One thing that struck us was the relative inactivity of the enemy artillery, which was quite out of proportion to the number of batteries we had identified. Obviously the French gunners were still far too maginate minded. Their shooting was not adaptable enough and their speed in putting down strong concentrations of fire fell far short of the standard required in a war of movement. What was more, they had not developed forward observation technique to anything like the same extent as we had, nor were there specialists in this field of the same quality as our own observation battalions. As is so easy, the victor of 1918 had apparently been resting on his laurels much too long. It was, at all events, a pleasant surprise as far as we were concerned to find that the effect of the enemy artillery was not remotely comparable with that experienced in the static conditions of World War I. All the same, my own crossing of the Somme Flats proved somewhat ticklish, since the recently erected emergency bridge was still within range of the enemy in the village of Brilly. Nevertheless, I managed to get through quite safely to 63 Infantry Regiment of 27 Division which, led by its excellent commander, Colonel Grinner, had just taken the opposing heights though not without heavy losses. What struck me as particularly admirable was the composure of the wounded, who were having to wait in the dead ground for vehicles which could not evacuate them at this early stage. Next I went back over the Somme to make my way via another crossing point to 40 infantry regiment of the same division, which had gone in on the left wing of the corps. It was pinned down in front of Nilly Wood, which fell largely within the sector of the neighboring 14 Panzer Corps and was still held by the enemy. Here, too, I fear, quite considerable losses had occurred, since the regiment was under fire from behind from the village of Ailey, which was still in enemy hands. Despite this, the high ground commanding the valley had been captured here, too. 46 Infantry Division, on the right, had likewise made a successful crossing and was now in possession of the opposing heights. One could thus feel satisfied with the first day's results, even though the fighting for the riverside villages lasted well into the night. As for the corps on each side of us, 15 Panzer Corps was also across the river, but could make no headway for some time, owing to the fact that the enemy was fighting hard for a large-sized locality called Arrains and thereby blocking the road indispensable to the armoured vehicles. On our left, 14 Panzer Corps, which had attacked from the Amiens bridgehead after a preparatory bombardment, appeared to have met with a serious hold-up because of enemy minefields. 
for this reason it was directed to attack southwards, with the result that we were out of touch with it for the remainder of our advance. The attack of 5th June had gained us so much space south of the river that it was possible to bring the first batteries over during the night. However, it was still not clear whether the enemy would admit his defeat or try to continue his tough resistance further back. In such situations there tends to be a complete lack of intelligence on a vital question like this. A veil of uncertainty the one unvarying factor in war had descended on the enemy's location and intentions. Any over hastiness at such a time can lead to severe setbacks, whereas a delay of even a few hours may enable the enemy to build up a new front that will cause another round of heavy losses. The field commander whose reaction here is to wait for unimpeachable intelligence reports to clarify the situation has little hope of being smiled upon by the goddess of war. In the very early hours of 6 June, therefore, I drove out to the command post of 46 Division which had meanwhile moved over to the south bank of the river. Finding everyone there obviously still half asleep after the strenuous events of the previous day, I pointed out the necessity of immediately taking up the pursuit, since the division appeared to have no direct contact with the enemy. With that I drove out to the division's forward areas, where, finding units of 42 regiment without orders despite the audible din of combat out to their front, I set about getting them on the move. Next I paid a visit to the right-hand regiment of the corps. Though in fact ready to go forward, it was waiting to see what effect the artillery had on the village of Koizi to its front and the adjacent high ground and wood perimeter. Reconnaissance reports were not available. As I had the impression that neither the village nor the high ground and woods were any longer occupied. I ordered the regimental commander to start advancing on the broad front, but in well dispersed groups. If there really were enemy still out there, they would duly show themselves and be beaten down by the artillery, which was being held in readiness. As long as it advanced in the pattern I had ordered, moreover, the regiment need have no fear of heavy losses. Since the commander evidently harbored strong doubts about my appreciation of the situation, I went on ahead in my Q-Bell wagon. Six at the entry to Koizi we found the way barred by a barricade, but it was unmanned. From inside the village occasional shots could be heard, evidently fired by stragglers. After a brief observation, we drove into the village and found that it had indeed been evacuated, as had the high ground and the forward edge of the nearby woods. With this information in my pocket I returned to the regiment, which was now ready to advance, and suggested that they make arrangements to do their own reconnoitering in future. Although corps commanders are not meant to do the work of scouting patrols, I felt it necessary in the circumstances to set a drastic example, particularly as the fighting troops did not know me yet and I was convinced that the effectiveness of a pursuit depended on the initiative of the commanders. I was delighted to see how my ADC, Lieutenant V. Schwerdner, and my young driver, Sergeant Nagel, enjoyed this unexpected reconnaissance trip. During the afternoon, I visited two regiments of 27 Division which were engaged in attacking the village of Sazimont. Somewhat unintentionally, I found myself in the very front line, talking to a company commander. After briefing me on the situation, he apparently saw no reason why he should not take advantage of the presence of a high ranking officer and got me flat on my belly to spread out my big situation map and give him a detailed account of the battle as I knew it. Only after I had quenched his thirst for information could I start back for core, taking with me a wounded man who had likewise shown a burning interest in my account of the situation. Fortunately the return trip was quite short, my tactical headquarters having meanwhile been moved up into a small wood near the front. On 7th June 6th Infantry Division which had already been brought over the river the day before, was committed to battle on the core extreme right. These sturdy Westphalians who have always been good soldiers showed admirable Ellen, and when I drove out to see the division in the course of the afternoon I found the steep depression of the Poix sector, which could actually have served the enemy as a useful support already captured. The small town of Poix in our hands and the regiment busy attacking a village on the far side of the sector. Nonetheless, 
Poix and the approach road which ran into it were under very uncomfortable fire from long-range artillery. Some light relief was provided when the driver of an ammunition lorry, finding himself halted by the shell fire, chose to dive for cover under that very same vehicle, despite its cargo of shells. That afternoon I was to see a regiment of 46 Division which was pinned down in front of the Poix sector. It, too, managed to cross by evening, after establishing the necessary liaison with the heavy weapons and artillery, which had presumably been lacking in the first instance. 27 Division, which had had to bear the brunt of the fighting, could now be assigned to the second line, for the pursuit was undoubtedly well into its stride. Its place on the left flank of the corps was to be taken by the newly allocated 1 Cavalry Division. 8th June saw a continuation of the pursuit, with the Westphalians still setting the pace. 46th Division reported a concentration of 100 tanks, against which a dive bomber attack was ordered. Unfortunately, nothing came of an order to the division to take advantage of this opportunity to seize the tanks. They vanished although swift action would probably have produced the desired result. The course of the fighting on 7th and 8th June left Corps HQ with the impression that our hard-hit opponent was no longer able to offer anything more than localized and temporary resistance in the open field. It could be assumed that he would try to get what forces he still possessed safely back behind the lower reaches of the Seine. There, with the help of any reserves he might have, he would in all likelihood renew his attempts to fight back. As far as the Corps was concerned, therefore, everything depended on our moving in quickly to force our way across the river before the enemy had the time or opportunity to organize a defense. So although the Corps was still about 45 miles from the Seine on the evening of 8 June, orders were given to the leading divisions to have their motorized spearheads not only up to the river but actually across it by the following day. The main body of infantry and horse-drawn artillery was to follow at the highest speed they could march so that they, too, reached the Seine on 9 June. Sixth Division was directed towards the crossing at Le Andlis, 46th Division to that at Vernon. This was an extraordinary feat to expect from troops who had been engaged in a running fight with the enemy for four days past, but there happened to be moments in war when a senior commander must impose the most severe demands if he is to avoid flinging away an opportunity for which his troops may have to fight all the harder later on. In this case, moreover, the overall operation argued in favor of taking swift action. So far the French seemed determined to defend Paris. There were strong enemy forces stationed in the metropolitan defense system running from the Oyeis to the Marne far north of the city. If the Seine could be crossed below Paris, the defenses in question would be lifted off their hinges and the forces manning them would have no alternative but to withdraw hastily from the city to avoid being cut off. Thus the situation of the Corps dictated high demands on the troops. It required commanders at all levels to display the utmost initiative and to act with the greatest possible speed. An opportunity as favorable as this must be seized with both hands. From the early morning till the late evening of 9th June, I was out on the road ensuring that the forward divisions of the Corps reached the objectives assigned to them. It was a pleasure to note that despite what they had already been through, our infantry were cheerfully prepared to go to the limits of endurance to attain their goal. The same dot naturally the usual frictions occurred, although in the case of 6th Division everything went off very smoothly. Early in the morning I had met the two divisional commanders and then paid a visit to 46th Division. When I subsequently arrived at 6th Division's crossing place by Leandlis about noon I discovered that the reconnaissance battalion had by now reached the river and that the divisional staff were already preparing for the crossing, which was due to take place that afternoon. Unfortunately the bridge had been blown by the time the reconnaissance troops arrived. The picturesque little town of Le Andlis, perched high on a cliff, was burning from a dive bomber raid which, since it gave advance notice of our arrival, we had not in the least desired. One or two difficulties did crop up in the case of 46 Division, however. First of all, it had moved off three hours later than was expected. By the time I returned to it after visiting 6th Division it had lost all contact with its reconnaissance battalion, and the latter, 
wherever else it might be, was certainly not at the Seine, like that of 6th Division. There was nothing for it but to suggest to the commander of 46th Division that he meet me early that evening at Vernon, his crossing place. He might, I added, at least bring his missing reconnaissance battalion along with him. Meanwhile, I returned to Le Andlis, where I found six divisions crossing in progress at three points in the face of only weak opposition. The infantry and horse drawn artillery had strained every nerve to reach the Seine in good time. On returning to Vernon about seven in the evening, I found that the divisional commander and his reconnaissance battalion really had arrived. Here, too, unfortunately, the enemy had had time to destroy the bridge. As Vernon was under rather fierce machine gun fire from the south bank of the river, I directed that the reconnaissance troops should cross at night under the cover of darkness. During this turbulent chase I had been unable to employ one cavalry division which had meantime arrived in the core area as I would have liked. It was still too far back and the army had let me have it only on the express understanding that I committed it on the OIs to cover the army's left flank against any threat from Paris. Incidentally, the division reported that it had been attacked still far to the rear of my advance divisions by strong enemy armoured forces. These were clearly the tanks that had previously given 46th Division the slip and were now marauding in our extended flank. When, after a short night's sleep, I returned to Vernon in the early hours of 10th of June, 46th Division, too, had got its first elements across the river. Thus 38 Corps was the first to have established a firm foothold on the south bank. The troops had every right to be proud of the pursuit they had accomplished, and I, for my own part, was happy to know that swift action had probably spared the Corps a hard struggle for the same crossings. 38 Corps position was no enviable one all the same. It stood alone on the south bank of the river. Fifteen Corps on its right had not reached the Seine until 10th June, and had then been diverted to Louvre. Two Corps, which was following behind, was still some distance away. On the left flank loomed the big question mark of Paris, where any number of the enemy might be hidden. What was more, 38 Corps needed another two days to lift all its forces over the river. The two weak pontoon bridges at Le Andlis and Vernon were the object of repeated attacks by the RAF, which did in fact succeed in putting the one at Vernon out of action for a time. If the enemy commander still had any reserves available on this wing and could bring himself to take the initiative, 38 Corps in its isolation south of the river would inevitably be their target. The commander of 4th Army, Colonel General V. Kludge had told me at the start of the offensive that the operational objective set him by OKH was to gain bridgeheads south of the Seine. Even if it were the Supreme Command's aim to decide this second phase of the French campaign not as I had envisaged, by a strong north wing wheeling round to the west of Paris on the lines of the Schlieffen plan but most successfully, as it turned out by a southward thrust of massed armour to the east of Paris, the mission allotted to Fourth Army still seemed a most inadequate one for even if the thrust east of Paris were intended to be the decisive action, with Army Group C's breakthrough attacks on the Maginot Line and Army Group B's advance over the lower Somme ranking as perhaps only secondary undertakings, it was necessary that we retain the initiative. Army Group A did not start its drive across the AI until 9th June, and it still remained to be seen whether this would bring the decisive success expected of it. At the same time one had to assume that the enemy also with the Schlieffen plan in mind would not overlook the danger of our executing an extensive outflanking movement across the lower Seine and would duly take his own countermeasures. This gave us all the more reason for retaining the initiative on the right wing of the German armies and not leaving the enemy any time to deploy here for either defence or counterattack. If, then, Fourth Army's strategic role as I saw it gave reason for pressing on with the attacks south of the river, it seemed wrong to me that 38 Corps should sit in a bridgehead and wait for the enemy to amass what might prove to be superior forces against it. I thus asked the army for permission to attack southwards as soon as my corps artillery were across the river, instead of holding the bridgehead which we had meanwhile expanded to the Eura. As a precaution, 27 Infantry Division. 2, 
had been brought over to the south bank of the Seine. On NTH June, moreover, I requested approval to bring one cavalry division south of the Seine from its position on the Oyeis, where it had that very day scored in each success against the enemy armor mentioned above. In the circumstances I found it entirely natural that the one cavalry division we possessed should form the spearhead of the pursuit. My intention was to use it to bar the railway lines and roads to Paris at the earliest possible date. Unfortunately my proposals were turned down on the grounds that the army must first await instructions on its future actions, one cavalry division was then taken away from me and placed under command of one corps in the second line of advance, with orders to continue guarding the Oyeye's flank and in any case to remain north of the Seine. And so, to my intense regret, this fine division was deprived of the one role that would have corresponded to its special character. Two incidents on the evening of 11th June served, in my opinion, to vindicate the requests we had made. 58 Infantry Regiment of 6 Division shot down an enemy pilot who was found to be carrying documents indicating that an extensive withdrawal had been ordered. Secondly, 46 Division reported that it was being subjected to a strong attack by the enemy's tanks a sign that he found our presence south of the river most disagreeable. Further inactivity on our part could only improve the position as far as he was concerned. 46 Division beat off the attack the same evening, though the losses it suffered in the process were not inconsiderable. Early next day it reported that the enemy to its front was again preparing to attack. The number of tanks it named was 110, and urgently appealed for help. I resolved to go over to the attack on my own initiative with all three divisions. Hardly had the orders to this effect been issued, however, when the army commander himself appeared. While agreeing with my decision, he felt he must still bide his time in the absence of any fresh operational directives from OKH. His main anxiety was obviously that I might set off with my corps on my own. Consequently he gave strict orders that the attack must not go beyond the line of Ruxpacy. To make doubly sure, this was reiterated in army orders the same evening. While the attack of 27 Division on the left made good progress. 46 Division reported that it was not yet able to get started because it had insufficient artillery, ammunition and rations on the south bank. Even so, it had repelled the tank attacks though the number involved had proved to be not more than 50 or 60. The next few days were again a period of pursuit, two corps crossing the Seine to our right on 13th June. That day we put up at a little chateau belonging to the well-known novelist Colette Darville who was unfortunately away. I thus spent the night in Madame's bedroom, like the salon, it was most elegantly furnished, with a private entrance from the park presumably dating back to gayer days. The swimming pool outside was a great boon to us all. On 14th June we received a visit from the commander-in-chief. I was able to apprise him of the core successes to date, but while taking note of these, he revealed nothing about any future intentions. On 15th June, Colonel General V. Kludge informed me that 4th Army had now been given Le Mans as its objective, and stressed the need to go flat out for this without any regard for the formations on either flank. In our case, I feel, the advice was unnecessary. On 16th June, the divisions of the Corps again encountered organized resistance along the line 30 Sinokis Chaitnyev. The forces involved were elements of one, two and three mechanized divisions, which, after fighting in Flanders, had escaped through Dunkirk and disembarked again at Brest. Troops of two spy brigades and a Moroccan division were also identified. By evening enemy resistance was broken. Here, too, I was most impressed by the men of 6th Division when I visited the latter during my tour of the divisions. That evening we received an army order fixing Le Mans Angus as our axis of advance. One corps was to be phased in on our left, taking 46th Division under command. 15 Panzer Corps, less one division earmarked to take Cherbourg, was to advance on the Lower Loire and form bridgeheads there. This seemed to be the be all and end all of it. On 17th June, the resignation of Renaud and the appointment of Marshal Badain was announced. 
Was the old man to organize resistance afresh or did the politicians intend to leave it to this renowned veteran of the First World War to sign a capitulation? An order from the Fuhrer reaching us on 18th June called for a ruthless pursuit of the enemy once again no novelty as far as we were concerned. It also ordered the occupation of the Old Reich territories of Toul, Verdun and Nancy, the Creusot works and the ports of Brest and Cherbourg. We made a forced march, one of our regiments covering almost 50 miles and a motorized reconnaissance battalion under Colonel Lindman actually getting to a point west of Le Mans. I spent the night in the medieval castle of Bonitable. With its moat and drawbridge, its four front towers with walls nine feet thick, and its ceremonial gardens flanked by two more towers at the rear, it was, next to the Loire castles I was soon to see, probably the most impressive building of its kind I came across in France. The interior, too, was splendidly furnished, and even some of the domestic staff were still in occupation. The owner, M. de Rochefoucauld, called, Duke of Dowdain, had unfortunately fled. On 19 June I drove 30 miles out to Lindemann's reconnaissance battalion without seeing a single German soldier. At Le Mans, where my grandfather had made a Victoria century 70 years before, I went over the magnificent cathedral. En route we met bodies of unarmed French troops marching east and a whole artillery regiment which had surrendered to Lindemann with its full complement of guns and vehicles. The enemy was obviously disintegrating. Despite this, I found Lindman's battalion held up on the main sector at Lined Angers. Tanks had been spotted on the far bank and machine guns had the bridge under fire. Lindman was making vain efforts to drive off the enemy with the only artillery he had, a 10 cm motorized battery. On going down to the most forward position by the river, some distance from the bridge, I discovered that except around the bridge itself the enemy was obviously not present in any great strength if indeed he were there at all. Spotting a squadron commander who was apparently waiting on the bank to see whether the enemy would now give up the bridge voluntarily, I advised him to swim across further downstream. If he wished, I added, I should be glad to go with him. The offer worked. Shortly afterwards the entire squadron naked as God made them plunged into the river and reached the far bank unscathed. The bridge was ours though by now, I fear, a number of German dead lay around the approach to it from our side. I stayed with the reconnaissance troops till they had resumed their advance on the far side of the river, and then returned to my corps command post. In view of the fact that this reconnaissance force had been held up on the Mayenne for eight hours by only a few enemy tanks and machine guns, I sent my senior aide, Lieutenant Graf, straight back to Lindman with strict orders to cross the Loire that very night. Sure enough, Graf found the troops just about to settle down to rest on our own side of the river. He carried his point, however, and the same night the battalion went over the river with Graf in command of the leading rubber dinghy. During the hours of darkness Corps HQ heard from both divisions that they had their reconnaissance troops across the Loire. I immediately went forward, and could not help being impressed, on my arrival there, by the immensity of the river. At the western crossing point, in grids, there was a powerful current running, and the distance from bank to bank measured close on 600 yards. Two arches of the high bridge had been blown, and the intervening gap was to be closed by a pontoon bridge. To compensate for a difference in height of almost 30 feet, a steep ramp had to be installed. Since it proved hazardous enough to drive up this even in a cube L wagon, all the heavy types of vehicles still had to be ferried across, no easy task in view of the breadth of the river, the strong current and the numerous sandbanks. The position was simpler at Chillon, the other crossing point, for here the river split into three tributaries. The bridges over the two northern branches had fallen into our hands intact, leaving us only a stretch of 160 yards to span. At this spot I was to witness a most unusual duel. While the only French troops to be seen on the opposite bank during the morning had been unarmed, heavy tanks subsequently showed up there in the course of the afternoon. The forces we had ferried so far had been unable to halt them, since they still had no means of getting any guns across. So, 
From a position by the Chillen Bridge, I saw an 88mm German AA gun and a heavy French tank come into position simultaneously on opposite sides of the river and open fire on one another at the very same instant. Unfortunately our own gun was immediately knocked out. The very next moment, however, its place was taken by a light anti-tank gun, which was lucky enough to score a direct hit on the one weak spot in front of the enemy 32-tonner. The latter immediately burst into flames. That evening I moved into the castle of Sirent near Chillen. It was an imposing building of tremendous size, flanked by massive towers and arranged in the form of a horseshoe around ceremonial gardens. Round it all flowed a moat. The castle belonged to the Duke de la Trimouille, Prince Tatar and one of the leading names of ancient France. The dukes had gained the latter title by marriage in about 1500 as the hereditary right of the Anjou family in Naples. They did not, however, win the Neapolitan throne, of which Ferdinand the Catholic took possession. Together with Bayard, a Trimouille had the sole right to the title of Chevalier sans pret sans reproc. In addition to the wonderful library, the castle contained a wealth of historical mementos, including many from the days when its masters were supporters of the Stuarts. The ground floor was closed, as this was one of the castles being used to store the furniture from the Palace of Versailles. I myself occupied an upstairs room in one of the towers, fully furnished for a grand lever, with a bed of state under a 25-foot high canopy. Adjoining it was an equally splendid dressing room with a wonderful coffered ceiling in barrel vaulting. The castle, the outer walls of which were coated in white sandstone and the towers built of pebbles, lay in a huge park. A magnificent staircase under an arched renaissance ceiling led up to the chambers on the first floor, a number of which were beautifully panelled and hung with paintings and the most delightful goblin tapestries. It goes without saying that here as in all other quarters we occupied. The owner's property was respected and treated with the most scrupulous care. By 22nd June we had succeeded in getting six and twenty-seven divisions over the war. Their reconnaissance units pressed a little further still to accept the surrender of countless French troops. On 23rd June we learnt that an armistice had been signed in Compton the previous day. The French campaign was over. In a core order of the day I felt it proper to thank the divisions under my command none of which, I pointed out, had enjoyed the benefits of armoured protection or mechanical propulsion for their self-sacrifice, bravery and joint achievements. As the sequel to a successful assault operation they had made possible a 300-mile pursuit which had every right to be called the assault march to the Loire exclamation mark the wheel had turned. The road from Compton 1918 to Compton 1940 had been a long one. Where would it take us from here? Question mark 7. Between two campaigns the day the French laid down their arms erased one of the blackest memories in the minds of the Germans that of the surrender of 11th of November 1918, signed in Marshal Fox Railway Coach at Compton. Now France was having to sign her own capitulation at the same place and in that same coach. 22th of June 1940 marked the peak of Hitler's career. France, the threat of whose military might had hovered over Germany since 1918, was eliminated as an opponent of the Reich, just like her eastern satellites before her. Britain, even if by no means finally beaten, had been driven off the continent. And although the Soviet Union now a neighbor of the Reich constituted a latent threat in the East despite the Moscow Pact, she was hardly likely, in view of the German victories over Poland and France, to turn aggressive in the near future. If indeed the Kremlin had ever contemplated exploiting Germany's engagement in the West to carry out further expansion, it had apparently missed its chance. Evidently it had not allowed for the possibility of the Wehrmacht's winning so swift and decisive a victory over the Allied armies. That the Wehrmacht had achieved such successes in Poland and France certainly did not mean that its leaders had been working for a war of revenge ever since that first day of Kampen. Contrary to all the claims of hostile propagandists, 
The plain fact is that general staff policy in the years between 1918 and 1939 thanks to a sober appreciation of the dangers that would threaten the Reich in the event of hostilities was not to wage a war of aggression or revenge but to safeguard the security of the Reich. Admittedly, the military leaders had ultimately allowed Hitler to outmaneuver them, just as it may be said that they accepted the preeminence of politics even politics they did not agree with but could have prevented only by a coup d'apostrophe tat dot for the rest. The extent of the rearmament which Hitler had done everything possible to promote was far from being the only reason for the successes now attained. Certainly considering the state of defenselessness dictated to Germany at Versailles rearmament had been a prior necessity for the successful conduct of the war. But there could be no question of the Wehrmacht's having had anything like the preponderance which was later to be enjoyed by the Soviet Union on land and the Western powers in the air. Indeed, as far as the number of formations, tanks and guns went, the Western powers had been equal, and in some respects even superior, to the Germans. It was not weight of armaments that had decided the campaign in the West but the higher quality of the troops and better leadership on the German side. While not forgetting the immutable laws of warfare, the Wehrmacht had simply learned a thing or two since 1918. After the armistice, OKH started taking steps to demobilize a considerable number of divisions. At the same time, certain infantry divisions were to become either armored or motorized. The headquarters of 38 Corps was initially moved into the region of Sancerre on the middle reaches of the Loire, to handle the conversion of a number of these divisions. We thus exchanged the splendid castle of Sirent, filled with so many historical memories, for a smaller chateau built by the manufacturer of the world-famous coin track the summit of a steep hill overlooking the Loire Valley. Our new home was supposed to represent an ancient stronghold and had all the hallmarks of bad taste usually found in imitations of this kind. The effect was not improved by a tower near the living premises that had actually been built to look like a ruin. Nor did the little cannons along the terrace bear as much resemblance to war trophies as their owner, the liqueur manufacturer, might have hoped. The only beautiful thing about the place was the view from the top of the hill over the far-flung, fertile valley of the Loire. One indication of the parvenu mentality of the owner could be found in a big picture hanging in his study. It depicted, ranged around a circular table, the crowned heads of Europe at the turn of the century our own Kaiser, the old Emperor Franz Joseph, Queen Victoria, and so forth. Unfortunately they all looked as if they had taken more coin than was good for them. On his feet beside the table was the owner himself, triumphantly brandishing a glass of his own liqueur. The removal of this monstrosity was the one change we made in the chateau. On 19 July all Sina Wehmacht commanders were summoned to Berlin to attend the Reichstag session at which Hitler announced the end of the campaign in the West. On the same occasion he expressed the gratitude of the nation by honoring a number of high military leaders, doing so on a scale which implied that he thought the war as good as won. Natural as the German people found it to honor meritorious soldiers. We army men felt the distinctions now bestowed overstepped the bounds of necessity both in character and scope. Hitler's appointment of a dozen field marshals and one grand admiral simultaneously was bound to detract from the prestige of a rank which had previously been considered the most distinguished in Germany. Hitherto, apart from the few field marshals nominated by Kaiser Wilhelm II in peacetime, one needed to have led a campaign in person. To have won a battle or taken a fortress to qualify for this dignity. At the end of the Polish campaign, during which the commander in chief and both the army group commanders had fulfilled these requirements, Hitler had not seen fit to express his thanks to the army by making these men field marshals. Yet now he was creating a dozen simultaneously. They included, apart from the commander in chief, who had fought two brilliant campaigns. The chief of OKW, who had held neither a command nor the post of a chief of staff. Another was the Under Secretary of State for the Luftwaffe, who, valuable as his feats of organization had been, 
really could not be ranked on a par with the commander in chief of the army. The most blatant indication of Hitler's attitude was the way he raised Goring over the heads of the army and navy commanders in chief by appointing him Reich Marshal and making him the sole recipient of the Grand Cross of the Iron Cross. In the circumstances, this method of distributing the honors could only be regarded as a deliberate slight to V. Braukic, and showed all too clearly what Hitler thought of O.K.H. On the day of the Reichstag session, I learned that our core HQ was earmarked for a new role. We were moved to the Channel Coast to prepare for the invasion of England, three infantry divisions being placed under our command. Our billets were in Latuka, an elegant seaside resort near Boulogne where a number of English people owned pretty villas. While the HQ took over one of the incredibly luxurious hotels, I and my immediate staff moved into a small villa belonging to a French ship owner. Though the owner had fled, he had left his domestic staff in possession, so we found someone already installed who could run the house and look after its furniture and other contents. In contrast to what happened later in Germany, it did not occur to us to act as lords and masters who could do as they pleased with enemy property. On the contrary, a strict check was kept on houses occupied by German troops, and the removal of whole sets of furniture or the appropriation of valuables as souvenirs certainly had no place in the German army's code of behavior. When out riding one day, I passed a villa that had been left in a state of pretty average confusion by the German unit recently in occupation. The very next morning the sergeant major of the company concerned had to move in with a fatigued party and personally ensure that order was restored. As a result of the impeccable behavior of our troops, nothing happened to disturb our relations with the civil population during my six months in France. The French, for all their politeness, maintained a dignified reserve which could only earn our respect. For the rest, I suppose everyone tended to fall under the spell of that blessed land, with its beautiful scenery and wealth of monuments to an ancient culture to say nothing of the delights of a famous cuisine, and the things that were still to be had in the shops. Admittedly our purchasing power was limited, as only a percentage of a man's pay was issued in occupation currency. This regulation was strictly enforced where the army was concerned, thereby imposing a check on the natural urge to go shopping a thing most desirable for way macked prestige. Still, one had enough to make an occasional trip to Paris and pass the day savoring the charm of that city. Our stay on the coast enabled us to go bailing right up to the middle of November a pleasure which my new aide, Lieutenant Specht, my faithful driver, Nigel, and my groom, Runge enjoyed just as thoroughly as the opportunities for long gallops along the beach. On one occasion, however, we forgot about the unusual tides in the channel, where there can be as much as 26 feet difference between high and low tide. This, incidentally, proved an extremely important factor when the possibility of a landing on the English coast and the times of embarkation in the invasion harbors came under discussion. As a result, when we were already far out to sea, the waves suddenly started lapping round our Mercedes on the beach. Only in the very nick of time did we succeed in getting a tractor to tow it out of the incoming tide, through sand that had already turned very soft. But neither the joys and attractions of that beautiful country nor the period of rest after a successful campaign caused our troops to go soft, a fate to which occupation troops are usually exposed. Any tendency in that direction was counteracted by the need to train our formations for the projected invasion, a completely new task in itself. The troops had daily exercises in the dunes and neighboring Fenland, which in many respects resembled our intended landing places. After the arrival of our ferrying equipment converted Rhine and LB barges, small trawlers and motorboats we were able, in calm weather to practice embarkation and disembarkation with the navy. As often as not, when a landing craft beached clumsily, this spelt a cold bath for one or two of those taking part. The young midshipmen still had their own job to learn. One could not blame them for their lack of enthusiasm at having to command LB barges instead of serving on a smart cruiser or U-boat, 
particularly as it was not always easy to get along with the old salts who owned the barges and trawlers and stood beside them on the bridges of these rather fantastic invasion craft. Nevertheless, all personnel showed the utmost keenness in training for their unaccustomed task, and we were convinced that, like everything else, it could be mastered in due course. Operation Sea Alien. This seems to me to be a good place to include a few critical remarks on Hitler's invasion plan and the reasons that led him to abandon it. If Hitler really believed he had already won the war after the defeat of France and that it was now merely a matter of bringing this home to Britain, he could not have been more wrong. The icy indifference of the British to his peace offer which was anyway an extremely vague one showed that neither the government nor the nation were open to persuasion. And so Hitler and OKW found themselves wondering what next. Any statesman or supreme commander is liable to be faced with the same problem in wartime when an entirely new situation arises through a military setback or an unexpected development in the political field the entry of another power into the war on the side of the enemy, for example. In such circumstances he may have no choice but to throw the existing war plan overboard. At the same time one may feel inclined to blame him for overestimating his own resources and underrating the enemies or for committing an error of political judgment. But when the head of a state or a war machine has to ask himself what next? After his military operations have entirely fulfilled or, as in this case, far exceeded his expectations, leading to one enemy's defeat and causing the other to beat retreat to his island fastness, one cannot help wondering whether such a thing as a war plan ever existed on the German side. Certainly no war goes off according to a firm program set by one side or the other. But since Hitler accepted the risks of war with France and Britain in September 1939, it was his duty to consider beforehand how he should cope with these powers and various contingencies. It is quite obvious that prior to or even during the offensive in France, Germany's supreme command had no kind of war plan to determine what measures should be taken once the victories it helped for had been won. Hitler's hope was that Britain would give in. As for his military advisers, they clearly felt obliged to await a Führer's decision. The above state of affairs strikingly exemplified the inevitable outcome of the inexpedient military roof organization that had merged in Germany when Hitler assumed supreme command without creating a Reich chief of staff responsible for grand strategy. The plain fact is that, next to the head of state who made the political decisions, there was no parallel military authority empowered to take responsibility for this overall strategy. From its very inception, Hitler had relegated OKW to the status of a military secretariat. In any case, its chief, Ki Eitel, would not have been in the least capable of advising Hitler on strategy. As for the commanders in chief of the three armed services, Hitler allowed them practically no influence whatever on grand strategy. From time to time they were able to express an opinion on policy matters at personal interviews, but ultimately Hitler alone made the decisions on the basis of his own deliberations. So invariably did he insist on the right to initiate policy that except in the case of Norway, where Reda probably put up the first suggestion I know of no instance in which a fundamental decision impinging on overall war policy can be placed to the credit of any of the three service staffs. Since no one least of all OKW was authorized to draft a war plan, the effect in practice was that everyone left things to the Führer's intuition. Some, like Ki Eitel and Goring, did so in credulous adulation, others, like Braukic and Reda, in a mood of resignation. The fact that all three service staff certainly conducted their own internal studies of long-term policy made not a scrap of difference. As early as the winter of 1939-40, for example, Grand Admiral Reda made the naval operations staff examine the technical possibilities and requirements of a landing operation on the coast of England, there was still no military authority or personality, in the sense of a real chief of the general staff whom Hitler was prepared to regard not only as an expert or executive but also as being explicitly in charge of overall strategy. In the event, the result of this pattern of command was, as I have already stated, that when the campaign in the West was finished, we were confronted with the problem of what to do next. In addition to this, 
the German Supreme Command had two facts to contend with, first, the existence of an unbeaten Britain which was palpably unwilling to come to terms. Secondly, the danger of intervention by our new neighbor, the Soviet Union, however peace-loving it might be acting in the meantime. It was a threat which Hitler had indicated back in November 1939, when stressing the need to achieve a prompt decision in the West. In the light of these two facts it was clear that the Reich's most pressing task must be to end the war with Britain at the earliest possible date. Only then could one hope that Stalin had finally missed his chance to exploit the discord of the European peoples for his own expansionist ends. If no way to an understanding could be found, Germany must try to rid herself of her last opponent, England, by force of arms. It is the tragedy of that brief period in which the fate of Europe was settled for so many years to come that neither side sought any means of coming to terms on a common sense basis. What is certain is that Hitler would have preferred to avoid a life and death struggle with the British Empire because his real aims lay in the East. The way he put over his far too vague peace offer at the Reichstag session after the campaign in France, however, was hardly conducive to favorable reactions. Apart from that, it is open to doubt whether Hitler, already drunk with the belief in his own infallibility, would have been ready to accept a peace based on reason and justice even if the opposing side had seriously suggested such a thing. What is more, he was now the prisoner of his own deeds. He had handed over half of Poland and the Baltic to the Soviet Union in action he could reverse only at the cost of a new war. He had opened the way to Italy's covetous desire for territories under French sovereignty, and thereby landed himself in a state of dependency on his ally. Finally, since Prague, he had become untrustworthy in the eyes of the world and forfeited everyone's faith in whatever agreements he might subscribe to. Dot for all that, the mass of the German people would have wildly acclaimed him had Hitler presented them with a reasonable negotiated peace after the defeat of France. They were not eager to incorporate tracts of predominantly Polish territory into the Reich, nor did they feel any sympathy for those who, still dreaming of a distant past, based their claims to these lands on the fact that they had once formed part of the Holy Roman Empire. The idea of a master race whom it behoved to dominate Europe, or even the whole world, was never taken seriously in Germany except by a few party fanatics. Hitler had only to whistle his pack of propaganda enthusiasts to heal and the general approval for a reasonable peace would have been free to express itself. On the other hand, though, it may be that the British national character, so impressively incorporated in the person of Winston Churchill, prevented Britain from entertaining any serious thought of a rational settlement at that or indeed any later stage of the war. There was that admirable tenacity of the British which impels them to go through with any struggle they have once embarked on, however threatening the situation of the moment may be. On top of this, in the bitterness of their unconditional hatred for Hitler and his regime, and for Prussianism, too, in the case of several political leaders, came the inability to discern an even worse system, and an even greater menace to Europe, in the form of the Soviet Union. What also prejudiced British policy was the traditional striving for a European balance of power, the restoration of which had been Britain's ultimate motive for entering the war, since it demanded the defeat of a Germany which had become too powerful on the continent. British eyes were blind to the fact that the big need in a changed world would be to create a world balance of power in view of the might which the Soviet Union had attained and the dangers inherent in its dedication to the idea of world revolution. In addition to all this, Churchill was probably too much of a fighter. His mind was too exclusively concerned with battle and ultimate victory to see beyond this military goal into the political future. Only several years later, when the Russians were approaching the Balkans, an Ural Jack spot for Britain, did Churchill appreciate the danger of this development. By then, however, he could no longer get his way with Roosevelt and Stalin. Meanwhile he relied on the vitality of his people and the ability of the American president eventually to bring the United States into the war on Britain's side disinclined though the American people might have been at that stage, for all their dislike of Hitler to see this happen. Furthermore, a man like Churchill was hardly going to overlook the latent danger which the Soviet Union represented for Germany. As far as the war was concerned, 
he booked it on the credit side for Britain. On the other hand, the idea of seeking a settlement with Germany on the premise that this would most probably be shortly followed by a struggle for power between the two totalitarian states appears to have found no place in his reasoning. This despite the fact that a sober assessment of the strengths and weaknesses of the two powers would almost certainly have led him to deduce that neither could completely master the other and that they were much more likely to tie each other down, to their mutual debilitation, for some time to come. Such a situation would automatically have cast the Anglo-Saxon powers as world umpires to say nothing of the fact that the struggle between the two totalitarian states would probably have sealed the fate of their re gimes. In an age of dictatorships, ideologies and crusades, an age in which the emotions of the masses are whipped up by unbridled propaganda, the word reason is, I fear, never spelt with a capital R. And so, to both people's detriment and Europe's misfortune, it turned out that neither Britain nor Germany could see any practical alternative but to fight it out. Thus, the German Supreme Command's answer to the problem of what to do after the end of the campaign in the West was to continue the struggle against Britain. But the fact that, for the reasons discussed above, no war plan extending beyond the campaign in the West of the continent had ever existed on the German side was to have grave consequences. When Hitler now conceived the plan, without actually making up his mind, to tackle Britain by invasion, no practical preparations whatever had been taken to this end. In consequence we threw away our best chance of taking immediate advantage of Britain's weakness. The preparations that were only now put in train used up so much time that the success of any landing became doubtful for reasons of weather alone. This last fact, in addition to others to which we shall return in due course, gave Hitler his grounds or rather his pretext for dropping the invasion project and turning right away from Britain to strike at the Soviet Union. The outcome is well known. Before I deal with the reasons for this decisive change of front, I feel I should review the chances that would have existed had Hitler been ready to carry through the fight with Britain to the last. Three methods would have been open to us. The first would have been to try to force Britain to her knees by cutting off her supple lines from overseas. Germany's prospects here were favorable to the extent that she now had full possession of the coasts of Norway, Holland, Belgium and France as bases for air and submarine warfare. The position regarding the resources to be used in this connection was less favorable. So far, the Navy had nothing remotely approaching an adequate number of U boats, not to mention the heavy vessels, particularly aircraft carriers, which would have had to cooperate with them. In addition, it was seen that Britain's anti submarine defenses would retain the upper hand as long as we failed to put the RAF out of action. As for the Luftwaffe, the following are the tasks that would have devolved on it, I, to achieve mastery of the air at least to the extent of eliminating the RAF's ability to combat submarine warfare, 2, to paralyze the British ports, 3, to cooperate effectively with the U-boats in their attacks on enemy shipping. In practice all this amounted to overcoming the RAF and destroying its production centers. That the Luftwaffe was still not strong enough to attain this object in 1940 is shown by the Battle of Britain. Whether the outcome would have been the same if weather conditions had not been so unexpectedly unfavorable in August and September and if the German command had not turned its attention from fighting the RAF to attacking London at what might well have been a critical time for the enemy may be left undecided. At all events, it was impossible in the summer of 1940, in the light of the very limited number of German bombers available and the lack of long-range fighters speedily to fulfill the aim of overpowering the RAF and destroying its production centers. Every battle that ever had to be fought out by sheer weight of material resources has always required more time and far more forces than were originally estimated. Quick decisions in battles between more or less equal opponents are usually reached only by superior leadership, and seldom by a test of strength, as would have inevitably been the case here. We ought, therefore, to have prepared from the outset for a prolonged struggle. Just as the submarine fleet should first have been multiplied to guarantee success, 
so would similar steps have been necessary with regard to the Luftwaffe. The fact must also be faced that the idea of quickly bringing a country as large as Britain to its knees by strategic air warfare as conceived by General Duet was in those days, at any rate still wishful thinking. The same thing may be said of the Allies' aerial warfare against the Rhine later on. In any case, once it had been decided to force Britain to the ground by cutting off her maritime traffic, the whole of the Reich's war production should have been given over to building up German submarine and air strength. A reduction of the army to free manpower for industry would have been indispensable in this connection. The very length of the struggle constituted its danger. No one could know how long the Russians would stay quiet. A reduction in Germany's land forces and the commitment of her entire air power against England would enable the Soviet Union, even if it did not enter the war, at least to exert political blackmail. Another danger was the possibility that the Americans, who were hardly going to stand by and watch Britain slowly strangled, would intervene at an early stage. In a battle of air fleets and naval forces they could have intervened relatively quickly, whereas if an actual German invasion of England had been taking place they would certainly have come too late. Nevertheless had the Rye had a real strategic policy, it would have been entirely conceivable that this course of action could have been taken with a prospect of success. Always bearing in mind, of course, the danger of intervention by the Soviet Union or the United States and certainly only provided that the aim of destroying the RAF and then cutting off Britain's supply lines at sea were strictly adhered to. Any digression into vague notions of striking at the morale of the enemy population by raids on the cities would only have endangered the chances of winning. The second possible way of bringing down Britain I will call the struggle for the Mediterranean. Hitler and, indeed, the German military leadership as a whole are reproached with having been incapable of breaking free from the continental way of thinking and of never having recognized the significance of the Mediterranean as the lifeline of the British Empire. It is true, perhaps, that Hitler thought only in terms of the continent. What is open to question, though, is whether, on the one hand, the loss of her position in the Mediterranean would really have compelled Britain to give up the fight and, on the other, what consequences the conquest of the Mediterranean zone would have had for the Reich. It is indisputable that the loss of the Mediterranean would have been a serious blow for Britain. The possible effects with regard to India and the Near East, and thereby to oil supplies, might have been extremely grave. Furthermore, the final blocking of the sea to shipping would have substantially aggravated Britain's food problems. But would this blow have been lethal? To my mind it would not. Britain would still have had her link with the Far and Middle East round the Cape of Good Hope, and this could in no event be cut, unless by a close blockade of the British Isles by the U-boats and Luftwaffe in other words, by the aforementioned method. This, however, would have pinned down the Luftwaffe's entire resources, leaving nothing in hand for the Mediterranean. Painful though the loss of Gibraltar, Malta and her positions in Egypt and the Near East might well have been for Britain it would certainly not have been fatal. Indeed, the British being as they are, it would presumably have served only to stiffen their national will. The British nation would have refused to accept these losses as final and would have gone on fighting all the more bitterly. In all probability it would have given the light of the slogan about the Mediterranean being the lifeline of the empire. It is also most unlikely that the Dominions would have withdrawn their support. The second question is what consequences the critical struggle for the Mediterranean would have had for the right. The first point here is that though Italy might have made a good basis for operations, her armed forces could have provided only a very modest contribution to the contest. This did not need to be proved by events, it was already apparent. In particular, the Italian fleet could not have been expected to drive the British from the Mediterranean. The main burden of the struggle would thus have to be borne by Germany, who would not be helped by the fact that her ally regarded the Mediterranean as his private reserve and would accordingly lay claim to the overall command. If we were going to deprive Britain of her position in the Mediterranean in the hope of dealing her a mortal blow, Malta and Gibraltar would have to be taken and the British expelled from Egypt and Greece. There can hardly be any doubt that if Germany were to shift the focal point of her strategy to the Mediterranean, 
she would have had to solve this task in a military sense. But that would not have been the end of it. The capture of Gibraltar could only have been carried out either with Spanish consent which was in fact never obtained or by bringing pressure to bear on the Spaniards. Either course would have meant the end of Spanish neutrality. The Reich would have been left with no other choice than to take over with or without the agreement of Madrid and Lisbon the protection of the whole Iberian coastline, as well as to guarantee the supply of that area. Resistance could have been expected from both countries most of all from Portugal, who would have seen her colonies immediately occupied by England. Anyhow, the Iberian Peninsula would have swallowed a considerable portion of the German army in the long run and the repercussions in the USA and Latin America to a forcible occupation of Spain and Portugal could have been disastrous. If no real settlement were found with France, which was pretty well out of the question in view of the Italian and Spanish claims on her colonial territories, it would have ultimately become necessary to occupy French North Africa if a naval power like Britain were to be prevented from one day retrieving a footing in the Mediterranean. Once the British had been driven from Egypt and from Greece, Two, in the event of their moving in there it seems likely that in the eastern Mediterranean the course of action considered here would inevitably have led on to the lands of the Near East, especially if one remembers that we should have needed to cut Britain's oil supplies. The view has been expressed that the creation of a base in the Near East would have offered Germany two advantages, one, the possibility of menacing India and the other a flank position against the Soviet Union to deter it from intervening against Germany. I feel these arguments are unrealistic. Quite apart from the questionable effect the establishment of German troops in their countries would have had on the Near Eastern peoples, there are two other aspects to bear in mind. Operations against India or the Soviet Union from the Near Eastern region could, for supply reasons alone, never have been executed on a scale guaranteeing real success. By virtue of being a naval power, Britain had the bigger pull here. The appearance of Germany in the Near East, far from dissuading the Soviet Union from action against Germany, would only have made her intervene all the sooner. The crux of this whole Mediterranean problem is, to my mind, as follows Britain's loss of her positions there would hardly have sealed her fate. To go further, a decisive struggle for the mastery of the Mediterranean would ultimately have tied down such large German forces for so long that the temptation to the Soviet Union to come into the war against us would have increased beyond measure. This is all the more true if one considers that the spoils in which the Soviet Union might well have been interested the Balkans and a dominating influence in the Near East could henceforth have been won only by fighting it out with Germany. To strive for Britain's downfall by way of the Mediterranean would, in fact, have constituted a detour comparable with that taken by Napoleon when he set out to strike a mortal blow at Britain in India by way of Egypt. It was a course entailing the long-term commitment of Germany's forces in addiction that could not be decisive. More than that, it would have enabled the British motherland to rearm and at the same time given the Soviet Union its really big opening vis-à-vis -vis the Reich. In point of fact the Mediterranean method would have implied evading the decision we felt unable to achieve against the British motherland direct. This brings us to the third course at issue in 1940 that of an invasion of the island of Britain. Before we pass on to this, it should be noted with regard to our Mediterranean strategy in its practical outcome that as so often happened later on in Russia Hitler never made the right forces available at the right time. It was in any case a cardinal error on his part to refrain from attempting to take Malta, the capture of which would almost certainly have been feasible in the early stages. His failure to do so can reasonably be regarded as a factor of decisive importance in the ultimate loss of North Africa and all that followed in its drain. At all events, in June 1940 Hitler conceived the plan of invading Britain, without, as I said, making any firm decision, and ordered the appropriate preparations to be started. The operation was to be prepared under the code name C. Alien but was to be put into execution only after certain prior conditions had been fulfilled. The manner in which the execution was planned and the interminable disputes which resulted primarily between the army and navy staffs have already been dealt with by others. 
so have the reasons or pretexts which were finally to justify the abandonment of the project. All that will be done here, therefore, is to examine the three most important questions would an invasion of England have compelled her to give up the struggle and would it, assuming that it had been successful, have finally decided the issue? Could an invasion really have been expected to succeed, and what would have been the consequences of its failure? What were the reasons that ultimately led Hitler to relinquish the plan, thereby giving up the idea of forcing an issue with Britain, and to turn against the Soviet Union? The answer to the first question is that an invasion would have been the quickest way to overpower Britain. The two other ways discussed above could not bring a quick decision. But would this one have been final? The answer must be that there was every possibility even probability that even after the fall of the island the Churchill government would have tried to continue the fight from Canada. Whether the other dominions would have followed its lead cannot be told. Still, the conquest of the island itself still did not mean the complete defeat of the empire. 7 The cardinal point must surely be this, the conquest of the island by Germany would have deprived the other side of the very base that was indispensable in those days, at any rate for a seaborne assault on the continent of Europe. To launch an invasion from over the Atlantic without being able to use the island as a springboard was beyond the bounds of possibility in those days, even if the United States came into the war. And it can hardly be doubted that with Britain occupied, the RAF eliminated, the fleet banished across the Atlantic and the island's war potential rendered nugatory, Germany would have been able to deal with the situation in the Mediterranean without further ado. It must be stated, then, that even if the British government had tried to fight on after the loss of the motherland, it would have had little further prospect of winning. Would the Dominions have continued to give their support in such circumstances? Would the Soviet Union's latent threat to the Rye have been of any further consequence had the Russians no longer been able to count on a second front in the foreseeable future? Would not Stalin's reaction to this have been to turn his attentions with Hitler's agreement to Asia? Would the United States have undertaken their crusade against the Rye had they known they must bear the brunt of the cost alone? No conclusive answers to these questions can be found today nor could they be found at the time. Admittedly the Reich would have been just as unable to impose peace across the seas. Yet one thing is certain, its position following a successful invasion of Britain would have been an incomparably happier one than any to be found along the road taken by Hitler. From the military point of view, then, an invasion of Britain in the summer of 1940, provided it offered a prospect of success, would undoubtedly have been the right solution. What steps should or could, have been taken in the event of a German victory in order to bring about the negotiated peace which should always have been the aim of a rational German policy is outside the scope of this military study. Let us rather turn to the military aspects again and seek to determine whether an invasion of Britain in 1940 would have had any chance of succeeding. Opinions on this score will, I suppose, always remain divided. Sea alien certainly involved tremendous risks. Nevertheless, it is not enough to point to the vast amount of technical equipment required by the Allies for their invasion in 1944 in order to prove that a German invasion dependent on infinitely more primitive ferrying gear would have inevitably miscarried. Neither is it enough to refer to the Allies' absolute supremacy in the air and at sea in 1944 decisive though it was in both cases. While Germany had none of these things to her credit in the summer of 1940, she had, on the other hand, the decisive advantage of not initially having to face any organized defense of the British coastline in the form of troops that were adequately armed, trained and led. It is a fact that as far as her land forces went in summer 1940, Britain was to a large extent defenseless. Her defenselessness would have been well nigh complete had Hitler not allowed the BEF to escape from Dunkirk. The success of an invasion of England in the summer of 1940 depended on two factors: colon one, execution at the earliest possible date so that we could hit Britain while she was still undefended and take advantage of the summer weather. In our own experience, the Channel was almost invariably as calm as a mill pond in July and August and at the beginning of September. Two. 
our ability to neutralize the RAF and British fleet in the Channel area for the duration of the crossing and the period immediately following it. At the same time it is true that, with our uncertainty regarding the weather and the Luftwaffe's ability to gain air superiority over the Channel to at least the extent demanded, Sea Alien was bound to involve very big risks. In the light of these risks the responsible way Macht staffs probably did go about the operation with some hesitation and various mental reservations. That Hitler's own heart was not in it was clear even then. At all levels the preparations lacked the driving force from the top which was usually so apparent. General Jodl, chief of the combined services operations staff, regarded any attempt at invasion as an act of desperation quite unwarranted by the situation as a whole. The commander-in-chief of the Luftwaffe, Göring, whom the high command had as usual failed to keep firmly in check, in no way regarded his air offensive against Britain as an integral part vital though it was of a concerted invasion undertaken by the Wehrmacht. On the contrary, the way he committed and ultimately squandered the Luftwaffe's resources points to his having regarded the air offensive against the island as a self-contained operation, which he conducted accordingly. The naval high command, which had been the first authority to raise the question of an invasion of Britain, had at least concluded from its study of the practical problems involved that the operation would be feasible provided certain advance requirements were met. Despite this, it was probably more strongly affected than anyone else by its awareness of the inadequacy of its equipment. The body taking the most positive view was undoubtedly the high command of the army, although it does not seem to have contemplated the idea of an invasion prior to the fall of France. One thing is certain. Those who stood to risk their necks first and foremost if sea alien were put into execution the army formations earmarked to take part were the very ones to display the greatest energy and assurance in their pursuit of the preparations. I feel entitled to say this because the formation under my own command, 38 Corps, was designed to go over in the first wave from between Boulogne and Etapels to the stretch of coast running from Beggs Hill to Beachy Head. Without underrating the dangers, we were confident of success. At the same time we may not have been sufficiently aware of the misgivings of the two other services, especially the Navy. It is well known that Hitler had two reasons or pretexts for finally dropping the sea alien plan. One was the fact that the preparations took so long that the first wave could not have crossed till 24 September at the earliest. This was a date by which it would no longer be possible even assuming that the first wave succeeded to count on the continuing stretch of fine weather necessary for the follow-up. The second and really decisive reason is the fact that even by this date the Luftwaffe had not attained the requisite air supremacy over British territory. Even if these two facts are accepted as having in September 1940 been grounds for calling off the invasion, that still does not establish whether a German invasion would not have been possible had the German command handled matters differently. This, however, must be the whole basis of any appraisal of Hitler's decision to avoid a fight to the death with Britain in order to turn on the Soviet Union. The problem is, then, whether the two above mentioned facts, the delay over the launching of Sea Alien and the inconclusive state of the Battle of Britain were inevitable or not. As far as the first is concerned, the postponement of the landing date till the end of September this could most certainly have been avoided. The existence of a war plan focused on the problem of defeating Britain would have meant that a considerable part of the technical preparations for the invasion could have been tackled while the campaign in the West was still in progress. The existence of such a plan would have made it unthinkable for Hitler whatever his motives to allow the BEF to escape from Dunkirk. At its worst the landing date would not have been retarded until well into the autumn had the German decision to invade Britain been taken at least at the time of the fall of France that is, in mid-June and not a whole month later, in mid-July. The invasion preparations carried out as they were in pursuance of the order issued in July and within the limits of what was humanly possible at the time, were completed by the middle of September. A decision four weeks earlier would thus have made it possible to cross the channel by the middle of August. As for the unsatisfactory progress of the Battle of Britain that formed the second reason for the abandonment of Sea Alien, 
The following points come to mind the idea of gaining air supremacy over Britain by dint of an isolated aerial war commencing weeks in advance of the earliest possible invasion date was an error of leadership. By gaining air supremacy over Britain before the invasion took place it was proposed to guarantee the success of the latter. All this achieved in the event was a premature dissipation of the Luftwaffe's strength in a battle fought under unfavorable conditions. A sober assessment of its own strength in relation to the enemies should at least have given the Luftwaffe staff strong doubts whether its own forces were adequate or suitable to carry the action against the RAF and its production centers to a decisive conclusion above Britain herself. First of all, the Luftwaffe leadership underrated the strength of fighter command and overestimated the effect of its own bombers, besides allowing itself to be surprised by the existence of an efficient radar system on the other side. In addition, the range and penetration zone of the bombers, and even more so that of the fighters, were known to be below what was required. As a result the RAF was able to dodge the annihilating blows that were aimed at it. Quite apart from this, the German fighters over England invariably had to operate under less favorable conditions than their opponents. The bombers, for their own part, had in a great number of cases to manage without proper fighter cover as soon as they outranged their escorts. This consideration alone should have decided the Luftwaffe command against starting a showdown with the RAF until the latter were compelled to join battle under similar conditions that as over the Channel or its coastlines in immediate operational conjunction with the actual invasion. Finally, the German command committed the further error of altering the operational target of its air offensive at the very moment when despite the Luftwaffe's handicaps, some foreseeable, some unexpected, vis-à-vis -vis the RAF the outcome was actually in the balance. On 7 September the main weight of the attacks was shifted to London a target which no longer had any operational bearing on the invasion preparations. Desirable though the attainment of air supremacy prior to the invasion always was, a careful review of all the factors involved should still have prompted the German Supreme Command to commit the Luftwaffe for its decisive blow only in immediate conjunction with the invasion. One can, of course, object that on this basis the Luftwaffe's resources would have been called upon to perform too many tasks, namely to attack British air bases in the south of England semicolon to cover the embarkation in the French harbours semicolon to protect the transports as they crossed the channel semicolon to support the first wave of invasion troops during their landing semicolon and, in cooperation with the navy and coastal artillery to prevent the British fleet from interfering. But not all these tasks would have been simultaneous, even if they had to be solved in close succession. For example, the British fleet, apart from the light naval forces stationed in harbours in the south of England could probably not have intervened until after the first wave of troops had landed. Everything would have depended on the outcome of a big aerial battle which would have started over the Channel or southern England as soon as the army and navy began invading. The conditions experienced by the Luftwaffe in this battle would, nevertheless, have been immeasurably more favorable than in its raids on the interior of the country. Naturally, such a mode of action meant staking everything on one card. That, however, would have been the price one was bound to pay in the circumstances if the invasion were to be risked at all. When Hitler, for the above mentioned reasons, virtually discarded the plan for an invasion of England in September 1940, these reasons may indeed have been cogent enough at the time. The fact that they could emerge at all was due to the absence of any authority inside the German Supreme Command except for Hitler the politician that was responsible for overall strategic policy. There was no authority that could in good time have worked out a war plan to include Britain and been capable of effectively directing the invasion as a unified operation of all three services. If the German command thus cast away its chances of fighting the final bout with Britain to a successful conclusion, the reasons are to be sought not only in the shortcomings of the staff organization but substantially in Hitler's political thinking. There can hardly be any doubt that Hitler always wished to avoid a contest with Britain and the British Empire. He stated often enough that it could never be in the Reich's interest to destroy the Empire. He admired this empire as a political achievement. Even if one is unwilling to take such utterances at their face value, one thing at least is certain 
Hitler knew that if the British Empire were destroyed, not he or Germany could be its heir, but the United States, Japan or the Soviet Union. Seen in this realistic perspective, his attitude to Britain does at least make sense. He had neither wanted nor expected war with Britain. Consequently he wished to avoid a showdown with her for as long as was possible. This attitude, and doubtless also the fact that he had not expected such a staggering victory over France, explain Hitler's failure to adopt a war plan which aimed at defeating Britain, too, once France was overthrown. The point is that he did not want to land in Britain. His political concept was at odds with the strategic requirements that followed from the victory in the West. The disastrous part of it was that this concept of his encountered no sympathy in Britain. Hitler's attitude towards the Soviet Union, on the other hand, was fundamentally different, despite the alliance he entered into with Stalin in 1939. He at once mistrusted and underrated the Russians. He feared their traditional urge for expansion though he himself had opened the way to it in the West by signing the Moscow Pact. One may assume that Hitler knew the two totalitarian powers were bound to clash sooner or later after becoming next-door neighbors. Furthermore, he was forever preoccupied with Lebensraum, the living space he felt obliged to secure for the German people. It was something he could find only in the East. Though there was nothing about either of these lines of reasoning to prevent the ultimate clash with the Soviet Union from being put off until some later date, they were bound to acquire a special urgency for a man like Hitler when, after France's downfall, he seemed virtually the master of Europe. His feelings were reinforced by the menacing build-up of Soviet troops on Germany's eastern frontier a trend which must in any event have given rise to misgivings about the Kremlin's future policies. Hitler now faced the problem of invading England. He was aware of the high degree of risk such an undertaking then involved. If the invasion were to fail, the army and navy forces taking part would be forfeit, and even the Luftwaffe would emerge very much weakened. At the same time the failure of an invasion attempt would not, from the strictly military point of view, have irreparably impaired German military power. The more far-reaching effect would have been in the political field on the one hand through the Philip any failure would have given to the determination of the British to go on with the war, on the other its impact on the attitudes of the United States and the Soviet Union. Most of all, though. A spectacular military failure of this kind would have gravely damaged the dictator's prestige, both in Germany and the world as a whole. This was the one danger the dictator could not afford to run. Just as his general attitude towards the British Empire had always made him put any thought of a showdown behind him, and just as his false appraisal of the British mind had encouraged him to hope that it would still be possible to come to terms in the end, so did he now recoil from taking the risk. He wanted to evade the hazard of a decisive struggle with Britain. Instead of destroying her as a power, he thought he could convince her of the need for settlement by trying as he himself put it to strike from her hand the last sword she might help to point at Germany on the mainland of Europe. But by thus recoiling from what was admittedly a pretty considerable military and political risk, Hitler committed his big error of judgment. For one thing was certain. If Hitler jibbed at fighting the battle with Britain in the hour most favorable to himself, Germany must sooner or later land in an untenable situation. The longer the war with Britain dragged on, the greater the danger threatening the Reich in the East must become. When Hitler did not venture to strike the decisive blow at Britain in the summer of 1940, and missed his unique chance of doing so, he could no longer play at seeing how long he could hold his breath. It was at this point that he was forced to venture the attempt to eliminate the Soviet Union by a preventive war while there was still no enemy in the West capable of menacing him on the continent. In reality this meant that because of his aversion to the risk of invading Britain, Hitler took on the far greater risk of a war on two fronts. At the same time, by taking so long over, and finally discarding the invasion plan, he wasted a year which should have brought Germany the final decision. It was a delay Germany could never make good. Dot with the cancellation of Sea Alien at the end of September, 38 Corps went back to normal training. The ferrying equipment that had been assembled for us was withdrawn from the Channel harbors, already imperiled by RAF raids. 
nothing was heard at this stage of Hitler's intentions regarding the Soviet Union, his final decision to attack it being taken much later. The first hints of what was to come did not reach me till the spring of 1941, when I was given a new appointment. Part 3, War in the E-State, Panzer Drive At the end of February 1941 I handed over command of 38 Corps on the Channel Coast in order to take over 56 Panzer Corps, whose headquarters were about to be set up in Germany. For me this fulfilled a wish I had cherished even before the campaign in the West to command a mechanized army corps. Dot as a corps commander, of course, I was not consulted on the advisability and method of conducting a campaign against the Soviet Union. Our own operation order was not received until a very late stage in May 1941, as far as I remember and even then it covered only the immediate commitments of the Panzer Group to which my corps belonged. Dot thus, as far as the actual conduct of operations against the Soviet Union in 1941 is concerned, I cannot comment to anything like the extent I have done regarding the Western campaign, where I had personally influenced the final shaping of the operations plan. However, I think two factors may be said to have become generally apparent since then. The first was the mistake committed by Hitler, if by no one else of underrating the resources of the Soviet Union and the fighting qualities of the Red Army. In consequence he based everything on the assumption that the Soviet Union could be overthrown by military means in one campaign. Had this even been possible, it could have been achieved only by bringing about the Soviet Union's simultaneous collapse from within. Yet the policies which Hitler in complete negation of the efforts of the military authorities pursued through his Reich Commissioners and Security Service, S.T., in the occupied territories of the East were bound to achieve the very opposite effect. In other words, while his strategic policy was to demolish the Soviet system with the utmost dispatch, his political actions were diametrically opposed to this. Differences between the aims of the political and military leaders have often arisen in other wars. In this case, with the military and political leadership united in Hitler's hands, the result was that his political measures in the East ran entirely counter to the requirements of his strategy, depriving it of whatever chance it may have had of a speedy victory. The second factor was the failure to achieve a uniform strategic policy at the summit that is between Hitler and OKH. This applied both to the planning of the overall operation and to its execution in the campaign of 1941. Hitler's strategic aims were based primarily on political and economic considerations. These were, a, the capture of Leningrad a city he regarded as the cradle of Bolshevism, by which he proposed to join up with the Finns and dominate the Baltic, and, b, possession of the raw material regions of the Ukraine, the armaments centers of the Dunitz Basin, and later the Caucasus oil fields. By seizing these territories he hoped to cripple the Soviet war economy completely. On the other hand, rightly contended that the conquest and retention of these undoubtedly important strategic areas depended on first defeating the Red Army. The main body of the latter, they argued, would be met on the road to Moscow, since that city, as the focal point of Soviet power, was one whose loss the regime dare not risk. Eight there were three reasons for this. One was that in contrast to 1812 Moscow really did form the political center of Russia. Another was that the loss of the armaments areas around and east of Moscow would at least inflict extensive damage on the Soviet war economy. The third and possibly most important reason from the strategic point of view was Moscow's position as the nodal point of European Russia's traffic network. Its loss would split the Russian defenses in two and prevent the Soviet command from ever mounting a single, coordinated operation. Viewed strategically, the divergence of views between Hitler and OKH amounted to this, Hitler wanted to seek the issue on both wings, a solution for which, in view of the relative strengths involved and the vastness of the theater of operations, Germany did not possess adequate forces, whereas OKH sought it in the center of the front. It was on this divergence of basic strategy that the German conduct of operations ultimately founded. Although Hitler agreed to the distribution of forces proposed by OKH, 
according to which the bulk of the army was to be committed in two army groups in the north and only one in the area south of the private marshes, the tug of war over strategic objectives continued throughout this campaign. The inevitable consequence was that Hitler not only failed to attain his aims, which were too far flung anyway, but also confused the issue for O.K.H. The general intention laid down by Hitler in his Barbarossa directive, destruction of the bulk of the Russian army located in western Russia by bold operations involving deep penetration by armored spearheads, prevention of the withdrawal of battle with the elements into the Russian interior was in the last analysis nothing more than a strategic or even tactical formula. Admittedly, thanks to the superiority of German staff work and the performance of the combat troops, we achieved extraordinary successes that brought the Soviet armed forces to the very brink of defeat. But this formula could never replace an operations plan over whose preparation and execution there should have been complete unanimity at the top and which, in view of the relative strengths of the opposing armies and the tremendous distances involved, accepted the premise that it might take two campaigns to destroy the Soviet armed forces. In my capacity as a corps commander, however, I was not as I have already said briefed on the plans and intentions of the Supreme Command. For this reason I had no suspicion at the time of the momentous differences of a strategic nature existing between Hitler and OKH yet even at this level I soon began to feel their effect. 56 Panzer Corps was to attack from East Prussia as part of 4th Panzer Group of Northern Army Group. Northern Army Group, Field Marshal Ritter V. Lieb, was assigned the task of driving forward from East Prussia to destroy the enemy's forces in the Baltic territories and then to advance on Leningrad. The task of 4th Panzer Group, Colonel General Hopner, in this connection was to thrust forward to the Dvina opposite and below Dvinsk, Dunneberg, in order to seize all crossing points for a further advance in the direction of Apica. On the right of 4th Panzer Group, 16th Army, Colonel General Bush, had to advance through Kovno, Corners, on the left, 18th Army, General V. Kutchler, was to move in the general direction of Riga. I arrived in 56 Panzer Corps assembly area on 16th June. Colonel General Hopner had issued the following orders for the advance of 4th Panzer Group Colon 56 Panzer Corps, 8 Panzer Division, 3 Motorized Infantry Division and 290 Infantry Division was to break out in an easterly direction from the forest area north of the Memel and east of Tilsit and to gain the big road to Dvinsk northeast of Kovno. To its left 41 Panzer Corps, General Reinhardt, 1 and 6 Panzer Divisions, 36 Motorized Infantry Division and 269 Infantry Division, was to advance towards the Dvina crossing at Jakobstadt. The SS Death's Head Division, also belonging to the Panzer Group, would initially follow along behind with a view to being sent in behind the corps making the fastest progress. For the purpose both of cutting off all enemy forces forward of the Dvina and of forging ahead with Northern Army Group's operation, it was of decisive importance that the Dvina bridges should be captured intact, since this mighty river presented a formidable obstacle. The advance of 4th Panzer Group would thus be a race to see which of the two corps could reach the Dvina first. 56 Panzer Corps was determined to be the winner, its advantage being that in the light of the available information it stood to encounter less resistance in the enemy rear than 41 Panzer Corps. For this very reason the latter had been given one armored division more than our own corps. My suggestion that it would be better to make our main effort where we hoped to find the enemy weakest received no support from Panzer Group H. Q. Before I describe the operations of 56 Panzer Corps, which are really conspicuous only for the fact that they were to develop into a Panzer Drive in the truest sense, some attention must be given to a matter which threw a revealing light on the gulf between soldiers' standards and those of our political leadership. A few days before the offensive started we received an order from the Supreme Command of the Armed Forces, OKW, which has since become known as the Commissar Order. The gist of it was that all political commissars of the Red Army whom we captured were to be shot out of hand as exponents of Bolshevik ideology. Now I agree that from the point of view of international law the status of these political commissars was extremely equivocal. 
they were certainly not soldiers, any more than I would have considered a Gauleiter attached to me as a political overseer to be a soldier. Neither could they be granted the same non-combatant status as chaplains, medical personnel or war correspondents. On the contrary, they were without being soldiers fanatical fighters, but fighters whose activities could only be regarded as illegal according to the traditional meaning of warfare. Their task was not only the political supervision of Soviet military leaders but, even more, to instill the greatest possible degree of cruelty into the fighting and to give it a character completely at variance with the traditional conceptions of soldierly behavior. These same commissars were the men primarily responsible for the fighting methods and treatment of prisoners which clashed so blatantly with the provisions of the Hague Convention on Land Warfare. Whatever one might feel about the status of commissars in international law, however, it inevitably went against the grain of any soldier to shoot them down when they had been captured in battle. An order like the Commissar Befell was utterly unsoldierly. To have carried it out would have threatened not only the honor of our fighting troops but also their morale. Consequently I had no alternative but to inform my superiors that the commissar order would not be implemented by anyone under my command. My subordinate commanders were entirely at one with me in this, and everyone in the core area acted accordingly. I need hardly add that my military superiors endorsed my attitude. It was only very much later, however that all the efforts to get the commissar order ascended were ultimately successful when it had become clear, namely, that the order simply incited the commissars to resort to the most brutal methods to make their units fight on to the end. 9 at 1300 hours on 21st June our HQ was notified that the offensive would begin at 0300 the following morning. The die was cast. Dot because of the restricted space allotted to my corps in the forest area north of the Memel, it was only possible to use eight Panzer Division and 290 Infantry Division in the assault on the enemy frontier positions, which had been found to be occupied. For the time being, three motorized infantry division was kept south of the river. Dot in the immediate vicinity of the frontier, we initially met with only weak resistance, probably from forward defended localities. Very soon, however, a holdup was caused by a well prepared pillbox system that was overcome only after 8 Panzer Division had broken through the enemy fortifications north of the Memel around noon. On this very first day, the Soviet command showed its true face. Our troops came across a German patrol which had been cut off by the enemy earlier on. All its members were dead and gruesomely mutilated. My ADC and I, who often had to pass through sectors of the front that had not been cleared of the enemy, agreed that we would never let an adversary like this capture us alive. Later on there were more than enough cases where Soviet soldiers, after throwing up their hands as if to surrender, reached for their arms as soon as our infantry came near enough, or where Soviet wounded feigned death and then fired on our troops when their backs were turned. It was our general impression that while those of the enemy in front line areas were in no way surprised by our attack, the Soviet military command had probably not been expecting it or not for a while, anyway, and for that reason never got as far as committing its powerful reserves in any coordinated form. There has been a great deal of argument as to whether the Soviet troop dispositions were actually defensive or offensive in character. If one went by the strength of the forces assembled in the western parts of the Soviet Union and the powerful concentration of armor in the Bialystok area and around Lao, it was possible to contend as Hitler did in support of his decision to attack that sooner or later the Soviet Union would take the offensive. On the other hand, the layout of the Soviet forces on 22nd of June 1941 did not indicate any immediate intention of aggression on the part of the Soviet Union. I think it would be near us the truth to describe the Soviet dispositions to which the occupation of eastern Poland, Bessarabia and the Baltic territories had already contributed very strong forces as a deployment against every contingency. On 22nd of June 1941, undoubtedly, the Soviet Union's forces were still strung out in such depth that they could then have been used only in a defensive role. Yet the pattern could have been switched in no time to meet any change in Germany's political or military situation. With a minimum of delay the Red Army each of whose army groups was numerically, 
if not qualitatively, superior to the German army group facing it, could have closed up and become capable of going over to the attack. Thus the Soviet dispositions did in fact constitute a latent threat, even though they remained formally defensive up to 22nd June. The moment the Soviet Union had been offered a favorable opportunity military or political it could have become a direct menace to the Reich. Certainly Stalin would have preferred to avoid a clash with the Reich in summer 1941. But had international developments sooner or later led the Soviet leadership to believe that it could resort to political pressure, or even to the threat of military intervention against Germany, its provisionally defensive deployment could swiftly have taken on an offensive character. It was, precisely as I have said, a deployment against every contingency. And now let us return to 56 Corps. If the Corps were to fulfill its task of seizing the Dvinsk crossings intact, it had to concentrate on two things. On the very first day, it had to thrust 50 miles into enemy territory in order to capture the crossing over the Dubissa at Air Irregular. I knew the Dubissa sector from World War I. What we should find there was a deep, ravine valley whose slopes no tank could negotiate. In the first war our railway engineers had labored there for months on end to span the gap with a masterly construction of timber. If the enemy now succeeded in blowing up the big road viaduct at Air Irogula, the Corps would be helplessly stuck and the enemy would have time on the steep far bank of the river to organize a defense which would in any case be extremely difficult to penetrate that we could thereafter no longer expect to make a surprise descent on the Dvinsk bridges was perfectly obvious. The air Irigla crossing was indispensable to us as a springboard. Excessive though Core H. Q's requirements may appear to have been, 8 Panzer Division, General Brandenburger, with which I spent most of the day, still fulfilled its task. After breaking through the frontier positions and overrunning all enemy resistance further back, it seized the Air Irologa crossing with a reconnaissance force by the evening of 22nd June. 290 division followed, marching at record speed, and three motorized infantry division, which had started moving over the Memel at noon, was directed towards a crossing south of Air Irigla. The first step had succeeded. The second condition for success at Dvinsk was that the Corps should push straight through to that town regardless of whether the formations on its flanks kept abreast or not. The capture of those precious bridges depended entirely on our being able to take the enemy there completely by surprise. Naturally we were fully aware that this course of action involved considerable risks. As it turned out and as we had hoped, the Corps had the good fortune to strike a weak patch in the enemy's defenses. Despite repeated enemy counter-attacks, some of which entailed hard fighting, the divisions were able to break this resistance relatively quickly. While on our left 41 Panzer Corps was temporarily held up by a strong enemy grouping dug in around Sioli, Shulan, and on our right the left wing of 16th Army was fighting for Kovno, 56 Panzer Corps actually reached the Dvinsk Highway by 24th June in the area of Wilkemeers. Already 105 miles deep into enemy territory, it had not only outdistanced the German formations on either flank, but had also left the Soviet forces in the frontier zone far behind it. Now there were a bare 80 miles to go to reach the coveted bridges at Dvinsk. But could we maintain the pace? The enemy was certain to throw in fresh reserves against us. At any moment, moreover, he was liable at any rate temporarily to patch up the breach behind us and cut off our supplies. But in spite of warnings from Panzer Group HQ, we had no intention of letting the goddess of fortune elude us as a result of overcautiousness on our part. Though 290 infantry division had naturally been unable to keep up with the rest of the corps. The fact that it was following in our train gave us a certain safeguard particularly as it had already drawn the attention of strong enemy forces that would otherwise have attacked us in the rear. Meanwhile Corps HQ and the two mobile divisions 8 Panzer moving up the highway and 3 motorized division, with rather more difficulty, along byways to the south of this were striking out for the victory prize of Dvinsk. Both divisions were able to smash the enemy reserves thrown in to meet them. In these battles, some of which were extremely fierce, the enemy lost 70 tanks, about half the strength of our own armor, and numerous batteries. 
At this stage we had hardly the time or the men to spare for rounding up prisoners. Early on 26 June 8th Panzer Division was outside Dvinsk, and at 0800 hours I was handed a report at its divisional headquarters that our dash to capture the two big bridges had succeeded. Fighting was still going on in the town on the far side of the river, but the big road bridge had fallen into our hands completely intact. The sentries detailed to set off the demolition charges had been overrun a few yards from the entrance. The railway bridge had been only slightly damaged by a small explosion and was still fit for use. The following day three motorized infantry division pulled off a surprise crossing of the river upstream from the town. Our aim was achieved. Before the offensive started I had been asked how long we thought we should take to reach Dvinsk, assuming that it was possible to do so. My answer had been that if it could not be done inside four days, we could hardly count on capturing the crossings intact. And now, exactly four days and five hours after zero hour, we had actually completed, as the crow flies, a non-stop dash through 200 miles of enemy territory. We had brought it off only because the name of Dvinsk had been foremost in the mind of every officer and man and because we had been ready to face heavy risks to reach our appointed goal. It gave us a tremendous feeling of achievement to drive over the big bridges into the town, despite the fact that the enemy had set most of it on fire before pulling out. It was an added satisfaction to know that we had not had to pay too high a price. Naturally the core position if only on the northern bank of the Dvina was anything but secure. 41 Panzer Corps and the left wing of 16th Army lay from 60 to 100 miles behind us. Between them and ourselves were several Soviet Army Corps, now withdrawing to the Dvina. Not only must we expect the enemy to do everything in his power to assail us on the northern bank, we also had to cover ourselves on the southern bank against those enemy formations approaching from the south. The precariousness of our position became further apparent when the Corps Q branch was attacked from the rear in Owood not far from my own tactical headquarters. However, we were less exercised by our present rather isolated position, which would not continue indefinitely, than by the problem of what the next move should be. Was the objective to be Leningrad, or should we turn towards Moscow? The Panzer Group Commander, who flew over to see us in a Fiesella Storch on 27th June, could tell us nothing. One might reasonably have expected the commander of a whole panzer group to be in the picture about future objectives, but this was obviously not the case. Instead, our enthusiasm was damped by an order to widen the bridgehead around Vinsk and keep the crossings open. We were to wait for 41 Panzer Corps and the left wing of 16th Army to move up, the former having been directed to cross the river at Jakobstadt. While this was certainly the safe, staff college solution, we had had other ideas. As we saw it, our sudden appearance so far behind the front must have caused considerable confusion among the enemy. He would obviously make every attempt to throw us back across the river, fetching in troops from any quarter to do so. The sooner we pushed on, therefore, the less chance he would have of offering us any systematic opposition with superior forces. If we drove on towards Skov while, of course, continuing to safeguard the Dvina crossings and if, at the same time, Panzer Group HQ pushed the other Panzer Corps straight through Dvinsk behind us, it seemed likely that the enemy would have to keep on opposing us with whatever forces he happened to have on hand at the moment, and be incapable for the time being of fighting a set battle. As for the beaten enemy forces south of the Dvina, these could be left to the infantry armies coming up behind. It goes without saying that the further a single Panzer Corps or indeed the entire Panzer Group ventured into the depths of the Russian hinterland, the greater the hazards became. Against this, it may be said that the safety of a tank formation operating in the enemy's rear largely depends on its ability to keep moving. Once it comes to a halt it will immediately be assailed from all sides by the enemy's reserves. But the Supreme Command did not share our view, and for this it certainly cannot be blamed. We should, after all, have been tempting fortune more than somewhat had we tried to hold on to her coat sleeve any longer, for there was always the possibility from now on that she would lead us over a precipice. And so, 
for the immediate future. The goal of Leningrad receded into the distance as far as we were concerned, leaving us to mark time at Dvinsk. As we had anticipated, the enemy was now moving up reinforcements not only from Skov, but from Minsk and Moscow as well. Before long we were having our work cut out to beat off the attacks he launched on the northern bank of the Dvina with an armoured division in support, and at a number of points the position became quite critical. In the course of a counter-attack made by three panzer division to recover some temporarily abandoned ground, our troops found the bodies of three officers and thirty men who had lain wounded in a field dressing station captured by the enemy the previous day. Their mutilations were indescribable. In the next few days, the Soviet Air Force did everything possible to destroy the bridges which had been allowed to fall into our hands. With an almost mulish obstinacy, one squadron after another flew in at treetop level, only to be shot down by our fighters or flak. On one day alone, they lost 64 aircraft in this way. Finally, on 2nd July, we were able to move off again. After the SS Death's Head Division had joined the Corps as its third mobile formation and 41 Panzer Corps had crossed the Dvina at Jakobstadt. For its further advance, 4th Panzer Group had been allotted the Axis Rizek Nostrovskov. So Leningrad now beckoned, after all. Nevertheless, six days had elapsed since the Corps surprise dashed to Dvinsk. The enemy had had time to recover from the shock it must have given him to be suddenly confronted by German units on the northern bank of the Dvina. A tank drive such as 56 Panzer Corps made to Dvinsk inevitably generates confusion and panic in the enemy communications zone. It ruptures the enemy's chain of command and makes it virtually impossible for him to coordinate his countermeasures. These advantages had now been waived as a result of 4th Panzer Group's decision however commendable its motives to consolidate on the Dvina. Whether we should now be fortunate enough fully to regain that lead over the enemy was doubtful, to say the least. Certainly the only chance of doing so lay in the Panzer Group's being able to bring its forces into action as an integrated whole. As will be seen, however, this is precisely what it failed to do, even though the enemy's resistance remained insufficient to halt the advance dot to begin with. However, the Panzer Group moved off uniformly enough from the line Dvinsk, Jakobstadt in the direction of Skov, 56 Panzer Corps proceeding along and to the east of the main road Dvinsk Rizek Nostrovskov and 41 Panzer Corps to its left. The enemy's resistance proved tougher and more methodical than in the first few days of the campaign, but he was still being outfought over and over again. The Panzer Group was now approaching the Stalin line. A fortification which ran, in varying strength, along the original Soviet frontier from the southern extremity of Lake Pepper's west of Skov to what had once been the small Russian frontier fortress of Zibash. At this stage, Panzer Group HQ allocated the main road to 41 Panzer Corps to continue advancing on Ostrov, and swung 56 Panzer Corps hard east towards Zibash and Apaka. The intention was that we should break through the Stalin line and outflank from the east a strong force of enemy armor believed to be based on Skov. It was an excellent scheme if the force really existed and 56 Panzer Corps were able to execute the maneuver with any speed. In our opinion, however, the former was not the case and the latter was not feasible, since in the direction it had been ordered to take, the Corps had to negotiate extensive swamps lying forward of the Stalin line. Our strong representations that both corps should be kept on the original line of advance towards Ostrov proved of no avail, and I regret to say that our misgivings regarding the swamps turned out to be fully justified. Eight Panzer Division did strike a timbered roadway leading across the swamps, but this was already completely blocked by the vehicles of a Soviet motorized division. It took days to clear the route and replace the blown bridges. When the division finally emerged from the swamps it ran into strong opposition which was broken only after relatively heavy fighting. Three motorized division found only a narrow causeway, on which its vehicles could make no progress whatever. It had to be pulled out again and sent on to Ostrov behind 41 Panzer Corps. Better ground though it included a strong line of concrete fortifications was struck by the SS Death's Head Division in its advance on Zibash. 
and now there emerged a weakness which was bound to be inherent in troops whose officers and NCOs lacked solid training and proper experience. As far as its discipline and soldierly bearing went, the division in question undoubtedly made a good impression. I had even had reason to praise its extremely good march discipline an important requirement for the efficient movement of motorized formations. The division always showed great dash in the assault and was steadfast in defense. I had it under my command on frequent occasions later on and think it was probably the best Waffen SS division I ever came across. Its commander in those days was a brave man who was soon wounded and later killed. None of these things, however, could compensate for deficient training in leadership. The division suffered excessive losses because its troops did not learn until they got into action what army units had mastered long ago. Their losses and lack of experience led them in turn to miss favorable opportunities, and this again caused unnecessary actions to be fought. I doubt if there is anything harder to learn than gauging the moment when a slackening of the enemy's resistance offers the attacker his decisive chance. The upshot of all this was that I repeatedly had to come to the division's assistance, without even then being able to prevent a sharp rise in casualties. After a matter of ten days the three regiments of the division had to be regrouped to form two new ones. Yet, bravely as the Waffen SS divisions always fought, and fine though their achievements may have been, there is not the least doubt that it was an inexcusable mistake to set them up as a separate military organization. Hand picked replacements who could have filled the posts of NCOs in the army were expended on a quite inadmissible scale in the Waffen SS, which in general paid a toll of blood incommensurate with its actual gains. Naturally, this cannot be laid at the door of the SS troops themselves. The blame for such unnecessary consumption of manpower must lie with the men who set up these special units for purely political motives, in the face of opposition from all the competent army authorities. In no circumstances must we forget, however, that the Waffen SS, like the good comrades they were, fought shoulder to shoulder with the army at the front and always showed themselves courageous and reliable. Without doubt a large proportion of them would have been only too glad to be withdrawn from the jurisdiction of a man like Himmela and incorporated into the army. Before returning to the fortunes of 56 Panzer Corps, I should like to give the reader a picture of how the command staff of a tank formation had to work during the last war. As late as the Battle of Street Private Gravelot, in the War of 1870-71, my grandfather assembled his staff on a hill from which he commanded a view of the entire battlefield and could personally direct the operations of his army corps. He was even able to ride over to the regiments as they deployed for the assault and, so the story goes, addressed some pretty harsh words to one battery for unlimbering too far from the enemy. Such scenes are naturally a thing of the past. The staffs of World War I were forced further and further to the rear as the range of enemy artillery fire increased, and the breadth of the fronts rendered visual survey and personal command on the battlefield a sheer impossibility. Efficient telephone links were the decisive thing from then on, and Schlieffen's picture of the Supreme Warlord who sat behind his desk issuing stirring orders over the telephone duly became a reality. World War II in its turn called for other methods of command, especially in the case of highly mobile formations. In the case of the latter, situations changed so rapidly, and favorable opportunities came and went so fast that no tank force commander could afford to bind himself to a command post any great distance to the rear. If he waited too far back for reports from his forward units, decisions would be taken much too late and all kinds of chances would be missed. Often, too, when a successful action had just been fought, it was necessary to counteract the only two natural phenomenon of battle fatigue and to instill new life into the men. It was even more vital. In view of the unprecedented demands which our new war of movement made on the energies of officers and men, that higher commanders should show themselves as often as possible to the frontline troops. The ordinary soldier must never have the feeling that the top brass are busy concocting orders somewhere to the rear without knowing what it looks like out in front. 
it gives him a certain satisfaction to see the commanding general in the thick of it once in a while or watching a successful attack go in. Only by being up with the fighting troops day in and day out can one get to know their needs, listen to their worries and be of assistance to them. A senior commander must not only be the man who perpetually has demands to make in the accomplishment of his mission, he must be an ally and a comrade as well. Quite apart from anything else, he himself derives fresh energy from these visits to the fighting troops. Many's the time, when visiting a divisional headquarters, that I have heard anxieties voiced about the diminishing battle morale of the fighting troops and the excessive strain to which they were often unavoidably subjected. Such worries inevitably preoccupied commanders more and more as time went on, for it was they who ultimately bore the responsibility for the regiments and battalions. Yet once I had gone forward to the troops in the line, I was often overjoyed to find them more confident and optimistic than I had been led to expect not infrequently because they had fought a successful action in the meantime. And then, as I smoked a cigarette with a tank crew or chatted with a rifle company about the overall situation, I never failed to encounter that irrepressible urge to press onward, that readiness to put forth the very last ounce of energy, which are the hallmarks of the German soldier. Experiences like this are among the finest things a senior commander can ask for. The higher one rises, unfortunately, the rarer they become. An army or army group commander is quite unable to mix in with the fighting troops to the same extent as the general commanding a corps. Dot even the corps commander, of course, cannot be permanently on the road. A man who is constantly rushing around his forward areas, and can never be found when required, virtually hands over his command to his staff. This may be quite a good thing in many cases, but it is still not the role for which he was intended. Everything ultimately hinges particularly with highly mobile formations, on a rational organization of command duties, the continuity of which must be maintained at all costs. It was indispensable that the core Q branch should usually remain stationary for several days at a time in order to keep the flow of supplies moving. The commanding general and his operations branch, on the other hand, had to move their tactical headquarters forward once or even twice a day if they were to keep in touch with the mechanized divisions. This called for a high degree of mobility on the part of the headquarters. The only way to achieve it was to cut the tactical staff to a minimum always a salutary measure where command is concerned and to do without any of the usual comforts. Needless to say, the patron saint of red tape, who, apart from her other activities, I fear, likes to tag along behind armies in the field, used to have a pretty thin time when we were operating under conditions of this kind. We did not waste time looking for accommodation. In France castles and mansions had been ours for the asking. The small wooden huts of the east held little appeal, particularly in view of the ubiquity of certain domestic pets. Consequently our tactical headquarters lived almost the whole time in tents and the two command wagons which, together with a few wartime Volkswagen and the vehicles of the wireless section and telephone exchange, carried our other ranks when we changed location. I myself slept in a sleeping bag in the small tent I shared with my ADC, and do not remember having used a proper bed more than three times throughout this panzer drive. The one man with any objection to living under canvas was our senior military assistant, who preferred to sleep in his car. Unfortunately he had to leave his long legs sticking out through the door with the result that he could never get his wet boots off after a rainy night. We always used to pitch our little camp in a wood or a copse near the main axis of advance if possible by a lake or stream so that we could take a quick plunge before breakfast or whenever we came back caked with dust and grime from a trip to the front. While the chief of staff naturally had to stay behind the command post to deal with the work and telephone calls, I spent the days, and often part of the nights, out on the road. I usually left early in the morning, after receiving the dawn situation reports and issuing any orders that were necessary, to visit divisions and forward troops. At noon I would return to the command post for a while and then go out to visit another division, for as often as not it is just around eventide that success beckons or a fresh impetus is needed.
By the time we returned to our tented camp, which would meanwhile have been shifted to a new location, we were dead tired and as black as sweeps. On such occasions it was a special treat to find that, thanks to the forethought of Majinman, my second assistant, we were to have a roast chicken or even a bottle of wine from his own small stock instead of the usual evening fare of rye bread, smoked sausage and margarine. I am afraid that however far forward we were, chickens and geese were very hard to come by, having as a rule been snapped up by other fanciers before we appeared on the scene. When, with the onset of the early autumn rains, it became rather too chilly to sit in the tent, we found it both pleasant and refreshing to use the sauna baths which, however primitive in form, were to be found on almost every farmstead. Such flexible leadership on my part was, of course, possible only because I was able to take a wireless vehicle along with me on these trips under our excellent signals officer Cola, who later became a general staff major. Thanks to the admirable speed with which he could raise our tactical staff or any divisional headquarters on the air, I was kept continuously informed of the situation throughout the core sector, and decisions taken by me on the spot could be passed back with the minimum of delay. I might add that during my imprisonment after the war Cola proved a most unselfish friend and helper to my wife. Apart from my faithful drivers Nagel and Schumann and two outriders, my constant companion on these trips was my ADC, Lieutenant Specht. We called him Papa because of his short, wiry figure and his youthful freshness and happy-go-lucky nature. He was a young cavalry officer of the best type. Brisk, vigorous, somewhat irresponsible where danger was concerned, shrewd and quick on the uptake, he was always cheerful and slightly saucy. All these qualities had endeared him to me. He rode brilliantly. His father was a keen horse breeder, his mother a first class horsewoman, and had won several big events as a newly commissioned officer just before the war. He was game for anything, and would have liked nothing better than to take his commanding general out on skirmishing patrols. As long as we belonged to a panzer corps and could be daily at the scene of action, Papo was content with me and his lot. But when I became an army commander and could no longer be up at the front so often, he began to champ at the bit. It was a very proper attitude for a young officer, and I gave him his head on a number of occasions. In the Crimea he twice led a reconnaissance squadron with great skill and dash. When we were in front of Leningrad I again sent him to a division, but this time he crashed while on his way there in a fee-seller storch. The loss was a heavy blow to me. Now let us return to 56 Panzer Corps. By 9th July it had become clear that 4th Panzer Group's attempt to outflank the enemy forces it believed to be at Skov by sending our corps round to the east had no hope of success on account of the martiness of the ground and the strength of the enemy's resistance. There was nothing for it but to discontinue the maneuver and redirect Corps HQ and 8 Panzer Division onto the original northern axis towards Ostrov, as had already been done with 3 Motorized Infantry Division. Still, since moving off from Dvinsk the Corps had according to intelligence reports available on 10th July smashed 4 or 5 of the enemy's infantry divisions, 1 Armored Division and 1 Motorized Division forces far superior to its own numerically. Apart from the thousands of prisoners we had taken, our booty since crossing the Reich frontiers included 60 aircraft, 316 guns, including anti-tank and anti-aircraft, 205 tanks and 600 lorries. But the enemy, though pushed back to the east, was still not destroyed as was very soon to become apparent. Now that the Panzer Group was concentrated around Ostrov, we at 56 Panzer Corps hoped for a rapid, direct and uniform advance on Leningrad, with ourselves passing through Lugo and 41 Panzer Corps through Skov. In our view this offered the best chance not only of effecting the quick capture of the city but also of cutting off the enemy forces retreating through Livonia into Estonia before our 18th army. The task of safeguarding this operation on its open eastern flank would have had to devolve on 16th Army as it moved up behind 4th Panzer Group. Presumably acting on directives from the highest level, however, 
Panzer Group HQ decided otherwise. 41 Panzer Corps was allotted the main road through Lugo along which to advance on Leningrad. 56 Panzer Corps, once again pulling out to the east, was to advance through Porkov and Novgorod to Chudovo in order to break communications between Leningrad and Moscow at the earliest possible date. Important though the latter task was, these orders must once again have led to the two corps becoming widely dispersed, as a result of which each was liable to be deprived of the necessary striking power. The danger was increased by the fact that much of the country to be crossed this side of Leningrad was marshy or wooded and hardly suitable for large armoured formations. A particularly regrettable step was the removal from 56 Panzer Corps of the SS Death's Head Division, which had meanwhile been relieved in the Zebeshipakan area by 290 Infantry Division. The SS Division was now retained south of Ostrov as the Panzer Group Reserve. Thus, as had previously happened when we set off from the German frontier, the Panzer Group's main effort was again placed on its left wing 41 Panzer Corps. 56 Panzer Corps was dispatched on its wide sweep round to Chudovo with only one armoured and one infantry division, thereby being denied the essential protection of its open south flank by the SS Division following along in echelon on the right. It was a particularly risky move when one considered that even though the enemy forces engaged by the corps to date had been outfought, they were far from annihilated. Be that as it may, we were still convinced that the corps would continue to find its safety and speed of movement. Three motorized division, which only came back under command at Ostrov, had already taken Porkov on 10 July after a hard struggle and was put on a minor road leading north. 8 Panzer Division was to drive through Zoltsy to seize the vital crossing point where the Mshaga ran into Lake Ilmen. In a series of battles, most of them fierce ones, the advance was kept going for the next few days. Except for one attack on the Corps Command Post on the north bank of the Shalon River in the early hours of 14 July apparently carried out by enemy reconnaissance forces the enemy had so far not made his presence felt on our open flank in the south. That same day, at my insistence, 8 Panzer Division, which had taken Zoltsy after a battle against an enemy well equipped with artillery and armor, pushed on to the Mshaga sector. It found the bridge already blown. Meanwhile, Panzer Group HQ had transferred the main effort of its advance even further west of the Luger Road. It had moved 41 Panzer Corps 3 mechanized formations northwards to bar the way to the enemy forces retiring through Nava north of Lake Peppers, before 18th Army. Only one infantry division of the Corps, the 269th, had been left on the road to Luga. Thus 56 Panzer Corps suddenly found itself even more isolated than before in its wide swing towards Chudovo. Accordingly we got on to Panzer Corps HQ to point out that if we were to carry out the Chudovo assignment our corps must have the immediate support both of the SS Death's Head Division and also of 16th Army's 1 Corps, which was relatively close behind. Before this appeal could be answered, however, 56 Panzer Corps was already in trouble. Early on 15 July we received a number of most unpleasant reports at the Corps Command Post on the Shalon, west of Zoltsy. The enemy had launched a powerful attack from the north into the flank of 8 Panzer Division, now strung out to the Mshaga, and simultaneously driven up from the south over the Shalon. This meant that the bulk of 8 Panzer Division's fighting troops, who were located between Zoltsy and the Mshaga, were cut off from the division's rear echelons, in whose area Core HQ was located. But that was not all. The enemy had closed the trap behind ourselves, too by pushing up strong forces from the south to straddle our supperly route. At the same time three motorized division, advancing further northwards, found itself being attacked by superior enemy forces from the north and northeast at Mali Utagash. It was obviously the enemy's intention to encircle 56 Panzer Corps while it was isolated. The failure to echelon the SS Death's Head Division along our rear right flank had enabled him to attack across the Shalon with those of his forces which lay south of us. At the same time the removal of 41 Panzer Corps from the Luger Road had released the strong enemy forces there, 
and these were now attacking our northern flank. Our core position at that moment was hardly an enviable one, and we could not help wondering whether we had taken rather too great a risk this time. Had we been carried away by our previous successes to the extent of paying insufficient heed to the enemy on our southern flank? Yet what other chance should we had have of carrying out our mission? As matters stood, the only course open to us was to pull late Panzer Division back through Zoltzi to escape the encirclement that now threatened. Three motorized division had to be disengaged at the same time to give the Corps back its freedom of movement. The next few days proved critical, with the enemy straining every nerve to keep up his encirclement and throwing in, besides his rifle divisions, two armored divisions enjoying strong artillery and air support. Eight Panzer Division nevertheless managed to break through Zoltzi to the west and regroup, despite having to be temporarily supplied from the air. Before completing its own disengagement, three motorized division had to beat off 17 successive attacks. In the meantime, after Panzer Group HQ had put the SS Death's Head Division under our command, it was possible for us to clear the core supply route. By 18th July, the crisis was as good as over the core being by then firmly established around no on the front facing roughly east by northeast. The earlier danger on our open flank in the south was removed by the proximity of 16th Army's 1 Corps, which was now drawing near no. One consolation was afforded us by the capture from a courier aircraft of a letter bearing the signature of Marshal Voroshilov, whom I had met in Moscow in 1931 and who now commanded the front opposite us. This not only confirmed that very substantial elements of the Soviet armies had been wiped out, but in the same connection referred specifically to the battles around Zoltzi. As long as we had been surrounded, our only links with the rear had been at best by wireless or aircraft. The very moment our lines of communication were restored, however, the usual plethora of paper descended on us. One item deserving special mention was an ominous inquiry telegraphed through from the Supreme Command. Moscow Radio, in somewhat premature celebration of our core encirclement, had reported the capture of certain top secret data on our multiple rocket launcher. The Soviets had obviously taken an intense dislike to this new weapon, with which we were able to fire missiles of flaming oil. Already the Soviet army facing us had wireless to warning Enclair that if we did not stop using it they would retaliate with gas an empty threat, of course, in view of the complete inadequacy of their own chemical warfare defenses. In these circumstances it was understandable that they should make such a song and dance about the capture of this information. Now we were being called upon to explain how a top secret document could possibly fall into enemy hands. Obviously it had not been taken from the fighting troops, but from a transport column intercepted by the Soviets when they cut our supplely route. This sort of thing was liable to happen to any armored formation operating far ahead of its own army front. In response to the Supreme Command's inquiry we duly reported the facts of the case, adding that to avoid any further censure we would henceforth refrain from cruising around on our own some 60 miles behind the enemy lines. On 19 July we had been informed by Panzer Group HQ that it now planned to send 56 Panzer Corps through Luga to Leningrad. 269 Infantry Division, which was assembled on the Luga Road, had already been placed under our command. We still had no success with our proposal that the forces of the Panzer Group be at long last concentrated for concerted action preferably up north with 41 Panzer Corps east of Narva, where there were four serviceable roads to Leningrad, rather than along the Lugo axis, which ran through extensive woodlands. For the rest, we were first to launch an attack eastwards with one corps against the Mshaga sector, which we had already reached once before. Apparently the Supreme Command was still sticking to its plan for a wide outflanking movement and was even prepared to go round to the east of Lake Ilmen. For the time being, therefore, we and one corps were involved in fresh battles, in the course of which the enemy was thrown back across the Mshaga. On 20th July we had a visit from the Obakwati Mr. Iavoke H. General Paulus. 
I put him in the picture about the battles we had fought to date and pointed out how run down our Panzer Corps had become in country which was most unsuitable for the use of armored troops. I also drew his attention to the disadvantages of scattering the Panzer Group's resources. The losses of our Corps 3 mobile divisions already amounted to 6,000 men, and both the troops and equipment were being subjected to excessive strain, even though 8 Panzer Division had been able, during a few days rest, to bring the number of its serviceable tanks back from 80 up to the 150 mark. I told Paulus that in my opinion the best thing to do would be to withdraw the entire Panzer group from an area where a rapid advance was almost out of the question and to use it against Moscow. If, on the other hand, the idea of driving on Leningrad and executing a wide encircling movement through Chudovo were to be maintained, it was essential that infantry be made available. Once the wooded zone had been cleared, our own corps must be saved for the final thrust on the city, otherwise the mobile divisions would reach Leningrad in no fit state for fighting. In any case, I pointed out, such an operation would take time. If we wanted to gain swift possession of Leningrad and the coastline, the only thing to do was to concentrate the whole Panzer group up north in the area east of Narva, whence it could drive straight for the city. General Paulus entirely agreed with my views. Initially, however, things turned out quite differently. While 16th Army, consisting of one corps and another corps which had just arrived, took over the Mshaga front west of Lake Hillmen, it was decided, after all, that 56 Panzer Corps should now carry out the thrust on Leningrad up the route through Luga. For this purpose we were allotted three motorized infantry division, 269 infantry division and the newly arrived SS police division. This had the effect of dispersing the Panzer Group's mechanized forces further than ever. The SS Death's Head Division remained with 16th Army by Lake Hillmen, and 8 Panzer Division was taken into reserve by the Panzer Group to be initially employed on clearing the communications zone of partisans a role for which it was not only far too valuable but also quite unsuitable. The Corps now had only one mobile division, three motorized, in the Lugan area, while 41 Panzer Corps owned three were in action east of Narva. The maxim established by Colonel General Guderian on the use of armor was Klotzen, nicked Klecken, don't spatter, boot em. In our own case the very opposite course seemed to have been taken. All our efforts to retain the three mobile divisions irrespective of which way our corps was sent proved unsuccessful. Experience has long shown that when forces run short, only very few commanders managed to maintain a tidy order of battle and avoid splitting their formations. It would take up too much space here if I were to describe the battles around Luga. They proved very tough indeed. While the enemy had had only a very modest number of troops available in this area a few weeks previously, he had now brought his strength up to a full corps of three divisions supported by strong artillery and armor. To cap this, the country around Luga was a Russian training area with which, of course, the enemy was intimately acquainted, and in addition, he had had time to dig himself in properly. While these battles were still in progress, our corps was given a new task. At long last, it was to join up with 41 Panzer Corps in the north for the assault on Leningrad. Even now, however, only Corps HQ and three motorized division were involved, eight Panzer and the SS Death's Head Division were to continue in their present role. On 15 August we handed over at Luga to HQ 50 Corps under General Lindman, an old friend of mine from World War I days, and began moving north. The route to our new command post on Lake Samro, 25 miles southwest of Narva, was so bad that we took 8 hours to travel a distance of 125 miles. We had hardly reached Lake Samra late that evening when a telephone call was received from Panzer Group HQ ordering us to halt 3 motorized division, which was coming up behind us, and to drive straight down south again next morning to report to HQ 16th Army and no. We, together with 3 motorized Division and the SS Death's Head Division, which was being pulled over from Lake Hillmen, were now to join that formation. 
no one will pretend that we were particularly pleased at these peregrinations. The one admirable exception was our quartermaster, Major Kunschmidt, whose cheerful equanimity was quite undaunted by the news that he would have to swing his supply and transport arrangements round through an angle of 180 degrees. So, on 16th August, we moved back to Dno along the same dreadful route we had covered the day before. This time the distance was 160 miles, and we took 13 hours to do it. Luckily, three motorized had not come too far north and could be turned round in good time, but what the troops thought of it all I do not care to imagine. The ultimate reason for the change was probably that our sum total of forces was inadequate and that the whole area between Leningrad. Skov and Lake Hillmen was thoroughly unsuitable as tank country. The picture we were given on our arrival at HQ 16th Army was the following 10 Corps, fighting on the right wing of the army south of Lake Hillmen, had been attacked and pushed back by far superior enemy forces, 38th Soviet Army, comprising eight divisions and cavalry formations. It was now fighting a difficult defensive battle south of Lake Hillmen on a front facing south with the enemy obviously trying to outflank it in the west. 56 Panzer Corps was to provide the urgently needed relief. What our corps had to do if possible without attracting the attention of the enemy was to introduce its two mechanized divisions into his western flank east of Dno in order to roll up the front while he was busy attacking our own 10 corps in the north. The task confronting us was a pretty one and it was gratifying to see how pleased the SS were to come back under our command. It was only a pity that we could not get 8 Panzer Division released for such a worthwhile operation. By 18th August the carefully concealed move of the two divisions into camouflaged assembly areas in the enemy's western flank had been successfully completed, and when the Corps unleashed its attack early next day the enemy was obviously taken completely by surprise. Our plan to roll up the enemy front from the flank proved entirely successful, and in the engagements that followed we and 10 Corps, which had now returned to the attack, jointly succeeded in roundly defeating 38th Soviet Army. By 22nd August we had reached the Lovat southeast of Stararissa, despite the fact that in that sandy terrain, with its almost complete absence of roads. The infantry of the two motorized divisions had had to advance most of the way on foot. During those few days 56 Panzer Corps alone captured 12,000 prisoners, 141 tanks, 246 guns and several hundred automatic weapons and motor vehicles. The booty included two extremely interesting items. One was a brand new 8.8 cm anti-aircraft battery of German manufacture from the year 1941. The other was the very first Soviet salvo gun to fall into German hands. As I was most anxious to have the latter evacuated, I was all the more indignant to find that it could not be moved because somebody had helped himself to the tires. The offender proved to be none other than my second assistant, Majinman, who had discovered that these tires fitted our own command wagon. He looked somewhat crestfallen when told to hand them back for reassembly. While the fighting troops, who once again had to exert themselves to the utmost, were enjoying a brief rest on the Lovat, there was talk of withdrawing 56 Panzer Cal for employment elsewhere, but then 16th Army's eastward advance south of Lake Hillmen was resumed, after all. At the end of August, however, the first rains of that summer set in turning every road into such a quagmire that for a while both motorized divisions were completely stuck. At the same time the enemy moved up new forces. In lieu of his beaten 38th Army three new armies appeared along the Comil men front opposite our own 16th Army, the 27th, 34th and 11th, fresh battles ensued, but to describe these in detail would take up too much space. 56 Panzer Cal forced a crossing over the Polar and pushed on to a point just short of Demyansk. Quite apart from the fact that enemy resistance was stiffening, the painful effort of advancing along roads several feet deep in mud imposed a particular strain on both men and equipment. During this period the whole of my time was spent out with my divisions, 
but even my sturdy Cubel wagon often had to be towed by a tractor to make any headway on those so-called roads. During this period even we came to feel the divergence between the aims pursued by Hitler, Leningrad, and OKH Moscow. The commander of 16th Army, Colonel General Bush, told me he intended to push east as far as the Valdai Heights so that he could later advance in the direction Kalin and Moscow. It seemed that HQ Northern Army Group did not agree principally because it was worried by the prospect of bearing the army's eastern flank. While at the beginning of September, 57 Panzer Corps intervened in our operations from the area of Central Army Group in the south, we ourselves were told on 12th September that we would shortly be moved south with 3 Motorized Division to come under command of 9th Army and Central Army Group. Even as a corps commander one could make neither head nor tail of all this chopping and changing, though I did form the impression that it was all ultimately due to the tug of war evidently going on between Hitler and OKH over whether the strategic aim should be Moscow or Leningrad. At all events, the battles which 16th Army fought in those weeks with 56 Panzer Corps taking part were continuously successful and on 16th September OKW was able to announce the defeat of substantial elements of the 11th, 27th and 34th Soviet armies. Nine enemy divisions were considered to have been destroyed and nine more badly battered. We still failed to find any real satisfaction in these achievements, however, for no one was clear any longer what the actual aim of our strategy was or what higher purpose all these battles were supposed to serve. Whatever else might happen, the period of sensational advances of the kind we had made on Dvinsk was at an end. My days at the head of 56 Panzer Corps were now numbered. On the evening of 12th September, under a steady downpour of rain, I was sitting in my tent with one or two officers of my staff. Ever since it had begun to get dark early we had taken to playing bridge to while away the time until the evening situation reports came in. Suddenly the telephone rang at my elbow and I was asked to take a call from my friend Bush, the army commander. A telephone message at this late hour did not usually bode anything pleasant, but on this occasion Bush read me out an order that had come over the teleprinter from OKH, General of the Infantry V. Manstein will leave forthwith for Southern Army Group to assume command of 11th Army. Every soldier will sense how proud and happy I felt at the prospect of leading a whole army from now on. To me, at the time, this seemed the peak of my military career. Early next morning I took leave only by telephone, unfortunately of the divisions under my command and then bade farewell to my own staff. In doing so I had grateful memories of all that 56 Panzer Corps and its staff had achieved in the past months, when the headquarters and divisions had grown into a thoroughly integrated unit. Joyful though I was in taking over this new and bigger task, I was nevertheless fully aware that probably the most satisfying phase of my life as a soldier was now over. For three whole months I had lived close to the fighting troops, sharing not only their trials and tribulations, but also the pride of their successes. Time and again I had been able to derive fresh energy from the very fact of this common experience, from the cheerful devotion with which everyone went about his duty and from the intimacy of comradeship. From now on my position would prevent me from working among the troops to the extent I had done to date. It was unlikely that I should ever again live through anything comparable to the impetuous dash of 56 Panzer Corps in the first days of the campaign the fulfillment of all a tank force commander's dreams. I thus found the leave taking extremely hard most of all from my experienced chief of staff, Colonel Baron V. Elverfelt, a cool high-minded and never-failing counselor. The same applied to my high-spirited and talented chief of operations, Major Dittelfson, the head of my intelligence branch, Guido V. Kessel, and that indefatigable quartermaster, Major Klenschmidt. Another of those I had to leave behind me was the head of my adjutant general's branch, Major V. D. Marwitz who had joined us only a few weeks previously and with whom I had close ties of friendship dating back to the days we had spent together in Pomerania and at the military academy. When I left on the morning of 13th September to take formal leave of my friend Bush, 
The only people I could take with me were my ADC, SPECT, and my two drivers, Nagel and Schumann. Not one of them is alive today.9 The Crimean campaign if I now attempt to describe the battles fought in the Crimea by 11th Army and its Romanian fellow combatants, my main reason for doing so is to commemorate my comrades of the Crimean Army. At the same time I should like to give the men who survived those battles a general account of the events of which they could have had only an incomplete picture at the time. These men put up a tremendous performance in the period 1941-2, fighting one battle after another against an adversary who almost invariably outnumbered them. In attack and pursuit their aggressive spirit was unparalleled, and when the situation appeared hopeless they would stand and fight unflinchingly. Often they may not have known what compelled us to make demands on them that seemed impossible to fulfill, or why they were flung from one action to another and from one front to the next. And yet they went to the very limit of endurance to carry out these demands, reciprocating the trust of those who led them. But 11th Army's campaign in the Crimea also deserves attention outside the immediate circle of its participants for it is one of the few cases where an army was still able to operate independently in a segregated theater of war, left to its own devices and free of interference from the supreme command. It was a campaign which, in ten months of incessant fighting, included both offensive and defensive battles, mobile warfare with full freedom of action, a headlong pursuit operation, landings by an enemy in control of the sea partisan engagements and an assault on a powerfully defended fortress. Finally, the campaign is of interest because it was fought over the Black Sea Peninsula which even today bears traces of the Greeks, Goths, Genoese and Tartars. Once before, in the War of 1854-6, this had been a focal point of history, and the names of places which played a role then, the Alma. Balaclava, Inkerman and Malakoff will be heard here all over again. Operationally, however, the War of 1854-6 can in no way be compared with the campaign fought in 1941-2. In the former case the Western powers enjoyed naval supremacy in all the advantages this implies, whereas in the Crimean campaign of 1941-2 it was the Russians who controlled the Black Sea. Our 11th Army had not only to conquer the Crimea and Shivastopol, but also to contend with all the possibilities open to the Russians by reason of their mastery at sea. The situation on my assumption of command on 17th of September 1941 I arrived at 11th Army HQ in Nikolaev, the Russian naval base at the mouth of the Bug, and took over command. My predecessor, Colonel General Ritter V. Skobert had been buried in the city the day before. On one of his daily visits to the front he had landed on a Russian minefield in his Fiesella Storch aircraft, and both he and his pilot had been killed. In him the German army lost an officer of great integrity and one of its most experienced front-line soldiers. His troops would have followed him anywhere. H.Q. 11th Army, whose operations staff was later to form the headquarters of Don Army Group was almost without exception a superb team of men, and I have grateful memories of the assistance I received from so many splendid officers in two and a half tough years of war. We got on extraordinarily well together, and when I relinquished my command in 1944 many of them did not want to remain on the staff. The novelty of my new position did not end with the expansion of my sphere of command from an army corps into an army. I did not discover until I reached Nikolaev that in addition to 11th Army I was also to take over 3rd Romanian Army, which was affiliated to it. For political reasons the actual chain of command in this part of the Eastern Front had not been easy to arrange. Command of the Allied forces committed from Romania 3rd and 4th Romanian Armies and 11th German Army had been entrusted to the Romanian head of state, Marshal Antonescu but at the same time he was bound by the directives of Southern Army Group, commanded by Field Marshal V. Rundstedt. HQ 11th Army had been acting as the connecting link between the Marshal and Army Group HQ and had advised him on operational matters. By the time I arrived, however, the situation was such that Antonescu only retained control of 4th Romanian Army, 
which he had directed to attack Odessa. The other Romanian army taking part in the campaign, the third, had been placed under command of 11th Army, which henceforth took its orders direct from HQ Southern Army Group. At the best of times, it is embarrassing for an army headquarters to have to control another self contained army in addition to its own, and the task was necessarily twice as difficult when the army in question happened to be an allied one. What made things harder still was that there were not only certain differences of organization, training and leadership between the two armies, as is always the case where allies are concerned but also a noticeable contrast in their fighting qualities. From time to time this led us to take a firmer hand in our allies handling of an operation than was usual with our own forces or desirable in the interest of good relations. That we were able, despite these difficulties, to collaborate with the Romanian headquarters staffs and fighting units without any real friction occurring was primarily due to the loyalty of the commander of 3rd Romanian Army, General, later Colonel General, Dumitrescu. The German liaison teams which we had attached to all Romanian staffs down to divisional level also contributed by their tact, and when necessary by their firmness, to this cooperation. The man most deserving of mention in this respect, however, is Marshal Antonescu. Whatever verdict posterity may pass on him as a politician, Antonescu was a real patriot, a good soldier and certainly our most loyal ally. He was a soldier who, having once bound up his country's destiny with that of the Reich, did everything possible until his overthrow to put Romania's military power and war potential to effective use on our side. If this did not always work out quite as he had hoped, the reason was to be found in the internal circumstances of his state and his regime. At all events, he remained faithful to his allies, and I can only speak with gratitude of our work together. As for the Romanian army, there is no doubt that it had considerable weaknesses. Although the Romanian soldier who was usually of peasant origin was modest in his wants and usually a capable, brave fighter, the possibilities of training him as an individual fighting man who could think for himself in action, let alone as a non-commissioned officer, were to a great extent limited by the low standard of general education in Romania. In cases where members of the German minority did come up to the necessary standard, Romanian national prejudice tended to impede any advancement. Neither were such outmoded practices as flogging likely to improve the quality of the rank and file. Their effect was rather to make Romanian soldiers of German stock do everything they could to join one of the German armed services or since the latter were not allowed to accept them the Waffen SS.1 disadvantage as far as the inner stability of Romanian troops was concerned was the absence of a non-commissioned officer corps as we know it. I am afraid people in Germany nowadays are all too ready to forget what a debt we have owed in the past to our excellent body of regular N.C.O.S. Another factor of far-reaching importance was that a considerable proportion of the Romanian officers holding senior and medium appointments were not up to requirement. Most of all, the Romanians lacked that close link between officers and men which tends to be taken for granted in the German army. Man management with them was entirely devoid of the Prussian tradition. Because they had no war experience, the combat training of the Romanians fell short of the exigencies of modern warfare. This led to unnecessary losses, which in turn was bound to affect morale. The military leaders, who had been under French influence since 1918, still thought in terms of World War I. Weapons and equipment were partly obsolete and also inadequate. This was particularly true of the anti-tank units, with the result that they could hardly be expected to hold their ground against Soviet tank attacks. Whether Germany could not have rendered more effective help in this respect is a question for others to decide. One final drawback regarding the use of Romanian troops on the Eastern Front was their terrific respect for the Russians. In difficult situations this was liable to end in a panic. Indeed. It is a problem of which account must be taken in any war against Russia involving Southeast European nations. In the case of the Bulgarians and Serbs the insecurity is increased by their sense of Slavonic affinity. There was one other factor that could not be entirely disregarded in any assessment of the combat efficiency of Romanian troops. 
at the time with which we are dealing Romania had already attained her fundamental war aim, the reconquest of Bessarabia. Even Transnistria, the territory between the Dniester and Bug which she had been persuaded to accept by Hitler, did not really lie within the scope of Romania's aspirations. It was understandable that the idea of pushing even further into the Russia they dreaded so much was none too warmly received by many Romanians. Despite all the defects and reservations mentioned above, however, the Romanian troops performed their duty as best they could. Above all, they always readily submitted to German military leadership and did not, like other allies of ours, put matters of prestige before material necessity. Undoubtedly the soldierly mentality of Marshal Antonescu exerted a decisive influence in this respect. To sum up, the verdict given me at the time by my advisers was that in the event of any substantial losses Third Romanian Army would cease to be capable of offensive action and only be fit for defense if reinforced by German corset bones. The sector I had to command formed the sunmost wing of the Eastern Front. Broadly speaking, it embraced the Crimea and the part of the Dnieper bend south of Zaporozhye. There was no direct contact with the main forces of Southern Army Group advancing north of the Dnieper, which was all to the good as far as 11th Army's operational freedom was concerned. After the forest tracts of northern Russia in which I had last had to operate with a tank corps unsuited to that type of country, I now found myself in the vast expanses of the steppes which were almost entirely devoid of natural obstacles, even if they did not offer any cover either. It was ideal tank country, but unfortunately 11th Army had no tanks. The only variety was offered by the smaller rivers, the beds of which dried up in summertime to form deep, steep banked fissures known as bulkers. Nevertheless, the very monotony of the steppes gave them a strange and unique fascination. Everyone was captivated at one time or other by the endlessness of the landscape, through which it was possible to drive for hours on end often guided only by the compass without encountering the least rise in the ground or setting eyes on a single human being or habitation. The distant horizon seemed like some mountain ridge behind which a paradise might beckon, but it only stretched on and on. The poles of the Anglo-Iranian telegraph line built some years before by Siemens, alone served to break the eternal sameness of it all. Yet at sunset these steps were transformed into a dazzling blaze of color. In the eastern part of the Nogaysk steps, around and northeast of Melitopol, one came upon lovely villages with such German names as Karlsruhe and Helenental. They lay in the midst of rich fruit plantations, their well-built stone houses bearing witness to a past prosperity. The inhabitants still spoke the purest German, but they were almost all old men, women and children. The men had been deported by the Soviet authorities. The task assigned to 11th Army by the Supreme Command inevitably committed it in two divergent directions. On one hand, by advancing on the right wing of Southern Army Group, it was intended to continue pursuing the enemy as he withdrew eastwards. To this end the main body of the army was to be brought forward along the north coast of the Sea of Azov in the general direction of Rostov. On the other hand, the army was also meant to take the Crimea a task given special priority. One reason for this was the favorable effect the capture of the peninsula was expected to have on the attitude of Turkey. Another even more pressing one was the threat of the enemy's big Crimean air bases to the Romanian oil fields, so vital to Germany. After the Crimea had been taken, the 11th Army's Corps of Mountain Troops was to move over the Straits of Kerch towards the Caucasus, evidently to reinforce an offensive beyond Rostov. At that time, therefore, the Supreme Command still had pretty far reaching aims for the 1941 campaign. It was soon to become apparent that the dual role allotted to 11th Army was unrealistic. At the beginning of September, 11th Army had forced a crossing over the Lower Dnieper at Birislavl, an exceptional feat of arms in which the main part had been played by 22, Lower Saxon, Infantry Division. Nonetheless, it marked the point where the duality of the army's task inevitably brought about a cleavage in its axis of advance. When I took command, I found myself confronted by the following situation: two Army Corps, 30 Corps under General V. Samoth, 
72 and 22 infantry divisions and Obstandarty Adolf Hitler, and 49 Mountain Corps under General Kubia, 170 infantry division and 1 in 4 mountain divisions, had continued their eastward pursuit of the enemy after his defeat on the Dnieper and were approaching the line from Malitopol to the Dnieper bend south of Zaporozhye. One Corps the 54th under General Hansen had been diverted to the approach to the Crimea, the Perekopismus. 50 Infantry Division, which had come from Greece, was partly under 4th Romanian Army before Odessa and partly engaged in mopping up the Black Sea coast. 3rd Romanian Army, comprising a Mountain Corps, 1, 2 and 4 Mountain Brigades, and a Cavalry Corps, 5, 6 and 8 Cavalry Brigades, was still west of the Dnieper, where it proposed to rest for a while. In doing so it was probably guided by a desire to avoid any advance beyond the river, since it had already exceeded Romania's political aims in having to cross the bug. Faced with this dual mission of pursuing the enemy eastwards to Rostov and conquering the Crimea for a subsequent drive through Kerch to the Caucasus, 11th Army headquarters had to decide whether to deal with the two divergent tasks simultaneously or in chronological order. A decision which was really the responsibility of the Supreme Command was thus left to an army. It seemed quite certain that both tasks could not be solved simultaneously with the forces we had at our disposal. The capture of the Crimea called for a considerably stronger force than 54 Corps, now facing Perekop. Although the intelligence picture indicated that only three divisions of the enemy army were likely to have escaped from the Dnieper into the Isthmus. It was not clear what forces the Russians had available in the Crimea itself, particularly at Shivastopol. Soon afterwards it emerged that the enemy could put not three but six divisions into action in the Isthmus itself. These were later to be reinforced by the Soviet army then defending Odessa. Ten in view of the nature of the ground, however, a stubborn defense by even three enemy divisions would probably suffice to deny 54 core access to the Crimea or at least to cause it considerable losses in the fight through the Isthmus. The Crimea is divided from the mainland by the so called Lazy Sea, the Zivash. This is a kind of mud flat or brackish swamp, almost impassable for infantry and an absolute obstacle to assault boats on account of its extreme shallowness. There are only two firm approaches to the Crimea the Isthmus of Perekop in the west and a neck of land running west of Genishesk in the east. The latter is so narrow in places as only to leave room for a causeway and railway embankment, both of which are interspersed with long stretches of bridges. For the purpose of an attack, therefore, it was quite useless. As even the Perekop Isthmus was less than five miles wide, the assault would have to be purely frontal and over ground quite devoid of cover. A flanking attack was ruled out by the proximity of the sea on either side. In addition to being already equipped with strong field defenses, the isthmus was cut straight across the middle by Tartar's ditch, an ancient earthwork anything up to 50 feet in depth. Once the Perekop isthmus had been broken through, there was another bottleneck to be tackled further south at Ishan where salt lakes reduced the potential assault front to a mere two miles. In view of these difficulties on the ground and the enemy's superiority in the air, we had to expect a hard and exhausting struggle. Even if we succeeded in breaking through at Perekop, it was doubtful whether the Corps would still have the strength to fight a second battle at Ishan. In any case, two or three divisions would never be enough to conquer the whole of the Crimea including Shivastopol. To ensure a swift occupation of the Crimea, therefore, the army had at all costs to detach strong additional forces from its pursuit group now heading eastwards. What remained should still suffice for the pursuit as long as the enemy continued to withdraw though it would be too weak for an objective as remote as Rostov if he were to form a new front further back or actually bring up fresh forces. Should it be considered crucial to advance on Rostov, the Crimea would have to be left behind for the time being. In that event, however, it would be difficult to tell when, if ever, the forces needed to conquer the peninsula could be made available. Besides, in the hands of an enemy with command of the sea the Crimea was liable to become a serious menace deep in the flank of the Eastern Front, 
quite apart from the fact that the air bases would continue to threaten the Romanian oil fields. If the attempt were made to conduct a far reaching operation towards and beyond Rostov with two army corps and simultaneously to conquer the Crimea with one other corps, the only result could be that neither objective would be effectively attained. 11th Army accordingly decided to give priority to the Crimea. At all costs we were determined not to tackle this task with insufficient forces. As a matter of course 54 Corps was given all the available army artillery, engineers and anti-aircraft guns, in addition to which it was to call forward 50 infantry division from its relocation at the latest in time for the second phase, the battle for the Ishan Isthmus. But this was still not enough. It was imperative to have a second corps in order to conquer the Crimea quickly after the breakthrough if indeed it were not actually needed to fight through the lakes at Ishan. We decided that this should be the German Mountain Corps, which the Supreme Command had anyway earmarked in its directives to be moved up through Kerch to the Caucasus later on. Meanwhile this formation of two divisions could be put to better use in the mountainous parts of the southern Crimea than out in the steppes. Apart from all this, an attempt was to be made, once we had broken into the peninsula itself, to take the fortress of Shivastopol by a surprise thrust with motorized units. For this purpose the Lubstand RT was to assemble behind 54 Corps when it went into the assault. These dispositions naturally entailed a considerable weakening of the army's eastern front. All that could be found to replace the forces there apart from the elements of 22 infantry division being used on coastal defense north of the Crimea, was 3rd Romanian Army. Despite the Romanian inhibitions to which I alluded earlier, I was able to arrange in a personal talk with General Dumatrescu that his army should be moved quickly forward over the Dnieper. It was perfectly clear that the measures taken by 11th Army would involve considerable risks if the enemy on its eastern front were to halt his retreat and try to regain the initiative there. This was the price that had to be paid if we were to avoid attempting the capture of the Crimea with inadequate forces. Battle on two fronts breakthrough at Perekop and the battle on the Sea of Azov while supply difficulties caused the preparations for 54 Corps attack on the Perekop Isthmus to drag on till 24 September and our forces were still regrouping on the lines already indicated, there were signs of a change in the situation on the army's eastern front from 21st September onwards. The enemy had taken up prepared positions along a front from west of Malitopol to the Dnieper Bend with the result that the pursuit had to be discontinued. Nonetheless, the army went ahead with the disengagement of the German Mountain Corps, giving orders for the remaining German formations to be mixed in with those of 3rd Romanian Army in order to keep the risk down to a minimum. The Romanian Cavalry Corps in the southern sector of this front was incorporated into 30 German Corps while 3rd Romanian Army in the north took over 170 German infantry division to bolster the Romanian Mountain Corps. By 24th of September 54 Corps was able to move into the assault on the Perekop Isthmus. Though given maximum artillery support, 45 and 73 infantry divisions had the hardest possible conditions to fight under, having to advance in blazing sunshine across salt steps on which there was no trace of water or cover. The enemy had transformed the Isthmus into a powerful, 10 mile deep defense system, and he fought bitterly for every single trench and strong point. Nevertheless, after warding off strong enemy counterattacks, the Corps took Perekop and crossed Tata's Ditch on 26 September. Three more days intensive fighting saw it through the rest of the enemy's defense zone, and, after the capture of the strongly defended locality of Armyansk, out into more open country. The enemy fell back between the Ishan lakes, having suffered heavy losses in killed and left 10,000 prisoners, 112 tanks and 135 guns in our hands. But the fruit of this hard-won victory, the final breakout into the Crimea, could still not be blocked. Although the enemy's losses had been heavy, the number of divisions facing the Corps had meanwhile risen to six. 
in all likelihood any attempt to go straight ahead with the storming of the Ishan bottleneck would have been too much for our troops, in view of the relative strengths involved and the tremendous sacrifices it would have imposed on the German corps. As for 11th Army's proposal to have reinforcements to hand at this juncture in the form of the Mountain Corps and the Obstandarty, the enemy had already thwarted it. Obviously anticipating that we were intent on a speedy conquest of the Crimea, he had brought fresh forces up to his front between the Sea of Azov and the Dnieper. Here, on 26 September, he had attacked our army's eastern front with two new armies, the 18th and 9th, consisting of 12 divisions which were mainly new arrivals or recently rested. In the first assault he had admittedly failed to score any successes against our own 30 corps though even here the situation became pretty tense but in the sector of 3rd Romanian army he had overrun the latter's 4 mountain brigade and torn a gap 10 miles wide in the army front. The brigade in question had lost the bulk of its artillery and seemed to be at the end of its tether. Both the other Romanian mountain brigades had also suffered severe losses. We now had no choice but to make the German mountain corps, which was already on its way to the Perecopismus, do a right about turn in order to set about restoring the position of 3rd Romanian Army. Simultaneously, moreover, 11th Army was virtually deprived of the services of its one fast moving formation, the Lbstandarty as we were now ordered by the Supreme Command to hold it in hand for the drive on Rostov as part of 1st Panzer Group, to which it would shortly be transferred. We thus had to abstain from using the Lobstandarty to exploit the success in the Isthmus, and it was likewise ordered back to the Eastern Front. In order to be close to the Army's two fronts, the Army Operations Branch had on 21st September established a tactical headquarters at Ascania Novo in the Nogaysk steppes, which had once been the property of a German family, the Faltzfeins. Formerly a model estate known all over Russia, it had now become a collective farm. The manor buildings were sadly neglected, and the retreating Soviet troops had destroyed all the machinery just as they had thrown petrol over the mountains of threshed wheat lying out in the open air and set them on fire. The latter smoldered for weeks on end without our being able to extinguish them. The increasing gravity of the situation on the army's front impelled us to move close up behind the danger spot with a small tactical staff on 29th September. This is always an expedient measure in times of crisis if only because it prevents subordinate staffs from pulling out early and making a bad impression on the troops. On the occasion in question it was particularly appropriate in view of the tendency of many Romanian headquarters staffs to change their locations prematurely. The same day, the German Mountain Corps and the Lobstandarty delivered a thrust into the enemy's southern flank where he had broken into 3rd Romanian army but had failed to exploit his initial success properly. While it was possible to restore the situation in this area, a fresh crisis was brewing on the northern wing of 30 Corps, where a Romanian cavalry brigade had given way. I had to intervene vigorously there and then to prevent its hasty withdrawal. The threatened breakthrough was then parried by swinging round the Lobstandarty to meet it. Tense though the situation on our eastern front had become as a result of the events described above, it also had the makings of a golden opportunity. By launching repeated attacks to frustrate our intentions in the Crimea, the enemy had tied both his armies down on a frontal basis and obviously now had no further reserves with which to protect himself against the Dnieper crossings at Zaporozhye and Dnipropetrovsk, whence General V. Klist's first Panzer group could break out against his northern flank. After I had made representations to Southern Army Group some days previously in favor of an intervention from this quarter, the appropriate orders were issued on 1st October. While 11th Army kept a tight hold on the still attacking enemy, the Panzer Group steadily increased its pressure from the north. Now the enemy began to yield, and by 1st October it was the turn of 30 Corps and 3rd Romanian Army to go over to the attack. In the next few days, in cooperation with 1st Panzer Group, we succeeded in encircling the mass of both enemy armies in the area ball. Took Mac Mariupol Berdyansk Corps in destroying them as they retreated. Some 65,000 prisoners, 
125 tanks and over 500 guns found their way into German hands on this occasion. The conquest of the Crimea following the Battle of the Sea of Azov a change was made in the order of Battle of the German Southern Wing. The Supreme Command seemed to have realized that no army could simultaneously fight one operation in the direction of Rostov and another in the Crimea, and from now on the advance on Rostov was entrusted to 1st Panzer Group to which 11th Army was ordered to hand over 49 Mountain Corps and the Lobstandarty. 11th Army was given the sole task of conquering the Crimea with its two remaining Army Corps. Of these, 30 Corps comprised 22, 72 and 170 Infantry Divisions, and 54 Corps was composed of 46, 73 and 50 Infantry Divisions one third of the last named being still outside Odessa. Third Romanian army, which now reverted to the command of Marshal Antonescu, was merely to be responsible for coastal defense on the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. After I had approached the Marshal direct, however, he agreed to let me take the headquarters of the Romanian Mountain Corps, with one cavalry and one mountain brigade under command into the Crimea to screen the eastern coastline. Now that 11th Army's mission was reduced to the single aim of conquering the Crimea, however, the Supreme Command became all the more impatient for a corps to be put across the Straits of Kerch towards the Cuban at the earliest possible date. Realizing from this demand how much Hitler was underestimating the enemy, 11th Army felt impelled to point out that the prior conditions for any such operation must be the complete clearance of the Crimea. The enemy would undoubtedly fight to the last for the peninsula and would abandon Odessa rather than Shevastopol. Indeed, as long as the Soviets had even one foot in the Crimea there could be no question of throwing part of 11th Army which had only two core anyway through Kerch to the Cuban. As it was, we took this opportunity to put in a bid for an extra corps of three divisions, and within the next few weeks primarily, one would suppose, because of Hitler's above mentioned requirement the army was augmented by 42 corps headquarters and 132 and 24 infantry divisions. In consequence of the Russians' desperate efforts to hold on to the Crimea, these reinforcements were to prove indispensable for the peninsula battles alone. The struggle for the Ishanis must the immediate problem, however, was to resume the struggle for the approaches to the Crimea and to open up the way through Ishan. Just another assault operation, one might say. Yet that 10 day battle towers above the normal type of offensive action as a shining example of the aggressive spirit and self sacrifice of the German soldier. In it, we lacked almost all the advantages which are generally regarded as prior necessities for an attack on fortified positions. Numerical superiority was on the side of the Soviet defenders, not of the German attackers. 11th Army's total of six divisions was very soon confronted by eight Soviet rifle and four cavalry divisions, for on 16th October the Russians had evacuated the fortress of Odessa until then the object of so many unsuccessful assaults by 4th Romanian Army and transferred the defending army to the Crimea by sea. Despite the Luftwaffe's claim to have sunk 32,000 tons of shipping, the bulk of the convoys from Odessa had still made landfall at Shivastopol or harbors along the west coast of the peninsula. The first divisions of this Soviet army duly appeared at the battlefront shortly after the start of our offensive. The German artillery was certainly superior to the enemy's and effectively supported the attacking infantry. But on the enemy side, armor plated coastal batteries were able to intervene from the northwest coast of the Crimea and the southern bank of the Zivash without the German guns initially being able to get to grips with them. And while the Russians had abundant armor to draw on for their counter attacks, 11th Army did not possess a single tank. Above all, senior commanders had hardly any opportunity to lighten the troops' arduous task by tactical maneuver. In that situation it was quite impossible to take the enemy by surprise, since all he had to do was to sit in his well-constructed fieldworks and wait for the assault to develop. As had been the case at Perekop, the sea on one side and the Zivash on the other excluded any possibility of outflanking or even enfilading the enemy. 
on the contrary, it was necessary to carry the attack forward purely frontally along the three narrow strips of land into which the isthmus was divided by the lakes lying within it. The breadth of these three strips allowed us to commit only the three divisions of 54 Corps, 73, 46 and 22, in the first instance, 30 Corps being unable to go in until a certain amount of elbow room had been gained further south. The salt steps of the isthmus flat as a pancake and bare of vegetation, offered no cover whatever to the attacker. Yet the air above them was dominated by the Soviet Air Force, whose fighters and fighter bombers dived incessantly on any target they could find. Not only the frontline infantry and field batteries had to dig in, it was even necessary to dig pits for every vehicle and horse behind the battle zone as protection against enemy aircraft. Things got so bad that anti-aircraft batteries no longer dared to fire in case they were immediately wiped out from the air. Not until the last days of the offensive, after Mulder's 11, and his fighter group had been called in to assist the army, could the sky be kept clear and even then only in the hours of daylight. At night time not even Mulder's could help. Dot under such combat conditions, and in the face of an opponent who stubbornly defended every inch of ground. The demands made on the attacking troops were bound to be abnormally high and their losses very considerable. Throughout this period I was constantly on the road to see for myself how things were going and what assistance could be rendered to the fighting units in their difficult struggle. I was alarmed by the way fighting power deteriorated. The divisions carrying out this tough assignment had already made heavy sacrifices at Perekop or in the Azov battle and the time came when one wondered whether the struggle for the narrow corridors could possibly succeed or, assuming that we did manage to break through, whether our forces would still be equal to winning the Crimea from an enemy whose strength was constantly on the increase. By 25th October the troops seemed too exhausted to go on with the attack. Twice already the commander of one particularly good division had reported that the regiments under his command were at the end of their strength. This was the hour that usually comes sooner or later in such a contest, when the outcome of the battle is on the razor's edge. It was the hour that must show whether the will of the attacker to exert himself to the very limit of physical endurance is stronger than that of the defender to go on resisting. The struggle of deciding whether to call for a last supreme effort, at the risk of having ultimately demanded all that sacrifice in vain, is one that can only be fought out in the heart of the commander concerned. It would be pointless, however, were it not inspired by the confidence of the troops and their determination not to give up the fight. 11th Army was not prepared, after all it had had to ask of the fighting troops, to throw victory away through its own weakness at what might be 1 minute to 12. As it turned out, the unbroken aggressive spirit of the troops overcame even the enemy's grim resolution to hold out. After one more day of hard effort, 27th October brought the final success. On 18th October, at the end of ten days of the most bitter fighting, the Soviet defense collapsed. 11th Army could take up the pursuit. Pursue with chase which followed gave one more splendid example of the boldness and initiative of commanders at all levels and the self-denial of the fighting troops. The sight of those regiments weakened by their heavy losses and well nigh exhausted by the unprecedented demands of the campaign, yet racing towards the tempting goal of the South Crimean coast, put one in mind of the soldiers of another army who in 1796 stormed the fields of Italy promised them by Napoleon. By 16th November the furious chase was over, and the whole of the Crimea except for the fortified area of Shivastopol was in our hands. The six divisions of 11th Army had wiped out the best part of two enemy armies totaling 12 rifle and four cavalry divisions. Of his initial strength of around 200,000 men, the enemy had lost over 100,000 as prisoners in the struggle for the two necks of land and the pursuit that followed, as well as 700 guns and 160 tanks. What troops had been able to escape across the Straits of Kerch or into Shivastopol were mere debris and without any heavy weapons. The fact that those taking refuge in the fortress could immediately be reformed into proper units was due to the enemy's command of the sea, which enabled him to bring in replacements and stores with a minimum of delay. While the administrative branches of 11th Army HQ moved into Zimferopol, 
the largely Russianized capital of the Crimea lying in beautiful surroundings on the northern edge of the Yale Mountains, our tactical headquarters went to Zarabus, a sizable village north of the city, where we found very suitable accommodation in one of the new schools built by the Soviets in almost all the bigger country places. I personally lived with the chief of staff in the small farmhouse of the Fruit Growing Collective, where each of us had a modest room to himself. The furniture in my own consisted of a bed, a table and chair, a stool for the wash bowl to stand on, and a few clothes hooks. Naturally we could have obtained some furniture from Zimferopol, but our staff did not believe in indulging in comforts which the ordinary soldier had to do without dot except for two brief stays at a command post on the Kerch front and the period in which the tactical headquarters was up in front of Shevastopol. We remained in these unpretentious quarters until August 1942. After the nomadic life we had led to date it was a complete change for all of us, though not necessarily a welcome one. Whenever a formation staff becomes static, the inevitable result is not only a settled day-to-day -day routine but also a return to the paper war. I fought the paper war of that winter in my classroom between two little brick stoves we had built on the Russian pattern the heating system having naturally been destroyed by the Soviets. At this point I might touch on a problem which, even though it receded before the grave anxieties which the winter of 1941-2 was to cause us in the operational sphere, was always a matter of great concern to me. The man who commands an army is also its supreme arbiter, and the hardest task that can ever confront him is the confirmation of a death sentence. On one hand it is his inexorable duty to maintain discipline and, in the troops' own interest, to inflict severe penalties for delinquency in action. On the other, it is a grim thought to know that one can snuff out a human life by a mere signature. Of course, death claims thousands of victims a day in war, and every soldier expects to have to lay down his life. Yet there is a very big difference between falling honorably in battle and facing the muzzles of one's comrades rifles to be ignominiously erased from the ranks of the living. When, of course, a soldier had besmirched the honor of the army by some base action or culpably brought about the death of his comrades, there could be no mercy. But there were plenty of other cases caused not by sheer baseness of character but by some perfectly explainable human lapse. Even so, the court-martial concerned had to pass the death sentence according to the full rigor of military law. In no case involving a death sentence was I ever content to base my final decision on the verbal elucidations of my army judges admirable men though they were but I always made a careful study of the files myself. When two soldiers in my corps were sentenced to death on the outbreak of war for aping and killing an old woman, they only received their just deserts. A very different case was that of a man who, after winning the Iron Cross in the Polish campaign, had been posted to a strange unit following a spell in hospital. On his very first day though his whole machine gun crew was killed, whereupon he lost his nerve and fled. By law, it is true, his life was forfeit, but there still seemed grounds in this instance even though the man had been guilty of cowardice and thereby of endangering unit morale for applying a different yardstick. As I could not immediately quash the sentence passed by the court-martial, the procedure I adopted in this and other such cases was to consult the man's regimental commander and, subject to the latter's agreement, to suspend the sentence for four weeks. If the man redeemed himself in action during this time, I quashed the sentence. If he failed again, it was carried out. Of all the condemned men to whom this probationary period was granted, only one went over to the enemy. All the others either proved their worth or died like true soldiers in the heavy fighting in the east. The first assault on Shevas top Olovanth army's task now was to assault the enemy's last Crimean stronghold, Shevastopol. The sooner this was achieved, the less time the enemy would have to organize his defense and the greater would be the prospect of success. What was more, it reduced the likelihood of an intervention from the sea. According to our calculations, the necessary troop movements and ammunition dumping would be complete by 27th or 28th November. Consequently, we made this the deadline for the start of the offensive. At this point, the Russian winter overtook us, 
its impact being all the more devastating by reason of the two different forms it took. In the Crimea itself the rains came, very soon rendering all the unpaved roads the quite unusable. The mainland in the north, on the other hand, was already in the grip of severe frosts which promptly immobilized four of the only five railway engines then available south of the Dnieper. In consequence 11th Army often found its supplies reduced to as little as one or two train loads a day. Though there was ice on the Dnieper, it still would not hold, and so far no ice-free bridges existed. Dot and so the preparations for the assault dragged on. Instead of 27th November, the preliminary bombardment could not start until 17th December. At last, after a three weeks delay which was ultimately to prove crucial, 54 and 30 Corps were able to launch their attacks against the northern and southern sectors respectively. Prior to this, however, 11th Army had had a difficult decision to make. On 17 October the critical turn of events around Rostov had caused the army group to order the immediate handover of 73 and 170 infantry divisions. Despite all our warnings that this would make it impossible to attack Shivastopol, we had only been allowed to keep 170 division, which was still moving along the coast to join 30 Corps, and would not have reached Rostov in time anyway. This concession did not alter the fact that the removal of 73 Division deprived the assault on the northern sector of its necessary reserve element, and we had to make up our minds whether in these circumstances we could afford to attack at all. In the event, we decided to risk it. It is not possible here to describe the course of the attack in detail. The first task was to drive the enemy, by a surprise thrust from the east, from his forward area between the Kaka and Belbek and at the same time to capture his strong points in the Belbek Valley and along its southern elevation. Thereupon the assault would be carried forward through the actual fortress glassy south of the Belbek right up to Sevenaya Bay. The main responsibility for the success of this battle lay with the Valiant 22, Lower Saxon, Infantry Division, under its outstanding commander, Lieutenant General Wolf. It cleared the forward area between the Kaka and Belbek of the enemy stormed the heights south of the Belbek Valley with 132 infantry division and drove into the fortified zone proper to the south of the latter. But the spearhead of the attack was steadily narrowing, as 50 and 24 infantry divisions, whose task was to advance towards Sevenaya Bay from the east, were not making any real progress in the difficult mountain country, parts of which were overgrown with almost impenetrable bush. The heavy fighting for the pillboxes, which the enemy defended with stubborn determination, was sapping the strength of our troops, and the severe cold to which they were henceforth exposed taxed their energies to the utmost. Nevertheless, in the last few days of December the struggle having continued all through Christmas the tip of the spearhead drew near to Fort Stalin, the capture of which would at least have given our artillery visual command of Sevenaya Bay. All we needed now were fresh troops and the drive to the bay was bound to succeed. But these were just what we had lacked since handing over 73 division, and not even by drastically packing the assault divisions into the spearhead of the attack could we make good the loss. Such was the situation when the Soviet landings struck, first at Kerch and then at Fodosia. The threat was a deadly one, coming as it did at the very moment when the entire forces of the army except for one German division and two Romanian brigades, were in action around Shivastopol. It was clear that we should have to throw forces from Shivastopol to the threatened points with the utmost speed. The slightest delay might prove fatal. But ought the attack on Shivastopol to be abandoned just when only one more push seemed necessary to gain command of Seven Air Bay? Furthermore, it would almost certainly be easier to disengage forces from Shivastopol after a success on the northern front than if one were to let go of the enemy prematurely. 11th Army accordingly decided to accept the risk involved in every further hour's postponement of the release of troops from Shivastopol. Initially, only 30 Corps was ordered to halt its assault, and 170 Division was dispatched to the threatened Kerch Peninsula. At the same time, 
with the agreement of the commander of 54 Corps and his divisional commanders, a final attempt was to be made on the northern front to reach the assault objective, 7 I obey. As always, the troops gave everything they had, and 22 divisions vanguard, 16 infantry regiment, under Colonel V. Koltitz, actually penetrated the outring of Fort Stalin. By then everyone's strength had given out, and on 30th December the commanders of the assault divisions reported that no further attempts to carry on with the attack could be expected to succeed. After urgent representations by telephone through Army Group had convinced even Hitler that such action was necessary, 11th Army Headquarters issued orders for the attack to be finally stopped. Over and above this, it was reluctantly compelled to order the withdrawal of the Northern Front to the heights north of the Belbeck Valley. But for these measures the requisite forces could not have been released to say nothing of the fact that the situation within the narrow confines of the spearhead would anyway have been untenable in the long run. Hitler's disapproval of this decision, which though he could do nothing about it clashed with the strict ban he had just placed on any voluntary withdrawals weighed little in comparison with one's own responsibility to the troops who had sacrificed so much. And so the first attempt to storm the fortress of Shivastopol had failed. The Stalin offensive to reconquer the Crimea the landing of Soviet troops on the Kerch Peninsula, catching 11th Army just when the battle on the northern front of Shivastopol had entered its crucial phase, soon proved to be more than a mere diversionary measure on the enemy's part. Soviet radio stations proclaimed that this was an all-out offensive to reconquer the Crimea, planned and commanded by Stalin personally, and that it would not end until 11th Army had been wiped off the map. That the threat was no empty one soon became apparent from the weight of enemy forces committed. Behind them, and in the utter ruthlessness with which they were expended, one sensed the brutal will of Stalin. On 26 December, after crossing the Straits of Kerch, the enemy had begun by landing two divisions on either side of the city. Smaller landings followed on the northern coast of the peninsula. The position of 42 Corps, General Count Sponek, which depended solely on 46 Infantry Division for the defense of the peninsula, was certainly not an enviable one. Count Sponek accordingly requested permission to evacuate the peninsula in the hope that it could be sealed off at Papak. 11th Army did not agree with him, for if the enemy succeeded in establishing a firm footing at Kerch, the upshot would be a second front in the Crimea and an extremely dangerous situation for the entire army as long as Shivastopol remained untaken. Consequently we ordered 42 corps to strike while the enemy was still off balance after his landing and to hurl him back into the sea. At the same time, in order to keep the whole of 46 Division free for this task, we sent four and eight Romanian mountain brigades of which the former was around Zimferopol and the latter engaged in guarding the eastern coast of the Crimea to Fodosia to deal with any attempt the enemy might make to land at this critical spot. Simultaneously orders were given to the only regimental group of 73 division still in the Crimea that is the reinforced 213 infantry regiment to move on Fodosia from Genechek. By 28th of December, 46 Infantry Regiment actually succeeded in eliminating both the enemy beachheads north and south of Kerch, except for a small body of troops still fighting on the northern shore. In spite of this, Count Sponek again asked permission to evacuate the Kerch Peninsula. This we categorically forbade, still being convinced that any surrender of the Kerch Peninsula might well lead to a situation which the army would be unable to master with the forces at its disposal. Meanwhile, on 28th of December, 54 Corps had moved off for its last attack on Shivastopol. Yet the enemy was on the point of delivering a new blow. Early on 29th December, we heard that he had carried out a night landing at Fodosia under cover of strong naval forces. Our own weak forces there, one engineer battalion, anti tank troops, and some coastal batteries, the Romanians not having started to arrive until the following morning had been unable to stop the landing. Our telephone link with 42 Corps headquarters, which was located somewhere in the middle of the peninsula, was out of action, but at 1000 hours we were notified by radio that Count Sponek had ordered the immediate evacuation of the peninsula because of the new landings at Fodosia. 
though we immediately issued a countermand, it was never picked up by 42 core signals. While fully appreciating the core anxiety not to be cut off by the enemy at Phodosia, we still did not believe that the situation would in any way be improved by a headlong withdrawal. Simultaneously with countermanding the evacuation of the Kerch Peninsula, 11th Army ordered the Romanian Mountain Corps to throw the enemy forces disembarked at Phodosia straight back into the sea with the help of the two brigades mentioned earlier and a Romanian motorized regiment now in the process of moving up. Although we had no illusions about the offensive capacity of these Romanian formations, the enemy could still not be present at Phodosia in any real strength, and if we struck with real determination, it should be possible to catch him at a disadvantage. At the worst, we felt, the Romanians would manage to contain the enemy in a narrow beachhead around Phodosia until German troops could get their dot development of the situation on the Kerch Peninsula even this hope was to prove illusory, however. Far from carrying home its attack on Phodosia, the Romanian Mountain Corps actually allowed a handful of Soviet tanks to push it right back to a point east of Stari Krim. By a series of forced marches 46 Infantry Division did in fact reach the narrow stretch of land at Papak. In doing so, however, it had to abandon most of its guns on the ice-covered roads, and its troops arrived in a state of complete exhaustion. From the small beachhead still in his hands north of Kerch the enemy was immediately able to take up the pursuit, the speed with which his reinforcements arrived being due to the freezing over of the straits. Had the Soviet commander pressed home his advantage properly by pursuing 46th Division really hard from Kerch and thrusting relentlessly after the Romanians as they fell back from Phodosia, the fate of the entire 11th Army would have been at stake. As it happened, he did not know when to take time by the forelock. Either he did not realize what a chance he had, or else he did not venture to seize it. Dot and so it was possible, with the help of an exhausted 46th Division, 213 Infantry Regiment, which had meanwhile arrived from Jenicek, and the Romanians, to build up a protective front, albeit a perilously thin one between the northern slopes of the Yale Mountains near Starikrim and the Zivash west of Akmon. -a. In order to stiff the Romanian troops and safeguard their heavy weapons, all available German officers and men, including those who could be spared from 11th Army headquarters, were attached to Romanian units. By 15th of January, 30 and 42 Corps were ready to counterattack on the Phodosia front. The decision to risk this attack was a hard one for it had to be launched with three and a half weakened German divisions and Romanian Mountain Brigade against an opponent whose strength had meanwhile increased to eight divisions and one brigade. The enemy, moreover, had a limited number of tanks at his disposal, whereas we had none at all. The support of the Luftwaffe was more than doubtful, since bad weather had prevented it from flying any sorties against Phodosia for the last few days. Nevertheless, we had to take the chance and attack. Thanks to the bravery of the troops, the attack succeeded, and by 18th January Phodosia was ours. In addition to 6,700 dead, the enemy had lost 10,000 prisoners, 177 guns, and 85 tanks. It now emerged that the Luftwaffe had still done a good job in Phodosia harbor, in spite of the bad flying conditions and had sunk a number of transport vessels. Our success at Phodosia naturally led us to consider the possibility of immediately exploiting it to get the Soviet armies right out of the Kerch Peninsula. But desirable though this would have been, 11th Army decided, after careful reflection, that it could not be done with the resources available, especially now that a tank battalion and two bomber wings originally promised to us the very forces we should have needed for the task in question had had to go to the army group. 11th army thus had to dispense with any sweeping exploitation of its achievements at Phodosia and to content itself with throwing the enemy back as far as the Parpark bottleneck, where the Kerch Peninsula could be sealed off between the Black Sea and the Sea of Azov. 
There was certainly nothing pusillanimous about this decision, we simply realized that after everything the troops had gone through to date, it might cause very serious reverses to demand too much of them now. The Stalin offensive continues even though the recapture of Phodosia and the sealing off of the Kerch Peninsula at Parpark had temporarily banished a mortal danger, we did not let that lull us into a false sense of security. At that particular time the enemy was striving everywhere on the Eastern Front to make good his defeats of the previous summer and to regain the initiative. Why should he make an exception of the Crimea, where his mastery of the sea offered him such exceptionally good prospects? Success here could have decisive repercussions on the entire situation in the East politically with regard to Turkey and economically through the recovery of a base for air operations against the Romanian oil fields. Another point to consider was that Soviet propaganda had linked the offensive against the Crimea so closely with the name of Stalin that it was most unlikely to be called off. And, sure enough, we soon discovered that the enemy was pushing reinforcements across to Kerch. Having possession of the frozen straits, he could put up with the loss of the port of Phodosia. Air photography continually showed the enemy to be concentrated in strength in his Black Sea harbors and the airfields in the area north of the Caucasus, and as early as 29th January intelligence estimates of his strength on the Parpark front amounted to more than nine divisions, two rifle brigade groups and two independent tank brigades. The Shivastopol front was also livening up again particularly where the artillery was concerned. After weeks of outward calm that were really loaded with tension, the enemy finally launched his big offensive on 27 February. The heavy battles that followed on both the Parpark and Shivastopol fronts continued with unremitting violence until 3 March. Then on both sides a period of exhaustion ensued. On the Parpark front we had eventually succeeded in containing the enemy breakthrough in the northern sector by making effective use of the marshlands there. Although the front was now a continuous one, however, it did recede quite a long way west in its northern part. On 13 March the enemy began another mass attack, this time with eight trifle divisions and two independent armoured brigades up. While we were able to knock out 136 tanks in the first three days, a number of crises developed. The bitterness of the fighting may be judged from the fact that the regiments of 46th Division, which bore the main brunt of the assault on this occasion, had to beat off anything from 10 to 22 attacks between them during the same three days. On 18th of March, 42 Corps had to report that it could no longer withstand any major attacks. As the newly constituted 22 Panzer Division had arrived behind this front in the meantime, having been allocated to 11th Army by OKH, we decided that the extreme tenseness of the situation justified our employing it on a counter attack. Our object was to regain the main fighting line we had originally held across the actual neck of the Parpark Isthmus and thereby to cut off the two or three enemy divisions located in the northern salient. Together with a very small tactical staff, I had moved into a command post close behind the threatened Parpark front in order to watch the preparations for the counterattack being handled by 42 Corps headquarters. The attack which took place on 20th March and was to be supported on either flank by 46 and 170 infantry divisions, proved a failure. The new armoured division ran straight into a Soviet assembly area in the early morning mists. Obviously we had been wrong to throw it into a major battle before putting it through its paces in exercises with its parent formation. While this attack, despite its being directed at a relatively limited objective miscarried, the same division came fully up to expectations only a few weeks later, after completing its training under warlike conditions as part of a larger formation. But what else could we have done in the circumstances but risk committing it to battle? At least it had given the enemy a severe shock and checked his preparations for another big attack at just the critical moment. When the latter did materialize on 20th March, it was beaten off by 42 Corps. This time the enemy had committed only four divisions, either because he had temporarily exhausted his other formations or because he preferred to limit his objective now that tanks had been seen on our side for the first time. In the meantime, while 22 Panzer Division was out of the line for a rest and refit, 
the advance elements of 28 Light Division also arrived behind the front. 12. We could now face any new enemy attack with equanimity. It came, and this was the enemy's last effort to reconquer the Crimea on 9 April, launched by between 6 and 8 rifle divisions and supported by 160 tanks. By NTH April, it had been beaten off, with heavy losses to the enemy. With that the enemy's offensive capacity in this part of the theatre was finally spent. The stout-hearted divisions which had seen this defensive battle through to a successful conclusion, despite the tremendous strains it imposed on them, were now able to relax, even though they could not be taken out of the line. Army headquarters, on the other hand, turned from an arduous winter of unprecedented trials and crisis to the next task it had to tackle that of preparing its own offensive for the final expulsion of the Russians from the Crimea. Operation Busted Reconquest of the Kerch Peninsula Between the penultimate and last defensive battle in the Kerch Peninsula, Marshal Antonsky had come out to the Crimea and gone round with me on a tour of the Romanian divisions and the Shivastopol front. In his soldierly way he made an excellent impression and the senior Romanian officers seemed to go in mortal fear of him. I was particularly grateful for his promise of two more Romanian divisions, since apart from the two German divisions which had already arrived, 22 Panzer and 28 Light, OKH was unable to provide any further forces for the projected offensive. According to OKH directives, the final expulsion of the Soviets from the Crimea, including Shivastopol, was intended to preface the grand offensive which the Supreme Command planned to launch in the southern sector of the Eastern Front. 11th Army's first concern was obviously to destroy the enemy in the Kerch Peninsula. One reason for this was the impossibility of predicting how long an operation to clear Shivastopol would take. The most important one, however, was that the Kerch Front, being the easiest to reinforce, continued to constitute the main threat to 11th Army. The enemy here could be given no time to recover from the losses of his abortive attacks. Shevastopol would have to be shelved until the Soviet forces in the Kerch Peninsula had been wiped out. The relative strengths of the Russian and German forces in the Crimea, however, gave no grounds for any great optimism regarding the outcome of these two big undertakings. The enemy had three armies in the Crimea under command of a Crimean front headquarters which appeared to have been only recently formed and was probably located in Kerch. The Shevastopol fortress continued to be defended by the Coast Army, whose strength we had ascertained in February to be seven rifle divisions, one rifle brigade, two naval brigades and one dismounted cavalry division. During our Kerch offensive all we would have available to contain these forces on the northern and eastern fronts of the fortress were 54 corps and the newly arrived 19 Romanian division, which had been put there to free 50 German division for Kerch. The only force left on the southern front of Shevastopol would be 72 infantry division. The Romanian Mountain Corps, with only four mountain brigade under command had to defend the entire south coast of the Crimea against surprise attacks from the sea. Thus 11th Army was having to strip the other fronts bare in order to attack at Kerch in the greatest possible strength. On the Kerch front the enemy still had his 44th and 51st armies. At the end of April 1942 they comprised 17 rifle divisions, 3 rifle brigades, two cavalry divisions and four independent armoured brigades an aggregate of 26 formations. Against this formidable array we were able to commit merely five German infantry divisions, inclusive of 50 division from Shivastopol, and 22 Panzer division. These were augmented by the newly arrived 7 Romanian Corps, consisting of 19 Romanian division. 8 Romanian Cavalry Brigade and 10 Romanian Division the last named having been moved over from the west coast. As the usefulness of these Romanian forces in an offensive role was limited, the numerical disparity in the forthcoming offensive now being planned under the code name Busted was increased still further. It also had to be borne in mind that the attack through the Papa Gap must be a purely frontal one in the initial stages as the seas on either side excluded any possibility of outflanking. What was more, the enemy had echelined his defences in considerable depth. How were we in the circumstances, 
and in view of the enemy's superiority of at least two to one, to achieve our object of destroying both his armies. One thing was clear, neither a frontal push against the two enemy armies nor even a simple breakthrough could get us anywhere. If, after losing his pop-up positions, the enemy should manage to reform his front anywhere else, our operation would inevitably be halted. The broader the Kerch Peninsula became as one went east, the more the enemy would be able to make his numerical superiority felt. Our total of six German divisions might suffice for an attack through a mere eleven mile gap at Parpak, where the enemy could not put in all his forces simultaneously, but how should we fare further east when it came to fighting on a twenty five mile front? The object must be, then, not only to break through the enemy's Parpak front and achieve penetration in depth, but also to destroy either the main bulk, or at least a substantial part of his formations in the process of the first breakthrough. In this respect, the enemy himself offered us an opening. In his southern sector, between the Black Sea and Khoyasan, he was, in the main, still sitting in the strongly prepared defences of his original Parpak front. His northern front, on the other hand, protruded well beyond the latter in a wide curve reaching as far west as Kayat and dating from the time when the enemy had overrun 18 Romanian division. That the Soviet commander had considered the likelihood of our trying to cut off this bulge was clear from the way he had distributed his troops. According to our intelligence reports he had massed two-thirds of his forces both in the line and in reserve, in or behind his northern sector. In the south, however, there were only three divisions in the line and two or three in reserve. Quite likely the abortive attack by 22 Panzer Division earlier on, the aim of which had been to cut off the enemy front in the region west of Khoyasan, was the reason for these dispositions. Such was the situation on which 11th Army based its assault plan for Operation Bustard. We intended to make our decisive thrust not immediately in the area where the front protruded west but down in the southern sector, along the Black Sea coast. In other words, in the place where the enemy would be least expecting it. This task was to devolve on 30 corps, composed of 28 light, 132 and 50 infantry and 22 panzer divisions. Although 170 infantry division would have to remain in the central sector in the initial phase in order to deceive the enemy, it, too, would subsequently follow through in the south. The plan was that 30 Corps should break through the Parpak positions with three divisions up and exploit over the deep anti tank ditch in an eastward direction to enable 22 Panzer Division to cross this obstacle. Once the latter had moved up, the Corps would wheel north and drive into the flank and rear of the enemy forces concentrated in the northern sector. Then, in cooperation with 42 Corps and 7 Romanian Corps, it would finally surround the enemy on the north coast of the peninsula. The protection of 30 Corps eastern flank against enemy attacks from the direction of Kerch was to be the responsibility of a mobile formation, Brigade Group Grodk, which was made up of German and Romanian motorized units. It was to discharge its task offensively by advancing rapidly towards Kerch, since this would also serve to forestall any attempt by enemy elements in the rear to take evasive action. In order to facilitate the difficult initial breakthrough at Parpak, 11th Army had made provisions for what was probably the first seaborne assault boat operation of its kind. A battalion travelling by assault boats from Fodosia was to be dropped in the rear of the Parpak positions at first light. The decisive attack by the Corps was to be supported not only by strong artillery but also by the whole of 8 Air Corps. 8 Air Corps, which also included strong anti aircraft units, was by its structure the most powerful and hard hitting Luftwaffe formation available for support of military operations. Its commanding general, Baron V. Richthofen, was certainly the most outstanding Luftwaffe leader we had in World War II. He made immense demands on the units under his command, but always went up himself to supervise any important attack they made. Furthermore, one was constantly meeting him at the front, where he would visit the most forward units to weigh up the possibilities of giving air support to ground operations. We always got on extremely well together, 
both at 11th Army and later on at Southern Army Group. I remember V. Richthofen's achievements and those of his Air Corps with the utmost admiration and gratitude. On the rest of the Parpark Front, 42 Corps and 7 Romanian Corps had the task of simulating an attack in order to pin the enemy down. As soon as a breakthrough had been effected in the south, they were both to join in the main assault. The success of the operation depended on two things. The first was our ability to keep the enemy thinking that our decisive attack would come in the north until it was too late for him to back out of the trap or throw his reserves into the southern sector. The second was the speed with which 30 Corps and in particular 22 Panzer Division carried out the northward thrust. The first of these requirements was achieved by extensive deception tactics. Apart from wireless deception, these involved laying on a sham artillery preparation in the central and northern sectors and moving troops around in the same area. Apparently they were entirely successful, as the bulk of the enemy's reserves remained behind his northern wing until it was too late for them to move. Immediately before the offensive began we lost our highly experienced chief of staff, General Waller who had been such an invaluable support in the difficult days of the previous winter and played a leading role in the preparation of Bustard. Both of us found it particularly hard to part just as we had at last gained the initiative ourselves. However, Waller had been appointed Chief of Staff of Central Army Group, and I obviously could not put anything in the way of his advancement. Waller's successor was General Schultz, who was also to prove a sound counselor and friend. He was an inestimable help to me in the most difficult phases of the 1943 winter campaign and throughout the time we were fighting to save 6th Army. Apart from being a man of great personal courage, he had nerves of steel and a special awareness of the privations and needs of the fighting troops, as well as a most equable nature. Already, as Chief of Staff of the Corps, he had won the Knight's Cross in a most difficult situation. Later, as a corps commander in Southern Army Group, he was to prove a tower of strength. On 8 May, 11th Army moved off on Operation Busted. 30 Corps was able to cross the anti tank obstacle and penetrate the enemy's most forward positions, and the assault boat expedition, by virtue of the surprise it achieved, had rendered considerable assistance to our right wing in its advance along the coast. Nevertheless, it was no easy battle. The ground gained on the far side of the ditch was not sufficient for the armoured division to be moved over, and the subsequent attack by 42 Corps only progressed with difficulty. Nevertheless, we had already engaged 10 enemy divisions and shattered the enemy's southern wing, and there was no indication that his reserves had moved away from the northern wing. It was not possible to bring up and deploy 22 Panzer Division until 9 May and before swinging north it had to fight off a strong tank attack. Then rain set in and continued all night, making it well nigh impossible for the Luftwaffe's close support units to cooperate or for the tanks to make any headway on the morning of 10 May. Though the weather cleared in the afternoon, the 24-hour time lag was liable to be our undoing in an operation so dependent on speed of movement. It was consoling to know that before the rain started Brigade Group Grod could been able to move swiftly east, a fact which subsequently enabled it to frustrate every enemy attempt to form a front further back. Evidently the enemy had not anticipated such a bold drive into the depths of his communications zone. Unluckily the valiant Brigade Commander, Colonel V. Grod was severely wounded in the course of the operation and died soon afterwards. From 11th May onwards, the operations proceeded without any serious hold up. 22 Panzer Division got through to the coast in the north, bottling up some eight enemy divisions as it went, and the army was able to give the order for the pursuit to start. The troops, Romanians included, strained every nerve to carry it through successfully and by 16th May Kirch had fallen to 170 division and 213 regiment. Even then a great deal more heavy fighting was needed to mop up the enemy remnants which had trickled back to the east coast. Before the attack was launched I had once again moved into a command post close behind the front, and now I was out all day long visiting divisional staffs and the front line troops. For a soldier there was something unforgettable about this tempestuous chase. 
all the roads were littered with enemy vehicles, tanks and guns, and one kept passing long processions of prisoners. The view from a hill near Kerch, where I had rendezvous with General V. Richthofen, was quite breathtaking. Down below us, bathed in glorious sunshine, lay the Straits of Kerch the goal we had dreamt of for so long. From the beach in front of us, which was crammed with Soviet vehicles of every possible description, enemy motor torpedo boats made repeated attempts to pick up Soviet personnel, but they were driven off every time by our own gunfire. In order to spare our infantry any further sacrifices and bring about the surrender of the enemy elements still fighting back desperately along the coast itself, we had a mass artillery barrage laid down on these last pockets of resistance. By 18th May, the Battle of the Kerch Peninsula was over. Only small groups of the enemy continued to hold out in subterranean caves around Kerch for weeks to come under the pressure of a few fanatical commissars. According to the returns sent in, some 170,000 prisoners, 1,133 guns and 258 tanks had fallen into our hands. Five German infantry divisions and one armoured, together with two Romanian infantry divisions and one cavalry brigade, had annihilated two whole Soviet armies of 26 formations. Only negligible elements of the enemy had escaped across the Straits of Kerch to the Taman Peninsula. A true battle of annihilation had been fought to a victorious finish. Operation Sturgeon the conquest of Shivas top Olvanth army still faced the hardest task of all, the conquest of Shivas top I had already apprised Hitler of our intentions regarding the assault on the fortress during a visit to his headquarters in mid-April. It was the first time I had met him since submitting my views to him on the conduct of the offensive in the West in February 1940. Even at this second meeting I had the impression that he was not only extremely well informed on every detail of the battles fought to date, but also thoroughly appreciated the operational arguments expounded to him. He listened attentively to what I had to say and fully agreed with 11th Army's view on the way to conduct both the Kerch offensive and the assault on Shavastopol. He made not the least effort to interfere in our plans or, as was so often the case later on, to ramble off into endless recitations of production figures. One vital question was not discussed on that occasion, however, whether, in view of the offensive planned in the Ukraine, it was right to commit the whole of 11th Army to an attack on the powerful Shivastopol fortress for a period that could not be predetermined with any real certainty, particularly now that the victory on the Kerch Peninsula had removed the threat in the Crimea. The settlement of this problem was clearly a matter for the Supreme Command, not for our own headquarters. Speaking for myself, I believed at the time, and still do today, that the decision to make 11th Army take Shivastopol first was the correct one. Had we continued merely to invest the fortress, a good three or four German divisions, plus the Romanian forces in other words, half 11th Army would have continued to be tied up in the Crimea. What was undoubtedly a mistake, however, was the Supreme Command's decision, after Shivastopol's timely fall, to withdraw 11th Army from the southern wing of the Eastern Front for use at Leningrad and for patching up gaps in the line. After the fall of Shivastopol this army ought as originally planned to have been taken across the Straits of Kerch to the Cuban to intercept the enemy forces falling back on the Caucasus from the Lower Don before Army Group A had the time factor not permitted this, it should at any rate have been taken into reserve behind the southern wing. The Stalingrad tragedy might then have been averted. Immediately after the Kerch operation, 11th Army began regrouping for the assault on Shavastopol. 42 Corps was made responsible for safeguarding the Kerch Peninsula and the south coast of the Crimea. The only German troops left to it for this purpose were those of 46th Infantry Division, in addition to which it had seven Romanian Corps, comprising 10 and 19 infantry divisions four mountain division 13, and eight cavalry brigade. All other forces were forthwith dispatched to Shivastopol. 14 there could be no shadow of doubt that the assault on the fortress would be even tougher than that of the previous December, the enemy having had half a year in which to tighten up his fortifications, 
bring his manpower up to strength and stock up with stores from across the sea. The strength of the Shivastopol fortress consisted less in up-to-date fortifications though a certain number of these did exist than in the extraordinary difficulty of the ground, which was dotted with innumerable smaller defense installations. These formed a thick network covering the entire area from the Belbek Valley to the Black Sea coast. The whole of the ground between the Belbek Valley and Sevanaya Bay in particular constituted a strongly developed fortress belt. The northern front ran south of the Belbek, though north of this, too, the enemy had an extensive strong point around and northwards of the locality of Lyubimovka. The valley itself and the slopes rising away to the south were enfiladed by a 30.5 cm. Battery housed in a thoroughly up-to-date armoured emplacement, known to us as Maxim Gorky I. The slopes themselves were covered by a thick net of fieldworks one mile deep, some of which were concreted. Behind these came a series of strongly built, mainly concreted strong points which our troops had nicknamed Stalin, Volga, Siberia, Molotov, GPU and Cheka, and which were mutually linked by a chain of dug-in positions. A final barrier to the northern shore of Sevanaya Bay was formed by a defense zone of strong points which included Donets, Don, Lenin, the fortified locality of Bartonivka, the Old North Fort and the coastal batteries on Battery Headland. Into the cliffs overlooking the bay the Russians had driven chambers for storing supplies and ammunition. The eastern front branched off the northern one at a point about a mile and a quarter east of the village of Belbek, the hinge between the two being protected by the precipitous Kamishli ravine. The northern part of this eastern front ran through a stretch of the dense undergrowth with which the steep spurs of the Vela Mountains in this area are covered. In this undergrowth there were countless small pockets of resistance some of them nestling in holes blown in the rock which an attacker could hardly touch with his artillery. This wooded northern sector of the eastern front ended in the steep cliffs south and southeast of the locality of Gaitany. Though the woods petered out further south, the ground became increasingly difficult down towards the coast where it resembled a range of rocky mountains. Access to the southern fortress zone on both sides of the highway leading from the south coast to Shivastopol was barred in the first instance by a series of steep, dome-shaped summits which the Russians had converted into powerful strong points. Crimea veterans will remember such names as Sugarloaf, North Nose, Chapel Mountain Ruin Hill. Then came the strongly defended village of Kamari and finally the rocky massif northeast of the Bay of Balaclava. The enemy had been able to hold his own here when 105 Infantry Regiment achieved its bold capture of Balaclava Fort in autumn 1941. Penetration of this chain of fortified summits and cliffs was rendered all the more difficult by the fact that one hill always flanked the next dot behind this forward defense zone in the south. North of the road from Shivastopol, rose the massif of the Fayukini Heights, which was extended southwards to the coastal range by strong points like Eagle's Perch and the fortified village of Kadikovka. All these formed a sort of foreground to the strongest of the enemy's fortifications, which were established along the Zapun Heights. The latter are a range of hills with steep eastern slopes beginning at the cliffs of Inkerman and dominating the valley of the Kornaya down to the south of Gaitany. Though they turn southwest to bar the road to Shivastopol and finally link up with the sea through Windmill Hill, the western spur of the coastal range. There's a pun position. By virtue of its sharp drops and possibilities for mutual flanking fire, is extremely difficult for infantry to attack and artillery observers up the command the entire fortress area as far as the eye can see. These heights, incidentally, were the line held by the Western powers during the Crimean War to cover the rear of their attack on Shivastopol against the Russians' idle relieving army. But even when he had taken this commanding position, the attackers' troubles were still not over. Ranged along the coast were the coastal batteries including Maxim Gorky II apostrophe in its armored emplacement. There was also a wide semicircle of continuous defenses round the city itself, beginning at Inkerman on Sevanaya Bay and rejoining the latter by Strelitskaya Bay. 
it was composed of an anti-tank ditch, a barbed wire obstacle and numerous pillboxes, and included the British Crimean War Cemetery southeast of Shevastopol which the Russians had converted into a strong battery emplacement. Finally there were a line of fortifications running hard along the periphery of the city and also several traverses screening the peninsula of Kassans towards the east. The Russians have always been known for their skill in laying out and camouflaging field defenses, and at Chivastopol they had the added advantage of holding a stretch of country which offered them excellent opportunities for flanking fire. The rocky nature of the ground, moreover, made it possible to keep the cover for guns and mortars so narrow that they could practically only be destroyed by direct hits. And since we were dealing with Russians, it was a matter of course that extensive minefields had been laid not only along the front of the various defense zones, but also right inside them. When considering how the assault on the fortress area should be conducted, 11th Army arrived at essentially the same conclusions as it had done the previous winter. We could not entertain any idea of using the central portion of the siege front for a decisive operation because artillery and air support our two main trumps could never become entirely effective in the wooded area and our losses would be far too great. We thus had no choice but to attack once again from the north and northeast and in the south of the eastern sector. This time, too, at least to begin with the main punch was to be delivered in the north, for although the enemy fortifications were undoubtedly stronger and more numerous in the northern area of the fortress above Sevenaya Bay than in its southern part, the going there was far easier. Above all, the artillery in Luftwaffe could be used to infinitely greater effect in the north than in the hilly country of the southern sector. Of course, there still had to be an attack in the south as well. For one thing, it was important to split the enemy's defense by attacking from several sides at once. For another, he must be expected to hold out in the city itself and on the Kassan's headland even after losing the fortified area north of Sevenaya Bay. We had to remember that the task facing us at Shivastopol involved not only taking a fortress but also fighting an army which was certainly our match numerically even if it were inferior in material. 15 The factor that had primarily guided our assault tactics in the winter the need to gain command of the harbour at the earliest possible date was no less important, however. As long as 11th Army had 8 Air Corps in support, the enemy would no longer be at liberty to supply himself by sea. Such were the considerations on which 11th Army based its plan for Sturgeon, the code name of the operation. We intended to attack on the northern front and the southern part of the eastern front, while keeping the enemy pinned down in the central sector from Mackenzie to Verk Corgan. In the north, the first objectives were the northern shore of Sevenaya Bay and the heights around Gaitany, in the south, the capture of the dominating heights of the Zapun position on both sides of the roads leading from the south coast and Balaclava to Shivastopol. The attack in the north was to be carried out by 54 Corps, comprising 22, 24, 50, and 132 infantry divisions, commanded by Generals Wolf, Baron V. Detau, Schmidt, and Lindman, and a reinforced 213 infantry regiment. The Corps orders were to keep its forces rigidly concentrated in the main direction of assault on the high ground north of the eastern part of Sevenaya Bay. All parts of the fortified zone bypassed in the first instance were to be pinned down with a view to taking as many of them as possible from the rear later on. The left wing of the Corps was to gain possession of the heights of Gaitany and the ground to the southeast of the latter in order to clear the way for the Romanian Mountain Corps subsequent advance further south. The attack in the south was to be directed by HQ 30 Corps, with 72 and 170 infantry divisions and 28 light division under command. 16 Its first job was to gain the starting line and artillery observation posts for the advance towards the Zapun Heights. To achieve this it had to capture the enemy's foremost defense zone based on the strong points of North Nose, Chapel Mount, Ruin Hill, Cymru and High Cliff south of Cymru and to eliminate flanking fire from the rocky heights east of Balaclava in the south. To solve this problem 72 infantry division was to advance along both sides of the highway to Shivastopol, 
while 28 Light Division in accordance with its specialized role had to capture the most northerly summits of the range of mountains east of Balaclava Bay. 170 Division was kept in reserve for the time being. Because of the peculiarly rugged terrain in this sector, the tasks in question could only be solved by carefully prepared local attacks. Sandwiched between the two big assault groups, the Romanian Mountain Corps was initially responsible for pinning down the enemy on its own front. In particular, 18 Romanian Division was to carry out local attacks and an artillery bombardment to protect 54 Corps left wing against enemy flanking action from the south. Further south, one Romanian Mountain Division was to support 30 Corps Northern Wing by capturing the Sugarloaf. In making its artillery preparations for the attack, 11th Army dispensed with the intensive barrage so popular with our opponents. In view of the peculiar nature of the ground and the endless number of enemy positions, this could not be expected to have any decisive effect nor should we have enough ammunition available. Instead, the preparations would start five days before the infantry assault, beginning with an air attack and all-out artillery strafe against supply lines and points where enemy reserves were known to be concentrated. In the five days that followed our gunners were to beat down the enemy artillery by steady observed fire and soften up positions in the enemy's foremost defense zone. Throughout this period 8 Air Corps would be making continual attacks on the city, harbor, supply installations and airfields. And now a word about our artillery strength. 11th Army had naturally called in every gun within reach for the attack, and OKH had made available the heaviest pieces available. In all, 54 Corps, Artillery Commander General Zucker taught, had at its disposal 56 heavy and medium batteries, 41 light and 18 mortar batteries, in addition to two battalions of assault guns. This made a total of 121 batteries, supported by two observation battalions. The heavy siege artillery included batteries of cannon up to a caliber of 19 cm, as well as independent howitzer and heavy howitzer batteries with calibers of 30.5, 35, and 42 cm. Furthermore, there were two special 60 cm guns and the celebrated 80 cm. Big Dora. This monster had originally been designed for bombarding the most formidable section of the Maginot Line, but had not been finished in time. It was a miracle of technical achievement. The barrel must have been 90 feet long and the carriage as high as a two-story house. Sixty trains had been required to bring it into position along a railway specially laid for the purpose. Two anti-aircraft regiments had to be constantly in attendance. Undoubtedly the effectiveness of the cannon bore no real relation to all the efforts and expense that had gone into making it. Nevertheless, one of its shells did destroy a big enemy ammunition dump buried 90 feet deep in the natural rock on the northern shore of Sevenaya Bay. 30 Corps artillery was commanded by General Martinek, a particularly outstanding gunner officer who had previously held the same rank in the Austrian army. Unfortunately he was later killed in the east as a corps commander. Altogether the corps had 25 heavy and medium, 25 light and 6 mortar batteries, as well as one assault gun and two observation battalions. Also assigned to it was 300 Panzer Regiment, whose tanks were remote controlled and carried high explosive charges. The Romanian Mountain Corps had 12 medium and 22 light batteries with which to perform its holding task. A welcome addition to the assault artillery as a whole was provided by General V. Richthofen, commander of 8 Air Corps, who turned over a number of his anti aircraft regiments for use in a ground role. At no other time on the German side in World War II can artillery ever have been more formidably massed, particularly as regards the high calibers used than for the attack on Shivastopol. Yet, how trifling this seems when compared with the masses of guns later considered indispensable by the Russians for a breakthrough in open country. At Shivastopol, the attacker had 208 batteries excluding anti-aircraft, at his disposal over a 22-mile front. This meant an average of less than 10 batteries to every mile of front, though the ratio was obviously higher in the actual assault sectors. The Soviet offensives of 1945 were based on a ratio of 400 guns to every mile of assault front. 
A few days before the attack I paid a brief visit to the south coast to take a closer look at 30 Corps own preparations. Our command post down there was a charming little Moorish style palace, perched on a steep cliff overhanging the Black Sea coast and formerly the property of a Grand Duke. On the last day of my stay I made a reconnaissance trip in our only naval vessel, an Italian e-boat, along the coast to a point off Balaclava, my object being to ascertain how much of the coastal road, up which the whole of the core reinforcements and supplies must pass, was visible from the sea and liable to come under observed bombardment from that quarter. In the event presumably out of respect for our Luftwaffe the Soviet Black Sea Fleet ventured no such action. On the way back a calamity occurred just outside Yalta. Without any warning a hail of machine gun bullets and cannon shells began pumping into us from the sky. We were being strafed by two Soviet fighters which had swooped out of the sun, their sound having been drowned by the roar of our own powerful engines. In a matter of seconds seven of the sixteen persons on board were dead or wounded and the heat from the flames threatened to detonate the torpedoes slung alongside. The behavior of the captain, a young Italian sub-lieutenant, was beyond all praise, and he showed immense presence of mind in the steps he took to save us and his ship. Disregarding the danger of mines, Popo, my ADC, dived into the water and swam to the nearby shore where still stark naked he stopped a passing truck. With this he dashed into Yalta and got the help of a Croatian motorboat to tow us into harbour. It was a dismal journey. One Italian petty officer was dead and three sailors wounded. Captain V. Wedel, the port commandant of Yalta, had also been killed. But at my feet, severely wounded in the thigh, lay the truest comrade of all, my driver, Fritz Nagel. The Italian sub-lieutenant tore off his own shirt to use it as a makeshift bandage, but it was almost impossible to staunch the flow of blood from the artery. Fritz Nagel came from Karlsruhe and had been my driver since 1938. We had seen and lived through so very much together, and he had already been wounded at my side once before during our time with 56 Panzer Corps. Throughout the years he had been a devoted comrade and in time had become a real friend to me. He had fine, frank brown eyes and not a trace of servility in his makeup. Sportsmanlike and thoroughly decent by nature, he was a keen, cheerful soldier who had won the hearts of comrades and superiors alike. As soon as we touched land I took him straight to the field hospital. An operation was attempted, but he had already lost too much blood, and the same night his young light went out. We buried him alongside all our other German and Italian comrades in the Yalta Cemetery high above the sea perhaps one of the most lovely spots on the whole of that glorious coastline. I sent Fritz Nagel's parents a copy of the words I spoke at his graveside. But war waits for no man, not even for his thoughts. A few days later 11th Army's tactical headquarters, reduced to a bare minimum of personnel, set up a command post on the Shavastopol front at Yukari Karals, a Tata village nestling in a narrow valley among the cliffs. The Russians must have known that a command staff with its own signals section had moved in there, for every evening their duty pilot flew over in an old rata known to the troops as a sewing machine to drop a stick of bombs fortunately without ever doing the slightest damage. On a cliff top above the village, in the Cherkesskerman Mountains, where the Goths had once built their stronghold, we had established an observation post, and on the evening of 6th June we went up to watch the infantry assault go in along the entire front next morning. It was here, in a small dugout adjoined by an observation trench equipped with stereo telescopes, that the chief of staff, the heads of the operations and intelligence branches, Popo and I spent the still hours of the night before the storm. Once again it was Popo who introduced a cheerful note into an otherwise pensive evening. It had been suggested that I should issue an order of the day to the troops pointing out the importance of the impending battle. Generally speaking, I am not in favor of exhortations of this kind. Quite apart from the fact that they seldom get past the battalion orderly rooms, our troops did not need reminding what was at stake. 
since it was the usual thing to do on such occasions, however, I wrote out a few words on a sheet of paper and handed it to Popo for transmission to all corps headquarters. Shortly afterwards he returned to report, Herr General Obbust, I've passed on the blurb. It was a cheeky thing to say, but he was only expressing the ordinary soldier's view of such proclamations, and we all had a good laugh over it. Dot on the morning of 7th June, as dawn turned the eastern sky to gold and swept the shadows from the valleys, our artillery opened up in its full fury by way of a prelude to the infantry assault. Simultaneously the squadrons of the Luftwaffe hurtled down onto their allotted targets. The scene before us was indescribable, since it was unique in modern warfare for the leader of an army to command a view of his entire battlefield. To the northwest the eye could range from the woodlands that hid the fierce battles of 54 Corps left wing from view right over to the heights south of the Belbeck Valley, for which we were to fight so bitterly. Looking due west, one could see the heights of Gaetany, and behind them, in the far distance, the shimmer of Sevenaya Bay where it joined the Black Sea. Even the spurs of the Kassans Peninsula, on which we were to find vestiges of Hellenic culture, were visible in clear weather. To the southwest the towered the menacing heights of Zapun and the rugged cliffs of the coastal range. At night, within the wide circumference of the fortress, one saw the flashes of enemy gunfire, and by day the clouds of rock and dust cast up by the bursts of our heavy shells and the bombs dropped by German aircraft. It was indeed a fantastic setting for such a gigantic spectacle. At Chivestopol there was something more than an attacking army confronted by an adversary who was at least its numerical equal, something more than artillery and aircraft of the most modern design pounding away at fortifications embedded in steel, concrete and granite. Chivestopol was also the spirit of the German soldier, all his courage, initiative and self-sacrifice contending with the dogged resistance of an opponent whose natural elements were the advantage of terrain and the tenacity and steadfastness of the Russian soldier reinforced by the iron compulsion of the Soviet system. It is impossible to depict this struggle which was to go on for a round month in the most scorching heat even early morning temperatures being as much as 106 degrees Fahrenheit, in terms that would do justice to the feet of either attacker or defender. What our troops achieved in this battle would be worthy of an epic, but there is only space here for a brief account of a contest that must be almost unparalleled in its severity. On its right wing 54 Corps had directed 132 Division to launch a frontal attack across the Belbeck Valley towards the commanding heights to the south of it, leaving out the enemy bridgehead of Lubyimovka. To the left of it 22 Infantry Division had the task of opening the way across the valley for 132 Division by thrusting south of the Belbeck from the east, over the Kamishli Gully. To the left of that, 50 Infantry Division, attacking through the locality of Kamishli, was to join this thrust in a southwesterly direction. On the extreme left wing of the Corps, in the mountainous woodlands, 24 Infantry Division was to work its way forward towards the heights of Gaetany, its left flank being covered by 18 Romanian Division. As a result of overwhelming support by the powerful assault artillery and the incessant attacks of 8 Air Corps, it was possible to cross the Kamishli Gully and Belbeck Valley on the first day and gain a footing on the commanding heights south of the latter. Down in the south, 30 Corps' first job was to gain possession of the jumping off positions for its own follow up attack on both sides of the highway to Shivastopol, which was not to be launched until some days later. The second phase of the offensive, lasting up to 17 June, was marked on both fronts by a bitter struggle for every foot of ground, every pillbox, and every trench. Time and again the Russians tried to win back what they had lost by launching violent counter attacks. In their big strong points, and in the smaller pillboxes too, they often fought till the last man and the last round. While the main burden of these battles was borne by the infantry and engineers, the advanced observation posts of our artillery still deserve special mention, since it was chiefly they who had to direct the fire which made it possible to take individual strong points and pillboxes. They, together with the assault guns, 
were the infantry's best helpmates. On 13 June, the valiant 16 Infantry Regiment of 22 Division, led by Colonel V. Koltitz, succeeded in taking Fort Stalin, before which its attack had come to a standstill the previous winter. The spirit of our infantry was typified by one wounded man of this regiment, who, pointing to his smashed arm and bandaged head, was heard to cry, I can take this lot now we've got the Stalin. By 17th June it had been possible, though at the cost of heavy losses, to drive a deep wedge into the fortified zone in the north. The positions of the 2nd Defense Line, Cheka, GPU, Siberia and Volga, were in our hands. By the same date, 30 Corps was likewise able to drive a wedge into the advanced defense zones in front of the Zapun positions. In the course of heavy fighting, the fortified strong points of North Nose, Chapel Mountain, Ruin Hill fell to 72 Division, while 170 Division took Kimari. To the north of the Corps, after a series of fruitless charges, one Romanian Mountain Division finally won the Sugarloaf. 28 Light Division, on the other hand, was advancing only very slowly over the rugged cliffs of the coastal range, Rose Hill and Vermilion I and II apostrophe, since the only mode of action to adopt in that maze of clefts and chasms was to leapfrog raiding parties from one point to the next, a process which entailed considerable losses. Despite the price we had paid for these successes, however, the outcome of the offensive seemed to be very much in the balance for the next few days. The endurance of our own troops was visibly running out. In the case of 54 Corps it was found necessary to take 132 Division temporarily out of the line in order to exchange its sorely tried regiments for those of 46 Division in the Kerch Peninsula. Its place was taken by 24 Division which had to be released from the left wing of the corps for this purpose. At the very same time 11th Army found itself under pressure from OKH to release 8 Air Corps for the Ukraine offensive unless any prospect could be offered of Shevastopol's early fall. We, for our own part, insisted that the attack must at all costs go on until final success was achieved, which in turn depended on the continued presence of 8 Air Corps. In the end our view prevailed. Yet who at that time, faced with the dwindling strength of our infantry, could have guaranteed the early fall of the fortress? Realizing that the strength of our own troops might give out prematurely, 11th Army asked to be supplied with three extra infantry regiments a request which OKH duly approved. They were at least to arrive in time for the final phase of the struggle. In the existing situation, it was found expedient in the case of both assaulting corps to take advantage of an attacker's ability to switch the direction or main effort of his assault as he pleases, and thereby to take the enemy by surprise. 54 Corps turned west, committing 213 infantry regiment and 24 division to battle as it did so. 213 regiment led by Colonel Hitzfeld, took the armor-plated battery Maxim Gorky I, one of whose guns had already been put out of action by a direct hit from a siege battery. The other was demolished by our engineers, who had succeeded in getting onto the top of it. However, the garrison of the fort, which went several stories deep, did not surrender until our engineers had blown their way in through the turrets at ground level. In the course of one attempted breakout the commissar in command was killed, whereupon his men surrendered with the name of Christ trembling on their lips. After that 24 division was able, by 21st June, to clear the rest of the northern sector along the west coast as far as the fortifications guarding the entrance to Sevenaya Bay. In the case of 30 Corps, too, a surprise alteration in the focal point of the attack brought about an important success by 17th June. The Corps resolved to halt the advance across the northern chain of the coastal range east of Balaclava and to concentrate its forces on and immediately south of the main road for a surprise thrust. There was only artillery to counteract any flank action from the direction of the coastal range. 72 Division duly succeeded in overrunning the enemy's positions south of the road, and its reconnaissance battalion, led by Major Bake, boldly exploited this initial gain by pushing straight through the floundering enemy as far as Eagle's Perch in front of the Zapun line. 
In the early morning of 18 June the battalion managed to take the strongly defended Eagle position and to remain in possession there until the division could move reinforcements up. This having been achieved, it was possible to extend our penetration of the enemy defense system northwards. In the subsequent and third phase success was again achieved by sudden shifts in the focal point of the attack, particularly on the part of the artillery. In the north this meant the full attainment of the first objective, Sevenaya Bay, and in the south possession of our jumping off positions for the assault on the Zapun line. In the northern sector the whole fire of the artillery was concentrated to permit 24 division to take the peninsula forts dominating the entrance to Sevenaya Bay. The most formidable of these was the antiquated but still powerful strong point known as North Fort. 22 Division gained control along its whole front of the cliffs overlooking Sevenaya Bay. There was extremely hard fighting for the railway tunnel on the boundary between 22 and 50 divisions, out of which the enemy launched a strong counterattack with a brigade that had recently arrived by cruiser. The tunnel was finally captured by shelling its entrance. Not only hundreds of troops came out but an even greater number of civilians, including women and children. Particular difficulty was experienced in winkling the enemy out of his last hideouts on the northern shore of the bay, where deep galleries for storing supplies and ammunition had been driven into the sheer wall of rock. These had been equipped for defense by the addition of steel doors. Since the occupants, under pressure from their commissars, showed no sign of surrendering, we had to try to blow the doors open. As our engineers approached the first of them, there was an explosion inside the casemate and a large slab of cliff came tumbling down, burying not only the enemy within but also our own squad of engineers. The commissar in command had blown the casemate and its occupants sky high. In the end a second lieutenant from an assault battery, who had brought up his gun along the coastal road regardless of enemy shelling from the southern shore, managed to force the other casemates to open up after he had fired on their embrasures at point-blank range. Crowds of completely worn-out soldiers and civilians emerged, their commissars having committed suicide. Thirdly, 50 Division, which had some hard fighting to do in the thicket-covered country of its own sector, was able to reach the eastern end of Sevenaya Bay and gain possession of the heights of Gaitani dominating the mouth of the Kornaya Valley. To the left of it, the right wing of the Romanian Mountain Corps was fighting its way forward through wooded country over the hills southeast of Gaitani. General Lasker, who later went into captivity at Stalingrad, was the life and soul of this advance. 30 Corps, too, made gains by sudden changes in the direction of its attack. Taking advantage of the capture of Eagle's Perch by 72 Division, it swung 170 Division round from the south to attack the Fediukini Massif. The enemy, whose eyes were turned east and who was probably already expecting an attack on the Zapon Heights themselves, was taken completely by surprise, and it was possible to take the Massif relatively quickly. This secured a firm base for the decisive assault on the Zapun line. During the same few days, some progress was also made by the left wing of the Romanian Mountain Corps, one mountain division. 11th Army thus found itself in possession of almost the whole outer belt of the fortress by the morning of 26 June. The enemy had been thrown back into the inner fortified zone, whose northern front was formed by the precipitous rock face of Sevenaya Bay's southern shore, and whose eastern front ran from the heights of Inkerman along the Zapun Range to the cliffs around Balaclava. 11th Army now had to decide how to break open this inner ring of fortifications. It was taken for granted that the enemy in Shivastopol would continue to resist as bitterly as before particularly as none of the statements issued by his immediate superiors, Crimean Front Headquarters, encouraged any hope of an evacuation. On the other hand, the fact had to be faced that though the enemy's reserves might be largely expended, the offensive capacity of the German regiments was also virtually at an end. In recent weeks, I had spent all my mornings and afternoons visiting corps staffs, artillery commanders, divisions, regiments, battalions, and gunner observation posts. I was only too well aware of the state of our units. The regiments had dwindled away to a few hundred men each. And I remember one company being pulled out of the line with a strength of one officer and eight men. How, 
Then, were we going to finish off the battle for Shiva stop all, now that 54 core had 7 I obey before it and 30 core was facing the difficult assault on the Zapun heights? The ideal solution at this point would have been to switch the weight of the entire offensive to 30 core on the southern wing. In practice, however, this was just not possible. Moving the divisions alone was bound to take several days, and in this time the enemy would have an opportunity to recover his strength. In the frontal area the two sectors were linked by only one narrow road which we had taken immense trouble to build through the mountains the previous winter. In any case, it could not bear the weight of the heavy artillery, and the task of moving that quantity of guns round by way of Yalta and stocking them with ammunition when they reached the southern sector would have taken weeks to complete. An additional factor to bear in mind was the Supreme Command's intention of withdrawing 8 Air Corps from the Crimea at an early date. Immediately after 22 Division reached 7 Ia Bay, I had been down to visit its regiments in order to obtain a general view of the situation from an observation post on the northern shore. Before me lay a stretch of water between half a mile and 1,000 yards wide where whole fleets had once lain at anchor. On the far side, to the right, was the city of Shivastopol, and straight ahead a wall of cliff honeycombed with enemy positions. It occurred to me that from here in other words, from the flank one should be able to unhinge the Zapun fortifications, for the last direction from which the enemy seemed likely to expect an attack was across Seven Ia Bay. When I first discussed this plan of mine with 54 Corps and a number of subordinate commanders, there was a great deal of head shaking and skepticism. How? They asked, could assault boats get across that broad stretch of bay in the face of the formidable array of guns and fortifications overlooking the southern shore? How, for that matter, were the assault boats even to be got to the shore and loaded with troops when the sole access to the water was down one or two steep ravines which could obviously be kept under fire by the enemy on the southern coast? For the very reason that it appeared impossible, however, an attack across Seven Ia Bay would take the enemy unawares and might well be the key to success. Despite all the objections raised, therefore, I stuck to my plan hard though it was to order such a hazardous undertaking when one's own position prevented one from taking part. Once the decision had been taken, everyone involved set about its execution with the utmost energy. In this connection a special word of appreciation is due to the engineers who had already given an excellent account of themselves alongside the infantry in the fighting for the pillbox positions. The general offensive against the inner fortress area minus 54 core crossing 7 Ia Bay and 30 core assaulting the Zapun Heights, was due to start early on the morning of 29th June. Already on 28th of June 50 Division had succeeded in crossing the lower course of the Kornaya and taken the Inkerman. This was the scene of a tragedy that shows with what fanaticism the Bolsheviks fought. High above the Inkerman towered a sheer wall of cliff extending far away to the south. Inside it were enormous chambers which had served as cellarage for the Crimean champagne factories. Alongside the large stocks of wine the Bolsheviks had dumped ammunition, but now they were also using the chambers to accommodate thousands of wounded and refugees. Just as our troops were entering the Inkerman the whole cliff behind it shuddered under the impact of a tremendous detonation, and the co-foot wall of rock fell in over a length of some 900 yards, burying thousands of people beneath it. Though the act of a few fanatical commissars, it was a measure of the contempt for human life which had become a principle of this Asiatic power. During those midnight hours of 28th-29th June in which the preparations for the crossing of Seven Ia Bay were being made, a tremendous tension gripped everyone connected with the operation. In order to blanket all noise from the northern shore, eight air corps kept up an incessant air raid on the city. The whole of the artillery stood by to begin a murderous bombardment of the cliff tops on the southern shore the very moment any fire from the showed that the enemy had perceived what we were about. But everything remained quiet on the other side, and the difficult job of launching and loading the assault boats went off without a hitch. At one o'clock the first wave from 22 and 24 divisions pushed off and headed for the opposite shore. The crossing, which obviously took the enemy absolutely by surprise, turned out a complete success, 
for by the time the enemy defences on the cliff side went into action our sturdy grenadiers had gained a firm footing on the shore below. Any enemy weapons showing themselves from now on were quickly knocked out by our troops as they scaled the cliffs to the plateau above. With that the dreaded Zapon position was unhinged from the flank. At first light, however, our troops had also gone into action against the front of this position. On the left wing of 54 Corps, 50 Division and the newly committed 132 Division, now composed of the infantry regiments of 46 Division, moved off from positions around and to the south of Gaetany to assault the heights between the Inkerman and a point to the south of it. The attack received supporting flank fire from the artillery on the north shore of Sevenaya Bay and was joined by the right wing of the Romanian Mountain Corps. 30 Corps likewise began its decisive push towards the Zapun line at daybreak, supported by the long range batteries of 54 Corps and massed sorties by 8 Air Corps. While using its artillery to create the illusion that an attack on a broad front was pending, 30 Corps had assembled 170 Division as a task force in an extremely small area by the Fedjukaini Heights, and the latter, supported by assault guns, 300 Panzer Battalion and the direct fire of an anti-aircraft regiment, soon reached the high ground on both sides of the highway to Shivastopol. Taking advantage of the enemy's confusion, the Division forthwith exploited far enough north west and south for the corps to move its other divisions up to the crest. After the successful crossing of the bay, the fall of the heights of Inkerman and the penetration of the Zapun positions by 30 corps, the fate of the Shivastopol fortress was sealed. What now followed was a last desperate struggle that could neither stave off the defending army's utter defeat nor possibly benefit the Soviets as regards the overall operational situation. It would even have been superfluous from the viewpoint of military honor, for goodness knows the Russian soldier had fought bravely enough. But the political system demanded that the futile struggle should go on. Now that they had captured the cliffs on the south shore of the bay, the divisions of 54 Corps which had carried out the crossing were already inside the wide outer ring of positions which encompassed the city. So while elements of the Corps mopped up this ring in a southerly direction, the main body was able to turn west and deal with the peripheral fortifications and the city itself. With the fall of the famous Fort Malakoff, that bulwark which had cost so much blood in the Crimean War, the Corps was into the defences of Shivastopol proper. Meanwhile, before 29th June was out the two rear divisions of 30 Corps which had had the task of simulating a broad frontal attack 28 Light Division and 72 Division were pushed smartly through behind 170 Division. Once they had reached the Zapun positions already taken by the latter they were made to fan out to capture the Kusans Peninsula. 28 Light Division broke through the outer ring of fortifications southeast of Shivastopol by taking the English cemetery. The Russians had developed this into a main strong point of their outer ring of fortifications, and the marble monuments once erected to British soldiers were now in ruins. The new dead of this battle were lying over graves torn open by shelling. Then the division thrust south of the city to take it from the west in case it should be defended, or, alternatively, to head off an enemy breakout. 170 Division's goal was the lighthouse on the extreme western tip of the Kusans Peninsula, the spot from which Iphigenia may have gazed, soulfully seeking the Grecian land. On 72 Division devolved the task of thrusting along the south coast. Rolling up the Zapun positions in a southward direction, it first took the dominant Windmill Hill, and thereby secured the main road to Shivastopol for the use of the Corps. It was followed by four Romanian Mountain Division, which set about flushing the defense system round Balaclava from the rear, taking 10,000 prisoners in the process. After our experience of Soviet methods to date, we were bound to assume that the enemy would make a last stand behind Shivastopol's perimeter defenses and finally in the city itself. An order from Stalin had been repeatedly wireless to the defenders to hold out to the last man and the last round and we knew that every member of the civil population capable of bearing arms had been mustered. Our headquarters would have been neglectful of its duty to the soldiers of 11th Army had it failed to take account of this possibility. A battle within the city would cause more heavy losses to the attacker. 
In order to obviate them we directed the artillery and 8 air corps to go into action once more before the divisions resumed their assault. The enemy was to be shown that he could not expect to extract a further toll of blood from us in house to house fighting. And so 1st July began with the massed bombardment of the perimeter fortifications and the enemy's strong points in the interior of the city. Before long, our reconnaissance aircraft reported that no further serious resistance need be anticipated. The shelling was stopped and the divisions moved in. It seemed probable that the enemy had pulled the bulk of his forces out to the west the previous night. But the struggle was still not over. Although the Soviet Coast Army had given up the city, it had only done so in order to offer further resistance from behind the defenses which sealed off the Kazan's Peninsula either in pursuance of Stalin's backs to the war order or else in the hope of still getting part of the army evacuated by Red Fleet vessels at night from the deep inlets west of Shevastopol. As it turned out, only very few of the top commanders and commissars were fetched away by motor torpedo boat, one of them being the army commander, General Petrov. When his successor tried to escape in the same way, he was intercepted by our Italian boat. Thus the final battles on the Kusans Peninsula lasted up till 4th July. While 72 Division captured the armor-plated fort of Maxim Gorky II apostrophe, which was defended by several thousand men. The other divisions gradually pushed the enemy back towards the extreme tip of the peninsula. The Russians made repeated attempts to break through to the east by night, presumably in the hope of joining up with the partisans in the Yale Mountains. Whole masses of them rushed at our lines, their arms linked to prevent anyone from hanging back. At their head, urging them on, there were often women and girls of the communist youth, themselves bearing arms. Inevitably the losses which sallies of this kind entailed were extraordinarily high. In the end the remnants of the coast army sought refuge in big caverns on the shore of the Kusans Peninsula, where they waited in vain to be evacuated. When they surrendered on 4th of July, 30,000 men emerged from this small tip of land alone. In all, the number of prisoners taken in the fortress was over 90,000, and the enemy's losses in killed amounted to many times our own. The amount of booty captured was so vast that it could not immediately be calculated. A naturally strong fortress, reinforced and consolidated in every conceivable way and defended by a whole army, had fallen. The army was annihilated in the entire Crimea now in German hands. At just the right time from the operational point of view, 11th Army had become free for use in the big German offensive on the southern wing of the Eastern Front. I had spent the evening of 1st July with my immediate staff in our command post, a little Tatar dwelling in Yukari Karals. The Soviet duty pilot whose habit it had been to drop a few bombs in our valley around sundown had not shown up. Our thoughts went back to the battles of recent months and the comrades who were no longer with us. And then, over the radio, came a triumphal fanfare heralding the special communique on the fall of Shivastopol. Shortly afterwards the following message came over the teleprinter to the commander-in-chief of the Crimean Army Colonel General V. Manstein in grateful appreciation of your exceptionally meritorious services in the victorious battles of the Crimea, culminating in the annihilation of the enemy at Kerch and the conquest of the mighty fortress of Shivastopol, I hereby promote you Field Marshal by your promotion and the creation of a commemorative shield to be worn by all ranks who took part in the Crimean campaign, I pay tribute before the whole German people to the heroic achievements of the troops fighting under your command. Adolf Hitler. 10. Leningrad Vitebsk While the divisions of 11th Army were recovering from the hardships of the recent fighting and I was on leave in Romania, the various formation staffs were to work out plans for a crossing of the Straits of Kerch preparatory to the armies joining in the big offensive which had meanwhile been launched on the German southern wing. Throughout my leave I was kept posted on the preparations by the visits of my chief of operations, Colonel Buzz. Unfortunately all this planning proved quite fruitless, as Hitler, who was as usual chasing after too many objectives at once, 
overrated the initial successes of the offensive and gave up his original intention of including 11th Army in the operations. Returning to the Crimea on 12th August, I was disturbed to find a new directive from the Supreme Command awaiting me. The plan to take the army across the straits had been dropped and replaced by an operation involving only HQ 42 Corps. 46th Division and certain Romanian forces. 11th Army itself was earmarked for the capture of Leningrad, for which the artillery used in the assault on Shevastopol was already en route. Unfortunately three further divisions were detached from us. 50 Division was to remain in the Crimea. 22 Division, now converted back into an airborne division, was sent to Crete where though one of our best formations it was to lie more or less idle for the rest of the war. Finally, when we were already on the move, 72 Division was diverted to Central Army Group to deal with the local crisis there. Thus all that ultimately remained of 11th Army's original order of battle were HQS 54 and 30 Corps, 24, 132 and 170 Infantry Divisions and 28 Light Division. Irrespective of what the Supreme Command's motives may have been, this dismemberment of an army in which the same corps and divisions had worked together for so long was deplorable. Mutual acquaintanceship and the trust that comes of fighting hard battles together are factors of the utmost importance in war and should never be disregarded. But there was another aspect of even greater relevance. Could there be any justification for taking 11th Army away from the southern wing of the Eastern Front now that it was free in the Crimea and employing it on a task which was palpably less important the conquest of Leningrad? On the German side, after all, the decisive results in that summer of 1942 were being sought in the south of the front. This was a task for which we could never be too strong, particularly as it was obvious even now that the duality of Hitler's objective Stalingrad and the Caucasus would split the offensive in two directions and that the further east it went the longer the northern flank of the spearhead must become. Subsequent events showed how much better it would have been to keep 11th Army on the southern wing, irrespective of whether it had been moved forward over the Straits of Kerch to stop the enemy from falling back on the Caucasus or had initially followed up the attacking army groups as an operational Reserve. When I broke my flight north to call at Hitler's headquarters and talk over my new commitments, I discussed this problem in detail with the Chief of the General Staff, Colonel General Holder. Holder made it quite clear that he completely disagreed with Hitler's proposal to try to take Leningrad in addition to conducting an offensive in the south, but said that Hitler had insisted on this and refused to relinquish the idea. However, when I asked if he thought it practicable to dispense entirely with 11th Army in the South he told me that he did. I myself remained skeptical, without of course being able to refute the Chief of Staff's opinion in advance. On the same occasion I was appalled to find how bad relations were between Hitler and his Chief of Staff. One of the points brought up at the daily conference was the local crisis which had developed in Central Army Group's sector in consequence of a limited Soviet offensive that the same crisis, in fact, that had necessitated the detachment of our own 72 Division. When Hitler took this as an occasion for indulging in a tirade against the men fighting on the spot, Holder emphatically contradicted him pointing out that the strength of the troops had long been overtaxed and that the higher loss of officers and NCOs in particular had been bound to have repercussions. Though couched in thoroughly objective language, Holder's strictures provoked an outburst of fury from Hitler. He questioned in the most tactless terms Holder's right to differ with him, declaring that as a frontline infantryman of World War I he was an infinitely better judge of the matter than Holder who had never been in this position. The whole scene was so undignified that I pointedly left the map table and remained away till Hitler calmed down and asked me to return. Afterwards I felt compelled to mention the incident to the head of the personnel office, General Schmunt, who was also Hitler's chief military assistant. I told him it was quite impossible for the commander and chief and the chief of staff of the army to be on terms like this and that either Hitler must listen to his chief of staff and show him at least the respect that was his due, or Holder must take the only course remaining open to him. Unfortunately nothing of the sort occurred, until the break 
came six weeks later with Halder's dismissal. On 27 August, 11th Army headquarters arrived on the Leningrad front to investigate the possibilities of an attack in 18th Army's sector and to settle on the plan for the assault on the city. It was intended that once this was done, we should take over that part of 18th Army's front which faced north, while the latter retained its eastern front on the Volkhov. The front earmarked for 11th Army was divided into three parts, the Neva sector from Lake Ladoga to the southeast of Leningrad, the actual assault front south of Leningrad, and the front containing the extensive bridgehead still held by the Soviets on the south shore of the Gulf of Finland around Oranian Baum. In addition to powerful assault artillery, part of which had been brought up from Shivastopol, there were to be over 13 divisions at the army's disposal including the Spanish Blue Division, one armoured and one mountain division, and an SS brigade. Of these forces, however, since the Neva and Oranian bomb fronts would be requiring two divisions each, only nine and a half would be left for the attack on Leningrad. This was none too big a force considering that the enemy had an army there of 19 rifle divisions, one rifle brigade, one frontier guard brigade and between one and two independent armored brigades. In view of these relative strengths it would naturally have been of tremendous assistance to us if the Finns, who had forces sealing off the Kalian Isthmus in the north of Leningrad, had participated in the offensive. However, when the question was put to the German liaison officer at Finnish headquarters, General Erfurth, it emerged that the Finnish High Command had declined to take part. The Finnish standpoint, according to the general, was that Finland had maintained ever since 1918 that her existence would never constitute a threat to Leningrad. This put any Finnish contribution to the offensive right out of the question. 11th Army thus found itself thrown entirely on its own resources for the execution of its mission. We were well aware that the success of the operation was somewhat problematical and the fact that it need not have been necessary at all hardly made it any more palatable to us. In the summer of 1941 there had probably been a very good chance of taking Leningrad by a coup de main. Though in those early days Hitler himself regarded the early capture of the city as a main priority, the opportunity was missed for some reason or other. Later Hitler thought he could starve Leningrad out. This the Soviets foiled by supplying the city over Lake Ladoga, in the summer by ship and in the winter by a railway line laid across the ice. What the Germans were left with today was a front from Lake Ladoga to the west of Oranian Baum which was a steady drain on their resources. While its removal was certainly most desirable, the advisability of attacking the city just now, when an attempt was being made to force the issue in the south of the Eastern Front, was a debatable point. As Schiller once said, what we emit from a single hour is lost to all eternity. Still, it was up to us to prepare as best we could for the attack we were called upon to make. To anyone reconnoitering along the front south of Leningrad, the city seemed to lie within clutching distance, although it enjoyed the protection of a whole net of fieldworks distributed in depth. One could pick out the big Kolpina works on the Neva, which were still turning out tanks. The Polkovo shipyards on the Gulf of Finland were also visible. In the distance were the silhouettes of S.D. Isaac's Cathedral, the pointed tower of the Admiralty and the fortress of Peter and Paul. In clear weather it was also possible to see a battle cruiser on the Neva that had been disabled by gunfire. She was one of the 10 ton vessels we had sold to the Russians in 1940. I was sad to learn that several of the imperial residences I knew from 1931, the lovely Catherine Palace in Zarsku Silo, the smaller palace in the same place where the last Tsar lived, and the delightful Peterhof on the Gulf of Finland had fallen victims to the war. They had been set on fire by Soviet shelling. We realized from our reconnaissance that 11th Army must on no account become involved in any fighting inside the built up areas of Leningrad where its strength would be rapidly expended. As for Hitler's belief that the city could be compelled to surrender through terror raids by eight air corps, we had no more faith in this than had Colonel General V. Richthofen, the force's own experienced commander. It was our intention, therefore, to begin by breaking through the front south of Leningrad with maximum artillery and air support, 
but not to carry the advance any further than the southern perimeter of the city. Thereupon two corps would turn east and quickly cross the Neva southeast of the city to destroy the enemy forces between there and Lake Ladoga, cut the Supperly route across the lake and isolate Leningrad from the east. Thereafter it should be possible to bring about the rapid fall of the city like course or before it without any heavy house to house fighting. Unfortunately Schiller's dictum was soon to prove only too true. Quite naturally the enemy had not failed to notice the German build-up in the Leningrad sector, and as early as 27 August he launched an attack against 11th Army's Eastern Front, forcing us to engage 170 Division just after its arrival. In the next few days it became clear that the Soviets were conducting a powerful relief offensive with the aim of forestalling our own attack. On the afternoon of 4 September I received a telephone call from Hitler in person. He told me it was essential that I intervene on the Volkhoff front to prevent a disaster there, I was to assume command myself and restore the situation by offensive action. That very day the enemy had effected a deep breakthrough over a wide stretch of 18th Army's slender front south of Lake Ladoga. Obviously it was somewhat embarrassing for us to relieve 18th Army of command in its own sector just when a serious crisis had developed there. The headquarters staff had, quite understandably, been none too pleased to see us entrusted with so much as the attack on Leningrad. Even in the face of this open slight, However, it did everything possible to lighten our task in the absence of our own Q branch. Instead of the projected attack on Leningrad, a battle now developed south of Lake Ladoga. The enemy had succeeded in overrunning a five mile stretch of 18th Army's front north of the railway line from Leningrad to the east and in penetrating some eight miles to a point above Mga, through which the line passed. The first problem was to halt the enemy with what forces 11th Army had available. At the cost of some hard fighting it was possible to do this in the next few days, and after assembling the rest of its divisions, which had arrived in the meantime, 11th Army was able to start its decisive counter-attack. This was launched from the two still intact flanks in order to cut off the enemy spearhead at its route. The drive from the south was performed by 30 corps, comprising 24, 132 and 170 infantry divisions and 3 mountain division, from the north came 26 corps, the formation originally responsible here, with 121 infantry division, 5 mountain division and 28 light division under command. By 21st September, after heavy fighting, the enemy bulge had been tied off. In the next few days vigorous attacks by fresh enemy forces from the east were beaten off as they tried to relieve the encircled enemy spearheads. A similar attempt by the Leningrad army, attacking with eight divisions across the Neva and from the front south of Leningrad, was equally unsuccessful. At the same time, however, we had to dispose of the strong enemy forces still trapped between Gaito Lovo and Mga. As usual, Despite the hopelessness of his position and the utter futility even from the viewpoint of operations as a whole of continuing the struggle, the enemy had no thought of giving in. On the contrary, he tried again and again to break out of the pocket. As the entire area was thickly wooded, we, incidentally, would never have attempted such a breakthrough in country of this sort. Any attempt on our part to get our infantry to grips with the enemy would have caused us excessive losses. Consequently 11th Army brought over the greatest possible concentration of artillery from the Leningrad front in order to subject the pocket to a round-the-clock bombardment. In the space of only a few days this shelling, supplemented by repeated attacks by the Luftwaffe, had turned the forest area into a pockmarked wilderness relieved only by the stumps of what had recently been giant trees. The captured diary of a Soviet regimental commander later gave us some idea of what effect we had achieved. It also showed just how ruthless the commissars had been in forcing the troops in the pocket to prolong their resistance. By these methods, we were able to end the fighting in the pocket by 2nd October. The enemy, 2nd Shock Army, had thrown no fewer than 16 rifle divisions, 9 rifle brigades, and 5 armored brigades into the battle and, out of these, seven rifle divisions, six rifle brigades and four armored brigades met their fate in the pocket. 
the remainder suffered extremely heavy losses in their fruitless attempts to batter a way through to the beleaguered force. 12,000 prisoners were taken, and over 300 guns, 500 mortars and 244 tanks were either captured or destroyed. The enemy's losses in dead many times exceeded the number of prisoners. While the task of restoring the position on 18th Army's Eastern Front was thereby fulfilled, our own division's casualties had also been heavy and a considerable amount of the ammunition intended for the attack on Leningrad had been used up. In view of this, there could be no question of immediately going over to the offensive. Nonetheless, Hitler was at first unwilling to give up the idea of taking Leningrad although he was not prepared to set more limited objectives. This, of course, would still not have achieved our object, which was to iron out the position on the Leningrad front once and for all, and 11th Army duly insisted that it could not undertake an operation against the city without an adequate rest and refit, let alone with insufficient forces. While these discussions dragged on and one plan superseded another, October passed by. It was more than frustrating to be stuck up here in the north when our offensive in the south of the front appeared to be petering out in the Caucasus and at the gates of Stalingrad. Not surprisingly, my ADC, Lieutenant Specht, once again felt the dissatisfaction which inevitably besets a young officer on a higher formation staff when there is nothing vital to occupy him. Popo began tugging at the bit and I, knowing how he felt, could not bring myself to deny him his wish. I sent him off to 170 Division, which was in action on the Neva and in whose ranks he had already fought for a time in the Crimea. The poor lad crashed in a Fiesella Storch while on his way to join his regiment, and we buried him on 25th October. His death was a sad blow to everyone, most of all to myself. Never again should we hear his clear voice and gay laugh. How I would miss this young comrade who had filled our many hours together with his merriment and been my companion on so many strenuous and dangerous trips, never once losing his brightness, self-confidence or drive. After my good comrade Nagel, he was the second of my immediate associates to be snatched away from us by the war in the East. Just before Specht's burial I had to fly to the Supreme Headquarters to receive my Field Marshal's baton. What a thrill it would have given him to have gone with me. As had always been the case with me to date, Hitler went out. Of his way to be affable and spoke with warm appreciation of the way the troops of 11th Army had acquitted themselves in the Battle of Lake Ladoga. I took this opportunity to impress my views on him regarding the excessive demands being imposed on our infantry. With such high losses as we were bound to have in the East when fighting an enemy as tough as the Russians, it was vitally important that the infantry regiments should always be brought back up to strength with the minimum possible delay. But when replacements never arrived on time and none had ever done so since the Russian campaign began the infantry had to go into action far below their proper strength, with the inevitable result that the fighting troops became more and more worn down as time went on. Now, we were aware that the Luftwaffe, on instructions from Hitler, was in the process of setting up 22 so-called Luftwaffe field divisions, for which it was able to spare 170,000 men. There was nothing surprising in this. Goring had always done things on an extravagant scale in his own domain, not only where funds and installations were concerned, but also in regard to manpower. In the same vein the Luftwaffe had been established to take on operational commitments for which, as had since turned out, it was unable to find sufficient numbers either of air crews or machines. This is not the place to inquire why things should have been allowed to come to such a pass. The essential fact was that the Luftwaffe had some 170,000 men to spare and could have spared them long ago, the dream of a strategic air war having ended, for all practical purposes, with the Battle of Britain. These 170,000 men were now to be concentrated in the Luftwaffe's own private units to fight a war on the ground. Considering what a wide choice had been open to the Luftwaffe in making its selections for these divisions, they were doubtless composed of first-class soldiers. Had they been drafted to army divisions as replacements in autumn 1941 to maintain the latter at their full fighting strength, 
the German army might well have been saved most of the emergencies of the winter of 1941-42. But to form these excellent troops into divisions within the framework of the Luftwaffe was sheer lunacy. Where were they to get the necessary close combat training and practice in working with other formations? Where were they to get the battle experience so vital in the East? And where was the Luftwaffe to find divisional, regimental and battalion commanders? I covered all these aspects in detail during that talk with Hitler and a little later set them out in a memorandum I drafted for his attention. He listened to my arguments attentively enough but insisted that he had already given the matter his fullest consideration and must stick to his decision. Shortly afterwards the then chief of operations of Central Army Group, a man who was always well informed, on account of his friendship with Hitler's ADC, told me the reasons which Göring had given Hitler for wanting the Luftwaffe to set up its own divisions. Göring had claimed that he could not hand over his soldiers, reared in the spirit of National Socialism, to an army which still had chaplains and was led by officers steeped in the traditions of the Kaiser. He had already told his own people that the Luftwaffe must make sacrifices, too, lest the army appear virtually to stand alone in this respect. Such were the arguments with which Göring had sold his scheme to Hitler. Our Leningrad mission as such was now coming to an end. During my visit to Vinitsa, Hitler said that my headquarters would probably be moved to Central Army Group in the Vitebsk region, where there were signs that a big enemy offensive was pending. If and when this materialized, our task would be to counteract it with an offensive of our own. At the same time, however, he told me that if he and his headquarters should leave Vinitsa, I was to be put in command of Army Group A after removing Field Marshal List from this appointment without valid reason, following a difference of opinion with him, Hitler had been commanding the army group himself as a sort of sideline a quite impossible arrangement in the long run. More surprising still was what he had to say on this occasion in connection with my eventual appointment as commander-in-chief of the army group. Next year, he told me, he was thinking of driving through the Caucasus to the Near East with a motorized army group. It was a measure of how unrealistically he still assessed the overall military situation and its strategic possibilities. My last few days on the Leningrad front were marked by the hardest blow that could have befallen my dear wife, myself, and our children in the last war the death of our eldest son Jiro. He fell for our beloved Germany on 29 October, as a second lieutenant in the 51 Panzer Grenadier Regiment of my old 18 Division. I trust, as one under whose command so many thousands of youngsters gave their lives for Germany, that I may be forgiven for mentioning this purely personal loss here. The sacrifice of our son's life was certainly no different from that made by countless other young Germans and their fathers and mothers. But it will be appreciated that there must be a place in these memoirs of mine for the son who gave his life for our fatherland. He shall stand here for all the others who trod the same road as he did whose sacrifice was the same as his sacrifice, and who live on in the hearts of their dear ones just as our beloved son lives on in ours. Our Jiro, born on New Year's Eve 1922 and killed in his twentieth year, had been a delicate child from birth. He had suffered from asthma from childhood, and it was due only to the constant care of my wife that he grew up fit enough to become a soldier. Yet while his ailment deprived him of many things in his boyhood, it had also made him unusually mature and determined to do what life demanded of him despite all his handicaps. Jiro was a particularly lovable child, serious, thoughtful, but always happy. After taking his final school examination at the Ritter Academy in Liegnitz in 1940, he expressed the wish to become a soldier and to join my own arm, the infantry known in Germany as the Queen of the Battlefield because it has from time immemorial borne the brunt of the fighting. It goes without saying that we, as his parents, understood this desire to follow in the footsteps of generations of ancestors, although neither of us had ever made any attempt to influence him in his choice of a profession. It was simply in his blood to become a regular officer to be a trainer of German youth and to be at its head in times of stress. So. Having passed his school examinations, 
He joined 51 Panzer Grenadier Regiment in Liegnitz and went through the 1941 summer campaign in Russia as a private soldier. He was promoted corporal and won the Iron Cross for going back again with other volunteers to pick up a comrade wounded on patrol. In autumn 1941 he was sent home to the officers' school and in spring 1942 he received his commission. After a serious illness and convalescent leave he came back to the regiment he loved, now in action on Lake Hillmen as part of 16th Army. I had the joy of seeing him on his way out the when he visited me in my caravan at the front during the Battle of Lake Ladoga. After that I saw him once more when I visited my friend Bush at 16th Army Headquarters on 18th October. He had invited Jiro up as well, so that we, Bush and our dear Specht, my ADC, were able to spend a happy evening together. Specht himself was killed only a few days later. Early on 30th of October 1942, after the morning situation reports had been handed in, my faithful Chief of Staff, General Schultz, the successor to Walla, brought me the news that our son Jiro had been killed by a Russian bomb the previous night. As assistant adjutant of his battalion he had been on his way out to the front line to convey an order to a platoon commander. We buried the dear boy on the shores of Lake Hillmen the following day. The padre of 18 Panzer Grenadier Division, Pastor Kruger, began his oration with the words. A lieutenant of the infantry. Our son would not have wished it otherwise. After the funeral, I flew home for a few days to be with my dear wife, for whom this boy had throughout the years been a special object of care and devotion. He had given us nothing but joy, for all the anxiety he had caused us by the ailment he had fought so bravely. We laid his soul in God's hands. Juro Eric Sylvester von Manstein, as so many other young Germans, fell in action like the brave soldier he was. The officer's calling was his mission in life, and he fulfilled it with a maturity rare in one so young. If one can speak of a young aristocrat in this sense, then he was one indeed. Not merely in outward appearance he was tall, slim and fine-limbed, with long, noble features but most of all in character and outlook. There was not a single flaw in this boy's makeup. Modest, kind ever eager to help others, at once serious-minded and cheerful, he had no thought for himself, but knew only comradeship and charity. His mind and spirit were perpetually open to all that is fine and good. It was his heritage to come of a long line of soldiers, but by the very fact of being an ardent German soldier he was at once a gentleman in the truest sense of the word a gentleman and a Christian. Whilst I was in Liegnitz after Juro's burial, 11th Army Headquarters was moved from Leningrad to Central Army Group's sector in the area of Vitebsk. There is nothing of importance to tell regarding the few weeks it spent there. Before any steps could be taken to use us in counteracting the anticipated offensive, events in the south of the Eastern Front led to our being given a new role. On 20th November, we received orders to assume immediate command of the sector on both sides of Stalingrad as the headquarters of a newly created Don Army Group. I had just been on a trip to the front to visit VD Chevrolet's Corps with my Chief of Operations, Colonel Buss and had been delayed by the explosion of a mine under our train. In that territory the presence of partisans made it necessary to travel in armored vehicles or specially protected trains. Because the weather was too bad for flying, we had to leave Vipsk by rail on 21st November, and were once again held up by a mine attack. We reached HQ Army Group B, which was still responsible for our future sector, on 24th November, my 55th birthday. What we learned here about the situation of 6th Army and the adjacent fronts of 4th Panzer Army and 3rd and 4th Romanian armies will be dealt with in the chapter on Stalingrad. 11. Hitler as Supreme Commander My appointment as Commander of Don Army Group brought me for the first time under Hitler's direct orders as Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces, Wehrmacht, and the Army, here. Only now did I find myself in a position to see how he tried to fulfill the duties of a supreme war leader besides those of a head of state, for hitherto I had felt his influence on military decisions at best indirectly and from afar. Because of the strict secrecy surrounding all matters of an operational nature, 
I had been unable to form any valid opinion of my own. During the campaign in Poland, we had been unaware of any interference by Hitler in the leadership of the army. On his two visits to V. Rundstedt's army group, he had listened sympathetically to our interpretations of the situation and agreed to our intentions without making any attempt to intervene. As for the plan for the occupation of Norway, no outsider had known anything whatever about it. Hitler's attitude regarding the offensive in the West has already been discussed in detail. It was certainly both deplorable and alarming that he should have completely passed over OKH in this matter, yet it had to be conceded that his view that the solution must be an offensive one was fundamentally correct from the military point of view, even if the same could not be said of his original timing. Admittedly he had laid down the outline of a plan which as has already been pointed out could hardly have produced a complete solution. At that stage he had probably not thought it possible to attain results on the scale ultimately achieved. Nevertheless, when the plan put up by Army Group offered him this possibility, he had immediately grasped the idea and adopted it himself even though he imposed certain limitations which betrayed his aversion to risks. His fatal mistake of halting the armor outside Dunkirk had not at the time been apparent to an outsider, for the sight of beaches bestrewn with abandoned equipment tended to deceive anyone not yet aware how successful the British had been in getting their troops back across the channel. The absence of a war plan permitting the timely preparation of an invasion did, however, reveal a failure of Wehrmacht leadership, in other words, on the part of Hitler himself. On the other hand, it was impossible for anyone not actually on the spot to judge whether or not the decision to turn on the Soviet Union was unavoidable for political reasons. The Soviet deployment on the German, Hungarian and Romanian frontiers certainly looked menacing enough. As commander of a corps and later of 11th Army I learned just as little of Hitler's influence on the plan for an attack on the Soviet Union and the conduct of operations in the first phase of the campaign as I did of the plans for the summer offensive in 1942. There had certainly been no interference by Hitler in the handling of the Crimean campaign. Indeed. He had agreed to our intentions without hesitation when I went to see him in spring 1942 and had doubtless done everything to make our success at Chivestopol possible. I have already mentioned that I considered 11th Army to have been wrongly used after the fall of the fortress. Now that I had come immediately under Hitler in my capacity as an army group commander, however, I was to get my first real experience of him in his exercise of the supreme command. When considering Hitler in the role of a military leader, one should certainly not dismiss him with such clichés as the Lance Corporal of World War I apostrophe. He undoubtedly had a certain eye for operational openings, as had been shown by the way he opted for Army Group A's plan in the West. Indeed. This is often to be found in military amateurs otherwise history would not have recorded so many dukes and princes as successful commanders. In addition, though, Hitler possessed an astoundingly retentive memory and an imagination that made him quick to grasp all technical matters and problems of armaments. He was amazingly familiar with the effect of the very latest enemy weapons and could reel off whole columns of figures on both our own and the enemy's war production. Indeed, this was his favorite way of sidetracking any topic that was not to his liking. There can be no question that his insight and unusual energy were responsible for many achievements in the sphere of armaments. Yet his belief in his own superiority in this respect ultimately had disastrous consequences. His interference prevented the smooth and timely development of the Luftwaffe and it was undoubtedly he who hampered the development of rocket propulsion and atomic weapons. Moreover, Hitler's interest in everything technical led him to overestimate the importance of his technical resources. As a result, he would count on a mere handful of assault gun detachments or the new Tiger tanks to restore situations where only large bodies of troops could have any prospect of success. What he lacked, broadly speaking, was simply military ability based on experience, something for which his intuition was no substitute. While Hitler may have had an eye for tactical opportunity and could quickly seize a chance when it was offered to him, he still lacked the ability to assess the prerequisites and practicability of a plan of operations. 
he failed to understand that the objectives and ultimate scope of an operation must be in direct proportion to the time and forces needed to carry it out, to say nothing of the possibilities of supply. He did not or would not realize that any long-range offensive operation calls for a steady build-up of troops over and above those committed in the original assault. All this was brought out with striking clarity in the planning and execution of the 1942 summer offensive. Another example was the fantastic idea he disclosed to me in autumn 1942 of driving through the Caucasus to the Near East and India with a motorized army group as in the political sphere, at all events after his successes of 1938, so in the military did Hitler lack all sense of judgment regarding what could be achieved and what could not. In autumn 1939, despite his contempt for France's powers of resistance, he had not originally recognized the possibility of attaining decisive success by a correctly planned German offensive. Yet when this success actually became his, he lost his eye for opportunity where conditions were different. What he lacked in each case was a real training in strategy and grand tactics. And so this active mind seized on almost any aim that caught his fancy causing him to fritter away Germany's strength by taking on several objectives simultaneously, often in the most dispersed theatres of war. The rule that one can never be too strong at the crucial spot, that one may even have to dispense with less vital fronts or accept the risk of radically weakening them in order to achieve a decisive aim, was something he never really grasped. As a result, in the offensives of 1942 and 1943 he could not bring himself to stake everything on success. Neither was he able or willing to see what action would be necessary to compensate for the unfavorable turn which events then took daughters for Hitler's strategic aims, at least in the conflict with the Soviet Union, these were to a very great extent conditioned by political considerations and the needs of the German war economy. This has already been indicated in the introductory remarks on the Russian campaign and will emerge again in connection with the defensive battles of the years 1943-4. Now, questions of a political and economic nature are undoubtedly of great importance when it comes to fixing strategic aims. What Hitler overlooked was that the achievement and most important of all the retention of a territorial objective presupposes the defeat of the enemy's armed forces. So long as this military issue is undecided and this may be seen from the struggle against the Soviet Union the attainment of territorial aims in the form of economically valuable areas remains problematical and their long-term retention a sheer impossibility. The day had yet to come when one could wreak such havoc on the enemy's armament centers or transport system with raiding aircraft or guided missiles that he was rendered incapable of continuing the fight. While strategy must unquestionably be an instrument in the hands of the political leadership, the latter must not disregard as did Hitler to a great extent when fixing operational objectives the fact that the strategic aim of any war is to smash the military defensive power of the enemy. Only when victory has been secured is the way open to the realization of political and economic aims. This brings me to the factor which probably did more than anything else to determine the character of Hitler's leadership his overestimation of the power of the will. This will, as he saw it, had only to be translated into faith down to the youngest private soldier for the correctness of his decisions to be confirmed and the success of his orders ensured. Obviously a strong will in a supreme commander is one of the essential prerequisites of victory. Many a battle has been lost and many a success thrown away because the supreme leaders will failed at the critical moment. The will for victory which gives the commander the strength to see a grave crisis through is something very different from Hitler's will which in the last analysis stemmed from a belief in his own mission. Such a belief inevitably makes a man impervious to reason and leads him to think that his own will can operate even beyond the limits of hard reality whether these consist in the presence of far superior enemy forces, in the conditions of space and time, or merely in the fact that the enemy also happens to have a will of his own. Generally speaking, Hitler had little inclination to relate his own calculations to the probable intentions of the enemy, since he was convinced that his will would always triumph in the end. He was equally disinclined to accept any reports, however reliable, of enemy superiority, even though the latter might be many times stronger than he. 
Hitler either rejected such reports out of hand or minimized them with assertions about the enemy's deficiencies and took refuge in endless recitations of German production figures. In the face of his will, the essential elements of the appreciation of a situation on which every military commander's decision must be based were virtually eliminated. And with that Hitler turned his back on reality. The only remarkable feature was that this overestimation of his own willpower, this disregard for the enemy's resources and possible intentions, was not matched by a corresponding boldness of decision. The same man who, after his successes in politics up to 1938, had become a political gambler, actually recoiled from risks in the military field. The only bold military decision that may be booked to Hitler's credit was probably the one he took to occupy Norway, and even then the original suggestion had come from Grand Admiral Reda. Even here, as soon as a crisis cropped up at Narvik, Hitler was on the point of ordering the evacuation of the city and thereby of sacrificing the fundamental aim of the entire operation, which was to keep the iron ore routes open. During the execution of the Western Campaign, too, as we have seen earlier, Hitler showed a certain aversion to taking military risks. The decision to attack the Soviet Union was, in the last analysis, the inevitable outcome of cancelling the invasion of Britain, which Hitler had likewise found too risky. During the Russian campaign, Hitler's fear of risk manifested itself in two ways. One, as will be shown later, was his refusal to accept that elasticity of operations which, in the conditions obtaining from 1943 onwards, could be achieved only by a voluntary, if temporary surrender of conquered territory. The second was his fear to denude secondary fronts or subsidiary theatres in favour of the spot where the main decision had to fall, even when a failure to do so was palpably dangerous. There are three possible reasons why Hitler evaded these risks in the military field. First, he may secretly have felt that he lacked the military ability to cope with them. This being so, he was even less likely to credit his generals with having it. The second reason was the fear, common to all dictators, that his prestige would be shaken by any setbacks. In practice this attitude is bound to lead to the commission of military mistakes which damage the man's prestige more than ever. Thirdly, there was Hitler's intense dislike rooted in his lust for power, of giving up anything on which he had once laid hands. In the same context mention may be made of another trait of Hitler's against which his chief of staff, Colonel General Zietzler, and I both battled in vain throughout the period in which I was commanding Don Army Group. Whenever he was confronted with a decision which he did not like taking but could not ultimately evade, Hitler would procrastinate as long as he possibly could. This happened every time it was urgently necessary for us to commit forces to battle in time to forestall an operational success by the enemy or to prevent its exploitation. The general staff had to struggle with Hitler for days on end before it could get forces released from less threatened sectors of the front to be sent to a crisis spot. In most cases he would give too small a number of troops when it was already too late with the result that he usually finished up by having to grant several times what had originally been required. The tussle used to last for whole weeks when it was a question of abandoning untenable positions like the Dunitz area in 1943 or the Dnieper Bend in 1944. The same applied to the evacuation of unimportant salients on quiet stretches of front for the purpose of acquiring extra forces. Possibly Hitler always expected things to go his way in the end, thereby enabling him to avoid decisions which were repugnant to him if only because they meant recognizing the fact that he must accommodate himself to the enemy's actions. His inflated belief in his own willpower, a certain aversion to accepting any risk in mobile operations, the retour offensive, for example, when its success could not be guaranteed in advance, and his dislike of giving up anything voluntarily such were the factors which influenced Hitler's military leadership more and more as time went on. Obstinate defense of every foot of ground gradually became the be-all and end-all of that leadership. And so, after the Wehrmacht had won such extraordinary successes in the first years of war by dint of operational mobility, Hitler's reaction when the first crisis occurred in front of Moscow was to adopt Stalin's precept of hanging on doggedly to every single position. 
It was a policy that had brought the Soviet leaders so close to the abyss in 1941 that they finally relinquished it when the Germans launched their 1942 offensive. Yet, because the Soviet counteroffensive in that winter of 1941 had been frustrated by the resistance of our troops, Hitler was convinced that his ban on any voluntary withdrawal had saved the Germans from the fate of Napoleon's Grand Army in 1812. In this belief, admittedly, he was reinforced by the acquiescent attitude of his own retinue and several commanders at the front. When, therefore, a fresh crisis arose in autumn 1942 after the German offensive had become bogged down outside Stalingrad and in the Caucasus, Hitler again thought the arcanum of success lay in clinging at all costs to what he already possessed. Henceforth he could never be brought to renounce this notion. Now it is generally recognized that defense is the stronger of the two forms of fighting. This is only true, however, when the defense is so efficacious that the attacker bleeds to death when assaulting the defender's positions. Such a thing was out of the question on the Eastern Front, where the number of German divisions available was never sufficient for so strong a defense to be organized. The enemy being many times stronger than we were, was always able, by massing his forces at points of his own choice, to break through fronts that were far too widely extended. As a result, large numbers of German forces were unable to avoid encirclement. Only in mobile operations could the superiority of the German staffs and fighting troops have been turned to account and, perhaps, the forces of the Soviet Union ultimately brought to naught. The effects of Hitler's ever increasing predilection for hanging on at all costs will be dealt with in greater detail in connection with the defensive battles fought on the Eastern Front in 1943 and 1944. The reason for his insistence on it may be found deep down in his own personality. He was a man who saw fighting only in terms of the utmost brutality. His way of thinking conformed more to a mental picture of masses of the enemy bleeding to death before our lines than to the conception of a subtle fencer who knows how to make an occasional step backwards in order to lunge for the decisive thrust. For the art of war he substituted a brute force which, as he saw it, was guaranteed maximum effectiveness by the willpower behind it. Since Hitler placed the power of force above that of the mind and, while having every regard for a soldier's bravery, did not rate his ability to the same extent, it is hardly surprising that, in the same way as he overrated technical expedients, he was possessed of la rage du number. He would intoxicate himself with the production figures of the German armaments industry, which he had undoubtedly boosted to an amazing extent, even if he preferred to overlook the fact that the enemy's armaments figures were higher still. What he forgot was the amount of training and skill required to render a new weapon fully effective. Once the new weapons had reached the front, he was content. It did not worry him whether the units concerned had mastered them or not, or whether a weapon had even been tested under combat conditions. In just the same way, Hitler was constantly ordering new divisions to be set up. Though an increase in the number of our formations was most desirable, they had to be filled at the cost of replacements for the divisions already in existence, which in course of time were drained of their last drop of blood. At the same time, the newly established formations initially had to pay an excessively high toll of killed because of their lack of battle experience. The Luftwaffe field divisions, the unending series of SS divisions and finally the so-called People's Grenadier divisions were the most blatant examples. A final point worth mentioning is that although Hitler was always harping on his soldierly outlook and loved to recall that he had acquired his military experience as a frontline soldier, his character had as little in common with the thoughts and emotions of soldiers as had his party with the Prussian virtues which it was so fond of invoking. Hitler was certainly quite clearly informed of conditions at the front through the reports he received from the army groups and armies. In addition, he frequently interviewed officers who had just returned from the front line areas. Thus he was not only aware of the achievements of our troops but also knew what continuous overstrain they had had to endure since the beginning of the Russian campaign. Perhaps this was one of the reasons why we never managed to get Hitler anywhere near a front line in the East. It was hard enough to persuade him to visit our army group headquarters, 
the idea of going any further forward never occurred to him. It may be that he feared such trips would destroy those golden dreams about his invincible will. Despite the pains Hitler took to stress his own former status as a frontline soldier, I still never had the feeling that his heart belonged to the fighting troops. Losses, as far as he was concerned, were merely figures which reduced fighting power. They are unlikely to have seriously disturbed him as a human being. 17 in one respect, however, Hitler's outlook was entirely soldier-like in the matter of war decorations. With these his first and foremost aim was to honor the brave among the fighting men, and the regulations he issued regarding the award of the Iron Cross at the beginning of the campaign were a model of their kind. This decoration, he decided, should be conferred only for deeds of bravery and outstanding leadership which meant that, as far as the latter category was concerned, it could be won only by formation commanders and their senior staff officers. Unfortunately many of those responsible for awarding the decoration failed all along to observe this lucid and admirable ruling partly, it must be admitted, as a result of the delay in creating a cross for meritorious war service, the Kriegsverdienst Kreuz, which was intended for those who, though employed on duties rendering them ineligible for the Iron Cross, still deserved distinction. With Hitler it was always harder to secure a knight's cross for a deserving general than for an officer or man at the front. As for the retrospective tendency to deride the many different badges and insignia that Hitler created in the course of the war. People should merely bear in mind what feats our soldiers accomplished during the many long years of its duration. Badges like the Close Combat Clasp, the Nachkampfspange, and the 11th Army Crimean Shield were at all events worn with pride. Besides, the number of medal ribbons worn by soldiers on the other side shows that the question of war decorations is not to be dismissed with a lot of silly talk about tin gongs. The deficiencies I have just described were bound to detract considerably from Hitler's fitness to play the self appointed role of the supreme military leader. They could still have been counterbalanced, however. If only he had been prepared to take advice from and place genuine confidence in an experienced and jointly responsible chief of the general staff. He did, after all, possess a number of the qualities indispensable to a supreme commander, a strong will, nerves that would stand up to the most serious crises, an undeniably keen brain and as I said before a certain talent in the operational field combined with an ability to recognize possibilities of a technical nature. If only he could have seen his way to compensate for his lack of training and experience in the military sphere, particularly as regards strategy and grand tactics, by utilizing the skill of his chief of staff, quite an efficient military leadership might have emerged despite all the shortcomings mentioned above. But this was precisely what Hitler would not accept. Just as he considered the power of his will to be in every way decisive, so had his political successes and, indeed, the military victories early in the war, which he regarded as his own personal achievement caused him to lose all sense of proportion in assessing his own capabilities. To him the acceptance of advice from a jointly responsible chief of staff would not have meant supplementing his own will but submitting it to that of another. Added to this was the fact that he was imbued by origin and background with an insuperable mistrust of the military leaders whose code and way of thinking were alien to him. Thus, he was not prepared to see a really responsible military advisor alongside himself. He wanted to be another Napoleon, who had only tolerated men under him who would obediently carry out his will. Unfortunately he had neither Napoleon's military training nor his military genius. I have already shown in the chapter dealing with the plan for the invasion of Britain that Hitler had so organized the supreme command that no one was vested with the authority to advise him on grand strategy or to draft a war plan. The operations staff, Wehmacht Führungstab, of OKW, which was theoretically qualified to discharge such a task in practice merely played the role of a military secretariat. Its only raison d'etre was to translate Hitler's ideas and instructions into the terminology of military orders. But there was even worse to come. Hitler's designation of Norway as an OKW theater of operations in which OKH had no authority was only the first step in the disruption of land operations. 
In due course all the other theatres were gradually turned over to OKW finally only the Eastern one remained as an OKH responsibility, and even then it had Hitler at its head. Hence the chief of staff of the army was left with just as little influence on the other theatres of war as were the commanders in chief of the two other services in matters of grand strategy. He had no say whatever in the overall distribution of the army's forces and often did not even know for certain what troops and material were being sent to the various theatres. In the circumstances it was inevitable that the OKW operations staff and the general staff of the army should clash. Indeed. Hitler probably created clashes deliberately in order that he alone should at all times have the decisive say. Naturally such faulty organization of the supreme military leadership was bound to contribute decisively to its breakdown. Another consequence of Hitler's overestimation of his willpower and military ability was that he attempted more and more to interfere by separate orders of his own in the running of subordinate formations. It has always been the special forte of German military leadership that it relies on commanders at all levels to show initiative and willingness to accept responsibility and does everything in its power to promote such qualities. That is why, as a matter of principle, the directives of higher commands and the orders of medium and lower commands always contain so-called assignments for subordinate formations. The detailed execution of these assignments was the business of the subordinate commanders concerned. This system of handling orders was largely the reason for the successes scored by the German army over its opponents, whose own orders generally governed the actions of subordinate commanders down to the very last detail. Only when there was no other possible alternative left did anyone on our side encroach upon the authority of a subordinate formation headquarters by specifically laying down the action it should take. Hitler, on the other hand, thought he could see things much better from behind his desk than the commanders at the front. He ignored the fact that much of what was marked on his far too detailed situation maps was obviously out of date. From that distance, moreover, he could not possibly judge what was the proper and necessary action to take on the spot. He had grown increasingly accustomed to interfering in the running of the army groups, armies, and lower formations by issuing special orders which were not his concern at all. While I had hitherto been spared such interference in my own sphere of command, I was forewarned of it by what Field Marshal V. Kludge had to tell me when I met him on a railway station on my way from Vitebsk to Rostov. At Central Army Group, he said, he had to consult Hitler before any operation involving forces of a battalion or more could be mounted. Even if I personally did not experience such intolerable interference later on, there were still to be quite enough clashes with the Supreme Command as a result of Hitler's meddling. In contrast to his passion for individual orders, which were usually nothing but a hindrance to command staffs and detrimental to operations, Hitler was loath to issue long-term operational directives. The more he came to regard the principle of holding on at all costs as the alpha and omega of his policy, the less prepared was he to issue long-term directives which took account of the normally foreseeable development of a strategic situation. That such methods must ultimately have placed him at a disadvantage vis-à-vis -vis the enemy was something he refused to see. His mistrust of his subordinate commanders prevented him from giving them, in the form of long-term directives, freedom of action, which they might put to a use that was not to his liking. The effect of this, however, was to do away with the very essence of leadership. In the long run even an army group could not get along without directives from the supreme command certainly not when it formed part of a larger front and was bound to its neighbors on either flank. We often thought nostalgically of our days in the Crimea, when we had been able to fight in a theater all of our own. It still remains for me to show in as far as I can do so from personal experience what pattern the disputes took which inevitably arose between Hitler and the army leaders as a result of his attitude to questions of military leadership. Many of the accounts on record depict him as foaming at the mouth and even taking an occasional bite at the carpet. Although he did undoubtedly lose all self-control on occasions, 
The only time he ever raised his voice or behaved badly when I was present was during the episode with Halder which I have already mentioned. Hitler obviously sensed just how far he could afford to go with his interlocutor and what people he could hope to intimidate with outbursts of rage that may often have been simulated. I must say that as far as my own personal contacts with him went, he maintained appearances and kept things on a factual plane even when our views collided. On the one occasion when he did become personal, the extremely sharp retort it evoked was accepted in silence. Hitler had a masterly knack of psychologically adapting himself to the individual whom he wished to bring round to his point of view. In addition, of course, he always knew anyone's motive for coming to see him, and could thus have all his counter-arguments ready beforehand. His faculty for inspiring others with his own confidence whether feigned or genuine was quite remarkable. This particularly applied when officers who did not know him well came to see him from the front. In such cases a man who had set out to tell Hitler the truth about things out there came back converted and bursting with confidence. In the various disputes I had with Hitler on operational matters in my capacity as an army group commander, what impressed me most was the incredible tenacity with which he would defend his point of view. There was almost invariably a tussle of several hours duration before his visitor either attained his object or retired empty-handed at best consoled with empty promises. I have known no other man who could show anything like the same staying power in a discussion of this kind. And while the maximum time involved in any dispute with a frontline commander would at worst be several hours, the chief of staff, General Zietzler, often had to battle for days on end at the evening conferences in order to get Hitler to take the necessary action. Whenever one of these contests was in progress, we always used to ask Zietzler what round they had reached. Besides, the arguments with which Hitler defended his point of view and I include the purely military ones here were not usually of a kind that could be dismissed out of hand. After all, in any discussion of operational intentions one is almost always dealing with a matter whose outcome nobody can predict with absolute certainty. Nothing is certain in war. When all is said and done. Whenever Hitler perceived that he was not making any impression with his opinions on strategy, he immediately produced something from the political or economic sphere. Since he had a knowledge of the political and economic situations with which no frontline commander could compete, his arguments here were generally irrefutable. As a last resort, all one could do was to insist that if he did not agree to the proposals or demands submitted to him, things would go wrong militarily and in turn have even worse repercussions in the political and economic fields. On the other hand, Hitler frequently showed himself to be a very good listener even when he did not like what was being asked of him, and on such occasions he was quite capable of objective discussion. Naturally, no relationship of any intimacy could develop between this fanatical dictator, who thought only of his political aspirations and lived in a belief in his mission, and the military leaders. The personal element obviously did not interest Hitler in the least. To him human beings were merely tools in the service of his political ambitions. From his own side there sprang no bond of loyalty to the German soldier. The even more apparent defects in Germany's military leadership some of which arose from Hitler's character and others from the quite impossible organization of the Supreme Command outlined earlier on, naturally raised the question of whether anything could be done to bring about a change. I prefer to leave the political aspects aside here as indeed I have done everywhere else in this book. I made no less than three attempts, in the interest of a more rational conduct of the war, to persuade Hitler to accept some modification of the Supreme Command. From no other quarter, as far as I know, was the inadequacy of his military leadership ever put to him quite so bluntly. I was fully alive to the fact that Hitler would never be prepared to relinquish the supreme command officially. As a dictator he could not possibly have done so without suffering what for him would have been an intolerable loss of prestige. In my opinion everything depended, therefore, on persuading Hitler while nominally retaining the position of supreme commander to leave the conduct of military operations in all theatres of war to one responsible chief of staff and to appoint a special commander in chief for the Eastern Theatre. These attempts of mine, which unfortunately proved unavailing, 
will be discussed further when I come to deal with the events of the years 1943-4. For me they were a particularly precarious undertaking, for Hitler knew full well that I was the very man many people in the army would like to see in the position of a proper chief of staff or as commander and chief in the East. It is not my intention here to go into the question of changing the leadership of the Reich by violent means as exemplified by the events of 20th of July 1944, although I may do so one day. Within the scope of these war memoirs it is enough to say that as one responsible for an army group in the field I did not feel I had the right to contemplate a coup d'etat in wartime because in my own view it would have led to an immediate collapse of the front and probably to chaos inside Germany. Apart from this, there was always the question of the military oath and the admissibility of murder for political motives. As I said at my trial, no senior military commander can for years on end expect his soldiers to lay down their lives for victory and then precipitate defeat by his own hand. In any case, it was already clear by that time that not even a coup d'etat would make any difference to the Allied demand for unconditional surrender. At the time when I held a command, we had not, to my mind, reached the point where such action had to be regarded as the only possible solution. 12. The Tragedy of Stalingrad Stranger. To Sparta say, her faithful band here lie in death, remembering her command. Never will these lines, telling of the heroism of the defenders of Thermopylae and ever after regarded as the song of praise to bravery, fidelity and soldierly obedience be carved in stone at Stalingrad in memory of 6th Army's martyrdom on the Volga. Nor is any cross or cenotaph likely to be raised over the vanished traces of the German soldiers who starved, froze and died the dot yet the memory of their indescribable suffering, their unparalleled heroism, fidelity, and devotion to duty will live on long after the victors' cries of triumph have died away and the bereaved, the disillusioned and the bitter at heart have fallen silent. The Battle of Stalingrad is understandably treated by the Soviets as the turning point of the war. The British ascribe similar importance to the Battle of Britain. The Americans are inclined to attribute the Allies' final success to their own entry into hostilities. In Germany, too, Many people feel constrained to regard Stalingrad as the decisive battle of World War II. In point of fact not one of these individual events should really be rated as decisive. The outcome of the war was decided by a wealth of factors, the most significant of which was probably the hopelessly inferior position in which Germany ultimately found herself vis-à-vis -vis her opponents in consequence of Hitler's policies and strategy. Stalingrad was certainly a turning point to the extent that the wave of German offensives broke on the Volga, to recede like a breaker on the ebbing tide. But grave though the loss of Sixth Army undoubtedly was, it still need not have meant that the war in the East, and ipso facto the war as a whole was irretrievably lost. It would still have been conceivable to force a stalemate if Germany's policies and military leadership had been adapted to such a solution. The way to Stalingrad cause of Sixth Army's destruction at Stalingrad is obviously to be found in Hitler's refusal, doubtless mainly for reasons of prestige to give up the city voluntarily. Yet the fact that Sixth Army could ever land in such a situation at all was due to the operational errors committed beforehand by the Supreme Command in the planning and execution of the 1942 offensive, most of all with regard to its final stages. The plight in which the German southern wing found itself in the late autumn of 1942 as a result of these mistakes will be dealt with in the chapter on the winter campaign of 1942 3. All I propose to do here is to bring out the points which settled the fate of Sixth Army. Thanks to the fact that Hitler's strategic objectives were governed chiefly by the needs of his war economy. The German offensive of 1942 had split into two different directions the Caucasus and Stalingrad. By the time the German advance came to a halt, therefore, a front had emerged, to hold which there were not enough German forces available. To make things worse, no strategic reserve existed, the Supreme Command having squandered 11th Army in every conceivable direction immediately it became free in the Crimea. Army Group A with its front facing south was located in the north of the Caucasus between the Black Sea and the Caspian. 
Army Group B held a front facing east and northeast which began on the Volga south of Stalingrad and bent back north of the city to join the Middle Don, along which it continued to a point north of Voronezh. Neither of the two army groups was strong enough to hold fronts of this length, particularly if one bore in mind that despite its heavy losses the enemy's southern wing had been able to avoid destruction and was not really beaten at all. Apart from this, the enemy had very strong strategic reserves in his other sectors, as well as in the hinterland. Last but not least, a gap 190 miles wide yawned between the two army groups in the Karmic steppes, guarded only by the quite inadequate resources of one division, 16 motorized, based on Yalista. The attempt to hold this overextended front for any length of time constituted the first of the mistakes which were to plunge 6th Army into its desperate situation at the end of November 1942. The second and even more fatal mistake was that Hitler compelled Army Group B to tie down its principal striking force, 4th Panzer and 6th Armies, in the fighting in and around Stalingrad. The job of protecting the deep northern flank of this group along the Don was left to 3rd Romanian Army, 1 Italian and 1 Hungarian Army and, in the Voronezh sector, to the weak 2nd German Army. Hitler must have known that even behind the Don the Allied armies could not stand up to a strong Soviet attack. The same was true of 4th Romanian Army, which he had entrusted with the task of guarding the open right flank of 4th Panzer Army. The attempt to gain control of the Volga by taking Stalingrad in a set battle after the original assault had been only partially successful would at best have been admissible on a very short term basis. But to leave the main body of the army group at Stalingrad for weeks on end with inadequately protected flanks was a cardinal error. It amounted to nothing less than presenting the enemy with the initiative we ourselves had resigned on the whole southern wing, and was a clear invitation to him to surround 6th Army. A third mistake was the utterly grotesque chain of command on the German southern wing. Army Group I had no commander of its own whatever. It was commanded by Hitler in what might be called a part time capacity. Army Group B had no fewer than seven armies under command, including four allied ones. No army group headquarters can cope with more than five armies at the outside, and when most of these are allied ones, the task inevitably becomes too much for it. HQ Army Group B had quite rightly established itself at Starobilsk, behind the defensive front on the Don, in order to keep a better eye on the allied armies. The choice of this location, however, also meant that the headquarters was much too distant from the right wing of its sector. Another factor was that by his frequent interference in the conduct of operations Hitler largely deprived the army group headquarters of control of 6th Army. It is true that OKH had recognized these command problems and made plans to create a new Don Army group under Marshal Anton Sku. The new headquarters had not been set up, however, as Hitler first wished to see Stalingrad fall. This failure to use the Romanian marshal was a serious mistake. Admittedly his capacity for command was untried so far, but he was certainly a good soldier. In any case, his presence would have lent greater weight to our calls for further forces to guard the flanks of the Stalingrad front. He was, after all, a head of state and an ally to whom Hitler had to pay greater heed than to German army group and army commanders. Above all, Anton Sku's personality would have served to brace up the senior Romanian commanders, who respected this man no less than they did the Russians. It was clear from an impassioned letter he wrote me after my assumption of command that the Marshal had on several occasions called attention to the dangers of the situation in general and that of 3rd Romanian Army in particular. As long as he did not hold a responsible command at the front, However, these comments of his inevitably lacked the emphasis they would have carried if uttered by a head of state simultaneously answerable for the sector that was threatened. It was equally clear that neither Army Group B nor 6th Army had failed to give warning of the big offensive the enemy was preparing to launch against the covering fronts on each side of Stalingrad. Finally, mention should be made of a fact which had grave repercussions on the position of 6th Army and the entire southern wing. The whole of Army Group A, as well as 4th Panzer and 6th Armies, 
3rd and 4th Romanian armies and the Italian army, were based on a single Dnieper crossing, the railway bridge at Dnepropetrovsk. The repair of the Zaporozhye railway bridge and the link across the Ukraine through Nikolaev and Kazan to the Crimea and thence across the Straits of Kerch had either been discontinued or was not yet complete. The north to south link behind the German lines was equally unsatisfactory. When it came to bringing up fresh troops or quickly switching forces behind the front, therefore, the German Supreme Command found itself at a permanent disadvantage vis a vis the enemy who had much more efficient communications at his disposal in every direction. Every commander in chief must run risks if he wants to succeed. The risk undertaken by the Supreme Command in the late autumn of 1942, however, should never have consisted in tying down the most hard hitting forces of Army Group B at Stalingrad over a long period in which it was content to leave the Don front covered by such an easily destructible screen. One possible argument in the Supreme Command's favor is that it was quite unprepared for the Allied armies to break down so completely. Yet the Romanians, who were still the best of our allies, fought exactly as our experiences in the Crimea implied they would. Any illusions about the Italians' fighting capacities, of course, were inexcusable from the start. The risk which the German command ought to have taken, after the summer offensive had merely won us more territory without bringing about the decisive defeat of the Soviet southern wing, consisted in returning to mobile operations between the Caucasus and middle reaches of the Don with due advantage being taken of the large bend of the river, in order to prevent the enemy from attaining the initiative. But to substitute one risk for another was not in keeping with Hitler's mentality. By failing to take appropriate action after his offensive had petered out without achieving anything definite, he paved the way to the tragedy of Stalingrad. Development of the situation around Stalingrad up to my takeover of Don Army Group The OKH order received by 11th Army Headquarters on 21st November in the Vitebsk area laid down that for the purpose of stricter coordination of the armies involved in the arduous defensive battles to the west and south of Stalingrad, we were to take over command of 4th Panzer Army, 6th Army and 3rd Romanian Army as HQ Don Army Group. Since we lacked a quartermaster general's branch, we were to be joined by the one already formed for Marshal Anton Sku. It was headed by Colonel Fink, a general staff officer whose soundness of character was matched only by his extraordinary talent for organizing supply and transport, and who in due course mastered all the supplely difficulties with which the army group constantly found itself confronted. The airlift to 6th Army, unfortunately, was outside his control. After my recall in April 1944 Colonel Fink was transferred to the staff of the Commander-in-Chief in the West, where, I am told, he soon had supply and transport in a state as near perfection as the enemy's complete domination of the skies permitted. As one of the men implicated in the conspiracy against Hitler, he was executed after 20th of July 1944. Don Army Group's task, as defined in the OKH order, was to bring the enemy attacks to a standstill and recapture the positions previously occupied by us. Initially, the only reinforcements promised us were a corps headquarters and a division which were to be moved up to Milarovo. Behind the future right wing of Army Group B. It may be gathered from the wording of our task and the insignificance of the proposed reinforcements that when issuing this order, OKH still did not realize the danger of the situation around Stalingrad, although the ring had closed around 6th Army that very day. Further information was forthcoming in Vitebsk and during a train stop when I was able to talk to Field Marshal V. Kludge and his Chief of Staff, General Waller. From this I gathered that the enemy had broken through 3rd Romanian Army's front on the Don northwest of Stalingrad in very great strength. Between one and two Soviet tank armies were involved, in addition to a great deal of cavalry in all some 30 formations. The same thing had happened south of Stalingrad to 4th Romanian Army which was under command of 4th Panzer Army. Before leaving Vitebsk, therefore, 
I sent the chief of the general staff a teleprinter message pointing out that in view of the magnitude of the enemy effort, our task at Stalingrad could not be merely a matter of regaining a fortified stretch of front. What we should need to restore the situation would be forces amounting to an army in strength none of which, if possible, should be used for a counter-offensive until their assembly was fully complete. General Zietzler agreed with me, and promised to try to let us have an armored division and two or three infantry divisions by way of addition. I also teleprinted a request to Army Group B that 6th Army be instructed to withdraw forces quite ruthlessly from its defense fronts in order to keep its rear free at the Don Crossing at Kalash. Whether this instruction was ever passed to 6th Army I have been unable to discover. Not until we arrived at HQ Army Group B in Starobilsk on 24th November did we obtain a clear picture of recent events and the current situation from the commander, Colonel General Baron V. Watts, and his Chief of Staff, General V. Sodenston. In the early hours of 19th November, after a tremendous artillery barrage, the enemy had broken out of his Don bridgehead at Kremenskaya and had also crossed the river further west to attack both the left wing of 6th Army, 11 Corps, and 3rd Romanian Army, 4 and 5 Romanian Corps. Simultaneously he had launched a strong attack against 4th Panzer Army, Colonel General Hoth, south of Stalingrad, where it was intermingled with 4th Romanian Army. While the left wing of 6th Army had held firm, the enemy had been able to overrun the Romanians completely on both fronts. At each of the two points of penetration strong Soviet tank forces had immediately pushed through in depth just as we had taught them to do. By an early hour on 21st November they had already linked up on the Don and Kalash, where the bridge so vital for the supply of 6th Army had fallen into their hands intact. Since the forenoon of that day, therefore, the ring had been closed around 6th Army and the German and Romanian elements of 4th Panzer Army which had been squeezed back into the pocket from the area south of Stalingrad. The encircled troops included 5 German corps totaling 20 divisions, 2 Romanian corps, the mass of the army artillery not on the Leningrad front and large numbers of army engineer units. Even later on the army group was unable to obtain any exact data on the sum total of German soldiers trapped in the pocket. The returns sent in by 6th Army fluctuated between 200,000 and 270,000 men, but it must be remembered here that the stated Russian strengths included not only the Romanian troops but also many thousand indigenous volunteers the so-called Iwis and prisoners of war. The most commonly quoted figure of over 300,000 is undoubtedly exaggerated. Various communications zone troops were left outside the pocket, as were part of the B echelon transport, a number of the wounded, and all ranks on leave. These residual elements, which later formed the cadres with which most of the 6th Army divisions were reconstituted, still amounted to anything between 1,500 and 3,000 men per division. If one bears in mind that the divisions of 6th Army had already fallen off in strength in November, the estimate that there were 200,000-220,000 men in the pocket, even allowing for the strong complement of army artillery and engineers, is probably fairly accurate. The situation on 24th November was approximately as follows the only intact formations left to 4th Panzer Army were 16 motorized division on its southern wing widely extended across the steppes on both sides of Yalis to an 18 Romanian division on the northern side. All the other Romanians had either been thrown back into Stalingrad or overrun. With what remnants of the Romanian units it could scrape together, plus various German communications zone troops, the army tried to hold an emergency defense line forward of Kotelnikovo and was not attacked again for the time being. What was left of 4th Romanian army, including the headquarters, was placed under command of Colonel General Hoth. After the Romanian collapse, his 4 Corps, which had been part of the front south of Stalingrad, had swung back onto a front south and southwest of Stalingrad and had come under command of 6th Army. 6th Army, consisting of 4, 8, 11, and 51 Army Corps and 14 Panzer Corps, was surrounded at Stalingrad. 
it had taken 11 core and elements of 8 core out of the front facing north on both sides of the Don and put them into the pockets newly formed western front, the salient tip of which reached to a point east of the Clash Bridge. A new southern front had been formed out of reserves and those elements of 4th Panzer, or 4th Romanian, army which had been thrown back to Stalingrad. The pocket measured about 30 miles across from east to west and 25 miles from north to south. Both wings of 3rd Romanian Army had been broken through. In its center, a group of about three divisions under the same General Laska who had distinguished himself at Shivastopol had put up a brave resistance, but they had since been surrounded and were now thought to have been captured. 48 Panzer Corps which had been in reserve behind the front facing the Don bridgehead, had launched what appears to have been a belated counter-attack, but this had proved unsuccessful. Both its divisions were now encircled and under orders to fight their way out to the west. The corps commander, General Heim, had already been replaced on orders from Hitler and summoned to the latter's headquarters. The Hitler had him sentenced to death at a court-martial presided over by Goring, who was always available for tasks of this kind, on the ground that he, General Heim, was to blame for his core failure. Heim was later rehabilitated when it was found that his forces had indeed been too weak for the task confronting them. 48 Corps consisted of the newly formed Romanian Armored Division, which had had no battle experience whatever, and 22 Panzer Division which had obviously not been up to standard from a technical point of view. For all practical purposes 3rd Romanian Army had only about three divisions still in existence. They were those of 1 and 2 Romanian Corps, which had not been drawn into the battle and were located next to the Italians on the Don. In the opinion of Army Group B, 6th Army had at most two days ammunition and six days rations left. These estimates were subsequently found to have been too low, the airlift to date insofar as the weather had permitted one to operate at all had provided only one-tenth of the army's requirements of ammunition and fuel. 100 Junkers aircraft, equivalent to a working load of 200 tons less the inevitable losses, had been promised and others were to follow. Intelligence reports showed that the enemy had poured some 24 formations, that is divisions and armored or mechanized brigades, through the gap he had torn in the front south of Stalingrad. These had then wheeled north against the southern flank of 6th Army, which they were fiercely attacking. From the point where he had penetrated 3rd Romanian Army, the enemy had also pushed about 24 formations through towards Kalash in the rear of 6th Army. About 23 more had been reported further west, advancing south and southwest towards the Cher. In addition, there were the Soviet troops in Stalingrad who had held out all along against 6th Army's attacks and were now being reinforced across the Volga, as well as the superior forces still opposite the northern front of 6th Army between the Volga and Don. Finally, there was no doubt that the enemy was continuously bringing up reinforcements by rail. Even by 28 November a total of 143 major formations, that is divisions, armored brigades, etc., had been identified in the operations area of the new Don Army Group. The forces to form Don Army Group under my command were as follows. First there was 6th Army, surrounded at Stalingrad by an enemy roughly three times as strong and composed of 20 very tired German and two Romanian divisions. Its stocks of ammunition, fuel and food were running low, and there was no steady inflow of supplies to build them up again. Quite apart from the fact that it was surrounded, the army enjoyed no operational freedom whatever, having received categoric orders from Hitler to hold fast to the fortress of Stalingrad. Next came the remnants of 4th Panzer Army and the two Romanian armies. The best forces we possessed at present were one hitherto untouched German division, 16 motorized, which could not be withdrawn from its defensive positions out in the steppes because it constituted Army Group A's only cover from the rear and four still intact Romanian divisions whose combat value was unquestionably inferior to that of the Russians. Sixth Army's subordination to HQ Don Army Group was more or less a fiction, however, 
for in practice it had hitherto come directly under OKH it was Hitler who had tied it down at Stalingrad when it might still have been able to fight its own way out. Now, operationally speaking, it was immobilized. The army group could no longer command it, but merely give it assistance. Besides, Hitler was still maintaining his direct control of 6th Army by a general staff liaison officer who was installed with his own signals section at 6th Army headquarters. Even in the matter of supplies Hitler had the final say, since he alone had the means at his disposal to maintain the army from the air. Strictly speaking, therefore, I should have been right to decline to have 6th Army in my army group and to insist that it formally remain under the direct orders of OKH I did not do so at the time because I hoped that I should be in a better position than OKH to ensure the direct cooperation of the relieving forces with the encircled army. Why this cooperation did not materialize in the decisive phase will be shown later. Apart from 6th Army, which, being surrounded, was unusable in the operational sense all that Don Army Group found awaiting it initially were mere remnants. It was envisaged that the Army Group should receive the following new forces, to be allocated as below HQ 57 Corps 23 Panzer Division Strong Army Artillery, from Army Group, to 4th PZ. Army, Roll, Relief Drive on Stalingrad from South 6 Panzer Division, recently brought up to strength from the West 1 Corps HQ, 4. 5 divisions, to 3rd drum. Army, left wing to relieve Stalingrad by advance eastwards from Aperture's Army Detachment Hollet. At HQ Army Group B I was shown a message which General Paulus, the commander of 6th Army, had radioed to Hitler on to the best of my recollection 22nd or 23rd November. It stated that he and all his corps commanders considered it absolutely imperative that the army should break out to the southwest. To raise the forces needed for such an operation, however, he would have to shift certain formations around inside the army and, for the purpose of economizing in troops, take his northern front back onto a shorter line. The view taken at Army Group Headquarters was that even if Hitler had given immediate approval, no breakout could have started before 28th November. However, Hitler had turned the request down and forbidden any retraction of the northern front. To make his point quite clear, he had entrusted General V. Sadlitz with command of the whole front in question. The staff of Don Army Group had neither the time nor the opportunity to retrace past events in 6th Army. Evidently, General Paulus did everything possible, within the limits of Hitler's order binding him to Stalingrad, to extract forces from those of his army fronts which were not so seriously threatened in the first instance. By pulling in four corps of 4th Panzer Army he was able to assemble a new front on his open south flank. Furthermore, he tried to keep his rear free by throwing 14 Panzer Corps from the eastern to the western bank of the Don. Unfortunately it ran into superior Soviet forces west of the river. At the very same time 11 Corps which was still holding its position west of the Don with a front facing north, was attacked in the rear. This situation led 6th Army to pull both corps back into a bridgehead west of the Don and subsequently across the river to the east, so that it could form an all-round front between the Don and Volga. Although these measures prevented 6th Army from being plunged into the vortex of defeat which had engulfed its neighbors, they also inevitably led to its encirclement. What must be made perfectly clear, on the other hand, is that it was the Supreme Command's business to issue an order affording 6th Army the opportunity to acquire operational elbow room and thereby to avoid being surrounded. A far-sighted leader would have realized from the start that to mass the whole of the German assault forces in and around Stalingrad without adequate flank protection placed them in mortal danger of being enveloped as soon as the enemy broke through the adjacent fronts. When the Soviets unleashed their big offensive across the Don and south of Stalingrad on 19 November, the German leaders must have known what was coming. From that moment onwards it was inadmissible to wait until the enemy had overrun the Romanians, for even if their armies had not been carved up so quickly, it would still have been necessary to use 6th Army in a mobile role in order to master the situation on the southern wing of Army Group B by the evening of 19 November at the latest.
Therefore, OKH should have given 6th Army fresh orders allowing it freedom to maneuver. Without going into the details of the first few days of the Soviet offensive, one may safely say that the encirclement of 6th Army could only have been prevented if the latter had attempted a breakout in the very early stages, either by crossing the Don to the west or by striking southwest along the east side of the river. The onus of ordering it to do so lay with the supreme command. While General Paulus should certainly have taken his own decision to disengage from Stalingrad, he could hardly have done so as early as OKH, not being briefed, as the latter was, on the situation in the neighboring army areas. By 22nd or 23rd November, when he did ask for permission to break out, the vital hour may already have been missed. The fact that it was a serious psychological error to put this request to Hitler at all is another matter. Paulus had been acquainted with Hitler's views on the war in the East since the winter of 1941, when he had been obiquati Mr. I at OKH he was aware that Hitler credited himself with having saved the German army from the disaster of a Napoleonic retreat that went to by ordering every foot of ground to be held. He must have realized that after Hitler's remarks about Stalingrad in his Sportpalast speech, the dictator would never agree to evacuation. The city's name was too closely bound up with his own military reputation. Thus, the only solution would have been to confront him with the fait accompli of the army's disengagement from Stalingrad. It is conceivable, of course, that such action might have cost Paulus his head. Yet no one must think that it was any fear of what might happen to him personally that kept Paulus from taking things into his own hands and doing what he believed to be right. It is more likely to have been loyalty to Hitler which impelled him to try to get the army's breakout authorized, particularly as he was in direct touch with OKH by radio. And, as I have already pointed out, he can hardly have had a sufficiently clear picture of the overall situation. The difficulty of deciding to act on his own initiative may also have been increased by the fact that a breakout would momentarily have meant a bigger risk to the army than forming a hedgehog position in Stalingrad. Don Army Group's appreciation of the situation on 24 November for the time being HQ Don Army Group was unable to take a hand in events by issuing any orders of its own. It could not take over its full responsibilities until such time as I arrived in Novokokarsk, the place here marked as our headquarters location, with a reasonably complete operations staff, and the necessary channels of communication had been established. Neither would be the case for some days yet. For one thing, our aircraft had been grounded by a blizzard in the central sector, as a result of which we were having to continue the journey by train. Nonetheless, as the future commander of the army group, I had to make up my mind on one thing straight away on the basis of the situation report given to us on 24th November. Ought 6th Army, if possible, to effect a breakout even at this late stage, or would it not be better, now that the first chance of doing so had undoubtedly been missed, to wait until a relief force could drive out to meet it? After careful reflection, and in complete agreement with my Chief of Staff, General Schultz, and the Chief of Operations, Colonel Buss, I came to this conclusion the enemy would in the first instance do everything in his power to destroy the encircled 6th Army. At the same time we had to bear in mind the possibility that he would try to exploit the collapse of 3rd Romanian Army by pushing mechanized forces across the large bend of the Don towards Rostov where he was offered the prospect of cutting off the rear communications not only of 6th and 4th Panzer armies but also of army group had the forces at the enemy's disposal which he could doubtless augment by road and rail transport, would allow him to pursue the two aims simultaneously. I further concluded that the army group's foremost task must in any case be the liberation of 6th army. On the one hand, the fate of 200,000 German soldiers was at stake. On the other, unless the army were kept in existence and ultimately set free, there could hardly be any hope of restoring the situation on the right wing of the Eastern Front. One thing was clear, even if we were able to raise the siege and re-establish contact, 6th Army must on no account be left at Stalingrad. The city's prestige value as far as we were concerned was non-existent. On the contrary, 
If we should succeed in getting the army out, it would be urgently needed to give the maximum possible help in stabilizing the situation on the southern wing sufficiently to bring us safely through the winter. The immediate question, however, was whether Sixth Army, having once missed its real opportunity to break out, should try to do so at this particular moment. As two days had passed since General Paulus's request to Hitler, the attempt could not, according to Army Group B, begin before 29th or 30th November. By then the enemy would already have had more than a week in which to tighten his hold on the pocket. The army would have the choice of only two escape routes, and in either case the enemy would be ready for it. One possibility was to break out towards the Don crossing at Kalash. But even if the army managed to pierce the encircling ring in this direction, there would still be the Don to bar its passage. Although most of the ammunition would have been expended on the original breakthrough, the army would now have to force a crossing against the powerful forces advancing west of the river towards the Loerger against negligible opposition. Its prospects of getting across, when it was short of ammunition and hard pressed by the enemy from north, east and south, seemed more than doubtful. Conditions might be slightly better if 6th Army were to try to break through to the remnants of 4th Panzer Army by moving in a southwesterly direction east of the Don Lo here, too the enemy would be ready for it. The objection in this case was that even if the actual breakthrough were successful, the army could not count on there being any German forces to meet it in the first instance. On its heels would be the Soviet armies now opposite its eastern, northern, and western fronts around Stalingrad, while west of the river the enemy would be able to follow it southwards and forestall all its attempts to effect a crossing to the west. Most probably the army would sooner or later have no choice but to stand and fight out in the steppes without adequate supplies of ammunition, fuel, or food. Some elements, such as tank units, might possibly get away, but the fate of the army as a whole would be sealed. The Soviet forces it had been engaging till then would be released, and this in turn was likely to lead to the destruction of the German army's entire southern wing including Army Group A which was still out in the Caucasus. For the sake of both 6th Army and the situation on the southern wing generally, our aim had to be to get the former out of the pocket intact and in fighting trim. This might have been done already if the Supreme Command had granted it operational freedom as soon as the danger of its encirclement became apparent. By now, however, it seemed too late for the army to break free and remain fit for further action without the extraneous help of relief forces. On the other hand, it could be assumed that once the two relief groups moved off, 6th Army's position would be substantially easier in the operational sense, even if not for the initial breakthrough. Once the enemy advancing west of the Don were engaged by other forces, 6th Army would at least be spared the prospect of having to fight that particular opponent. And if, at the same time as 6th Army moved off, the other relief group were to thrust into the rear of the Soviet siege front east of the Don, the enemy would be compelled to weaken the latter and thereby to facilitate the beleaguered army's initial breakthrough. 18 At the same time the fact had to be faced that any delay was dangerous, since it would give the enemy time to consolidate his siege front. Such a risk could only be entertained if the Supreme Command guaranteed to supply 6th Army by air for as long as was needed to liberate it. Such was the premise for not now resorting to the desperate solution of an isolated breakout by 6th Army but for awaiting a fresh opportunity. This would present itself as soon as the relief groups could go in. In the light of the foregoing, I informed the Chief of Staff of the Army by telephone that the Army Group's views were as follows a breakout by 6th Army to the southwest was probably still possible even now. To leave the Army at Stalingrad any longer constituted an extreme risk, in view of the ammunition and fuel shortage. Nevertheless, since we considered that the best chance for an independent breakout had already been missed, it was preferable from the operational point of view at the present time to wait until the projected relief groups could come to the army's aid always assuming that an adequate airlift could be counted upon. The latter factor, we emphasized, was absolutely decisive. The relief operation could be launched with the forces due to arrive at the beginning of December. To achieve real effect, 
However, it would require a steady flow of further reinforcements, as the enemy would also be throwing in powerful forces on his own side. An isolated breakout by 6th Army might still become necessary if strong enemy pressure were to prevent us from deploying these new forces. An absolute prerequisite for accepting the risk of not making an immediate breakout from Stalingrad was that 6th Army should daily receive 400 tons of supplies by air. 19 I made it perfectly clear in this conversation that unless the delivery of supplies could be guaranteed, one could not risk leaving 6th Army in its present situation any longer, however temporarily. Anyone who witnessed the subsequent tragedy of Stalingrad, Hitler's mulish determination to hold on to the city, OKH's deliberate failure to take the very last chance offered to it, a subject on which more will be said in due course. The delays which occurred in assembling their relief group of 4th Panzer Army, and the Soviet breakthrough on the Italian front which rendered Army Detachment Hollett incapable of any action to relieve Stalingrad will conclude that it would have been better to insist on an immediate breakout by 6th Army. It is fair to assume that at least some elements of the besieged formation would have managed to fight their way through to the remnants of 4th Panzer Army, certainly the tank units and probably a number of the infantry battalions. 2. On the other hand, it is unlikely that the army would have remained capable of operating as a formation. Things had already taken too ominous a turn by the earliest date at which a breakout could have been attempted. Yet at the same time as the extricated elements of 6th Army might have been joining 4th Panzer Army, the entire enemy siege forces would have been released. With that, in all probability, the fate of the whole southern wing of the German forces in the east would have been sealed including Army Group A. I would nonetheless emphasize that the latter consideration played absolutely no part in shaping our appreciation of 24th November. Far from wanting to sacrifice 6th Army in the interest of saving the southern wing, we hoped that it would have a better chance of escape when working in conjunction with the two groups earmarked for its relief than if it tried at this late stage to break out on its own. My staff and I were actuated by the hope of extricating not mere military debris but a complete army which would still be fit for further operations. It goes without saying that the name of Stalingrad and the prestige factor cut no ice with us whatever. That day, 